Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you William Powell and Myrna Loy in After the Thin Man. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. When Edgar Allan Poe popularized the detective story, he found the great common denominator of American entertainment. Millions of us have stayed up past bedtime to explore the fascinating realm of whodunit, including the President of the United States. And you can find devotees in every walk of life, rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief, and probably policeman too. Perhaps we haven't investigated this branch of the drama quite as often as we should in the Lux Radio Theater. But when we do engage a manhunter, we get the very best. Tonight, our play is After the Thin Man, adapted from the MGM picture, and naturally starring the same two players that go with a thin man story, Myrna Loy and William Powell. It's an occasion for great rejoicing, but we also must hang our heads a little, because it's exactly four years since Miss Loy was last at this microphone. There's more to the story of After the Thin Man than just the exciting quest of a criminal. Because our detective is the extraordinary Nick Charles. And Nick has a lovely wife named Nora. They happen to be very much in love. But even love can't keep Nora from interfering with her husband's business when she has an idea. And Nora is a girl with many ideas. Together they can solve just about any problem you give them. But you don't really need a detective to discover that Lux Flakes is the simple answer to your household problems. It's a deduction that millions of women have made after giving Lux Flakes a trial. Now, if your wits have been thoroughly sharpened and you're ready for anything to happen, we'll raise the curtain on the first act of After the Thin Man, starring William Powell as Nick Charles and Myrna Loy as Nora. The railroad station in San Francisco... Into the dim maze of tracks rolls a mighty streamliner, sleek and shiny, after its mad dash across the country. With the final throb of its powerful engines, it comes to rest. From the gate tumbles a crowd of reporters and photographers. They rush breathlessly up and down the length of the platform, eager to be the first to greet the arriving celebrities, Mr. and Mrs. Nick Charles. Nick? Where's Nick? Where's Nick? Where's Nick? Where's Nick? Where's Nick? Where's He's probably in that car over there. Come on, let's get a statement for hey. me. Is Nick Charles in this car? Charles, two cars back. Uh, thanks. Oh, there he is. Hey, Nick. Hello, Nick. Nicky. How does it feel to well, be home? Are you going to stay with us a while now? I'm from the Chronicle, Mr. Charles. Hey, Can I have a statement? guys, easy, one at a time. Darling, these are the gentlemen of the press. Gentlemen, my wife. Hello, Hello. How, how, do you do? Do? how do you do? Uh, how's about a statement, Nick? Are you going to keep on with your detective work? No, gentlemen, I've retired. Now on, I'm just going to take care of my wife's money. So I'll have something in my old age. Oh, you said you'd retired before, but I noticed you took that thin man case in New York. Yeah, that thin man was a beaut. They're still talking about it. You'd take a case like that now, wouldn't you? Not a chance. I just took that to please my wife. She wanted some excitement. Well, I guess you had it, Mr. Charles. Oh, it was wonderful. Two men tried to kill him. But he's not going to take any more cases. You can print that. That's the girl. So long, gentlemen. Come on, darling. Well, goodbye. Nice to meet you, Charles. Goodbye. Nice to have met you. Take slow down. I can't keep up if you're going to... Oh. Excuse me, lady. I guess I wasn't looking where I was going. No. I guess you weren't. Hiya, Fingers. Well, well, Nick Charles. Well, how are you? Fine. How's business, Fingers? Business? Oh, I quit that racket. Nick, my purse. It's gone. Oh, that's a shame. All right, I want you to meet Fingers McCoy. Uh, this is my wife, Fingers. Your, your wife? Mm-hmm. Say, I didn't know she w- Oh, I'm sorry about your purse, Mrs. Charles. What'll I do, Nick? I know I had it with me. Oh, it'll turn up. Won't it, Fingers? I certainly hope so. Oh, sure. Well, so long, Nick. Glad I bumped into you. Goodbye, Mr. Charles. Right. Goodbye. Nick, I've got to go back to the train. No, I wouldn't bother, darling. Let's get home. Well, I just can't go off. Come on now, come on. You don't want to embarrass him, do you? What do you mean? Fingers. He's a purse snatcher. Think of his feelings. A purse snatcher? Well, he must have taken it. Certainly. But you see, he didn't know you were my wife. You'll get it back in a morning mail, darling. He's a very honest pickpocket. Oh, Nick, you do know the nicest people. Hiya, Nick. Welcome home. Hiya, Bumps. How's the boy? Never better, Nick. In the pink. See you around. A prize fighter, darling? No, no. A wrestler. Oh, a wrestler. Well, that's different. Hiya, Nicky. 
What's a good boy? Well, hello, Slats. How's everything? I'm doing okay. Glad to see you, pal. Likewise. Now, there's a sweet character. He ought to be in jail just to play safe. He got out last Tuesday. Oh. Welcome home, Nora. Oh, hello. Thank you. Nice to see you, my dear. Thank you very much. Now, who are those people, darling? You wouldn't know them. They're respectable. Oh. You know, darling, the best thing about going away is coming back home. I suppose you remember that tonight is New Year's. I know. Got your keys, darling? Yes. Yeah. I also suppose you've got some ideas on the subject. Very definite ideas. I was afraid of that. I want to lock the doors and plug the bells, cut off the telephone, and crawl into bed for months. Mrs. Charles, you're a woman after my own heart. I won't be awake at midnight, so I'll kiss you now. Happy New Year, Nora. Happy New Year, darling. <laughs> Hey, folks, what you stand out there for? Come on in. Hey, what is this? Well, it's our house, all right. Come on, come on. Make yourself at home, folks. Well, let's go in, darling. He says it's all right. Oh, well, as long as we're invited. There's the bar right in there. Help yourself. Thank you very much. Okay. What's the celebration? Shh, we're giving a surprise party to Nick and Nora. Nick and Nora? Sure, don't you know Nick and Nora? No, we don't. Neither do I. But that's not going to spoil my fun. It's New Year's, so what's the odds? Go on in. Fake it. It's a sin. Oh, thanks for the tip. Sure. Get in there and get some of that Napoleon brandy before it's all gone. No. <clears throat> May I have this dance, Mrs. Charles? Thank you, sir. You're a gent. Who are all these people? Well, now, let's see. It looks like Moe Stone over there. He's a bookie. That fellow with him is a police captain. And I believe the gentleman in the loud suit runs the pool room. That fellow in the fireman's hat... Never mind. A... I get the general idea. Mrs. Charles, welcome home, madam. Thank you. How are you, Peters? Never better, Mr. Charles. I'm sorry about the party, sir, but they forced their way in. Yeah, knowing my friends, I can believe that. Nick, I smell something burning. Probably just the living room rug or... Uh... If I may be allowed to suggest, sir, that's probably Mrs. Charles' aunt. She's been calling all day and very much annoyed. She wants you to come to dinner this evening, Mrs. Charles. Oh, dear. Goodbye, darling. See you next year. <clears throat> she expects you, too, Mr. Charles. Me? Aunt Catherine wants me to come to dinner? Well, there must be some mistake. She couldn't want you, Nick. I'll take it in the bedroom, Peters. Nick, come with me. If it's your Aunt Catherine, get out of it. No more family dinners. I wouldn't go through that again if you had twice as much money. Hello? Hello, Nora. Who is this? This is Selma. Oh, hello, darling. Darling? Aunt Catherine? Shut up. It's my cousin Selma. How are you, Selma? It's all right. I had to call you. I wanted to make sure you were coming tonight. Well, I'm afraid not, Selma. You see... Nora, you've got to come. I'm in terrible trouble. What? Please, I can't tell you now, but you must come. I'm desperate. I... Oh, wait a minute. Selma, put down that phone. I won't. I'm speaking to Nora. Hello? I told you not to call anyone. Hello, Selma. Give me the phone. Hello, dear. Hello, is this... How are you, Nora? This is Aunt Catherine. Well, what's the matter with Selma? Oh, nothing at all, dear. You know Selma well enough not to pay too much attention to her. We'll see you tonight, Nora. Well, you see, it's New Year's Eve, Aunt Catherine. The old battle axe. Shut up. What? Excuse me, Aunt Catherine. I was talking to the dog. Oh. We'll expect you at 7.30. All right, Aunt Catherine. We'll come. Goodbye. What did you say? I said we'd be over for dinner. Oh, my own wife. I'm sorry, Nicky, but I had to do it. It's Selma. She's in trouble. You like Selma, don't you? Not as much as that. But she sounded so funny, as if she'd been crying. Mm, living with your Aunt Catherine, I can't say I blame her. <laughs> Selma. <laughs> Selma, stop that crying. Do you want the servants to hear her? I don't care, Aunt Catherine. I'm going crazy. I can't stand it any longer. I'm going to call the police. You'll do nothing of the sort. Haven't we paid out enough to hush up his other scandal? He never did anything like this before. How do we know but what he may be dead? I told you I'd handle this. I can't go on this way. Rob is my husband. And be quiet. Yes, Henry? I beg pardon, madam, but shall I set a place for Mr. Robert tonight? Certainly. Mr. Robert will be here. Very good, madam. You know he won't be here, Aunt Catherine. I know nothing of the sort. Now go upstairs and make yourself presentable. When Nora comes, I'm going to tell her. You will not tell her. I will not have that husband of hers snooping into our family affairs. I don't care. He can help us. I'm going to tell him the whole story. Nick. Nick. Aunt Catherine wants to speak to you. 
What did I do now? Use the wrong fork? Nick, listen. Do you know why Robert wasn't here tonight? Sure, because he's smart. I'm not fooling. He's disappeared. That's swell. Now, if we could only get rid of Aunt Catherine, we'd be all set. Come on. She's in the library with Selma. Here he is, Aunt Catherine. Oh, Nicholas, I'm sorry to take you away from the family. Oh, that's fine. I mean, it's uh, quite all right. Well, what's, what's all this about, Selma? How long has Robert been gone? Three days. Three days without a word. Mm. Have you notified the police? Certainly not. And we're not going to. Oh, no. Robert may be kidnapped. He may be lying dead somewhere, but we mustn't do anything about it. Our precious name might get in the paper. Oh, don't pay any attention to her. She's exaggerating the whole affair. However, to please her, I thought you might investigate the matter quietly. With your experience as a... Uh, uh, as a flat foot? And I didn't mean to be as blunt as that. Why not? It's all in the family. Selma, have you any idea where Robert might be? No. But there's a woman mixed up in it. I know it. Selma, you know nothing of the sort. What about the vanity case they sent me from that Chinese restaurant? It was a stupid mistake on their part. Mistake? Some woman left it. He was there with some woman. Selma, you know that Robert worships you. How can you say that? You know he hates me. He only married me for my money. He never did love me. Sometimes I wish he were dead. Well, I, I'm a little confused. Tell me, Selma, do you want him back or don't you? <laughs> of course she wants him back. Don't, Selma. Please come, Selma. I'll take you up to your room. Dr. Keller will be here in a moment. He'll give you something for your nerve. Excuse me. Nora, Nicholas. Well, Nick, what do you think about it? I'm not thinking at all. What are you getting me into? There are lots of detectives in this town, men who need the job. But no one as good as you, Nicky. Yeah, that won't get you a thing. I've retired. But this is different. This is for Selma. You will help find Robert, won't you? Why? I didn't lose him. It's your chance, Nick. It'll get you in right with the family. That's just what I'm afraid of. Nicky. Get your hat, darling. We're going to get out of here while we still got the chance. Well, where's it going to be? It's still New Year's Eve. We ought to go someplace. All right, let's go look for Robert. Now, listen, my sweet. Hello, Nick. Hello, Nora. Oh, hiya, David. David, how nice to see you. What are you standing out here for? Oh, well, they don't let me in the house anymore. Selma said she'd try and meet me later. I'm afraid she won't be able to make it. Did you know that Robert had disappeared? If he has, it's the only decent thing he's ever done. What's he been up to lately, David? The last thing he pulled on me was a couple of days ago. Called up and said that if I'd give him $25,000, he'd go away and leave Selma to me. Lovely boy. What did you say? I asked him to give me a couple of days to think it over. You know, 25000 would be cheap if he'd really go. Why don't you pick up a collection? There are a lot of people who'd like to contribute. Tell me, did you see Selma? How is she? I'm terribly worried about her. I know, I am too. Come on, David. We're going to go someplace and get the taste of respectability out of our mouths. Thanks, but I couldn't. Oh, David, why not? I've got too much on my mind. Well, I'm glad you're back anyway. Happy New Year to you. Happy, Happy New Year. Year. Selma was a fool not to have married him instead of Robert. They can't all be as lucky as you, darling. Well, where are we going? How do you feel about some Chinese food? Awful. Oh, I'm so sorry. Because we're going to that Chinese restaurant that sent the compact to Selma, the Lai Chi. Please, darling. Now, see here. I I'm not looking for Robert. Of course you're not. I am. Tell him we're all filled up. I did. He says to tell you his name is Nick Charles. Nick Charles? Where is he? Over by the door. <laughs> ah, now, this is more like it. You must feel right at home in a place like this. Too bad we didn't bring Aunt Catherine. Hello, Nick. How are you? Hello, dancer. Tell me, how many tables? Oh, I guess I can find one. Seeing as it's you... You just slumming? That's all, Dancer. Why? Just wanted to make sure. I don't like business calls on New Year's. Oh, say, I want you to be my partner. Hey, Lum Key, come here. Yes? I want you to meet a friend of mine, Lum Key. This is Nick Charles. And Mrs. Charles. Oh, I'm your friend. You bet you. You sent his brother up, Nick. Lum Ying, remember? Oh, yes, yes. He's the one who spread a tongue war out to include sticking up a bank. Oh, ho, ho. You, uh, you bet you. You catch my baller. You play trick on him. No play trick on him, no catch him, you bet you. You still in jail? Oh, you bet you. Four, five years more. Goodbye. Oh, nice start, please. Is he a tongue man, too, Mr. Dancer? No, but you never can tell how close brothers are. I thought you might like to know, Nick. Thanks. He's a good guy to have liking you. Oh, there's a table over there by the wall. 
This way, Mrs. Charles. Nicky, there's Robert. I know, I saw him before. Why didn't you tell me? Robert? Robert? Oh, hello. Good evening, Robert. Happy New Year. Is it? Robert, what are you doing in a place like this? We just saw Selma, Robert. Yeah? She's terribly worried about you. Don't you think you'd better go home? Sure, I'll go home. When I feel like it and not before. Robert! Oh, let him go. You got your table, Nick? Oh, is that fellow a friend of yours? On the contrary, he's a relation. He's been hanging around here drunk for three days. He's got a case on our prima donna. I wish you'd toss him out. His wife is going crazy. Oh, that's too bad. I'll speak to his girlfriend. Well, I've done my duty. Hey, Polly. Polly, come here. What's up, Jansen? Now, listen. That boyfriend of yours is pretty drunk. So what? I thought that was the idea. Keep him happy. Sure, but a couple of his relations just blew in. Relations? What do we do? Well, give the customers one more song and then knock off for the night and take him out of here. Okay, but I'm getting sick of that guy. Oh, it'll just be Lamar, honey, and then he can turn him loose. Tomorrow's a holiday. The banks will be closed. Ah, that's right. Well, then the next day. Ah, what's the difference? Ain't it worth it? I guess so. That's the girl. I'll make it snappy, Polly. I'll keep an eye on him. Hey, Polly. Yeah, what? I got a message for you. What is it? Your brother's looking for you. My brother? Where is he? In your dressing room. He wants to see you right away. Hello, Polly. What's the matter? You don't look so happy to see me. Please, Phil, don't try to start anything. I'm in a hurry. You've been in a hurry ever since I got back. Can I help it if I got to work? That's not what I'm kicking about. What's going on with this drunk Robert Landis? Nothing. Oh, no? Then what's this check doing on your dressing table? Give me that. A check made out to you, signed by Robert Landis. Get out of here. What are you... Shut up or I'll smack you right in the teeth. I'm in on this, you know. Phil, please. If you don't cut me in, the party's off. I can't cut you in. The check's yours, ain't it? Yes, but... But but, what? But what? Let me go. Let me... Sure. But this is just to remind you that I'm in on the deal. You big lug. Look what you've done to my face. How am I going to explain that? There's a lot of things you'll have to explain before I'm through. You and Dancer are taking this Landis guy for plenty of dough, aren't you? What about it? How much? Come on, how much? 25000 Did you get it yet? No. Go ahead, spill it. Some friend of his wife's is putting it up to get him to leave her alone. So you're going to keep him drunk and then collect it for him? When? I don't know. When, I said? Tomorrow night. Okay. I'll be around the next morning. Early. What are you doing here? Hiya, Dancer. Just leave him. So long, Polly. What did that heel want? Nothing. It's okay, Dancer. Now, listen. There's a switch in the plans. I just heard that that dough is being handed over tonight. Tonight? That David guy is meeting Landis in front of his house. Now, you better be with Landis, see? I'll be there. I told Nick that you were taking Landis home. Now, make sure they see you as you go out. Sure. And when the dough's delivered, you know what to do. I'll be across the street just in case something goes wrong. Now, get going. And no (laughs) slip-ups. doing in this office? Just calling a number. Any objection? Uh, once a gum heel, always a gum heel. I don't like gum heels. And I thought you'd quit it when you married a pot of money. Did he call me a pot? <laughs> yeah, I don't like to be critical, Dancer. But you know, it doesn't look quite right when you and your partner and your prima donna and your best customer all go out at the same time. It gives the place a sort of a vacant look. Have you ever been thrown out of a place, Mr. Charles? How many places was it up to yesterday, Mrs. Charles? How many places have you been in, Mr. Charles? Hello? Aunt Catherine? This is Nick. Uh, Nicholas. What? When? I see. Yes, I will. Bye. Well, if you're through in here, you can beat it. What's the matter, Nick? Bad news? Dancer, you'd better... Ah, Polly, come in. Another of our travelers has returned. Now, if only Lum Key will... <laughs> No sooner said than done. Oh, someone call me. Quite a gathering of the clan, isn't it? I wonder which one of you would be most surprised if Robert Landis walked in now. You know there's no chance of that, don't you? All of you. Now, I don't know what you're talking about. Now, get out of here. What is it, Nick? What's happened? 
Robert's been killed. Killed? He was killed on the front steps of your aunt's house. Police are questioning Selma. What's that got to do with us? Go on, get out. You said that before, Dancer, and it's foolish. I'm not going to get out. On the contrary, we're going to have a lot more people in. Listen, you... Hello. Nick Charles speaking. I want to get hold of Lieutenant Abrams, the homicide squad. Why are you calling him? It's a cinch none of us, Shotlanders. That's so. Well, then maybe you'd like to explain how you knew he was shot. <laughs> Curtain calls on Act One of After the Thin Man with Myrna Loy and William Powell. During this short intermission before Mr. DeMille presents Act Two, we introduce a very charming guest. Strike up the band, Lou. That music, ladies and gentlemen, welcomes a real southern belle, Miss Mary Nell Porter from Memphis, Tennessee. In private life, she's a debutante, but this spring she's touring the country in a very important role as made of cotton, representing our huge cotton industry. We're certainly delighted to welcome you to the Lux Radio Theater, Miss Porter. Thank you very much, Mr. Roy. I'm so glad to be here. I hear that you've been doing quite a little flying the last three months. I certainly have. Over 12,000 miles. And on top of that, I understand that you've had a staggering schedule of fashion shows and radio speeches and personal appearances in 30 different cities. It has been a very interesting experience, and I've enjoyed meeting so many nice people all over the country. We've had such large crowds at all our cotton fashion shows. Well, I'm sure the women want to hear about that. Now, I'd love to talk about it. You know, cotton is terribly smart this year for play suits and street dresses and evening frocks. Now, here, uh, just a minute, please. How about giving us some details? Well, there's a very good-looking red and white striped daytime dress with big sleeves. And has a very full skirt with the cutest Dutch boy pockets. I wear it with blue shoes. That sounds very patriotic. It surely is. Red, white, and blue is always fashionable this year. A lot of the dresses on our show are patriotic. I see where the stripes fit in, then. Well, they're smart, too. And so are flower prints. My bathing suit has tropical flowers scattered all over it. Oh, so cotton goes swimming. I should say it does. And dancing, too. You should see one evening dress in our fashion show. It's a brilliant red muslin with large white Hawaiian flowers all over it. Straight from the South Seas. Well, straight from a storybook. <laughs> it has the sweetest puff sleeves and a long basque bodice. Well, tell me, is cotton all glamour? Goodness, no. It's simply wonderful for wearing in town, too. Things like gingham or bouquet or seersucker make beautifully tailored suits. They're cool as can be and awfully easy to take care of. Miss Porter, don't you find it hard to keep all these lovely cottons fresh on your trip? Not at all. You see, the whole wardrobe is luxable. Even some of my shoes and bags. That makes things easy, doesn't it? I should say so. <laughs> Why, new quick lux flakes are simply wonderful. They take such beautiful care of all the lovely new cottons. You know, everything safe in water is safe in lux. Ladies, please note. This year's smart cottons are really fine fabrics. And they, they must be treated gently, just like washable silks, rayons, and woolens. New Quick Lux is so mild, it keeps them new-looking longer. That's why we use it for everything in our cotton show. Well, we've certainly enjoyed having you with us tonight, Miss Porter. Thank you so much. I'm mighty glad to meet you all. Well, good night, and good luck on your trip home. Thank you. Good night. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of After the Thin Man, starring William Powell as Nick Charles and Myrna Loy as Nora. It's two hours later. With mystery shrouding the death of Robert Landis, the police have been questioning Selma, who discovered the body. Now the grilling is over, and her nerves are worn to the breaking point. They're going to arrest me. They're going to arrest me, Nora. No, no, of course they're not. They all believe I did it. Aunt Catherine, everyone. They don't, Selma. They don't think that at all. I know. I heard them. Now, darling. But I didn't kill him, Nora. I didn't. I'm sure I didn't. I couldn't have. What? What do you mean? <sighs> Nora, you'll help me, won't you? Tell me what happened. Everything. He came to the house at midnight to get his things. He said he was leaving me. I tried to stop him. He pushed me away and went down the stairs. I followed him to the front door. While he was letting himself out, I went to the library table. There was a gun there. A gun, Selma? I didn't mean to use it. I only wanted to frighten him, to make him come back and listen to me. All right. Go on. I went to the door. 
He was standing on the steps looking up and down the street. And then, and then there was a shot. And he fell. Where did the shot come from? I don't know. I don't know. All right, darling, never mind. You've been through oh. enough. You'd better lie down now and rest. I can't. I can't rest. I've got to think. I've... Nora. Yes? David. What about David? He thinks I'm guilty, too. He thinks I killed Robert. Selma, how could... He must think so, or he wouldn't have taken... He wouldn't have taken what? Nothing. But he mustn't think that. I couldn't bear it. You must tell him. Tell him I didn't do it. Couldn't you tell him? No, no, somebody might be listening. You go to him. Tell him. Hurry! Who is it? It's me, Nora. Hello, Nora. This is a surprise. Come in. I got over as soon as I could, David. Selma What's said the that... Is there anything wrong? Well, you mean you don't know? No, what? What's happened? Well, Robert's been killed. Killed? That's impossible. What do you mean? I saw him only a little while ago. How long ago? About 10 o'clock. I met him in front of the house and gave him $25,000 in bonds. Wait a minute. This is too much for me. Where did he go then? He, he went inside the house to get his things. Oh, then it was when he came out again that he was shot. I've got to see Selma. Will you come with me? Come on. No, no, you don't. Stay right where you are, the both of you. What is this? Who are you? Detective Malloy, Homicide Squad. We've had our eye on you, buddy. Trying to make a getaway, huh? Are you crazy? Listen, someone's been kidding you, officer. Sure. Remember, you were kidding, too, when you were seen throwing that gun into the river. David! It's all right. There's been a mistake. Uh, tell Selma, will you? All right. Come here, sister. You're not telling anybody anything. You're going along with us. Where? Down to headquarters. Oh. <laughs> oh, you don't understand. I'm Mrs. Nick Charles. Oh, yeah? And I'm Mother Goose. Come on, step on it. <laughs> This is Abrams down at headquarters. Oh, uh, hi. Say, Nick, we picked up a woman a few minutes ago in David Graham's apartment. She claims she's your wife. My wife? Yeah. Says her name's Nora. What about it, Nick? Nora, Nora. Oh, sounds like a phony to me. You better put her in the jug till I get down there. You're the doctor, Nick. In the jug she goes. Right down here, Mr. Charles. Thank you, Matron. Nick! Nick, here I am, over here. Well, hello. <laughs> Fine way to start the new year, getting thrown in the can. Nicky, get me out of here. How long has this thing with David been going on? Oh, Nick, stop that and get me out of here. I've got something to tell you. About the case? Yes. Oh, oh no. I'll get you out on one condition. No more cases. No more detecting. Promise? But this is important. Do you want me to let her out, Mr. Charles? Definitely not. Nicky, please. Well, promise? I promise. All right, let her out, Matron. Nick, have you been working on the case? I've been giving it my undivided attention. What have you found out? Nothing. Oh, Nick. The only new development is that Polly has a brother. Where, we don't know. What about her and Dancer and Lum Key? All in the neighborhood at the time of the shooting. We've established that, but we can't prove a thing. But, Nick, somebody killed him. Yes, I think that's been proved. Mrs. Charles? Yes? Lieutenant Abrams wants you for questioning. Questioning? Nicky, they don't think I'm mixed up in this. Don't worry, darling. If they find you guilty, I'll write you every day. This way, please. Nicky! Now tell me, Mr. Graham, were you and Robert Landis on good times? Decidedly not. On bad times, Mr. Graham? Very bad. You and Mrs. Landis were once engaged, weren't you? Until Landis came along? Yes. Ever ask her to divorce him and marry you? I may have. But she never said she would. But you hoped she would. And you thought that with him out of the way, she might. I didn't kill Robert. No, of course not. But you did pay him to go away. Yes. Lieutenant Abrams? My wife. Oh, come on in. I got to ask her some questions, Mr. Charles. I'm sorry. Quite all right. Go ahead. Now, Mrs. Charles, why did you go to Mr. Graham's apartment? What? What? Uh... Uh, maybe I'd better leave. No. Selma had a silly idea that David thought she killed Robert. She wanted me to tell him that she didn't. Why, I can't imagine how she could think a thing like that. It's ridiculous. I haven't seen her for a couple of days. Here's Mrs. Landis, boss. No. Will you come in, Mrs. Landis? David... Oh, I didn't want you dragged into this. Oh, no, it's all right, dear. Mrs. Landis, why did Mr. Graham think you killed your husband? I never said that. I never thought it for one minute. Don't, David. He had every right to think I did it. He's just trying to protect me. He heard a shot. He rushed up to me and saw me standing near Robert with a gun in my hand. But I didn't fire the shot. It came from the street. You mean... 
You didn't kill him? No, look at the gun, David. It hasn't been fired. Oh, Selma, forgive me. Oh, of course I forgive you. Well, that's all cleared up. Go on, Nora. It isn't cleared up as far as I'm concerned. I've got to have something more than that. Where's that gun, Mrs. Landis? I've got to see that gun. Well, I haven't got it. Why? Well, David took it from me. David, where's the gun? What is it, David? Selma, I thought you were guilty. I thought I was doing the only thing. I, I threw it away. You threw it away? I threw it into the river. Oh, that's marvelous. Well, they can get it. I'll show them where I threw it. I'll get divers to go down after it. They'll find it. They must. Bowie, she don't want that gun back any more than you do. Hey, Mac, swear out a warrant for the arrest of Mrs. Robert Landis on suspicion of murder. <laughs> Nikki, Nikki, mm. are you awake? Hmm? No. No, I'm not. Oh, I thought you were. Did you say something about scrambled eggs? Mm. No, no, I didn't. No. Uh, I suppose that means you'd like me to go up and fix some for you. Oh, no. I don't care about them. Sure. Really? Good. Good night. Good night. After all, if I want scrambled eggs, I can get them for myself. Of course, I'm not as good a cook as you are, but... Oh, well, don't bother about me. You go on sleeping. I love to watch you sleep. You look so cute. Nikki, have you any pictures of yourself taken as a baby? Mm, no. Oh, that's a shame. I wanted to see what you looked like. I'll have one taken in the morning. <laughs> Poor Selma. Poor David. Nicky, can you reach the water? Huh? Oh. Yes, I thought so. Yes. Oh, I didn't want it. I just wanted to be sure you could reach it. <laughs> Nora, please go to sleep. I can't. I keep thinking of Selma down in that jail. Darling, there's nothing to worry about. Tomorrow they'll find the gun. They won't even fired. Selma will be free. Then you... Don't think she did it. For the tenth time, no. You're not saying that just to make me happy. Mm. You really mean it. Yeah, I mean it. Of course you're right. She didn't do it. She couldn't have done it. I don't think I'd kill you if you ran off with another woman. Mm. Thank you, darling. I might, though. Nora, don't be morbid. Go to sleep. What in the name of... Nick, the window. Keep your head down. Nick, somebody smashed the window. No, really? Look, there's a rock with a note attached to it. Take your note. Let's see. What is it, Nick? What does it say? Mm. Silly little woman, I told her to stop writing to me. Oh, darling. Please, read it. Mr. Nick Charles, if you want to know something about the murder of Robert Landis, get a line on Phil Burns, the guy Polly says is her brother. He's an ex-con and was married to Polly in Topeka, Kansas, three years ago. Married three years ago? What are we supposed to do, send him an anniversary present? Look at the way this fellow spells Topeka, T-O-P-E-K-E-R. <laughs> What's the matter with that? Nothing, darling. Good night. Oh, Nick, you can't go back to sleep now. Phone Abrams. What, and have him here, keeping us up all night? Oh, don't you see? If Phil is her husband, then he shot Robert because he found out about him and Polly. Oh, Nicky, you've got to call him. Uh, just as you say. You hear me the phone? Oh, isn't it wonderful? Everything's working out beautifully. All we have to do is find this fellow Phil Burns and we've got the murderer. Here, darling, call him and tell... Now, who can that be? Hello? Hello, Nick. This is Abrams. Oh, I was just going to call you. Yeah? Well, maybe you better get down here. You know that guy, Phil Burns, Polly's brother? Yeah, what about him? We traced him to his hotel. You find him? Yeah, but somebody else found him first. He's been murdered. Well, there he is. That's the way we found him, Nick. Dead for two hours at least. Strangled. Yeah. Like he was beaten up a bit before the strangling set in. Any fingerprints? All over the place. We're checking on him now. Mm, what else did you find? Nah, nothing much. He had a 38 in his drawer, six bullets in it, and a little dough. Oh, yeah, and this key. I guess it's the key to Polly's apartment. It's got her number stamped on it. Another good guess would be that Solomon Landis didn't do this. Mm, fair enough. But he wasn't killed the way Landis was either. Might be a good idea to check the chambers on that 38. He might have fired it and slipped in a new shell. Okay. 
Anything else on your mind? Uh, yes. That key to Polly's apartment. Could I borrow that for an hour? Sure. Here. Maybe you better give me a skeleton key, too, just for good measure. Okay. What are you looking for? I have the faintest idea. Just a hunch. Call you later. Okay. Nick, what did you find in there? Dead man. Is that all? Isn't that enough? Where are we going now? Well, I don't know about you. I'm going to visit Polly Burns. At this time of night? Without a chaperone? Nora, this is purely business. For me, too. Come on, darling. She's not home. Miss Burns keeps late hours, doesn't she? Mm. Nick, where'd you get that key? Shh. From Abrams. It was in Phil Burns' pocket. Oh, it's good you had an answer for that. Go on in. Be quiet. Here's a light switch. You turn it on. What do you expect to find in here? I don't know. Well, how do I know what to look for? Don't look for anything. Go over there and sit down. Suppose she comes in. What do we do? Tell her it's a surprise party. Anything in the drawer? Hey, give me a chance. Nick, what do you suppose people want a hole in the ceiling? They don't. Some people do. Look up there. Where? Up there. See, in the corner, a little hole in the plaster. What could that mean? Well, it might mean that the ceiling's falling down, or it might... What? What's the number of this apartment? Mm, 3D. I wonder who lives in apartment 4D. Let's go upstairs. Here it is. 4D. This is right over Polly Burns' apartment. What's the name on the bell? Uh, Anderson. Say, where did you dig up all these keys? We're going to visit Mr. Anderson. Or Miss Anderson. It doesn't say which. Anybody home? Put on the light. Let's see. That hole in the ceiling downstairs was right under this corner. If I'm right, these floorboards ought to be loose. Uh Uh-oh. I get it. Somebody took this apartment so they could see what went on downstairs. Exactly. Look through the hole, Nicky. What do you see? Well? That's funny. What is it? I can't see anything. It's... The hole's been plugged up from the other side. What? But how... There's somebody down there now. Somebody who knows about this people. Whoever it is plugged it up while we were coming upstairs. Nick! You stay here. No, Nick. It may be the murderer. Nicky, wait. I've got to see who it is. Listen, whoever it is just left, I can hear him going downstairs. Nick, let him go. All right, we better catch him before he gets to the street. Nick, wait for me. Will, did you see who it was? No. He went through that door at the end of the hall. That must go to the cellar. Wait here and don't move. Nick, be careful. It's black as pitch down there. Right back, darling. like to come on upstairs, or do I have to come and get you? All right. Have it your way. Come on. I can see you over there. Come on out, or I'll... Nick! Nick, are you all right? I'm okay. Come on down. I can't see. Nicky, did he get you? No, but I didn't get him either. He got out through a window over there. Oh, darling. I was so scared. Where are you? Oh, put your arms around me, darling. Are you sure you're all right? Oh, Nicky, you're bleeding. What are you talking about? I'm not bleeding. Nick, where are you? I'm here. Well, well, then who's this man over here? <laughs> just heard Act Two of After the Thin Men with William Powell and Myrna Loy. During this brief intermission before Mr. DeMille presents Act Three, we bring you another story about Mary. She's washing dishes. Oh boy, is she mad. I say, look at her hands. They're all red. 
And coarse. Here, let's see your soap, Mary. Oh, it's harsh. And soap that's harsh pecks away at your hands. No wonder they're red and rough. Here's a friendly tip. Try New Quick Lux. It's so kind to your hands. So mild, so pure. I want you to hear about our one-hand test of five dishwashing soaps, including Lux. Now, here's the story in the words of one of the women who took the test. This is Hugh Rennie of New York. She says... For 20 minutes, three times a day, and that's just about the time I spend doing my own dishes, I dip one hand in Lux suds and the other in suds from another soap. Mrs. Rennie took that test for several weeks under conditions similar to home dishwashing. She goes on to say... At the end of the test, my Lux hand was still nice and smooth, while the other hand was coarse and red. I hadn't realized there was such a difference in dishwashing soaps. I'll never use anything but Lux. Hundreds of women took that one-hand test with similar results. It proved Lux kindest to hands. Try it yourself and see. Ask for the generous large box of New Quick Lux tomorrow and use it for dishes every day. It's so thrifty. Even in hard water, it gives more suds, ounce for ounce, than any of ten other leading soaps tested. It's fast, too, yet it costs you no more. Remember, new quick lux in the same familiar box. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Rises on Act Three of After the Thin Man. In the thick blackness of the cellar, Nora has bumped into a man she thought was Nick. Now she discovers her mistake, and Nick rushes to her side. With quick, tense fingers, he strikes a match. There, in the wavering light, a man stands, propped against the wall. As they stare at his gleaming white face, he slumps to the floor at their feet. Nick! All right, take it easy. What's the matter with him? Is he... Is he... Yeah. He's dead. Shot. But when... When was he... I've seen that man before. You know him? Who is he? Light another match. Quick. Well? Of course I know him. His name is Pedro Dominguez. He used to be my father's gardener about six years ago. Your father's gardener? Well, that does a lot of good... Come on, we better call Abrams. What'd you find out, Lieutenant? Was I right about his name? Yes, you were, Mrs. Charles. Pedro Dominguez. But he wasn't a gardener anymore. He was janitor of this building. Probably shot about five hours before you found him. But he's a very funny thing. Go ahead, we can stand a laugh right now. The telephone company tells us that about 11.30 last night, that'd be just before he was shot... Someone here called up information and asked for Nick Charles' number. Our number? What would Pedro Dominguez be calling Nick for? No, I don't know. Do you, Nick? I can't imagine. I haven't even heard his name for six years. Did you remember him when you saw his face? No. That's funny, seeing he used to be Mrs. Charles' gardener. Who remembers a gardener unless he squirts a hose at you? Did you recognize him right away, Mrs. Charles? I had to look twice. He's a lot grayer than he used to be. Hey, by the way... What did you find out about the person in the apartment over Polly Burns? Not a thing. Not a fingerprint in the place. Not a stitch of clothes. Only a hunk of lead pipe and a ladder. A piece of lead pipe and a ladder. Well, that's interesting. Anything in Pedro's books? No, just that someone named Anderson took the apartment a week ago, paid cash in advance. Mm, that's all, huh? That's all. And the name is Anderson. No front name. No Mr., Mrs., or Miss. That's just dandy. You know, I've got a feeling that if we could just find out who took that room... We might have our murderer. Well, what do you think we ought to do? Get them all together in the Anderson apartment. Everyone that's mixed up in this. Let's shake them all up and see what happens. You're on. Are you going to take the murderer tonight? Yeah, we're going to try. How are you going to do it, Nicky? I haven't the slightest idea. I'm just going to listen. Pray that somebody makes a slip. Just one slip. <laughs> Is 
Is that it? You got them all here? All set and waiting, Nick. Picked up Dancer and Lumkey at the lychee. Polly was with them. Then there's that David Graham guy and your wife's cousin, Selma Landis. Anyone else? Yeah. A fat dame they call Aunt Catherine. I brought him along for luck. Yeah, swell. Oh, say, before you go in, I checked Phil Burns' apartment. Dancer's fingerprints were all over the joint. Dancer? You sure? Sure, I'm sure. You haven't told him, have you? Not yet. All right, don't. What's your plan, Nick? Build up a case against each of them. Throw all we've got at them and throw it hard enough to bounce. I'll make it bounce all right. And keep them talking. Nick, come on. The party's getting dull. Coming? Evening. Shut that door, please, Lieutenant. Sure. Ladies and gentlemen, I asked you all down here because we've just found that another murder has been committed. He's a man I think you all know. Pedro Dominguez. Pedro killed? Yes. What do you know about it, Polly? Nothing. I only saw him a couple of times when I went down to pay my rent. What about you, Dancer? You're in and out of this apartment. You must have known him. Sure, I know him. So what? You, Lumkey? I never been in this house before. You knew him, Selma. I? Well, no, I don't think you I... You remember Selma. He was our gardener six years ago. Oh. David, you remember Pedro Dominguez? Yes, vaguely. A man with long white mustaches. What did you know about him, Mr. Graham? Nothing. That was six years ago. I haven't seen him since. Nicholas, I can't see what possible connection this can have with us. It's very simple, Aunt Catherine. You see, Pedro and Robert were both shot with the same gun. Oh, well, I have nothing to do with it. Now, there was some monkey business going on we want to find out about. It. Seems that one week ago, Pedro rented an apartment to someone calling himself or herself Anderson. Did you ever see this Anderson, Polly? No. Did you ever hear anyone in the apartment just over you? No. I thought not. This Anderson intended to climb down into your apartment one night with the aid of a ladder and polish off Robert with this lead pipe. Then he was going to climb up to his place again and leave you holding the bag for Robert's murder. Now, do you know anyone who would be interested enough in you to do that? Why, uh, no. You're Dancer's girl, aren't you? I work for him. That's not what he asked. Well? Did Dancer know that you were going away with Robert? Why? Come why? on, come on. You told us before. You said you'd keep that a secret. I'll never trust a cop again. If you've made a dicker with the police, okay, Polly. But that ladder stuff's a lot of malarkey, Nick. No one did come down that ladder, and Landis wasn't killed in her place. The only reason the murderer didn't kill him that way was because he was found out. Pedro came in yesterday to clean up Anderson's apartment and discover the loose boards on the floor. He didn't like the looks of things, so he put a new lock on the door. When Anderson came in, he found he was locked out. He heard Pedro telephoning me, and he killed him. So what? So? Who is Anderson? I'll bite. Who? Polly, Phil had a key to your apartment, and Dancer had one. Yeah. Who else? Nobody. He's trying to hang this murder up on us to protect his own family. That Selma dame. She knocked her husband off. Everybody knows that. I didn't. And I then didn't. you got your boyfriend, David, to throw away the gun. That's a lie. Now, just a minute, please. Look, Dancer, let's come clean. You and Polly and Lum Key were out to shake Robert Landis down for 25 grand, right? Oh, sure. Then I suppose I knock him off and stir up all this fuss before I get the dough. What kind of a stumble bum does that make me out to be? You're the kind of a stumble bum that left your fingerprints all over the room when you killed Phil Burns. Phil? Phil's dead? Yes, yeah, strangled. Well, I didn't do it. Then why did you go to his place? Because I thought he'd gummed up my game. I figured he'd try to stick up Landers and had to kill him. So I pushed him around a little to learn the manners. And when I left him, he had a split lip and a couple of dents in him. But he was just as much alive as you are, if that means anything. Polly, who knew Phil was your husband? What? You were married, weren't you? Yeah, but... So Phil was your husband. As if you didn't know. I never knew till now. But I wish I had, Polly. Didn't you ever tell anyone that you were married, Polly? No. Would Phil have told? No. Did you and Phil talk about it? Yeah, one night last week. But no one could have heard. We were alone, down in my room. Alone? Don't forget Anderson could hear everything that went on in your room. Lieutenant, when was Phil Burns killed? Oh, about two, near as we can figure at 3.30, Anderson threw this note in at my window. He was beginning to use some of the information he'd gathered while he was up here. Dancer, how do you spell Topeka? None of your business. Uh -huh. This note is a poor attempt at illiteracy. The easy words are spelled wrong and the tough one's right. Like to see it, Lumkey? It was meant just to steer me down to Phil's place to find his body and your fingerprints, Dancer. Someone's framing you, Dancer. Yeah? You say you don't know this, Pedro, Lumkey? 
No. Well, I've got a picture of him right here. This picture was taken about six years ago when... Nick, what is it? Nothing. Except... Except that all this time I've been waiting for someone to make a slip. And someone has made it. Who? We've been wrong. This wasn't a killing for money. It was a murder of hatred. Revenge. Polly. What did Phil go to the pen for? Blackmail. Blackmail. David. When were you supposed to give Robert the money to go away? This morning. In cash? Yes. But when he decided to go last night, you had to give him bond? Yes. Where were you going to get cash on New Year's Day? A bank holiday? Funny, I forgot about that. No, you didn't, David. You never meant to give Robert that money. You didn't want him to go away. You wanted to kill him. You were going to get even with him for taking Selma away from you. Nora, is he fooling? Sure. And you were fooling when you said you hadn't seen Pedro for six years. You said Pedro had long white mustaches. Well, he's got long white mustaches now. But look at this picture. There he is six years ago. His mustache was neither white nor long. You didn't notice him six years ago any more than I did. You remember him as he was last night when you shot him. You killed him, and then you killed Robert. Phil saw you do it. He was going to blackmail you, so you had to kill him, too. And then you threw that note in my window, hoping to put me off your trail. David, David, don't let him say these terrible things. Tell him it isn't true. Ask him why he threw away your gun, Selma. He knew it hadn't been fired. He knew you only had to show it to prove your innocence. Yet he threw it away. Ask him why he did that. David, David, why don't you speak? Wasn't it because you hated her as much as Robert? Wasn't it because you wanted to get even with her, too? Wasn't it because you wanted to see her hang for Robert's murder? David. Tell her the truth now, David. You don't have to pretend anymore. That is the truth. I've hated you, Selma and Robert, ever since you threw me over for him. I've been watching, waiting for the time when I could get even with you for having ruined my life. I did kill Robert, but not the way I wanted to. It was too easy, too quick. I wanted to see him suffer the way he'd made me suffer. And you... And you, I wanted to see you go gradually madder and madder as the day came when you were going to hang. Well, I'm not going to see you hang. But I'm still going to see you die. Put out that gun. Don't be a fool, Dad. Get out of the way. I've got six bullets. One for her and one for myself. And the rest for anyone who tries to stop me. Get out of the way, Charles. Grab him. Go ahead. Get out of my way. I get him. I get him. Okay, Graham. I'll take that gun now. Nice work, Lumkey. Nice work. Nick, he saved you. And you sent his brother up. Oh, sure. Mr. Charles sent him up. Number one detective. I don't like my brother. I like his girl. I'm your friend. Oh, you bet you. Tired, darling? Not very. Well, can you believe it? We're alone. No reporters, no friends, no surprises. I suppose we really should decide where we're going. Oh, do you care? No, but I haven't any clothes. All the better. You won't have to pack. All I need in the world is you and a toothbrush. Hey, what's that you're doing? I'm knitting something. Oh, you haven't gotten very far with it. Mm, yes, I have. There, it's done. Done? Why, it... hey, that looks like... Is that a baby's sock? <laughs> and you call yourself a detective. Why, Mrs. Charles. draw the curtain on After the Thin Man. In a moment, Mr. DeMille returns with our stars. While we're waiting, let's talk about babies. You know, families often speculate on the chances of the stork bringing twins or triplets. Well, uh, here are some figures that may interest you. The chances of having twins is about one in 84. Of having triplets, one in 7,500. That makes triplets a pretty rare occurrence. Mrs. Frances Bardall of Holbrook, Massachusetts, was one of the mothers who drew the lucky number in 1939, and she's doubly lucky now 
because she has new quick lux to help her in caring for her three small babies. She says, The triplets have such sensitive skins, I wouldn't dream of washing their clothes in harsh soaps or rubbing them with cake soap. I just won't take chances on having woolens or diapers getting rough and scratchy. She's a wise mother, isn't she? She goes on to say, New Quick Lux is so mild and gentle. It's the only thing I'd use for the baby's clothes. It's so safe for everything, safe in water alone. I can depend on it never to make woolens harsh and scratchy or fade the pretty colors of little dresses and sunsuits. Yes, New Quick Lux is so wonderfully gentle and so easy to use, too, so fast. In water as cool as your hand, it dissolves three times as fast as any of ten of the leading soaps tested. Ask for the generous big box of New Quick Lux tomorrow. It comes in the same familiar package and costs you no more. Here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. As Bill Powell and Myrna Loy return to the microphone, we offer our congratulations to the thin man on some first-class detective work. Cecil, you're seldom wrong, but I'll have to mark that one up against you. Hmm? However, if it's any consolation... Everybody makes the same mistake. Brace yourself for a shock, Mr. DeMille. Bill is not and never was the thin man. He isn't. He never has been. Mercy Manor, can't we even believe what we see in the movies? Just for the record, the thin man was murdered in the first thin man picture. We haven't seen him since. Except in the title, where he seems amazingly healthy. <laughs> What's in the name? Call the picture by any name you like, so long as you and Bill remain as our favorite detectives. What's going to happen next to Nora and Nick? Well, there's another Thin Man picture planned, but we haven't started making it yet. It's called The Shadow of the Thin Man. Very promising manhunt. Mm -hmm. I have entire confidence in both of you. Uh, by the way, Cecil, didn't I hear you say that you're going to do Showboat next week? You certainly did, Bill, and we are. Who's going to be in your cast, Mr. DeMille? We'll have Irene Dunn, Alan Jones, and Charles Winninger. They were all in the cast of the motion picture... And they'll all be here on this stage to bring us the exciting drama of Showboat and the great song hits by Jerome Kern. We embark at the usual time next Monday night for this cruise of adventure and romance along the Mississippi. And we hope you'll all be on board. Showboat is practically a command to listen. Good night, Cecil. Good night. Good night. Good night. We'll call you two on another case soon. Sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Irene Dunn, Alan Jones, and Charles Winninger in Showboat. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Heard in tonight's play were Julie Bannon as Selma, Fred Mackay as David, Edward Marr as Abrams, Mary Lou Simpson as Polly, Warren Ash as Dancer, Wally Mayer as Lum Key, and Arthur Q. Bryan, Abe Reynolds, Walter White, Inez Seabury, Tristan Coffin, Eric Snowden, Russell Fillmore, Lou Merrill, and Fred Shields. The American Red Cross needs millions of dollars for European war relief work. They're asking for your contribution now, anything you can give. The place to give, your local Red Cross chapter. The time, as soon as you possibly can. William Powell and Myrna Loy appeared tonight through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. They will soon be seen together on the screen in If I, I Love You Again. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick.
The Jack Benny Program, presented by Lucky Strike. It is <laughs> Smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. Smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. Your level best. That's just how you'll feel when you light up a Lucky. Because Lucky's fine tobacco picks you up when you're low, calms you down when you're tense. Put you on the right level to feel and do your level best. It's important to you as a smoker to know that fine tobacco can do this for you. And every smoker knows. L-S-M-F-T. L-S-M-F-T. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Smooth, mild, thoroughly enjoyable tobacco. No wonder more independent tobacco experts, auctioneers, buyers, and warehousemen smoke Lucky Strike regularly than the next two leading brands combined. It's good to know that fine tobacco picks you up when you're low, calms you down when you're tense. By putting you on the right level to feel and do your level best. That's the lucky level. So, smoke a lucky to feel your level best. Smoke a lucky to feel your level best. Get on the lucky level where it's fun to be alive. Get a carton of luckies and get started today. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most popular restaurants in the country is the Brown Derby in Hollywood. So let's go back to yesterday afternoon and look in as the Brown Derby's head waiters handle the overflow luncheon crowd. Oh, Gus, did you see Mr. Gable at his usual place? No, Chilius. Mr. Gable joined Eve Arden and her party. Well, that's good. There's so many people waiting. Well, perhaps we can set up some more tables. Hey, Chilius, look who's coming in. Jack Benny. You take care of him. Uh, no, Gus. It's your turn this time. <laughs> No, no, it's your turn. All right, all right, I'll take care of him. He changed networks, why doesn't he change restaurants? <laughs> oh, Jack, here comes Chilius. Yeah, he'll get us a table. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Benny. Uh, hello, Chilius, I'd like a table. They have some lovely tables at Romanoff's. <laughs> I know. Uh, Romanoff sent us here. Oh. Good afternoon, Miss Livingston. I didn't see you. I'm awfully sorry, Mr. Benny. You'll have to wait. Every table in the place is taken. Well, maybe we... Hey, Mary, look. Hey, look, there's Jimmy Stewart having lunch all by himself. I'll ask him if we can sit at his table. Uh, but, Jack, if he's eating by himself, maybe he prefers to be alone. Oh, don't be silly, Mary. He'll be glad to have company. Come on. Only, uh, let me do the talking. Well... Uh... Hey, Mary! Look who's here! <laughs> hmm? Oh, hello, Jack. Hello, Mary. Well, if it isn't Jimmy Stewart. You know... You know, uh... You know, Jack, uh, Hollywood's a funny place. You say, well, if it isn't Jimmy Stewart and everybody in the Brown Derby applaud. <laughs> Yes. By the way, Jimmy, we're in a hurry and all the tables are taken. Would you mind if we joined you? How can he say no? You're already eating his rolls. <laughs> There's enough for both of us. Sure, sure. Come on, just sit down here. Here, I'll make room for you, Mary. Well, thank you. There we are. Now, Jack, I'll move over to oh, you. Oh, just sit still, Jimmy. You need move for me. I'll squeeze right in here and then we can... <laughs> Whoops! <laughs> oh, I'm... I'm sorry, Jimmy. I knocked over the pitcher and spilled the water. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> With this weather, it froze before it hit the floor. <laughs> that's right. It, it, here, Jimmy, let me hand you my napkin. And... <laughs> I, uh, I knocked over the ketchup bottle. Uh, better, uh, better wipe it off, Jimmy. You look like an ad for blood on the moon. Yeah, I'm sorry, Jimmy. You know, uh, Jack, I've been sitting here eating for 30 minutes. Uh, you've been here 10 seconds, and you've got more on me than I've got in me. Well, I... 
Well, I, I guess it's because we're in such a hurry. May I take your orders, please? Yes, yes. I'll have a club sandwich and a, a cup of coffee. Yes, sir. Yours, Miss Livingston? Oh, gee, I don't know what to have. Uh, what's that you're eating, Jimmy? Oh, it looks delicious. Oh, this is something my mother always used to make for me. It's my favorite dish. What is it? Matzo ball soup. <laughs> Uh, Chili, I'll have a Caesar salad and a pot of tea. Yes, Miss Livingston. Uh, by the way, Jimmy, I saw your latest picture, You Gotta Stay Happy. And you and Joan Fontaine certainly make a wonderful combination. Oh, well, thank you, Mary. Uh, you made that picture for Universal, didn't you, Jimmy? Yes, yes. Before that, I made Rope for Warners, and then I made one over at MGM, 20th Century, and no, one at 20th Century, and then one for Paramount. Keep a steady... What's the matter? Can't you keep a steady job? <laughs> Jack. Jack. It's just that Jimmy prefers to freelance. Oh, oh. Uh, by the way, Jack, uh, what have you been doing lately? <laughs> well, I've, uh, I've been rather busy with radio. Radio? Well, aren't you a little late getting into that with television and everything? <laughs> No, no, Jimmy. I've been in radio for 17 years. But I haven't made a picture since I was at Warner's. And I left there because there was always a big issue, you know, when it came to casting. Well, I can understand that, Jack. You and Errol Flynn are the same type. <laughs> yes. Yes, we are. Uh, Jack had the same trouble with MGM, but they decided to keep Lassie. <laughs> Anyway, Jimmy, I'm not appearing in pictures because I'm producing them now. Oh, I didn't know you were producing pictures, Jack. Oh, yes, yes. Matter of fact, I just finished my first one. It's called uh, The Lucky Stiff, starring Dorothy L'Amour, Brian Dunleavy, and Claire Trevor, soon to be seen at your neighborhood theater. Jack, uh, what are you yelling for? Jimmy, if these people can eat here, they can afford to go and see it, you know. You know, a plug's a plug. And then... Mr. Benny, if you'd like, you can move over to this table here. Chilius, I thought you didn't have any empty tables. We've got a lot of them now. <laughs> well, we'll just, we'll just stay where we are. Yes, sir. Here's your food. We'll get the salad, please. Oh, the salad is mine. Now, let's see. What were we talking about before the food came? The, p the picture you produced, the Lucky Salad. No, no, the Lucky Stiff. Oh, oh. <laughs> Say, you know, Jimmy, I've just been thinking. You're a nice guy, and here you've been having a tough, not working steady at one one studio. So I'm going to do you a big favor and put you in my next picture. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy. Jimmy. Jimmy, what happened? <laughs> Jimmy. Oh, that's the first time I ever saw anyone choke on a matzo ball. I probably surprised him with my offer. <laughs> yes, you certainly did. Uh, but, Jack, uh, uh, the only reason I can't accept it is because I have so many other commitments. Well, Jimmy, we can make it after you've fulfilled your other commitment. But, Jack, after that, I want to take a vacation. No but, Jimmy, my boy, look, at, I'll make a big star out of it. Now, you got to let me make this picture with you. Now, what's the salary you usually get per picture? $200,000. Take the water. The water is on the floor. So are you. Huh? Oh, yes. Yeah. Jack, uh. you better discuss this with Jimmy some other time. It's getting late, and the whole gang will be waiting at the studio for rehearsal. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I'll get the check. Waiter, waiter, our check. Waiter, waiter. Jack, just call him. Don't wave your toupee. <laughs> Jimmy, this isn't a toupee. It's just a small hairpiece. Hairpiece? I'd like to have a fur coat like that. <laughs> I'd like to have you read your line right. <laughs> Jack. What? Suppose I run along and start the rehearsal. Well... Well, see you later, Jack. Goodbye, Jimmy. So long, Mary. Say, Jimmy, have you heard the way people are talking about Mary lately? Talking about Mary? Yes, I hate to see this, uh, say this, really, but 
But have you noticed... <laughs> have you noticed how she always leaves the table just before they bring the check? <laughs> it's embarrassing, you know? I hate to see it, too, you know? But anyway, Jimmy... Getting back to the picture I want you to do for me. Now, I have a story. Excuse me for interrupting, but I happen to have a snapshot of you, Mr. Benny. Would you mind autographing it? Oh, I'd be happy. Say, Jimmy, would you mind lending me your fountain pen? Not at all. Here you are, Jack. Thanks. Now, let's see. With my very best wishes, Jack Benny. Here you are, lady. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was nice meeting you. Oh, wait a minute, lady. This is Jimmy Stewart. Don't you want his autograph? No, but 30 years ago, I would have. <laughs> now, look. Look, Jimmy, I've got to run over to CBS and rehearse my show. Suppose you come along with me, and we'll discuss a deal for a picture. No, uh, no, Jack. I'd rather not. Here's the check, gentlemen. No, oh, thank you, Julia. No, Jimmy, let me take it. After all, it was your table, and Mary and I barged in. So I insist on paying it. No, no, Jack. I'd feel better if I paid for it. Well, if your health is involved, go ahead. <laughs> well, I've, um... I gotta run along and... See, my hands are kind of sticky. Where's my napkin? Oh, here it is. Hmm. I can't pull it up. What's the matter with this napkin? You've got my shirt tail. <laughs> no, no. Well, here, I'm, I'm through with it. Um, <laughs> go on, Jimmy. Goodbye, Jack. Gee, I, I didn't realize it was so late. I hope they started the rehearsal without me. <laughs> Jack. Well, hello, Jack. Hello, Mr. Benny. Hello, kids. Uh, by the way, Jack, did Jimmy Stewart agree to let you produce his next picture? Well, not yet, Mary, but I'm sure he'll come around to talk to me about it. Now, come on, kids. We've got a rehearsal to do, so let's get started. Mr. Benny, I've read over my part three times already. Well, good, Dennis. Nice to know that you're diligent. Diligent? Are we doing a gangster sketch? That's diligent! <laughs> well, don't I get nothing for being close? No. And Phil... Look at Phil. Watch your cue. Now, you come into the sketch on page 21. 21? Yes. That's all your fingers, all your toes, and one more. <laughs> now, Mary, in this sketch, you're going to play the part of Dennis's wife, and you've just gotten married. Uh, Dennis and I are newlyweds? Yes. And you're in Niagara Falls on your honeymoon. Where am I? <laughs> What? I don't know about you, kid, but I'm on page 22. That's 21. I got 11 toes. <laughs> Phil, you miscounter. Try again. Now, Mary, as soon as we try... Jack, what was that? I don't know. Who fired that shot? I did. That reverberation you just heard was the result of a firearm that I discharged to test the acoustical quality of the studio. Acoustical quality? Who are you? I'm Herbert, your sound effects man. Oh, oh. Well, look, Herbert, don't try any more shots. All I want are the sound effects that are written into the script. Well, you can depend on me, Mr. Benny. For years, I have devoted my artistry to dramatic shows, and I have mastered the most difficult sound effects ever heard on radio. Really? Yes. Oh. One in particular baffled every sound effects man in the industry. 
But by perseverance and sheer ingenuity, I managed to reproduce it. I see. It was on the prudential hour. The scene was a moonlit night, and two lovers were dancing out on the patio. Oh, yes, yes, I heard that show. As the soft music filled the balmy summer evening, the two lovers drew closer and closer until his cheek lightly brushed against hers. That was the most delicate sound effect of all. Well, I should imagine it was. How did you get the sound of his cheek delicately brushing against hers? I slapped a hot water bottle with a piece of raw liver. <laughs> Gosh! <laughs> Say, those are the kind of effects we need on our show. Now, Mary, I'll write a scene where you brush my cheek, you know, against your, your cheek against mine. See? But, Jack, liver's 90 cents a pound. <laughs> well, just kick me in the pants. That's cheap. <laughs> Now, Don, let's take the rehearsal from that scene where we're in the house and there's a knock on the door. Okay, Jack. Herbert, uh, give us a knock on the door. No, no, Herbert, a little louder. Herbert, that still isn't loud enough. Uh, why is the knock so soft? I use Jergens. <laughs> oh. Well, then maybe we ought to have a doorbell instead of a knock... There, that's more like it. Well, I didn't do that. What? Jack, there's really someone at the door. Huh? Oh, Don, you're near the door. Open it, me. Say, Jack, it's Jimmy Stewart. You see, Mary, what did I tell you? Came after me already. Come on in, Jimmy. Thanks. Uh, what can I do for you? Well, Jack, I hate to break in on your rehearsal like this, but there's something I want to talk to you about. Oh, Jimmy, it's quite all right. We have plenty of time. Not me. I got to go to Niagara Falls and meet Mary. <laughs> Dennis, be quiet. Now, Jimmy, what is it you wanted to talk to me about? It's about the picture. You see, Mary? Now, Jimmy, we can start production on the picture just as soon as I mean we... the picture you autographed at the Derby. <laughs> you kept my fountain pen. <laughs> oh, oh. I wouldn't have bothered, but it's a lifetime pen, and I'm young yet. <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, here's your pen, Jimmy. Thanks. Now, Jimmy, let's get back to business. I know you made a swell picture call. You got to stay happy. But I can do so much for you that... Jack, why don't you leave him alone? Can't you see that Jimmy's not interested? But, Mary, I can help him. He doesn't need help. He's already won an Academy Award. An Academy Award, Jimmy? For what picture? Philadelphia story. Who cares about Philadelphia? I'm going to Niagara Falls. <laughs> <laughs> now, be quiet. You know, uh, Mary, you know, uh, you're just about the only sensible one around here. <laughs> and you know something else? I, I think you're very pretty, too. Oh, Jimmy, do you, do you really mean it? Yeah, sure. Of course I do. Come over here, Mary. You know, you have, you have such beautiful eyes and such a lovely complexion. Oh, Jimmy. Maybe sometime I could take you out dancing in the moonlight. Just the two of us, maybe? And out on the patio? He's getting close to her, Herbert. Get ready with the liver! <laughs> Mr. Day! <laughs> Dramatic actors get bigger laughs than comedians. Now look, Jimmy. Jimmy, let's settle, let's settle that picture deal we've been talking about. Well, Jack, I, I, uh, you're supposed to be I, mad here. Oh, I, uh, Jack, I just can't make a picture with you this year. Okay. Got to award. He can't read. Jack, I just can't make a picture with you just... 
You'll have to excuse me. Yeah? I'm going over to dressing room G. I have to look over a dramatic script. Oh, well, that's right next door, Jimmy. I'll show you where it is. Kid, I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> So, Jimmy, as I pointed out to you, it'll be to your advantage to make this picture for me. Jack, now, you've been talking to me for an hour and a half since we came into the dressing room here. Now, will you please just let me lie here and relax? How about it, will you? Okay, okay, Jimmy. See you later. Yeah, da dee da dum da dee da dum da dee da dee da dum He'll be back, da dee da dum Oh, Don... Don, bring the quartet in now. We'll go over the commercial. Well, Jack, we're going to have a little difficulty with the sportsmen this week. They're having trouble with their wives, and they're all upset. What? Yes, yes, Jack. It's terrible. Their wives want to leave them. All four of them? (laughs) Don, I've never seen a quartet like that. When one has a cold, they all have cold. When one has a headache, they all have headaches. Don, I don't care if they're having trouble with their wives or not. We've got to have a commercial. Now, where are they? Well, they're in the dressing room talking to the wives on the phone. Oh, my goodness. Come on, Don. We'll go in and talk to them right now. And I can't imagine four fellas having the same trouble at the same time. Well, here's their dressing room. Let's go in. Look, Jack, they're still on the phone pleading with their wives. Yeah. Say it isn't so. Say it isn't so. Everyone is saying you don't love us. Say it isn't so. Gee, that's awful. I'm sorry. Everywhere we go. Boys, boys. Everyone we know. Fellas, fellas, look. Whispers that you're really going to leave us. Say it isn't so. Boys, I'm sorry for you, but I need a commercial. Please don't go away. Fellas, really, I need a commercial. Promise you will stay. Boys, look, a commercial. We will fill the house with lucky strikes. You'll get them every day. Thank you. The lucky strike is better than the rest. you feel your level there. Don't leave us, darling. Say it isn't so. I know you're upset, but look at, don't cry. Look at, I'll talk to your wife. I'm sure everything will be all right. Tell us, look at, right now I need a commercial. Tell us, it'll be all right. Look at, I need a commercial. LSMFT means fine tobacco, fine as you can grow. That's why we're happy. Don, take them home. Maybe they'll feel better tomorrow. I'll see you later, Don. Yeah, I hate to see those fellows so upset. I hope they settle things with their wives. But then that's their worry, not mine. Oh, Jack. Huh? Oh, hello, Jimmy. Jack, uh, I came out here to talk to you. Yes, yes, about the picture. No, not about the picture. Then what is it, Jimmy? Jack, I realize now that when you took my fountain pen and the brown derby, you wanted me to follow you around. What? So, uh, when you took me into the dressing room and told me to lie down and relax and put my feet up on the chair, I should have known you were up to something. Huh? Jack, uh, give me back my shoes. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, your shoes. Here you are, Jimmy. Now, thank you for my socks, too. <laughs> Oh, yeah, your socks. Now, Jimmy, as long as you've got a few minutes while you're putting on your shoes and socks, let's talk about the picture. Now, if you will just... Now, no more talk, Jack. I told you I have too many commitments, and that settles it. Okay, Jimmy, but if you just change your mind, come around and see me. Well, I won't change my mind. Say it isn't so. Little does he know. (laughs) La, 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 la. Now, come on, kids. Let's finish the rehearsal and make it snappy. Rochester's waiting for me out in the parking lot with my car. Well, Mr. Benny will be out in about a half hour. I better start warming up the motor. (laughs) 
There must be something wrong with the battery again. I better take a look. Now, let's see. There's the battery, and it has the positive and the negative. Then there are the sparks. The sparks are supposed to go from the electrons to the electrodes. Or maybe they go from the generator to the distributor. Or then again, maybe they go from NBC to CBS. <laughs> yeah, I think this loose wire here is the trouble, so I'll just fasten it and... Hello, Rochester. Huh? Oh, hello, Mr. Stewart. Say, has Mr. Bennett come out of the studio yet? No, but he should be any minute. Uh, by the way, Mr. Stewart, I was over to your house the day before Christmas. Mr. Bennett had me drop off a package for you. Did you get it? Yes, but this time there was too much starch in the collars. <laughs> well, don't look at me. I'm rough dry. Mr. Bennett's the starch man. <laughs> You know, Rochester, your boss amazes me. How long has he been in the laundry business? Oh, a long, long time. Say, Mr. Stewart, you were born May 8th, 1911, weren't you? Yes, that's right. How'd you know? You used to take our diaper service. I did? <laughs> yeah. It broke Mr. Benny's heart the way you and Gary Cooper grew up so fast. <laughs> but, uh... Uh, Rochester, I still can't understand a man of Mr. Benny's position having a laundry service in his home. Oh, the laundry's just a sideline. A sideline? Uh-huh. Mr. Benny does more business in his living room than Eastern Columbia, Broadway at night. <laughs> yeah. On Dollar Day, you can't get near the joint. All right, Rochester. Are we ready to go? Yes, boss. All set. Good. Now, first, I want you to drive me to... Uh, Jack. I'd like to see you for a second. Oh, hello, Jimmy. So you finally changed your mind and you want to appear in my picture? No, 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 it's not that. Mm -hmm. There's uh, something I'd like to ask you. What is it? Now, look, uh, Jack, I, you've been using little tricks so I'd follow you around all day, hmm? Well, yes, I must admit I did. You're, you're not angry, are you, Jimmy? Oh, no, no, no. But tell me one thing. What is it, Jimmy? I, I, I know how you got my fountain pen. Uh-huh. I can even figure out how you got my shoes and my socks. Yeah. But how in the name of heaven did you get the filling out of my tooth? <laughs> I'll tell you when we finish the picture. Come on, Rochester, drive the home. Jack, we'll be back in just a moment, but first... Smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. Smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. You see, Lucky's fine tobacco picks you up when you're low, calms you down when you're tense, puts you on the right level to feel and do your level best. It's good to know that fine tobacco can do this for you, and that's why it's so important that you select and smoke the cigarette of fine tobacco Lucky Strike. For as every smoker knows, L-S-M-F-T, L-S-M-F-T, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. The experts, men who know tobacco, look to Lucky Strike for their own personal smoking enjoyment. Yes, more independent auctioneers, buyers, and warehousemen smoke Luckies regularly than the next two leading brands combined. So next time you buy cigarettes, ask for Lucky Strike and get on the lucky level where there's real joy in living, where it's fun to be alive. The lucky level where you feel and do your level best. Smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. Smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. Get on the Lucky level, where it's fun to be alive. Get a carton of Luckies and get started today. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank Jimmy Stewart for following me around on my program today. And next Sunday, listen in to CBS lineup. The Prudential Hour, Spike Jones. Jack. Just a minute, Jimmy. And after Spike Jones comes Jack Benny, that's me, and my guest will be Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. Jack. Jimmy, just a minute. Dinner's name is Nandy. Sam Spade. Jack, I've got to talk to you. And there's life with Luigi, our Miss Brooks, and Helen Hayes. Jack. What is it, Jimmy? I want to go home. Give me my pants. <laughs> there you are. Good night, folks. And don't forget the new Lucky Strike program, your Lucky Strike starring Don Amici, heard every weekday afternoon over most of these stations. CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Hollywood, California, Monday, June 14th. The Lux Radio Theater presents Anne Harding and James Stewart in Madame X. Lux presents Hollywood. Madame X comes to you through courtesy of the makers of Lux Flakes, the most popular fine fabric soap in the world. It is your regular use of Lux that makes the Lux Radio Theater possible. And we want you to know that we appreciate your patronage. Our stars tonight are Anne Harding, James Stewart of Metro-Golden-Mayer Studios, and Conway Turl. Our guests, the former first lady of the tennis courts, Mrs. Helen Wills Moody, and from New York, a Madam X and her son from real life. Produced each week by Cecil B. DeMille with Louis Silvers conducting, this program comes to you direct from the Lux Radio Theater on Hollywood Boulevard, where we bid a hearty welcome to you all. Before we hear Anne Harding, James Stewart, and Conway Turl in Madame X, may I remind you that summer is practically here with its cool, comfortable cottons, its wash suits and dresses and sport things. These clothes can look so fresh, so crisp and immaculate that it makes you cooler just to see them. And I don't have to tell you how comfortable they feel. There's no reason why your summer things should ever lose their cool, crisp, new look. Lux is especially made to protect them. These delicate flakes are free from the harmful alkali too often found in many ordinary soaps. Any color, any material that's safe in clear water alone is safe in gentle Lux. Make a note to order Lux tomorrow. You'll find the large size box most convenient. And now, the Lux Radio Theater presents its eminent producer, that outstanding pioneer of motion pictures, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Anne Harding became an actress because she wanted to write. Employed by an insurance company in New York, she spent her spare time reading novels and plays for famous players Lasky, of which I was director general, helping our studio in its search for picture ideas. When she decided to study stage technique, she visited the Provincetown players. They offered her the lead in their next production. Following came five offers from Broadway along with an ultimatum from her father, the late General George Gatley, commanding her to give up the stage or her home. Anne chose the stage. And eight years passed before the general admitted that an actress in the family, especially an actress like Anne, was no discredit to the Gatleys. Several months ago, Anne went abroad, made a picture in England, and triumphed on the stage in Canada. She returned last month to Hollywood with her husband, the distinguished conductor, Werner Jansen. Tonight in Madame X... She plays the title role. With the same speed that he displayed on the track while attending Princeton University, lanky James Stewart has vaulted into picture popularity. At Princeton, he studied architecture when he could tear himself away from playing the accordion. One summer, he worked as an assistant to a magician, but there is no truth to the rumor that he became a lady killer by sawing a woman in half. From college, he went into summer stock, was stage manager for Jane Cowell, and soon after was acting on Broadway. Metro Goldwyn Mayer brought Jimmy to Hollywood, and he's heard tonight as Raymond. In the role of Alan Cartwright, we present Conway Turl, an outstanding personality on the stage and screen for more than 20 years. Out of the limelight for a while, Mr. Turl made a remarkable comeback on the stage in Dinner at Eight, and is currently seen in Romeo and Juliet. Now for our play. Our stars make their entrance as the curtain rises. And the Lux Radio Theater presents Anne Harding and James Stewart in Madame X with Conway Turl. <laughs> the year is 1918. It's late at night. And in the richly furnished library of his home in New York City, Alan Cartwright paces the floor anxiously, waiting for news of his four-year-old son, who tosses feverishly on a sickbed upstairs. As the door to the library opens, Cartwright crushes out a cigarette with nervous fingers and turns quickly to greet the doctor. How is he? Is there any change? 
He's much better, Alan. You mean that he'll, he'll live? The crisis is over. His temperature has started to drop already. Oh, thank God. He'll be romping all over the house in a few days. Youngsters come back fast. All he needs is rest and quiet. If anything happened to Raymond, he's all I have left. Nothing's going to happen to him. Now pull yourself together, Alan. I've left a prescription with the nurse. And something for you, too. For me? <laughs> I don't need anything. I'm as fit as a fiddle. Your nerves are raw, Alan. You've been working too hard. And now, with this, you need a rest yourself, man. A rest? How can I rest? I have a law practice to attend to. Your law practice doesn't demand that you kill yourself, does it? Take things easy. You've done nothing but work all your life. It's the only thing you know. It's the only thing worth knowing. And one thing more, Alan. I don't like to mention this, but I'm your physician and your friend. Well? Jacqueline has been gone for two years now. She's not coming back. You've got to begin to accept that fact. You think that's what's got me down? Well, I... But it hasn't. I've no intention of ever allowing her to come back. She's been calling here all day. Jacqueline? She heard Raymond was sick. Wanted to see him. You're going to let her, of course. No. But Alan, she's his mother. She left him and she left me. Life wasn't gay enough for her here. Well, very well then. But I make her own life. Make it or wreck it. She's young, Alan. Much younger than you. Has it ever occurred to you that uh, perhaps you were to blame, too? For what? You were so absorbed in your work. You had so little time for her. It wasn't gaiety Jacqueline wanted. It was companionship, love. She... She left Raymond, her own baby. There's nothing more to be said about it. Sorry, Alan. When are you coming to see Raymond again? I'll drop in later on my way from the hospital. Good night, old man. Good night. Just a moment, please. Oh, good evening, ma'am. Good evening, Bessie. Is Mr. Cartwright in? Why, yes, ma'am. Uh, that is, I'm not sure, ma'am. How is Raymond? I'm sorry, Mrs. Cartwright, but, but Mr. Cartwright said that... Did he leave orders that I was not to be admitted, Bessie? Is that the trouble? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Is that the doctor back again, Bessie? Let him in. Don't give him... Uh... Oh. Good evening, Alan. You may go, Bessie. Close the door. Yes, sir. Well? I've come to see Raymond. How is he, Alan? I told you not to come here. Oh, please. How is Raymond? Is he any better? The danger is over. Oh. Oh, may I see him, please? No. All I want to do is open the door and look at him. He mustn't be disturbed. I won't disturb him. I'm sorry. But I'm his mother, Alan. I have a right to see him. You forfeited that right when you left him two years ago. I'm sorry, Jacqueline. I didn't leave him, Alan. I left you. I had to. It was a mistake, I admit it, a great mistake, but I only meant it to be for a little while, just, just time enough to think things over. Why didn't you answer my letters, Alan? I sent you money. Why didn't you answer my letters? I was busy. You were always busy, weren't you, Alan? That was always the trouble. I reached out for you again and again. I could never find you. You knew what you wanted, Jacqueline. Now, now you've got it. You left Raymond and you left me. And there's no returning. It's too late for that. You want a divorce, Alan? No. No? But you... Oh, I see. It isn't a good thing for a man to be divorced if he wants to be a judge. You'd sacrifice your whole life for that and mine too, wouldn't you? It's my career, not yours. I'm sorry, but you'll have to leave now. I've come here to beg your forgiveness, to ask you for one glimpse of my own baby. And... Too much excitement. I and, won't and... excite Raymond. I love him. But you won't let me near him. Clients, courts, the judge's robes. That's what your life is and all it will ever be. You don't know what love means. Get out. Opinions, decisions. Human beings aren't bound in leather and filed with your law books. They live. They make mistakes. 
We forgive and love and keep on living. Oh, please, Alan, let me see him. Let me see my baby. No, Jacqueline. You say I'm hard. Well, perhaps I am. But it's for his good, too. I don't uh, trust you. You've made me too unhappy. You've ruined my life. You're not going to have a chance to ruin his. I should hate you for this, Alan, but I can't. I can't feel anything at all for you, except pity. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know what it means. But someday you will. And you'll never forgive yourself, Alan. Never. There. Now light the candles on the cake, Betty. (laughs) Hurry up. We'll surprise him. Ten candles. Ten years old today. It seems only yesterday he was a baby, Mr. Potter. Letter from Raymond, Allen? Yes, and listen to this. When my sophomore year's over, I'm planning to switch to pre-law. <laughs> pre-law, Perry, well, what do you think of that? It is my privilege this day to award them their diplomas. May they practice their profession in uprightness and in honor. Will the men step forward, please? Albert Ainsworth, John Butler, Howard Bridges, Raymond Cartwright, James Carvel, Gerald Franz. Albert Ainsworth, John Butler, Howard Bridges, Raymond Cartwright. There you are, Dad. My name in the newspaper. <laughs> I see it, son. Uh, you can just about see it, yes. Yeah. Pretty small print, isn't it? Well, it'll be larger someday. Well, not as large as yours, I'll bet. But did you see that story on the record this morning? Alan Cartwright sworn into the state Supreme Court. I got a real kick out of that. Yeah, so did I. You've been working for it long enough. All my life, son. Now it's here. Hey, you must feel pretty good. Yes. Huh? Yes, I-, I suppose I do. Well... I don't see you throwing any hats into the air or anything. You know, if I ever just get one case, I'll be a success, you know. Well, success isn't everything, son. You'll find that out as you get older. There's more to life. Oh, much more. And such as what? Well, a home, friendship, family, a clear conscience. Do you have those, Dad? Mm, I have. Most of them. You've been my family, Raymond. <laughs> I guess I haven't been much help, I... Might have been different if Mother had lived, but... What was she like, Dad? You thought we were never to mention your mother's name. Oh, I, I know. I promise, but... Why not? It was such a long time ago, and... Everyone likes to know something about his mother. What she looked like, where she came from, what she did and said. You've never even told me her name. She, uh... She died... When you were four. You were ill at the time. Where is she buried? What? Where is mother buried? Oh, oh, a long way from here, Raymond. I'll take you there someday. What was her name, Dad? Jacqueline. Jacqueline. A beautiful name. She must have been beautiful. <laughs> Albert Ainsworth, John Butler, Howard Bridges, Raymond Cartwright. Raymond Cartwright. Who is it? Come on, open up. Just a minute. Oh, come in, Tony. Hey, you're getting kind of exclusive, ain't you, Jackie? Locking your door now, huh? I have a right to privacy in my own dressing room. Sure, but not when the customers are waiting for a number. Come on. I'll be ready in a minute. What have you been doing? Reading the newspapers. Why? New York papers, huh? What do you read them for all the time? The news is three days late. That's my business, isn't it? Sure. And maybe the San Francisco sheets don't carry the stuff you're interested in, huh? What are you talking about? Ah, Now, don't give me that, Jackie. I know you too well. Who is this guy Cartwright? If you'll get out of here, I'll get ready for my number. Come on, come on. Who is he? Why have you got a whole drawful of clippings on him? 
How do you know that? <laughs> Don't be foolish. I looked. You're frank enough. Why not? Alan Cartwright, a prominent attorney, and son Raymond, vacation at Palm Beach. Alan Cartwright appointed to Supreme Court. Who is he, Jackie? Come on, loosen up. Now, what are you trying to do, shake him down? Get out. A Supreme Court judge, huh? He's a hot number if he got something on him. Did you hear what I said? Get out of here. <coughs> Get out. Uh, there, you see? You get yourself all worked up. You'll be pulling one of those feints of yours in a minute. You want a drink? No. Oh, well, I was just thinking. If you have got something on this bird, you ought to count me in. You know, for old times' sake. Oh, I may be pretty low right now. I may have stepped down pretty far to be working in a place like this and for a man like you. But I haven't reached your level yet. Now get out. All right. That's the way you feel about it. See you outside, Jackie. Hey, Nick. Nick. Come here. What do you want, boss? Run out and send a wire for me to Joe Harper in New York. Tell him I want some dope on a guy by the name of Alan Cartwright, Supreme Court judge. Okay. And look, yeah. <laughs> I want to know especially about his wife, see? Who she was and where she is now. Tell him to get everything he can. I'll meet him in New York a week from Saturday. Okay. Get the stuff you left here. Oh, it's swell. Just what I wanted. And no, no, I can't see you now, Joe. Come around to the hotel tomorrow. So long. Who is it? Hello, Tony. Well, if it isn't Jackie. How are you, Jackie? All right. I didn't expect to see you here. Well, they told me you'd gone to New York. So I followed you. Yeah? What for? Just to make sure you didn't try anything that might get you into trouble. Thanks, but I don't need any advice from you, see? I got everything I need, Jackie, and it's a swell story. Is it? You see, I know who you are and who your husband is and your son, too. And what are you planning to do with that information? I'm going to do with it what you didn't have the nerve to do. I'm going to use it. To blackmail him. Oh, no. I'm just going to tell him where his wife is and what she is. Oh, no, you're not. Oh, huh? and who's going to stop me? I am. You're not going to ruin my son's career, Tony. I'm not the type to stand by and see you wreck his life. Yeah? Well, what do you think you're going to do about it? It's very simple. Huh? Put that gun down. You don't scare me. I'm not trying to scare you. You know where you land, don't you? That doesn't worry me. I can't last much longer anyway, so I've got nothing to lose. You have. Sure. Sure, about 10,000 bucks if I let you bluff me out of it, but you can't, see? Because I'm going to see him right now, tonight. I'm not bluffing, I mean it. Stay away from my husband. Get out of my way. I'm warning you, stay away from my husband. I'll show you what I think of you and your warnings. Don't open that door. Well, why don't you shoot? Stay away from that door, I tell you. <laughs> so long, bluffer. What's the matter? In there, take that room. What's going on up here? Ah, she's killed him. Grab that woman. I'll get the police. Come here, you. Take your hands off me. I did it. I'm not trying to escape. I killed him. Before going on with Madame X, let's stop a minute in a bright and shining little kitchen near Glendale. Brother Bob is staying overnight with Walter and Sally. Walter has just gone out to put the car up. Sally is about to do the dishes while Bob leans against the cupboard near the door. Oh, Lux Flakes. So you use Lux for dishes, too. Indeed I do. No dishpan hands for me. Yeah, that's what Kay says, too. And she ought to know. Remember how she complained last winter about dishwashing making her hands sore? You bet I do. Just about the time you came on here for a visit. Honestly, I didn't believe a girl's hands could look so rough and red. All split around the nails, too. And all because she was using a harsh soap for dishes. Trying to save money, she said. Well, I got her to change to luck. Honestly, it was almost unbelievable how much better her hands looked in just the short time I was there. She says she finds luck isn't at all expensive. She sure is proud of her hands now. But I didn't know she had you to thank for it. Not me. 
It's the makers of Lux she should thank. Lux hasn't any harmful alkali, you know. It gets the dishes clean in no time at all. Look, I'm practically through already, thanks to... To me, as inspiration. But most of all, to Lux. Once again, Mr. DeMille. Anne Harding, James Stewart, and Conway Turl continue in Madame X. Arrested for the murder of Tony Phillips, Jacqueline is taken to police headquarters. In an office of the Homicide Bureau, she sits in the glare of a blinding electric lamp. Two detectives are cross-questioning her. Captain Keene leans close and wraps his hand sharply on the table. Come on, come on, come on. You admit that you killed a man by the name of Tony Phillips? You admit you went to the Hotel Trent for the purpose of shooting him dead? Now, who was he? What was he to you? He was nothing to me. And why did you kill him? I won't tell you. You must have had a reason. What was it? I won't tell you. All right, sister. But you're making it a lot tougher for yourself. You know that, don't you? You know what'll happen to you, don't you? Yes. Yes, I know what will happen to me. And why don't you come clean? Come on, give us the dope. We're only trying to help you. I have nothing to say. You're waiting for your lawyer, is that it? I have no lawyer. But you're going to have one. No. Uh, it's no use, Chief. Let her send her back till we get a chance to work on this thing. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Murphy. I'm going to give you one more chance, sister. I won't ask you who the man was. I won't ask you why you shot him. All I want to know is one thing. Who are you? What's your name? Where do you come from? Come on, come on. What's your name? You can tell us that, can't you? What's your name? Who are you? Who are you? All right, Murphy. Send her back. Lynn. Yes, sir? Take her back to her cell. This way, sister. Well, that was a nice waste of time. I don't see what you're so worried about, Chief. It's an open and shut case. She walked into a hotel room and drilled a guy. She admits it, even. Yeah, yeah, sure she admits it. But how do you know what she'll admit when she gets on the stand? That's what counts, Murphy. What she says in front of 12 good men and true. You say the same thing. She didn't even want a lawyer. Well, the court will take care of that for her. Yeah. They'll appoint someone to represent her. Some kid, probably, who can't even find his way to the witness chair. Uh, she sure is a sucker for not talking. In the interest of justice, it is the duty of this court to see that the accused is ably represented by counsel. To that end, and to assure the accused of a just trial in accordance with the laws of this state, the court hereby appoints as counsel for the defendant, Raymond Cartwright. Hello, Dad. Well, come in, Raymond. Well, I've got it. The what? My first big case. Look me over. <laughs> Good boy. The first one's always the hardest, you know. Yeah, don't I know it. Of course, there's not much glory attached to this one. It's uh, one of those assignments. Oh, well, well, it's a start, Raymond. Well, that's the way I look at it. Criminal case, I suppose. Yeah, she's charged with murder. Oh, a woman, eh? Mm-hmm. Any evidence? Well, that's the whole trouble, you know. It's all evidence. She admits everything. She won't talk about it. Won't even give her name. Oh, yes. I think I read something about it in the papers this morning. What is it the reporters are calling her? Yeah, trust them to give it a name. They're calling her Madam X. That's it, yes. Well, they've handed you a nice one for your first case. How are you handling it? Well, I haven't decided that yet. Well, you have to get her to talk. Any luck so far? No, I haven't even seen her. She wasn't in the court when I got the assignment. I, I'm i seeing her at the tombs at 4 o'clock. I, you know... I don't know what I can do for her if she won't give me anything to go on. And, well, if she admits everything now, it's, it's, it's sort of hopeless, I guess. Well, you can't tell. You can admit the murder and still get an acquittal, you know. Temporary insanity. Self-defense. Extenuating circumstances. Oh, it's been done before. Yeah, I know, but isn't that sort of drawing a little fire? Oh, not a bit. You see, justice is a funny thing. There's a district attorney on one side, a counsel for the defense on the other. Your job is to present your client's case in its most favorable light. Just as it's the DA's job to convict her, if possible. If you can dig up any facts that might conceivably influence a jury to vote to not guilty, it's your right and your duty to use those facts. A human life depends on it. Depends on you. Yes, I know. It's a big responsibility, isn't it? Yes. 
Anything I could do to help? Oh, no, no, thanks. I'd rather have a look at myself. I mean, <laughs> oh, of course, I mean, we'll go to it. And the best of luck. Thanks, Dad. You're a better man than the whole homicide squad. How long has she been in here? Ten days. She ought to come to trial pretty soon. No use in delaying on these open and shut cases. Have you questioned her since you brought her in? Every day. She won't talk. She won't even eat. She just sits there and stares at you. It's enough to give a man the creep. You still won't give her name, huh? No. She says her name is Williams. Laura Williams. She admits it's a phony. It's only for the records. Here we are. You've got a visitor, sister. Go ahead, son. Thanks. I, I'd like to see her alone, of course. Sure. I'll be at the end of the car then. Just yell when you want me. How do you do? What do you want with me? If you've been sent here to question me, you're wasting your time. I've nothing to say. I've told him that. Oh, no. I'm, I'm not an officer. I'm your attorney. I told him I didn't want an attorney. No, but you... You ha- have to have someone to plead your case. You see, that's the law. I-, I was appointed by the judge. Well? Well, if I'm to represent you, I've got to know something about you. Who you are, where you came from. Now, you'll tell me that, won't you? My name is Laura Williams. Oh, but that's not your real name. They asked me my name for the records. I told them my name was Laura Williams. That's all I have to say. But I... That's all I have to say. Well... You're not being very fair. You're not being fair to yourself or to me either. You? Yes, I... You see, this is my first case. Oh. That doesn't sound very encouraging, does it? But I I think I can help you. That is, if you're just giving me the chance. Now, I did want to make a showing on this. So if you don't want to do it for yourself, perhaps you'd be willing to help me. You're very young, aren't you? Oh, I'm 24. 24. I had a son. He'd be 24 now, too. And he's just... Then he's alive. I didn't say that. I'm sorry. I know it hurts to be reminded when you've lost someone near to you. Have you ever lost anyone? Yes, I... My mother. How? Well, she died some time ago. Oh, But we were speaking of your son. Now, he's still alive. I'd rather not talk about it. Has he anything to do with the man that was shot? No. Oh, let me alone. Please, just let me alone. But I've got to defend you. I don't want to be defended. I killed that man. I walked into his room at the Hotel Trent and I shot him. Is there anything more to be said? I'm perfectly willing to pay for what I did. But don't you see? There may be no reason why you should pay. That's all I'm trying to find out. Just what the motive was. You see, you you might have had a good reason to kill him. I did. Well, did he threaten you in any way? No. It wasn't self-defense then? No. Did he threaten anyone near to you? No. Your son, perhaps? No. Why do you keep bringing up my son? Well, it's the only thing I know about you. That you have or had a son. I'm just groping in the dark, that's all. Trying to help you. You can't blame me for that. It's just my job. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, too, that that this had to be your first case. But you mustn't take it too much to heart. Everything's against you. Nobody expects you to win. Hello, Hotel Trent. What name, please? Just a moment, please. Hello, room service? Hold on a minute. Hello, Hotel Trent. Yes, ma'am. What name, please? Oh, one moment, please. Excuse me. What do you want? Uh, the manager said I could speak to you for a minute. Yeah? Take my calls, will you, Francis? Okay. Well? Uh, my name is Raymond Cartwright. Are you the girl that was on the switchboard the night the man was shot in 518? Yeah, why? Now, I want you to think hard, try to remember. Did he receive any calls that night? Yeah, he got a call about 8 o'clock. You're sure? Sure, it was a man called. I remember because it was just a couple of minutes before the fellow was shot. You didn't tell the police? Well, I didn't think it was important, was it? Oh, that's all right, that's all right. Now, look. When that man called, 
Did he mention his name? Now, come on. Think hard now. Come on. Yeah. He said his name was... Uh, um, wait a minute now. Uh, Harper. Harper, that's what it was. Joe Harper. You're sure of that? Yeah, we always ask what name. And I remember because my boyfriend's name mm-hmm. is Harper. All right, and I thought all right. He... That's fine. Thanks. Huh. Uh, you keep this quiet, will you? Oh, oh sure. <laughs> Hello? Yes? Well, what'd you find? Well, now, keep looking, will you? Try the city directory. Try anything you can think of. Now, we've got to locate this Joe Harper before we go on trial. All right, all right, thanks. Oh. Good luck, son. No, nothing yet. If I could just get this man Harper, I might learn something. I've got two men working on it right now. Well, what about the woman? Have you asked her? Well, she doesn't know him. If she does, she's not saying... I, I can't get her to talk about this case. She's just not interested. They brought her the notice of the trial. She didn't even read it. You know, she doesn't even know my name, and I'm defending <laughs> When do you go to trial? Uh, Thursday morning. Doesn't leave you much time, does it? I tried a postponement, couldn't get it. You know, Dad, it, it's funny. I this, this thing's got me. Well, that's natural. Your first criminal case? No, no, that's not the reason. I, there's just something about that woman... Something I can't explain. You think she's innocent? No. No, but I, I have a feeling somehow that, that what she did, she had a good reason for doing. She, she was protecting someone. I, I'm sure of it. Well, silence seems a pretty good indication of that. I'd use that point in the summing up, if I were you. Oh, I'm going to. I'm going to. I don't know what good it'll do, but the only thing I've got to go on so far. She's uh, never given you... Anything else? No, except that first day about her son. She talks to me now, though. What about? Oh, not everything except herself. She sort of rambles on as if I weren't there. But every once in a while, I catch a glimpse of something in her life. Something dark and sordid, something that's been gnawing at her for years. And she's been through hell, that woman. It's in her eyes. But then... And there's something beautiful there, too. Something I've got to save if I can. I think you will, son. If you feel like that, I don't think there's anything that can stop you. I'm going to see her once more, just before the trial. I'm, uh, I'm going to ask her if she'll go on the stand. You think there's a chance? Well, I don't know. I can only try. I think I'll be there to watch you, son. You know, I've got a feeling that I'm going to be very proud of you. Whether you win or lose makes no difference. Remember that, my boy. All right. They'll be ready for us in just a few minutes, sir. We're just waiting for the judge. You feel all right? I'm all right. I just wish it were over, that's all. Now, before we go out there, I'm going to ask one favor of you. Now, please don't refuse me. What is it? Well, I want you to take the stand. Testify for yourself. No, I can't do that. Now, you won't have to tell them anything. I just I just want that jury to hear you speak. I'm sorry. I don't like to refuse you, but I can't do that. Well, I'm sorry, too. I've tried to help you. I... Now, don't feel badly about it. There's, there's nothing more you can do for me. I appreciate what you've already done. You've been very kind. You know, you've never even asked my name. Names? They don't matter very much. It's what you are that counts. And you've been kind. Thank you. You don't know what it's meant to have someone to talk to, someone who understands things as you do. I'd have gone mad just waiting there. Tell me, haven't you any friends at all? Oh, I did have one. I think I had everything that a woman could ask for. But I made one mistake. And I threw it all away. And it's so easy to keep on making mistakes once you've started. There's no turning back then. You just go on, step by step. Always a little lower. Till at last there's nothing left but memories. Bitterness. An ache in your heart for what you might have been. They say time heals everything. I don't believe that. I've never been able to forget. I've never wanted to. That's why I'm glad it's over now. 
I'll find peace where I'm going. Peace and rest. And I need them so. Come in, please. Almost ready. All right, thank you. I'll be right outside here when you want me, Mr. Cartwright. Cartwright! Is... Is that your name? Oh, yes, I'm Raymond Cartwright. Oh, God! What is it? Well, why do you stare at me like that? You... You're going to defend me? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Now, that... And that's why I want you to go on the stand, just to tell them. You don't know what you're saying. You don't know what it means. What's the matter? Here, give me your hand. Now, get a hold of yourself, please. All right. I'll be all right now. We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. KMX Los Angeles, the voice of Hollywood. Anne Harding, James Stewart, and Conway Turl return shortly in Madame X. Tonight's play concerns one type of court. Now we hear from a young woman who's made history on another kind. Seven times Wimbledon tennis champion, seven times United States champion, and four times champion of France. An An unequaled record. Helen Wills Moody, as one of the greatest of all women athletes. I introduce her tonight with the hope that she'll settle a question in the mind of everyone who follows this sport of king and commoner. Mrs. Moody, have you given up tournament tennis for good, or is there a chance you'll return? I should like to go on one more tour which would include Wimbledon and Forest Hills. It's difficult, however, to leave home for such a long time as is required for the summer tournaments. But there's something irresistible about tennis and I find myself playing regularly at home in San Francisco four or five times a week. In a few days, the matches will begin at Wimbledon. That must be rather a hard call for you to resist. Indeed it is, but after all, it isn't Wimbledon or championships that make tennis such a grand game. It's the finest sport in the world because it's everybody's game, a sport for all ages. When I was in Stockholm, I played with King Gustav of Sweden, who's still on the courts in his late 70s. Here in Hollywood, you'll find many of the stars playing remarkably well, not only for exercise, but because they know tennis develops poise. Among them are stars like Errol Flynn, Clark Gable, Gilbert Rowland, Warner Baxter, Greta Garbo, Ronald Coleman, and Merle Oberon. I understand that now you're devoting a lot of time to designing clothes and painting. How does an artist's brush feel in a hand accustomed to a tennis racket? The fields are not so far removed as you may think, Mr. DeMille. The action of a tennis game, the sweep of the strokes, the graceful line, the rhythm of motion are qualities that lend themselves very readily to an etching or a pencil sketch. Look at a good painting and then at a good game of tennis and you'll find a kindred artistry. As for clothes, my interest in designing was stimulated when I once found myself with a match on my hands but no outfit. I was in a large city and yet couldn't find a store that had sensible sport clothes. Most of my designs have been for active sportwear, but I have also done some bathing suits and street dresses. Since I've been doing this designing work, my attention has been called to the problem of keeping up the attractiveness of sportwear, and I know that the answer has been found in the use of Lux Flakes. Sportwear lasts longer, looks better, and stays fresher when cared for with a splendid product responsible for this program. It's obvious, Mrs. Moody, that you believe in having a variety of interests. Yes, I believe if you have one main interest and a variety of lesser interests, it makes for greater happiness, in proof of which I've also tried my hand at writing, and I've just completed a book. I've called it 15 to 30, because it deals not only with tennis, but with the experiences I've had and what I hope I've learned during those years, during those years. All my thanks, Mr. DeMille, for asking me to appear in the Lux Radio Theater. I'm sure you'll be a champion among authors, too. And now, back to the story of Madame X, starring Anne Harding and James Stewart with Conway Turl. The knowledge that our own son is to defend her seals Jacqueline's lips even tighter than before. 
We're in the courtroom, where the trial is almost ready to begin. In the enclosure near the judge's bench, Alan Cartwright sits at a long table. Beside him is his old friend, Dr. Chesney, who's come to hear Raymond plead his first case. Has Raymond any kind of a chance at all, Alan? Well, not on the facts alone, Perry. But you make a good showing. He's convinced in some manner that the crime was justifiable. He's got his heart in it. That's always a help. He's a little young to be swaying juries on sentiment alone. Well, we'll see. The court will please rise. The court of general sessions is now in order. The Honorable Gerald M. Darrett presiding. Be seated, please. The case of the people versus Laura Williams. Uh, There she is. She's just come in with Raymond. Hmm. He looks worried. I hope he... Good God, Perry. What is it? That woman... Look at her. Who is she, Perry? It does look like... But she can't be, of course. It is. It's Jacqueline. Jacqueline here is caught on trial for murder. Sit down, Alan. I've got to speak to her. You can't do that. Not now. Besides, you're not even certain that it is Jacqueline. Not certain. Oh, God. Don't you think I know her face? Haven't I seen it every time I've closed my eyes for the last 20 years? Oh, that you can't do anything. It's too late, man. It's in Raymond's hand now. Her son. Her own son. And he doesn't know. There's nothing to be done now, Alan. Nothing. Here, sit down right over here. Face the bench. Thank you. Feel better now? Yes. The state ready? Ready, Your Honor. Defendant ready? Ready, Your Honor. Proceed with the case, please. The state versus Laura Williams. The defendant is charged with the willful murder of one Tony Phillips. On the night of May 4th, 1937, it was... These gentlemen of the jury are the facts that the state will bring forward. By the defendant's own admission, she committed an act of murder. But the law of this state is such that we cannot force her to testify against herself. Therefore, the state will present its witnesses as rapidly as possible. Witnesses who were at the scene of the crime... Only a few seconds after its commission. The first witness, a woman who had the adjoining room, will swear to this. I was alone in my room and I heard a shot. I ran out into the hall and I... In the hall. I didn't hear the shot, but when I got out there, there were about four or five people standing around the door of room 518. They were banging on it. I ran up to the door and tried to find out... There she was, standing over him with a gun in her hand. The gun was still smoking. She said, I killed him. I'm not trying to escape. I killed him. That's all she'd say. And then I went downstairs to find an office. Came back to me. And that, gentlemen, is the case as presented by the state. The counsel for the defense has shown no flaw in any of the testimony he's heard, nor has he offered to produce any witnesses to refute this testimony. Your Honor, gentlemen of the jury, the state rests. Oh, please, please, we can't let her just go with that. You've got to speak. You've got to tell no, me. No, don't say any more. Don't try to defend me. Let them send the jury out now. It can't make any difference, Raymond. Why do you call me Raymond? I don't know. You did it once before, too. I'm sorry. No, please. Please, but you say it as if it had some meaning to you. Do I? Will counsel for the defense present his case, please? No, don't say anything. Please, I've got to. Your Honor, gentlemen of the jury, you have just heard the state's case, and you have heard no denials by the defendant. The defense has no witnesses to present, and I am frank to admit that the defendant, in spite of my counsel, has repeatedly refused to take the stand on her own behalf. Now, this would seem to indicate that she has reason to be afraid, but we must look deeper than that. Now, this woman, gentlemen, whom you see before you, has admitted her guilt openly. She has nothing to lose by testifying. On the contrary, she has only to gain by it. But still, she refuses. Now, there must be some reason for this. And from my conversations with her before this trial opened, I am firmly convinced that she is keeping silent for one purpose, and for one purpose only. To protect and shield someone near to her. Someone she loves. 
Yes, gentlemen, there, there is a mystery surrounding this woman that newspapers have called Madame X. Who is she? Where does she come from? Whom is she shielding? Whom is she protecting? Is it a husband, a daughter, a son? No, don't. What did she say? What did she say? She told me she had a son of my age. And she refused to speak any more of him. But he lives. Now, perhaps he faced some great danger. I don't know what, but she knew and she killed to protect him from it. Now, you will say that this is supposition. Well, it is, gentlemen. It is supposition. But our law states that where there is a reasonable doubt of guilt, the defendant must be deemed innocent. Well, there is doubt here. Not, not as to actual fact, but as to motive. And the courts of our state have recognized time after time, case after case, that there is such a thing as justifiable homicide. Let me through here. Let me through. Order, order there. Your Honor, Your Honor, I'd like to speak to the counsel for defense, please. The counsel for defense is summing up his case. This is no time. Your Honor... If the court so pleases, this man is in my employ. Now, if he wants to speak to me now, I assure you it has direct bearing upon the case. Very well. Go ahead. All right, what is it? Joe Harper. I found him. What, is he here now? Sure. I served him with subpoenas as soon as I found him. All right, him. all right. Now, get him up here quick. Right. Your Honor. Your Honor, I, I ask the court's pardon for this interruption. I also ask the court for permission to introduce a witness for the defense. I object. The counsel has already begun his summation. A human life is at stake here. Objection. Overruled. Your Honor, I ask the court to call Joseph Harper. Joseph Harper to the stand. Raise your right hand. Gentlemen of the jury, I have never seen this witness. Now, his testimony may act to the advantage of the defendant. It may act to her disadvantage. But regardless of that, I believe he knows something about this case. What's your name? Joseph Harper. Where do you live, please? 618 West 74th Street. Now, I want you to look at the defendant. Have you ever seen her before? No. You, you don't know who she is? No. Now, tell me this. Did you ever know a man by the name of Tony Phillips? Did you? Yeah. Did you call him on the telephone at the Hotel Trent on the night of May the 4th? I guess so. No, no, did you or didn't you? Answer the question. Yes. Well, why did you call him? Well, he, um, he asked me to. When was that? Well, a week before. He, uh, he sent me a telegram. From New York? No, 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 San Francisco. He wanted me to do him a favor. What was that favor? Well, he asked me to get some information for him. What about? Did I have to answer that? What about? Well, it was about a person that he was no, trying to... No, don't answer. Don't answer. Do you hear? <laughs> Don't let him kill. Take him off the stand. Don't question him anymore. I'll do anything you want. I'll do anything. But please, please don't let him speak for my sake. Please. True what you said. I was protecting someone. It was my son. The man I killed was going to blackmail him and my husband because of me. He was going to wreck my son's life and my husband's career because of what I was and what I am now. That's why I couldn't speak. That's why I can never speak. In God's name, please don't ask me to tell. Don't ask me to give up my life for nothing. I'm not afraid to die if I know that he'll be safe. He's my son. My son whom I've never known and who's never known me. You can take my life as a worthless thing anyway, but please, please let him have his. Oh. Oh, she's fainted. Here, get a doctor, quick. Betty, has she come around yet? Not quite. She's in pretty bad shape, Alan. Where's Raymond? Ah, she's away to the corridor. Did you, did you tell him about Jacqueline? Yes, yes. It, it wasn't easy, Perry. How did he take it? He wanted to come in to see her. I made him wait for the jury to come back. He'll get an acquittal. It's, it's almost sure. I wonder how much good it will do, Alan. What do you mean? Hmm? Oh, she's hmm. coming too. Jacqueline. Jacqueline, do you hear me? Alan. Yes, darling. I saw you in the court. I was so afraid you'd tell. 
I want it to, Jacqueline. No, no. Better. Better this way. Much better. I know everything you've done has been for me and Raymond. I, I, I can't tell you. Don't cry. You told me once that I'd never forgive myself for what I did. I never have, Jacqueline. I've tried to find you. Oh, so many times. But I'll make it all up to you. I swear I will. I'll make you happy again, Jacqueline. I'm happy now. So very happy. Come here, Raymond. Raymond, does he know? Yes, I know, Mother. Oh. Oh, Raymond. It's all over, Mother. The jury's come in and they've acquitted you. We can go home now. Home. I only wish I could. But you can. You're going to. Give me your hand, Raymond. My son. All these years I've been so proud of you. And all these years you thought of me as, as a dream mother who died long ago when she was young and pretty. Please, try to go on thinking that. For my sake. But I, I've found you, Mother. I, I can't lose you again so quickly. That isn't in our hands, Raymond. I don't know what you mean. Now, you mustn't be sad. And you mustn't think too much about me. Because I'm not sad. I'm happy, Raymond. Happier than I've ever been in all my life. Mother? Mother? Dr. Chesney, what is it? We found her. T too late, my boy. <laughs> Anne Harding and James Stewart step from their tragic roles and speak to us as themselves in just a moment. From a different part of the country, we now present another Madame X and her son, whose name also is Raymond. They will tell their own story, this time the actual story of a mother and son lost to each other for 18 years. Today they're reunited, but up until now have refused all requests to tell their amazing story to the world. This evening they consented to come to the Lux Radio Theater and tell it in person. It's my pleasure to introduce to you the young gentleman and his mother who present their proof of the adage that truth is often stranger than fiction. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Raymond Meir and his mother, who speak to you from New York. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. For the last 18 years, I have believed my mother dead. Every time I asked my father about her, the only answer I could get was that she had died when I was three years old. My father had remarried in the meantime, and two years ago, he died. A year and a half ago, I got a job ushering at the Paramount here in New York, where I am now assistant chief usher. Two months ago on my day off, I was in the neighborhood and happened to stop in at the theater, and there I was handed a message. It was sent by my stepmother, and all it said was, your mother is in town and wants to speak to you. I have read stories like that, and I have seen such things happen in the movies. Madam Mix is one, I remember, but I never thought it would happen to me. But you had known, hadn't you, Mother, that someday it would happen? Yes, Raymond. I just knew that you were alive. And even if I couldn't find you, I could hope I might someday. Do you know why my father would never let you see me? He had his ideas of how to bring you up, and I had mine. We couldn't agree. We separated, and he traveled a great deal. And once he took you with him, I never saw you again. But, Raymond... You tell the story. All right. I'd rather just listen to you. All right. My mother tried every means to find me for 15 years, but she never could. Finally, two months ago, she did discover a clue to where I had been working. She went to that firm in New York, and as it turned out, the woman she interviewed there was my stepmother. Neither knew who the other was. My mother asked for me, and my stepmother, not knowing her, was very cautious at first. They took a liking to each other, and finally, my mother revealed her identity. 
Then my stepmother did the same. The whole story came out then. And convinced of the truth of it, my stepmother sent that message to me at the Paramount. I went to her office immediately, and she told me to go to a certain address where my fa- mother was staying with friends. I went, and when I walked into the room and saw mother, I thought I must be looking into a mirror. We looked so much alike. Uh, Raymond, I never even asked you, how did you feel when you first saw me? I don't really know. I was so stunned that I don't know whether I felt anything, really. I can't even remember what I said. And I'm not sure I know what you said, do you? No, I just remember. All of a sudden, I couldn't see you. Uh, I guess I was crying. Very soon after my mother and I were reunited, we began checking over places we had been, where we might have met. We discovered that one month before she found me, she had been in New York, and some friends insisted that she go to the movies with them. They went to the Paramount, and as my mother still says, it was very dark inside. Maybe you are the young man who took me to my seat. And now, Mother, I think it's time we said goodbye. From Hollywood, we send our thanks to Mr. Muir and his mother and the hope that their newfound happiness will be with them always. Before Mr. DeMille brings Anne Harding and James Stewart back to the microphone, may I remind you that the Lux Radio Theater comes to you through the courtesy of the makers of Lux Flakes. The familiar blue box has a friendly place in most of the homes you know. These gentle flakes are made especially to safeguard fine silks and woolens. You'll find them kind to everything that is safe in clear water alone. Again, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Back to our microphone, come Anne Harding and James Stewart, giving us, among other things, a chance to learn from Miss Harding her impressions of the stage and screen in England. Well, I'm afraid I'm hardly the right person to ask about English pictures, Mr. DeMille. I did make a picture in England, but an American produced it, an American directed it, and the cameraman was an American. <laughs> Well, then how about the English stage, Miss Hardy? Ah, well, now, it isn't safe to start me on that subject. (laughs) Playing on the English stage was a marvelous experience. Isn't it rather strange that George Bernard Shaw's play, Candida, wasn't given a major production in London for 37 years? In fact, not till you went over to star in it. Well, I could hardly believe it when they told me that. It was pretty exciting to find that it was such a success. What have you been doing, Mr. Stewart? When I left Hollywood a year ago, everyone was talking about that amazing young actor who lived with Henry Fonda, owned 30 cats, and played the accordion. (laughs) (laughs) We know Henry Fonda married, but uh, what happened to the cats and the accordion? I don't know. Whatever attracted the cats in the first place, I don't know. They just seemed to come around. (laughs) They haven't caught up with me yet. Every night I play the accordion to sort of discourage them. (laughs) Are the neighbors in sympathy? Well, I, uh, I just asked them which they'd prefer, an accordion or a troop of 30 yowling cats. I guess it's a case of the lesser of two evils. <laughs> what do they say to that? Well, sir, I hardly ever get a civil answer. <laughs> <laughs> but, Mr. DeMille, I meant to ask you about this. In case you need an accordion player for the Buccaneer, you remember the Stuart's name. Uh, th- th- thanks, Jimmy. But after all, even the pirate can endure just so much. <laughs> Goodbye, Jimmy. (laughs) You're a very remarkable fellow. Thank you, Miss Harding and Mr. Stewart. This is your announcer, ladies and gentlemen, Melville Rui. Next week's stars and play will be told shortly by Mr. DeMille. James Stewart appeared through courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studios, Mr. DeMille, Paramount, and Louis Silver's 20th Century Fox, where he was in charge of music for the new picture, This Is My Affair. Our play was based on John Raphael's adaptation of the original by Alexandra Bisson. And here is Mr. DeMille. To the ever-popular Booth Tarkington, we're indebted for the story which comes to us next Monday night. A story whose suspense and delightful romance have ranked it as a classic of its kind ever since Richard Mansfield brought it to the stage many years ago. Its title, Monsieur Beaucaire. I'm especially pleased to announce that filling the title role will be one of the greatest artists of our time, Mr. Leslie Howard. And starring with him, Alyssa Landy. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theatre presents Leslie Howard and Alyssa Landy in Monsieur Beaucaire. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. KNX, the Columbia Station, Los Angeles.
we hold these truths. This is a program about the making of a promise and the keeping of a promise. This is a program about the rights of people. This is a program coming to you over the combined radio networks of the United States, bringing you the voices of Americans, bringing you the voice of the President of the United States. This is a program for listeners in all zones of continental time, for listeners on ships away from home, for listeners in uniform, for listeners on the American islands in the two great oceans. This is a program about the guarantee made to the people of America 150 years ago. A guarantee that has been kept through peace and war and peace and war. A guarantee we call the Bill of Rights. Barrymore. I am one of several actors gathered in the studio in California and the shores that face an enemy across an ocean now Pacific in name only. We are here tonight to join the 130 million fellow Americans in praise of a document that men have fought for, that men are fighting for, that men will keep on fighting for as long as freedom is a strong word falling sweet upon the ear. What we enact here tonight has been enacted many times before in living flesh and blood. The people we portray have walked the world. The drama is an ancient one. The endless one. The struggle for men's rights to live their lives out peacefully and profitably in a decent world. It may be many of us people here are unknown to many of you people there, for with us, honored to have a part in this program of commemoration, are some whose names you may have heard, such names as Edward Arnold, Walter Brennan, Bob Burns, Norman Corwin, Bernard Herman, Walter Houston, Marjorie Maine, Edward G. Robinson, Corporal James Stewart, loaned to us for this occasion by the Army Air Corps, Rudy Valley, and Orson Welles. In New York City, waiting to join us is Dr. Leopold Stokowski in the Symphony Orchestra. In Washington, the highest name in the land, the President of the United States, Commander-in-Chief of the Army and the Navy, Mr. Roosevelt. But this is not a night of names, of personalities. Our names or any names are meaningless unless your names are added. Unless you join us. You, for whom the sacred rights were written. And to whom their keeping is entrusted. You, the guardians of what has been bequeathed to you by millions like yourselves and by the toil of centuries as dark and menacing as this we live in. You, the people of the Federated States. One hundred fifty years is not long in the reckoning of a hill, but to a man it's long enough. One hundred fifty years is a weekend to the redwood tree. But to a man, it's two full lifetimes. One hundred fifty years is a twinkle to a star. But to a man, it's time enough to teach six generations what the meaning is of liberty. How to use it. 
when to fight for it. Have you ever been to Washington, your capital? Been there lately? Well, let me tell you, it's a place of buildings and of boom and bustle, of the fever of emergency, of workers working overtime, of windows lighted late into the night. It's a handsome city, proud of its sturdy name, proud of the men who stopped there and made decisions, proud of its domes and lawns and monuments. Of course, Washington is like some other cities you've seen. It has streetcars, haberdasheries, newsstands, coffee shops and slums. At busy intersections, there are neon traffic signs which, when the light's against you, say, don't walk. And when the light changes, walk. It's a tourist city which is proper when you think how much of history a busy guide can cover in a day and when you realize that the district of columbia belongs to all the people of the states the tourists know that here their voices have been heard from clear back home that here their votes are put to work the tourists go to see the sites they've seen in a thousand pictures of sites so famous and familiar that they're thrilled to find they look well, they, they look just like they thought they looked. Washington Monument, for example, or the Lincoln Memorial, where the seated and relaxed Abe Lincoln sits between two mighty murals of plain words, his own words. With firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. The city moves on busily outside the monument. The tourist goes to see the Capitol, the White House, the museums, sees all about him statues and inscriptions with more sayings than he's ever seen in his life before. They're wise sayings, profound sayings. At, at Union Station, for example. A man must carry knowledge with him if he would bring home knowledge. Samuel Johnson. The Archives Building. What is past is prologue. The Supreme Court. Justice, the guardian of liberty. But one of the best is in the Library of Congress. The noblest motive is the public good, Virgil. Ah, the tourist thinks that over. The noblest public good. And with this in mind, he climbs the marble stairs inside the library to come at length upon a case containing a handwritten document. The engrossed original of the Constitution of the United States of America. He sees that the manuscript is aging, that its words are worn as though from use. The writing's dim. It's hard to make it out. It's getting on in years. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Article 1, Section 1. The words are dim, but not the meaning of the words. The pens that put this down are dust, but not the marks they made. There was a time when this was shining parchment, when the text was easier to read, when the ink was not yet dry. Suppose that we stopped here in modern Washington before this shrine were to return, go back, go back a little north by east in time and space to one bright afternoon in Philadelphia, that fine fall day when deputies from 12 free states subscribed their names to a new blueprint of a new society. And of the independence of the United States the 12th, in witness whereof we have hereunto subscribed our names, George Washington, President and Deputy from Virginia.
Now, gentlemen, we are ready for your signatures by geographical progression north to south. The deputies from New Hampshire will please sign first. John Langdon. John Langdon. Nicholas Gilman. Nicholas Gilman. The delegates from Massachusetts. Good-looking men, these are mostly lawyers. Two or three of them sergeants. Rufus King. The gentleman from Connecticut, please. William Broom there. William Broom Sherman. of Delaware. Roger he did surveying Sherman. for a while. Roger Sherman. Oh. And now our representative of Sherman, New York. who just signed. Alexander he was a shoemaker Hamilton. before he studied Alexander law. Hamilton. The gentleman from New Jersey. William That's Lincoln. Washington calling the delegation. David Brearley. David Brearley. The gentleman from... The man behind Ben Franklin is Alexander Hamilton. Ben's getting old now. 81. Hey, he slept off and on throughout the whole convention, but when it was important to be awake, he was awake Charles all right and Coachworth active. Charles Pinkney. Charles Coachworth Pinkney. The gentleman ah, there have been men assembled in a room William before, William but never to a greater purpose. The others. Well. Abraham Baldwin. Here comes the last to sign now. William Jackson, secretary. Well, now, I do so, the Constitution has been drafted, signed, and presently will be submitted to the states for their approval. Now, the convention is all relaxed now. There are handshakes, felicitations. Well, is everybody happy? Will they celebrate this close? Will Rufus King go home to Boston and be welcomed by a welcoming committee from the city? Will appreciative Virginians hoist James Madison on their shoulders and parade him through the streets? Shouting, Father of the Constitution, will a thumping band march up and down the town making a noise like this? No, there will be no band. And I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, the heart of every man and woman, nay, of every child in each and every one of our 13 states, from the rock-bound shores of Maryland to the golden sands of Georgia, should fill and swell with pride on reading the noble and glorious Constitution which our wise and prudent and far-sighted representatives in solemn assembly have framed and admitted to our glorious states for their approval. And I say to you, no, there will be no speeches, there will be no celebration, no confetti from the windows, fireworks saluting cannon, roses strewn beneath the coaches of the delegates. Instead, suspicion. Suspicion by the very men who fought the long fight so that there could be a constitution drawn for the emancipated states. The farmers and the clerks and the hackmen and the artisans and the grease-grimed blacksmiths in their shops. These men who only lately put away their guns and powder in a good dry place. These men who won a war of freedom but who know that freedom must be guarded to be kept. And they're suspicious. And they're talking in the coma, in the tavern, and in the parlor, and in the foundry room. Mm -hmm. All right, what else does it say? Well, that covers it. That's the whole thing. Constitution. I don't like it. Why? Come here with me. Come over at the door. See that spire? Yes. That's the church I go to. Well, what about it? I like it. I'm a God-fearing man. I want to keep on going there. Well? Don't want anybody telling me I have to pray his way. Well, who'd think of doing that? It's been done. It happened often. You ever hear state religion? Yes. Bad. I don't like it. Don't think we should have it. Well, we haven't got it. Nothing in that thing you read me guarantees we won't get it. 
Say, this here Constitution gives us order and authority, huh? Yeah. But we had order and authority under King George before the Revolution. Chuck, the Romans had order and authority under Nero, too. Only the wrong kind and too much of it. Oh, yes, but surely you can trust the men who... Ah, no, it ain't that I don't trust the men who wrote the Constitution. Oh, sure, I trust them, but them fellers won't always be around. Oh, yeah, well, you don't seem to understand. This is our own authority. Now, if you... Uh, The fact that it's our own don't make no difference. Constitution's fine as far as it goes. But the time to talk authority is after you put it down in black and white that we're all free men. Then we'll give you all the authority you need to keep us that way. What's more, we'll back it up with guns. Is that fair enough? Well, the way you talk, you'd think that... The way I talk? Didn't... I think it all depends on who's handing out authority. Whether it's to keep men slaves or keep them free. <laughs> think it was necessary. The English thought it was necessary a hundred years ago. They've got a Bill of Rights. Where's ours? Well, maybe they'll get around to that. Maybe they'll amend the Constitution later. How do we know they will? Well, maybe they're planning. I don't like this maybe business. When my husband Robert got killed at Trenton, there was no maybe about it. He got killed. He knew what he was fighting for and he was glad to die for it. Now the fighting's over. I want to see it. I don't know, Jerry. Sometimes I wonder whether you use your head for anything else than to keep your ears apart. I got my opinion, and I stick to it. The Constitution looks good to me. I don't think it needs no adding to it. Hand me that brick there. It's a foundation, that's what it is. Sure, it's a foundation. That's just what I'm talking about. But do you build the foundation and then go away and not build the house? Do you clear the woods and then let the ground go barren? Ah, oh, piffle. Ah, the way you are, you piffle, eh? Is that all you can say? Hand me that brick there. What's the hurry? Give them time. It's not an easy job to get a new country running right. That's just the point. It's a lot easier to get it run wrong. Rights, 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 man. Can't you get that through your head? Why shouldn't rights be written into the Constitution just as much as rules on how to meet and when to vote and how much a senator should get paid? Not they alone. Not only little men like they, whose names escape us, whose names will never be recalled. The men who left their bloody footprints in the snows of Pennsylvania and buried their comrades in a clearing back of a clump of evergreens. The little men who took it, gave it, stuck for the duration, saw it through. Not they alone are doubters, wondering and grumbling, no. There are big names, too. Names now bandied on the tongue, but later to be lustrous, later to be sated. Tom Jefferson, George Mason, Jimmy Madison, Pat Henry. Uh, now take Jefferson, for instance. You know what he says? The Bill of Rights is what the people are entitled to against any government on earth. I'll take Pat Henry. I cannot give my oath to support this Constitution without a Bill of Rights. Now take Mason, a wealthy planter of Virginia who'd rather plant a seed of liberty than 20,000 acres of tobacco. Government to be lasting must be founded in the confidence and affections of the people. Without a Bill of Rights, this government will end either in monarchy or a tyrannical aristocracy. This Constitution has been formed without the knowledge of the people, and it is not proper to say to them, take this or nothing. Well, then, the Constitution is in peril. This document, so handsomely engrossed in Philadelphia... There are doubts about it and suspicions. Will the states approve of it? Approve by ratifying? Will they throw it out? Or will they ratify providing certain changes will be made? The writing's fresh, still fresh upon the parchment. The text is clean, the ink is bold, the meaning clear. Only the worth of the Constitution is uncertain. All the points, the articles, the regulations are well put. But will they be well taken? The states decide. Not one man, two men, three men, 
but the states united, they decide what says South Carolina. We ratify but offer four amendments. What says Massachusetts where she stands? We ratify but offer nine amendments. New Hampshire, you. We ratify but propose 12 amendments. Rhode Island. We ratify but 21 amendments, please. North Carolina. 26 amendments and the Declaration of Men's Rights. Virginia. We ratify but we're suggesting 29 amendments and a Bill of Rights. New York. 33 amendments and four amendments, right? And we ratify. Congress may begin, may call itself first Congress, may go to work, may tackle the new job of running a democracy. But it has one thing to remember. A promise is a promise. The people have been promised changes, promised amendments, promised that their freedom should be written down in black and white for all to see, for all to know, for all to live and prosper by. Well, it'll take time. No quorum to begin with. Bad roads, New York City hard to get to. There's some indifference, too. So, well, days go by. No quorum. Month of March goes by. No quorum. Well, patience. Good things grow slowly. Good things don't come running when you whistle to them. Good things are always fought for, worked for, grown. The acorn to the oak is not an overnight procedure, you know. God himself took several days to make the earth. But one day they begin. They sit down in a drafty hall in New York City and, and they go to work. At first they're busy with a hundred other things, but Madison, he keeps after them. He's a stickler for this Bill of Rights. Madison remembers what the people want. And by this time, carpenters are making changes in Federal Hall, adding more room. You now, the place has got to be enlarged. The government's growing, you know. And the representatives, all 55 of them, they work through the noise. They're making some additions of their own. They're working on the Bill of Rights. Do you think... 55 representatives of the American people sat in a hall in New York City, in a drafty hall, and made up articles of freedom? Do you think the congressmen from 13 states made up those freedoms out of their own heads, debated there, deliberated there, without assistance, all by themselves, from their own experience? Oh, no. They had much help from many nameless and unknown, from dust in quiet places, from broken bones deep in the earth, deep in forgotten earth, mixed with the empty clay, from bleeding mouths, burnt flesh, cropped ears, from numberless and nameless agonies. The delegates from dungeons, they were there. I said that men were born equal. That is all I said. The delegates from ashes at the bottoms of the stakes, they were there. The king did not approve. The gallows delegates, whose corpses lifted gently in the breeze, they too. They too. The exiled wanderers, the Christians killed for being Christians, Jews for being Jews. The Quakers hanged in Boston town. They made a quorum also. Prince, we are not prince. The murdered men, the lopped off hands, the shattered limbs, the red welts where the whiplash bit into the back. Must you know what they said? Must you know how they argued? Must you be told the evidence? The silent testimony of the rays. Must it be told verbatim? Listen then! <whistles> that was an argument for an amendment. <whistles> that was a speech in favor of an article of freedom. 
that praise the passage of a Bill of Rights. How much of all this must be told to be believed? Must it be drawn on diagrams? X marks the spot where decency was last observed. The dotted line shows how the victim staggered. The arrow points to blood. The headsman, he was there in Federal Hall. The man who turned the ratchets on the rack. He sat in the assembly too. Nero was there. Caligula. King Philip. Torquemada. Cotton Mather. All the tyrants and the martyrs who had gone before. That quietly. Unseen among the representatives. Read from their memoirs. Expert testimonies found their ways into the record and between the lines. All the long and bloody history of fanaticism, murder in the name of God, torture in the name of love, crucifixion in the name of safety to the crown. My God, my God. He too sat in the Congress, the mild man with the scars in his hands and feet, for the sight went through. He was a consultant in the business at hand. Had he not died because the rulers of a realm denied free speech? Was he not nailed up on a cross between two thieves? because his treatments were considered treason. He, the Son of God, was he not executed over an issue of the rights of man? Make no mistake about it. He was there. He sat beside James Madison and Elbridge Gerry and John Page in Federal Hall. Unseen he was. The men of Congress were collaborated with. They added up the gains and the losses and the brave words spoken and the brave songs sung. They weighed the drawn and quartered flesh. They took into account the hemlock and the crucifix, the faggot, and garrot. And then they framed amendments to the Constitution out of the agonies, out of the crisscross scars of all the human race. They made a bill of rights for their own people, for a new a willful and a hopeful nation made a bill of rights stand against the enemies within, connivers, fakers, those who lust for power, those who make of their authority an insolence. The Congress of the 13th state, instructed by the people of the 13 states, threw up a bulwark, wrote a hope, and made a sign for their posterity against the bigots, the fanatics, bullies, lynchers, race haters, the cruel men, the spiteful men, the sneaking men, the pessimists, the men who give up fight that have been just begun. The Congress wrote a ten-part epic of a memory. Amendment one. Congress shall make no law regarding an establishment of religion 
or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Radburn, I move this amendment be accepted in its present form without qualification. These are the voices of Virginians. We are debating Congress's amendment on this mild December afternoon, this 15th of December, 1791, debating in the State Assembly in the capital of Richmond. Only one more state is needed now to ratify. Just one more state and the amendment becomes law. Ah, the victory is close at hand. Virginia likes these articles. Virginia, the home of Washington and Jefferson, of Madison and Mason. Virginia has fought to win these rights for many years, has waited for this day. This is December the 15th. 1791, Virginia will ratify the Bill of Rights today, and freedom will take hold, take root, begin to burgeon in the rich earth of America. Today, today, the 15th of December. Ha-ha, <laughs> now. Now the people of the states breathe easier. It's all down in black and white. A contract. It's a deal between the future and themselves. Americans don't make a promise lightly. Or take it that way either. A promise made by honest men to other honest men is like a hand clasp and a vow. Meant to be understood. Meant to be remembered. Ah, oh, look. Look about the country now. Suspicion thaws like frost beneath the frank diplomacy of spring. The people read the new amendment slowly, pleasurefully, as, as they'd read a letter from a son just set up in business who'd written home to tell how he was making good. Oh, well, now that's more like it. Yes, sir, that's more like it. Got your sleeve in the soup, dear. What's more like what? Listen to this. Amendment 2. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That mean you can keep your gun? That means if somebody gets into office and turns sour on the people that put him there, why, he can't vex us with a standing army the way George did before the war. No, sir, we people of the states, if we got arms, nobody's going to order us to do things the majority of the country ain't voted for. Not without a fight. Better eat that soup before it gets cold. Shouldn't read when you eat anyways. Put down the paper. Oh, all right. That's a good law, ain't it, Jasper? Yep. Go on, go on reading it. Why'd you stop? Well, how can you hear me when you're hammering? Concentration. Go on. Amendment three. No soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. <laughs> Isn't the elbow grease just hearing things like that? Makes the old hammer handle easier. Hmm. The way this sounds, you'd think we was expecting another war. In a time of war, this says. Why, well, I thought we'd just been all through that a little while ago. Why, the more these amendments make us free, the more they'll be hated by those who don't want freedom because it's spoiled of their game. Think nobody's going to try and break us up because we're united and agreed? <laughs> Some people just ornery that way. Wouldn't surprise me none if we had to fight more wars. Why, you mean to say we, we're maybe going to have to fight all over again to keep our independence? Well, I hope it don't get to be a habit. I hope it does. Pretty good habit to get into, fighting for your rights. Always somebody waiting for a chance to steal valuables. And if freedom made a valuable, I don't know what is. Yeah, well. Uh, go on, go on, read some more. Amendment 4. The rights of the people to be secure in their persons, homes, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be... 
shall not be violated and no warrant shall issue, but upon probable cause supported by oath and affirmation and particularly describing the place to be said and the person or things to be seen. I brought you these, Robert. I grew them myself inside the house. Don't smell much, but they're awful pretty. Everything's going on about the same at the house. Except I'm a year older since I was here last. I guess you don't have to worry anymore, Robert. I guess you can rest in peace. No. Looks like it's going to be all right. They didn't trick you, Robert. Looks all right. The voices of Americans in Maryland, in Pennsylvania, Connecticut, the Carolinas, Georgia. Up and down the little seaboard nation, the voices of Americans together now. Together in a new way in a strange new way, a way men had never lived together in before. Proud men, unsuspicious, trusting men. They're fighting over, and they're living just begun. They're building, and they're working, and they're singing, and just now getting started. Here strangers from a thousand shores Compelled by tyranny to roam Shall find amid abundant stores A nobler and a happier home Rejoice, Columbia, and rejoice To tyrants never bend the knee But join with heart and soul and voice For Jefferson and liberty Shall well, this song make good its promise? Does this folk tune hold the truth? Shall strangers from a thousand shores be compelled by tyrannies to roam? Shall they find here, amidst abundant stores, a nobler and happier home? 150 years from this beginning, how much of what is said and of what is sung and what is written down shall still be good? This parchment of the Bill of Rights with the word resolved so plainly written on it, how long will it endure? Is it a passport to a greater day? Will future generations read it, sanction it, and pass on it? Will children's children live by it, work by it, and profit by it? Look it over. Look it over. It is new. The parchment shines. The text is easy reading. The words are not yet worn with trial and experience. The writing's fresh. The meaning's clear. The parchment gleams in the December sunlight like a burnished shield upraised against oppression. Amendment 5. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury. Nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life and limb. Nor shall he be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Nor shall private property be taken for public use without... Let's go ahead 150 years from now. Let's rush headlong, unstopping down the corridors of time. Let's go ahead to 1941. The writing dims. The parchment cracks and curls up at the edges. The splotch of time is on it. And now it's in a case in Washington, D.C. It's in a case behind the pane of special glass protecting it from the light. You see that tourist bending over it there? He's, he's trying hard to make out the writing. He's tracing the rights of persons accused of crime. Amendment 6. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed 
which district shall have been previously ascertained by law and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. Where does this tourist come from? Oh, maybe from a place undreamed of when the Bill of Rights was born, a land as far away from Federal Hall as Europe. Well, California. What lies tonight between that place and here? Four dozen states without a yard of fenced-in border. 130 million people. People working, people resting up to work some more. People working in a mighty unison to prosecute a war. All right, now let's, let's uh, move along. Let's move among them. Let's hear them living lives and thinking thoughts and giving off opinions. Let's see now what they have to say 150 winters after Richmond. Let's see what happens to the Bill of Rights through their 33 administrations, 77 Congresses, and a half a dozen wars. Has anybody anything to say about the status of men's rights December 15th, 1941? I have something to say, if you don't mind. I'm in jail tonight, but I'm joining in your celebration and cheering as hard as anybody else. Uh-huh. Well, uh, if you don't mind my asking, uh, what... Well, a uh, trumped-up charge. The old routine in the city. And I'm getting out on bail tomorrow, and when I'm finally tried, it'll be by a jury and in public. And none of this Gestapo stuff. Not that they wouldn't try it if they could, but that little 450-word matter you're celebrating tonight stops them short of that. Yeah, well, what did they chuck you in the clink for? I mean, what the charge? For making a speech for the fusion party against the mayor. First, we hired a hall, so they took away our permit. Said the building was unsafe under an old fire ordinance. <laughs> so then we went down to Garrison Square, where no permit is required to speak in public. And within ten minutes, we were on our way to the police station on charges of blocking traffic, disturbing the peace, and inciting to riot. Oh, that's a fine thing. Yes, but listen, we'll beat him. He's scared of us. You scare the people who will find out the truth. And with good reason, because when they do, he's finished. That's why he doesn't want us to be heard. Uh-huh. It's only the crooks and the frightened little big shots who need to shut up their opponents. That may work all right in some other countries, but not here. Yeah, well, how are you going to beat them? Well, well there are such things as rights on our side. And not even the mayor's machine is powerful enough to stop us. We'll fight that fight on every front. Carry it to the highest courts if necessary. And we'll win! Is this the talk of servile men? Of tamed and gutless and obedient men? Is this the kind of talk you hear from slaves and witless followers? No, not quite. Not exactly. This is what they meant in Federal Hall and what they voted for 150 years ago today in Richmond. Those ten amendments are not dusty statutes loafing in retirement. They're a pep talk to the fighters and a fortress to the undefended. They double bar the front door of the home against culprits and searching parties. Stand the drinks for everybody toasting freedom. And of all things, they are not a set of legal clauses, dry and dusty. Uh, although that, that's Amendment 7, that makes us wonder. Amendment 7, in suits at common law where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial shall be preserved. And no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of the common law. Uh-huh, well, ex except for that, not like a lawyer's brief at all, but mostly, mostly like a kind of a freestyle ode to liberty, ten verses long. Amendment eight, excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. That's treason in most of your sentiment like that today. Amendment nine, the enumeration and the constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Do you, do you notice? Do you notice how many times it says, "the people"? Well, now, can it be because it means the people? Yeah, it can. Amendment ten: the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution 
are prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. Powers reserved to the people in the Bill of Rights. <laughs> How the mighty and the proud have fallen. Why, King John, who threw a fit when barons made him sign the Magna Carta. Barons, mind you, were heedless of the common people. John, the tough old monarch. Well, he would have died a thousand deaths of apoplexy at the mention of the thought of it. The pharaohs of old Egypt, masters of the blackest arts of slavery. They would have crawled inside a pyramid and shut 147 secret doors behind them in a panic. A promise is a promise. Has America been kept? Has it come through peace and war and peace and war untarnished and unbroken? Has it worked and is it working? For the people and by the people? Is it going anywhere from here? Are the rights the right rights? Are they rolling? Do they function? Do they click? Well, who knows the answer better than the people? Who better can we ask than ask the great custodians themselves, the hundred million keepers of the promise? And we shall ask them. Ask a few of them who stand for many more than few, the high and the low among them. Ladies and gentlemen, an office clerk. Well, <clears throat> we know what freedom is now. Looked for a while there like a lot of us had forgot what it really meant and how much we had of it. But the news that kept piling in from the four corners of the earth. <laughs> that reminded us all right. Ladies and gentlemen, an editor. There have been attacks on the freedom of the press and strangleholds of various sorts, but they've been broken every time. And today a man is free to start a paper, run it as, uh, run it as he pleases, differ from the next man, all he wants. That would make it seem to me, for one, that our rights have come down undamaged. Ladies and gentlemen, a worshiper. I go to the church of my choice. When I don't wish to go, I don't go. Ladies and gentlemen, an auto worker. We got the right to organize. We got the right to bargain collectively. Those are good rights, and we're proud of them. We're better workers on account of them. Ladies and gentlemen, a manufacturer. There is nothing in any law which forbids us to forget class differences and work together to strengthen the sinews of our country. Ladies and gentlemen, an okie. Okay. I got a right, if I'm hungry and out of work, which I has been, to go looking for work anywhere in the country. The big court says nobody can't stop me from looking. Dang it, that's my right. Ladies and gentlemen, a mother. I might be afraid to bring a child into the world, but not to bring a citizen into the population of the United States. Yes. And from men beneath the rocking spars of fishing boats in Gloucester, from the vast tenancy of busy cities, roaring with the million mingled sounds of work, from towns spread thinly through the Appalachians, from the assembly lines, the forges spitting flame, the night shifts in the mines, the great flat counties of the prairie states, from the grocers, from the salesmen, from the tugboat pilots and the motor makers, affirmation, yes, united proudly in a solemn day knit more strongly than we were 150 years ago this day. Can it be progress if our Bill of Rights is stronger now than when it was conceived? Is that not what you would call wearing well? The incubation of invincibility? Is not our Bill of Rights more cherished now than ever? The blood more zealous to preserve it whole? Americans shall answer, for they alone may know the answer. The people of America, from the east, from west, from north, from south. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the people of the United States. Free Americans, no date in the long history of freedom means more to liberty-loving men in all liberty-loving countries than the 15th day of December, 1791. On that day, 150 years ago, a new nation, through an elected Congress, 
adopted a declaration of human rights which has influenced the thinking of all mankind from one end of the world to the other. There is not a single republic of this hemisphere which has not adopted in its fundamental law basic principles of freedom of man and freedom of mind enacted in the American Bill of Rights. There is not a country, large or small, on this continent and in this world which has not felt the influence of that document directly or indirectly. Indeed, prior to the year 1933, the essential validity of the American Bill of Rights was accepted everywhere, at least in principle. Even today, with the exception of Germany, Italy, and Japan, the peoples of the whole world, in all probability four-fifths of them, support its principles, its teachings, and its glorious results. But in the year 1933, there came to power in Germany a political clique which did not accept the declarations of the American Bill of Human Rights as valid. A small clique of ambitious and unscrupulous politicians whose announced and admitted platform was precisely the destruction of the rights that instrument declared. Indeed, the entire program and goal of these political and moral tigers was nothing more than the overthrow throughout the earth of the great revolution of human liberty, of which our American Bill of Rights is the mother charter. The truths which was self-evident to Thomas Jefferson, which have been self-evident to the six generations of Americans who followed him, were to these men hateful. The rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which seemed to the founders of the Republic, and which seemed to us inalienable, were to Hitler and his fellows empty words which they proposed to cancel forever. The propositions they advanced to take the place of Jefferson's inalienable rights were these, that the individual human being has no rights, whatever, in himself and by virtue of his humanity, that the individual human being has no right to a soul of his own or a mind of his own or a tongue of his own or a trade of his own, or even to live where he pleases, or to marry the woman he loves. That his only duty is the duty of obedience, not to his God, not to his conscience, but to Adolf Hitler, and that his only value is his value not as a man, but as a unit of the Nazi state. To Hitler, the ideal of the people as we conceive it, the free, self-governing, and responsible people is incomprehensible. The people, to Hitler, are the masses, and the highest human idealism is in his own words that a man should wish to become a dust particle of the order of force which is to shape his universe. To Hitler, the government as we conceive it is an impossible conception. The government to him is not the servant and the instrument of the people, but their absolute master and the dictator of their very act. To Hitler, the church as we conceive it is a monstrosity to be destroyed by every means at his command. The Nazi church, is to be the national church, a pagan church, absolutely and exclusively in the service of but one doctrine, one race, one nation. To Hitler, the freedom of men to think as they please and speak as they please and worship as they please is of all things imaginable, most hateful and most desperately to be feared. 
the issue of our time, the issue of the war in which we are engaged, is the issue forced upon the decent, self-respecting peoples of the earth by the aggressive dogmas of this attempted revival of barbarism. This proposed return to tyranny, this effort to impose again upon the peoples of the world doctrines of absolute obedience, of dictatorial rule, of the suppression of truth, of the oppression of conscience, which the free nations of the earth have long ago rejected. What we face is nothing more nor less than an attempt to overthrow and to cancel out the great upsurge of human liberty of which the American Bill of Rights is the fundamental document to force the peoples of the earth and among them the peoples of this continent and this nation to accept again the absolute authority and despotic rule from which the courage and the resolution and the sacrifices of their ancestors liberated them many, many years ago. It is an attempt, an attempt which could succeed only if those who have inherited the gift of liberty had lost the manhood to preserve it. But we Americans know that the determination of this generation of our people our generation to preserve liberty is as fixed and certain as the determination of that earlier generation of Americans was to win it. We will not, under any threat or in the face of any danger, surrender the guarantees of liberty our forefathers framed for us in our Bill of Rights. We hold with all the passion of our hearts and minds to those commitments of the human spirit. We are solemnly determined that no power or combination of powers of this earth shall shake our hold upon them. We covenant with each other before all the world that having taken up arms in the defense of liberty, we will not lay them down before liberty is once again secure in the world we live in. For that security we pray. For that security we act. Now and evermore. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard the President of the United States speaking from the White House in Washington, D.C. Our national anthem. <laughs> been listening to We Hold These Truths, a special program commemorating the 150th anniversary of the ratification of the Bill of Rights and presented over the combined radio networks of the United States. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt spoke from the White House in Washington, D.C. The Hollywood portion of the program, written and directed by Norman Corwin, starred Edward Arnold, 
Walter Brennan, Bob Burns, Walter Houston, Marjorie Main, Edward G. Robinson, Corporal James Stewart, Rudy Valley, and Orson Welles. The original music score was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman. The national anthem was performed by the NBC Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Dr. Leopold Stokowski, and came to you from New York. Margaret Sullivan, James Stewart, Frank Morgan. The Gulf Screen Guild Theater. Your host and director of the star's own theater, Roger Pryor. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of your neighborhood Good Gulf dealer and the Gulf Oil Companies, welcome back to the Gulf Screen Guild Theater. Right now, the Gulf Theater is the most exciting place this Hollywood of ours has seen in months. Out front in the audience are many of the greatest names in motion pictures and radio. Right beside me here on the stage are Margaret Sullivan, James Stewart, and Frank Morgan, whom you'll hear later in tonight's play, The Shop Around the Corner. Behind me, of course, is Oscar Bradley's Gulf Orchestra with Fank Tours conducting. And facing me across the microphone is one of the grandest fellows in Hollywood or any place else, a great actor and the president of the Motion Picture Relief Fund, Gene Herschel. Gene has something to say to you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Gulf Screen Guild Theater means more to us here in Hollywood than you probably realize. Soon, just outside of Hollywood, a community complete in itself will be built a community that will provide a home for the less fortunate men and women of the motion picture industry who, because of some quirk of fate, can no longer provide for themselves. And we owe all this to the Gulf Theater. But the money that would ordinarily go to the stars who appear here, Gulf gives instead to the motion picture in front. So as we start our third season, I want to thank the Gulf people and all the stars who have helped make the Gulf Theater our theater. I'm proud to be associated with them. Thank you. Thank you, Gene Herschel. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our first production of the season, we bring you Margaret Sullivan, James Stewart, and Frank Morgan in the shop around the corner. corner, they call this story. And do you know whose shop? Matricek and Company, novelties and leatherware. Best of its kind in Budapest. It really is. Wonderful values at all times. In fact, I don't know how Matricek and Company does it. Uh, just a moment, please. Uh, who are you? Uh, who, uh, me? Well, pff, I'm Matricek. Oh. Yes, well, anyhow, it all happened in my store. Practically all. That's why I'm telling it. Well, this is the story of two young people of whom I'm very fond, Clara and Martin. Clara is very attractive, yes. She's most attractive and uh, an excellent sales girl. But Martin and Clara haven't gotten on at all from the very first day she came to work for me. Professional jealousy on Martin's part because no head clerk likes to have an assistant, especially such a pretty assistant, outsell him. Miss Novak, whatever became of those musical cigarette boxes that nobody ever buys? I just sold the last one, Mr. Martin. Oh. Uh, can I show you something, madam? Uh, no, thank you. I prefer to have the young lady wait on me. Oh. Well, I've had a pretty good day. My sales come to exactly 176 kronen. Mm, my sales come to 250 kronen. Oh. Mm. Yes. You, uh, you can easily see how these little occurrences would hardly make for a beautiful friendship. But all this didn't seem very important to Martin these days. He had something else on his mind. 
Martin was living in a romantic plane, far above the everyday routine of Matuchek and company. I found that out one day when I chanced to overhear him talking with a fellow clerk named Pirovich. Nice Pirovich. Yes. What is it? It's a letter from a girl. Now listen. My heart was trembling as I walked into the post office, and there you were, lying in box 237, and I took you out of your envelope and read you. I read you right there. Oh, dear friend. What is all this? Well, you see, I, I was looking through the ads in the Sunday paper, and I got on the wrong page, and I ran across this ad. Here, here, let me show it to you, see? Modern girl wishes to correspond on cultural subjects anonymously with intelligent, sympathetic young man. Address, dear friend, Post Office 15, Box 237. Now, we've exchanged four letters, and Pirovich, she, she's no ordinary girl. Now, listen to this. Are you tall or short? Are your eyes brown? Are they blue? Now, don't tell me. What does it matter so long as our minds meet? You're right. And it I, is I, beautiful. Yes, yes. now, listen. What are men and women for but to rise above the stupid necessities of the eight-hour day? That sounds very nice, Martin, but you really should... Oh, you should. Excuse me, Pervich. Uh, Miss Novak, where do you think you're going? I'm going home, Mr. Martin. It's six o'clock. It's five minutes of six. This store does not close for another five minutes. I'm afraid, Miss Novak, that you don't take your work very seriously. Oh, don't I? No, no, and I don't like your attitude. Listen, let me tell you something. Yes, and while I think of it, I don't like the clothes you've been wearing in the store. For instance, that yellow blouse with the light green dots you had on yesterday. a green blouse with light yellow dots. Everybody else thought it was very becoming. Yes, yes. And I I don't remember that I ever remarked about your neckties. And believe me, Mr. Martin, if you think I couldn't say anything about your necktie, so I'll thank you to leave my blouse alone. It's none of your business. Well, I'm very sorry, but Mr. Matichek seems to think it is my business. Oh, yes, that's right. I'm working under you. Well, from now on, I'll telephone you every morning to describe just exactly what I'm going to wear. And before I select my next season's wardrobe, my dressmaker will submit samples for you. Imagine you dictating what I should well, wear. Well, for heaven's oh. sake, I don't care what you wear. If you want to look like a pony in the circus, all right. Listen, I sold as much goods yesterday as anybody else in the place. 197 kronen isn't bad for a rainy Friday three weeks before Christmas. Did you tell that to Mr. Matichek? I did. What did he say? He said, tell her not to come on that blouse anymore. Tell him I won't. I will. Now, come, come, come. Always fighting you do. Why don't you try to get along better? I'd like to know who could get along with a man like him. Oh, it is now exactly six o'clock, Mr. Martin. May I go? Yes, Miss Novak. Oh, thank you very much. A stubborn little female. I don't know why we were hired that girl. Now, don't get yourself all worked up. Calm down. Sure, sure. What do I care about a girl like that? I know I will get her. Uh, Tell me more about that girl you've been acting to, you know, dear friend. Hmm? Oh, 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 yeah. Oh, pure, but she's wonderful. She's... Well, you know, after a while, in our letters, we came to the subject of love. Well, naturally, on a very cultural level. What else can you do in a letter? No. <laughs> but Pirovich, she's the most marvelous girl in the world. She has such ideals, such a point of view on things. Why, she's so far above the girls you meet today, there's, there's simply no comparison. You really like her, don't you? Well, I hope I will. What do you mean? You love a girl and you don't know if you like her? That's right, Pirovich. That's just the question. You see, I, I, I haven't met her yet. You haven't? What? After all this time, I postponed it again and again. I, I'm scared, Pirovich. You see, this girl thinks I'm the most wonderful person in the world, and after all, there's a chance she might be disappointed. Yeah, I see. I see. Yeah, but tonight, I'm taking the risk. I'm meeting her tonight at 8 o'clock in a cafe. She's going to have a copy of Tolstoy's Anna Karina and a red carnation for a bookmark. Oh, I haven't slept for days. I'm sure she'll be beautiful. Well, not too beautiful. Now, what chance would there be for a fellow like me? Would you want a homely girl? No, 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 no. No, no, just a lovely average girl, that's all. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the clock in the back of my shop striking 8 p.m. And that's exactly the hour Martin was to meet dear friend for the first time at the cafe. Well, when the time came, Martin didn't feel quite so brave, so he asked Pirovich to come along to give him moral support. And even after he got there, he was afraid to go in. He stood with Pirovich in a shadow outside the front window and peered in. He wanted Pirovich to see if he could spot a girl with a red carnation for a bookmark. Uh, not yet. I, uh, oh, oh, there's a beautiful girl. Oh, really? Very beautiful 
but no book. Oh, too bad. Wait, wait, wait a minute. I think I see it. Right here under the window. Yeah. Anna Karenina by Tolstoy. And the carnation. Yes, yes. Well, what does she look like? Well, I can't see her face. She's sitting behind the clothes rack. There's a cup of coffee on the table. She's taking a piece of cake. What? She's dunking. Well, why shouldn't she? Oh, all right. Oh, well, what else, Pyrrhus? Well, how does she look? Well, I can't see her face yet. Don't, don't shove me, Martin. Uh, no, uh, she's leaning forward now. She... Well, can you see her? Yes. Is she pretty? Very pretty. She is, huh? Uh, I would say she looks... She has a little of the coloring of Clara. Clara? Well, you mean Miss Novak of the shop? Oh, Martin, you, you must admit that Clara is a good-looking girl, and, and personally, I've always found her a very likable girl. Well, this is a fine time to be talking about Miss Novak. Well, if you don't like Miss Novak, I can tell you right now, you won't like this girl. Why? Because it is Miss Novak. <laughs> well, Martin was all for turning on his heel and starting home. But his friend Pirovich pointed out that Miss Novak had written those letters. And it really wasn't fair to the girl to leave her waiting there. Much against his will, Martin finally agreed to go inside the cafe and talk to Miss Novak. Well, hello, Miss Novak. Oh, good evening, Mr. Martin. Well, as I... What a coincidence. You know, I had an appointment. I, you haven't seen Mr. Pirovich by any chance, have you? No, no, I haven't. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I guess I'll wait. Mind if I sit down? Here? Yes, I do, please. Oh, Mr. Martin, I, I have an appointment, too. Oh, oh. Yeah. Well, there's no harm just sitting here, is there? <sighs> oh, I see you're reading tall stories on a Corinna. Yes, anything against it? Oh, no, 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 I... Never expected to meet you in a cafe with Tolstoy. It's quite a surprise. I didn't know you went in for the higher literature. Right? Yes. Well, there's so many things you don't know about me, Mr. Martin. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you ever read Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky? No, I haven't. I have. Yeah. A lot of things you don't know about me, too, Miss Novak. You know, you know people, people seldom go to the trouble of scratching the surface of things to find the inward truth. Really, Mr. Martin, I wouldn't care at all to scratch your surface. Probably because I know exactly what I'd find. A handbag instead of a heart, a suitcase instead of a soul, instead of an intellect, a cigarette lighter that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's very well put. I think comparing my intellect with a cigarette lighter that doesn't work, that's, that's a very interesting mixture of poetry and meanness. Meanness? Oh, don't, 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 don't understand it. I thought I told you I was expecting somebody. Listen, listen, if your party doesn't show up, would, would oh, I... Don't worry about that, Mr. Pa uh, Martin. This party will show up. It's really not necessary for you to entertain me. Well, let me tell you something, Miss Novak. You may have beautiful thoughts, but you certainly hide them. And as far as your actions are concerned, you're cold and snippy like an old maid, and you're going to have a terrible time finding a man to fall in love with you. I, an old maid? So, no man will fall in love with me. Really, Mr. Martin, you're getting funnier every minute. Why, I could show you letters that would open your eyes. No, maybe not. You probably wouldn't understand what's in them. They're written by a type of man so far above you that it's ridiculous. Ha! Huh. I have to laugh when I think of you calling me an old maid. You, you little insignificant clerk. <laughs> So ends Act One of our first Gulf production of the season. During the brief moment before the curtain rises on Act Two, I'd like to tell you some of the many things in store for you here in the Gulf Theater. Next week, for instance, you'll meet Clark Gable, Ann Southern, and Jeffrey Lynn in the great motion picture success, Red Dust. The following week, the pair you've all been waiting for, Vivian Lee and Lawrence Olivier, in Private Lives. In future weeks, among others, you'll hear from Jack Benny, Claudette Colbert, Ernst Lubitsch, Basil Rathbone, James Cagney, Mickey Rooney, and Judy Garland. And now, I know you'd like to hear a word about the man who's really behind the Gulf Theater, your neighborhood good Gulf dealer. He hopes you'll be listening in every week. And he hopes, too, 
that you'll take advantage of all he can do to give you more miles of motoring satisfaction. He's ready with that helpful Gulf service and with those splendid Gulf products, Gulf gasolines, and Gulf motor oils. Next time you're out driving, stop in at the sign of the Gulf orange disc and meet your neighborhood good Gulf dealer. Now we return to the second chapter of our story, The Shop Around the Corner, starring Margaret Sullivan, James Stewart, Frank Morgan, Oscar Bradley's music with Frank Tours conducting. Yeah, well, thank you, Mr. Pryor. I'll take over from here. It, uh, it was a terrible blow to Martin when he looked in the window of the cafe and discovered the unknown girl he'd been writing to for so many weeks was none other than his fellow clerk, Clara. But it was more of a blow to Clara when... After Martin left, she waited two hours, and her dream prince didn't show up. She took it hard, poor child. You, uh, you know how girls are, especially the dreamer type like Clara. Why, uh, I once knew a girl before I was married that did... Yes, well, that, that's another story. I mean, another program. Uh, Clara, as I say, took it very hard. She even stayed home from work. She was so upset. Martin felt pretty bad about this, so he decided he ought to call on her, strictly in the line of duty, of course. Yes, uh, incidentally, whenever you hear that particular rapping on that particular door, ladies and gentlemen, that means Mr. Martin is calling on Miss Novak. Good evening, Miss Novak. Oh, good evening, Mr. Martin. Come in. Uh, how are you, young lady? I'm all right, Mr. Martin. Sorry I couldn't come to work. Oh, that's all right. Now, you must take care of yourself. I'm sure I'll be all right in a day or two. No, but that doesn't mean that you should neglect yourself. Now, you, you see, I feel pretty responsible for the whole thing. You? Oh, no, Mr. Martin. Oh, no, I think I can relieve your mind. It wasn't your fault at all. No, there's a much bigger reason, unfortunately. A psychological reason. But it's my personal problem, and I'll come out of it. It's just one of those things. Oh, I'm very sorry. It's really a shame that you have to go through all this. But, of course, so long as it's only psychological. Only psychological. Mr. Martin, it's true. We're in the same room, but we are not in the same planet. <laughs> Miss Nowak, I... Although I'm the victim of your remark, I, I must admire your exquisite way of expressing yourself. You uh, certainly know how to put a man in his planet. Uh... Yes, come in. Dear Clara, a special delivery letter has just come for you. Oh, really? Thank you, Aunt Anna. I hope it's good news. Uh, well, Mr. Martin, it certainly was kind of you to drop in, but I... I don't want to spoil your evening. Oh, no, it's lots of time. You go right ahead with your letter. Don't pay no attention to me. Yeah, well, if you don't mind. Oh. Well, it's good news. Uh, wonderful news, Mr. Martin. You know, if I weren't feeling so wonderful right now, I could be very mad with you. With me? Why? Why? Because you really spoiled my date the other night. I wasn't so wrong when I asked you not to sit down at my table. You see... This gentleman did come to the cafe. He looked in the window, saw us together, and he misunderstood. Oh, you mean you mean he thought you and I were friends? Yeah, he oh. must have. Listen to what he writes. Uh, tell me, who is this very attractive young man? He's he's just the type women fall for. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I caused you so much trouble. Oh, I'll straighten it out. Let him be a little jealous. We'll hurt him. Mm-hmm. Doesn't seem to be much of a man, this friend of yours. He walks away. He's afraid to come over to the table because another man's Mr. sitting there. Martin, he was not afraid, I can assure you. He's tactful. He's sensitive. He's not the kind of a man who would sit at a table uninvited. Hmm. It's difficult to explain a man like him to a man like you. Where you would say black, he would say white. Where you would say ugly, he says beautiful. Mm -hmm. And where you would say, oh, maid, he says, here, our eyes that sparkle with fire and mystery. Vivacious. Fascinating. <laughs> he says I make him think of gypsy music. 
<laughs> well, I suppose there's nothing left for me to say except that I wish you a very Merry Christmas, both of you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Well, good night, Miss Novak. Good night, Mr. Martin. <laughs> Well, Clara showed up for work all right and worked like fury. She told everybody, including Martin and me, that she had an engagement for dinner on Christmas Eve and she was all excited about it. Well, when the shop closed after a record-breaking day before Christmas, only Clara and Martin were left. Oh, uh, before you go, Miss Novak, uh, you want to see something? Hmm? Look, look, how do you like this gold locket? Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, well, why don't you try it on? I'd sort of like to see what it looks like on a girl. I didn't know you had a girlfriend. Oh, yes, yes. I, it's probably not easy for you to imagine that somebody would like a man of my type. But... Oh, Mr. Mark, don't let's start all over again. It's Christmas, and I'd like to be friends with you. Listen, do you mind if I tell you something? No, 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 no. When I first started to work here, you know, something very strange happened to me. I found myself looking at you again and again. I just couldn't take my eyes off you. Really? Mm-hmm. All the time I was saying to myself, Clara Novak, what's the matter with you? This Martin is not a particularly attractive man. I hope you don't mind. No, no, no. no. <laughs> and listen, now comes a paradox. I caught myself falling for you. I can't believe it. Yes, Mr. Martin. In those first few weeks, well, there were moments when you could have swept me off my feet. There were, huh? Yes. <laughs> Well, you see, really, I was a different girl then. I was rather naive. All my knowledge came from books, and I just read a novel about an actress who, when she wanted to arouse a man's interest, she treated him like a dog. Oh, that's true. You treated him like a dog, all right. Yes, but it, instead of licking my hand, you barked. Oh, well, well, that's all forgotten now, isn't it? <laughs> oh, well, and now you go to see your girlfriend. By the way, is it serious? Yes, yes, very. <laughs> we might... Both be engaged Monday morning. I think we will. Oh, I, I don't want you to misunderstand. In my case, I just say it might happen. You see, he's coming to my house tonight to see me. It's 8 o'clock. As a matter of fact, I can tell you that it will happen. What? How do you know? Oh, uh, we'll go into that. Mr. Martin, what do you mean it will happen? Well, I, uh, I might just as well tell you. He came to see me. Who? Well, your fiancé. He came last night. Now, you shouldn't have told him who I am. You see, I spent a very uncomfortable hour. I, he apparently didn't believe it when you wrote him that I meant nothing to you, you see. I can't get it in my head. Come in to see you. Oh, no, that doesn't sound like him at all. Oh, no, but I, I straightened everything out. It's all right. Now, don't worry. In a little while, you'll be Mrs. Popkin. Mrs. Popkin? Popkin? Wasn't that his name? Popkin? I thought that. That's what he told me. Oh, Popkin, oh, yes, yes, that, that, that's right, Popkin. And a very nice fellow, very nice. I congratulate you. Yes, thank you. I, I think he's a very attractive man, don't you? Oh, yes, oh, yes. For his type, I would say, yes, yes. <laughs> would you really classify him as a, a definite type? Absolutely. And don't you try and change him now. Don't put him on a diet, don't. Would you call him fat? Well, that's a matter of opinion. Now, if if I were a girl and had to choose between a young, good-for-nothing with lots of hair and a fine, solid, mature citizen, I'd pick Matthias Popkin every time. But he has a fine mind, don't you think? Didn't he impress you as being rather witty? Mm, well, I don't know. He, uh... It struck me as being sort of depressed, but of course it's unfair to judge a man who's out of a job. Out of a job? Why, he never told me. Well, I showed you how sensitive he is, but don't worry. Now, he feels that both of you can live very nicely on your salary. <laughs> Terrible. Oh, I'm outraged. I never dreamed he was materialistic like this. If you could read his letters, such ideals. Well, I could quote you passages. To love is, is to be two and yet one. A man, a man and, and a, a woman, woman blended as angels, heaven itself. How did you know that? That's by Victor Hugo. He stole that. <laughs> oh. oh, no. I thought I was the inspiration of all those beautiful thoughts. 
And now I find he was just copying the words out of a book. He probably didn't mean a single one of them. Oh, I'm sorry you feel this way. I, I hate to think I spoiled your Christmas. That's all right. I guess I really ought to thank you. Well, I guess I'd better be going. Oh, Clara, I... If I'd known in the beginning how you really felt about me, things would have been different. You, you know what I wish would happen? When your bell rings at 8 o'clock tonight and you open the door, instead of Popkin, I come in. It's very sweet of you to try to cheer me up. But I, I think we'd better say good night. You have an engagement. Yes, and so have I. And I shouldn't be late. <laughs> here yet, and I'll thank you not to joke about it. Clara. Clara, couldn't I take his place? Please, you're only making it more difficult for me. Oh, Clara, my darling. Oh, no, you mustn't put your arms around me. There is sweetest Clara. I, I can't stand it any longer. Please take your key. Oh, Open post office box 237 no. and take me out of my envelope. Really? And kiss you me. You mustn't. Box 237? Dear friend, about the size of it. Of course, they got married. They're very happy now, those two. <coughs> and uh, now, if you should ever need some very fine leather goods or anything of the novel design... <laughs> thank you, Margaret Sullivan, James Stewart, and Frank Morgan for a really grand performance. And thank you, too, Norman Corwin, for your swell radio adaptation. And now, on with hey, the show. Roger, you know, I... Roger. Yeah? yeah? Remember me? Oh, I'm sorry, Bud. I almost forgot to introduce you. Ladies and gentlemen, meet our new Gulf Theater announcer, Bud Heaston. Say, uh... Say, haven't I seen you in pictures, Bud? Your face familiar. Well, I, I have done some work, Jimmy. But I'm usually just the face on the cutting room floor. Oh, yes. Well, don't fret, young man. We all start that way. Uh, I can remember when I first started in pictures. <laughs> I was, yes, but that's another story. Uh, besides, it's so glamorous I can sell it. Why give it away? So uh, you want to be an actor? <laughs> I'm just the man to help you. Well, gee, that's swell, Mr. Morgan. Uh, right now, however, I'm busy learning to be an authority on gas. Gas? Well, I know enough about gas to fill a balloon. Uh, what? <laughs> well, gasolines, Mr. Morgan. <laughs> For instance, I've been finding out about the new Gulf gasolines. Good Gulf and Gulf no Knocks. And I learned that they've both been stepped up. Stepped up to give you faster pickup, more power, and a sweeter running, quieter engine. And boy, if you've never tried the new Gulf gasolines, you don't know what you're missing. See if you don't notice a real difference the very first time you step on the accelerator. If you use a regular gasoline, try Good Gulf. If you prefer a premium fuel, try Gulf No Knox, the gasoline that is not proof under all normal driving conditions. Remember, you get either one at the sign of the Gulf Orange Disc. Drive in and fill up with America's stepped up gasolines, the new Gulf gasolines. <laughs> Next week, the stars of the Gulf Theater are Clark Gable, Ann Southern, and Jeffrey Lim. What happens to them on a rubber plantation in Indochina is the dramatic story of Red Dust. We hope you'll all be listening for the Gulf Theater next week, starring Clark Gable, Ann Southern, Jeffrey Lim, 
Oscar Bradley's Gulf Orchestra with Frank Tours conducting. Until then, this is Roger Pryor saying good night, everybody, for your neighborhood good golf dealer. Barbara Sullivan is currently working in the Low Lewin production of Flotsam. James Stewart and Frank Morgan appear through the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Jimmy's latest picture is Philadelphia Story, and Frank Morgan will soon be seen in Hullabaloo. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is ChestertonRadio.com. International Silver Company presents The Silver Theater. Starring James Stewart and Jane Bryan in Misty Mountain, directed by Conrad Nagel. Brought to you on behalf of two of the greatest names in silverware, International Sterling, world-famous solid silver... And 1847, Rogers Brothers, America's finest silver plate. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Conrad Nagel welcoming you to the 17th of the new series of Silver Theater Dramatic Productions. Among the many brilliant stars to be presented in future weeks are Loretta Young, Andrea Leeds, John Garfield, Lee Tracy, Shirley Ross, and others. Today and next Sunday, we're proud to present metro goldwyn Mayer's talented James Stewart, and the gifted young Warner Brothers actress, Jane Bryan, in Misty Mountain, an original drama by Grover Jones and True Boardman. And now the lights are being dimmed and the silver curtain is rising on the first act of Misty Mountain, starring James Stewart as Rusty Lane and Jane Bryan as Mary Lou Masters. Standard Airways, Flight 9, Albuquerque to Los Angeles, leaving from gate number 2. All passengers aboard, please. Flight 9 now leaving. Did you make any changes in the flight plan, Rusty? Uh, just one. We go over Wreck City at 8,000 instead of 10,000. That way we ought to miss that headwind. Passengers all aboard? Come on, let's go. All right. Oh, boy, young man, uh, are you the pilot of this plane? Yes, ma'am. You Go ahead, Elmer, and get this started. All right. <laughs> well, you see, this is my first trip by plane, Captain, and, uh, well, it won't be too bumpy, will it? Oh, well, I don't think so, ma'am. The weather looks very good, and if I see any bumps up in the sky there, I'll just fly around them. <laughs> Well, I hope you enjoy the trip, madam. Thank you. All passengers pass the plane, though. All set, Elmer? All set. Good. Uh, Lane in standard flight nine calling the tower. We are ready to taxi for takeoff. Tower to Lane in flight nine. Go ahead. Taxi to north runway. Take off northeast to southwest. Wind is southwest 12. Okay. Did you test the radio, Elmer, both day and night frequencies? Yeah. You know, you should have been with me today. I, you know where I went? I went out to an Indian reservation. Indian reservation? Yeah. And for what? Honest, you're the get around in this guy. Did you ever take an hour off and just do nothing? Give that curiosity of yours a rest. Oh, well, I... Where's those motor sound swell since the overhaul of it? Yeah. Uh, calling the tower, lane and flight nine. We are ready for takeoff. Okay, flight nine. No traffic in area. That's all. Clearing flight nine from Albuquerque. Go ahead. Okay. You see, uh, Elmer, about those Indians, they've got this ceremony. It's something to do with the rain. It's a new version of the Lamb of Walk, only uh, you have a rattlesnake for a partner. A rattlesnake? Wheels up. Wheels up. Did you say rattlesnake? Yeah, yeah. I said rattlesnake. Thanks. I'll sit that one out. Switch to the beam, Elmer. Right. Wow. How's that? Off the ground exactly on schedule. You know, you're going to be two minutes late someday, and the sky's going to fall in or something. You're the on time in this Well, way. how else can you run an airline? Now, with everything on schedule, we can just settle down to a nice, pleasant flight. Calm and uneventful. Except, of course, for Misty Mom. Elmer, you're a mind reader. You but know? look, Rusty, some of these days, talking to that gal's going to get you in Dutch. You know the rules about communicating with private individuals on the plane's equipment? Now, will you stop, Warren? In the first place, I talked to that girl on Misty Mountain on the emergency transmitter, and the ground station is tuned to our regular equipment. And in the and second place... in the place... second place, you're just plain balmy. Balmy? What do you mean, balmy? A beautiful girl's voice comes out of nowhere. A girl I've never seen, and she talks to me not once, but a hundred times. And, I don't know, she gets to be sort of a landmark on the flight. Now, talk to her. What do you mean? Of course I'll talk to her. And what about Helen Marshall? 
Just because she's in Honolulu, you needn't... Now, nah, there's nothing to do with Helen. Well, maybe I'm wrong. But when a guy's practically engaged to the daughter of the boss and then takes a chance of losing her... Losing her? Now, look. Now, Helen's my girl. He may even get married. Huh? Mary Lou, on the other hand, is just a voice. A voice out of nowhere. And as far as I'm concerned, that's all she'll ever be. Hey, we're off the beam. You know that. We're off the beam? If anybody's off beam, it's a guy called Rusty Lane. And I'm not talking about airplanes. Now, there she is, Elmer. Good old Misty Mom. Now, rest. Now, we better report. Show that switch. Ah, uh, Lane in Standard Airways, Flight 9, calling Las Vegas. Go ahead. Las Vegas to Flight 9. Go ahead. Uh, Flight 9 over Misty Mountain at 9,000, climbing at 456. Estimate Barlow at 7,000 at 517. Go ahead. Okay, Flight 9. Now, I'm going to switch the receiver over to night frequency. Ah, uh, rest. You heard me. Now, what's, what's her call letter again? W6RX2. I don't know. Yeah, you know. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Standard Airways, Flight 9, calling W6RX2. Come in, please. Calling W6RX2. Come in. Hooray, she's not there. Now, let's forget W6RX2, back to Flight 9. Hello, Rusty. Hello, Elmer. How are you up there today? Go ahead, Flight 9. Hello, Mary Lou. All right, Elmer, now say hello. Oh, hello. Uh, don't mind him, Mary Lou. He's just his sunny disposition. Well, now, what's new on Misty Mount? How's Mother McCree, huh? Did you have her pups yet? Go on, now tell us the news. Come in. <laughs> yes, Mother McCree did have her pups. Six of them. And, Rusty, they are the cutest things you ever saw. There's nothing else new down here, though. Say, Rusty, where are you up there anyway? I'm looking out the window and I can't see. Oh, there you are. The plane just came over the top of the peak. You know, it looks as if it was made of gold with a sunset on the wings like that. How fast are you going? Go ahead. Uh, well, we're going about ground speed of 180, I guess. But now, Mary, Mary Lou, now look, there are a lot of questions I want to ask you. Now, where are you down there? Now, tell me where your house is. Are you ahead of the plane or behind or left or right? You know, I checked with the post office department and there isn't, there isn't a town on Misty Mountain, not even a village. So where do you live down there? Now, tell me. Come in. <laughs> are, you, are you sure I'm here at all? Maybe I'm just a voice with no girl to go with it. Oh, no, you're not. Hey, I, I bet I can even describe you. Now, let's see, you're, uh, and you've got... You're uh, six feet three, you've got a pug nose, three warts on your chin, bow legs, and you wear a wig. And anyway, who cares? Uh, that was Elmer. I just threw him out of the airplane. He doesn't approve of my talking to you. <laughs> he says, I'll get fired and you'll lose your license if we're caught at it. But now go on. Now tell me about you. Who are you? Now what are you doing on Missy Mountain? You'll never know. I I'm signing off now, Rusty. Seventy-three's for today. Give my love to the angels up there. Good night, Rusty. Night, Elmer. W6RX2 signing clear. All right, well, Mary Lou. Mary Lou. Mary Lou. Mary Lou. Da, 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 da. No, shut up, shut up. Uh, so she's just a voice. Yeah. Yeah. Elmer, what do you suppose she does look like? What do you care? Helen's your girl. Oh, well, sure she is. Well, that just doesn't stop a guy from being curious, does it? Oh, is that what you call it? Now pipe down. Sure, sure. Mary Lou. <laughs> Standard Airways, Flight 9, Albuquerque to Los Angeles has just arrived. Passengers now disembarking... Gate number two. Uh, Rusty, in case you're interested, we have a rove, as the grammar books say, and the passengers are out. Come on. Okay. What are you going to do tonight, Rusty? No, I don't know. Well, there's a movie in town all about pilots and airplanes. I thought we might go learn something about how it's done. Hey, you know, that's not a bad idea. You know, wouldn't it be something if real flying was like it is in the movies? You know, I can just see you, the determined hero driving his ship through a blinding storm, ceiling zero, visibility zero, brain zero. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there yeah. he is. Oh, Rusty. Yeah, hey, it's her, Rusty. Your girl, Helen. Helen? Why, well, she's in Honolulu. Rusty. But... Oh, Rusty, darling. Well, stupid, aren't you going to kiss me? Oh, well, yeah, sure. 
Hello, Helen. How are you? I'm... Hello, Mr. Marshall. Hello, Lane. I... Hello, Sloan. Oh, darling, we came back ahead of time yesterday on the clipper. Dad had business here, so I came back with him. Yes, and I have to be getting at that business. Incidentally, Lane, I have some plans for you that I think you'll find interesting. But I'll let Helen tell you about them herself. Oh, well, thanks, Mr. Marshall. Thanks. <laughs> See you both later. Yeah, me too. Well, Helen, what is this about plans? Oh, Helen? not now. First, you're taking me to dinner and later to a dance down at the beach club. And then, if you've been very attentive, perhaps I'll tell you what Dad has in mind. Are you sure you won't be too cold out here, Helen? There's a wind blows in off that ocean. No, I'm not cold. At least I wouldn't have to be. What? Yeah, well, how's that? Man? Well, for a man I've come 2,500 miles to see, you're anything but demonstrative, darling. Well, Helen, I, I, I know. I, I'm just surprised, that's all. I, it's swell to have you back. Is it, Rusty? You're my girl, aren't you? How long have you been saying just that, Rusty? Oh, I don't know. Three years, I guess. It's nearly five. Is it? Is it five? Yes. Rusty. Yeah? You want to know Dad's idea? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. You know... Standard's been planning to start regular service across the Atlantic for two years. Well, you're going east to be in charge of establishing terminal bases for the line. What, me? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, Helen, that's swell. Oh, (laughs) yes. Beginning next week, you stop being just an ordinary pilot, and you become an executive. Oh, there's no limit to what it can mean, Rusty. Probably even a vice president in a year or so. Of course, you are. Oh, Helen, wait a minute. What's that about me not being a pilot any longer? Why, of course, you do... Well, uh, you you'll still fly some, of course, mapping routes and things like that, but you won't do just humdrum flying. Oh, I won't do humdrum flying, huh? Well, darling, aren't you happy about it? Well, yeah, sure, I, I guess I am, but, uh, Helen, I, there's just something I want you to understand. I... You, you needn't say it, Rusty. I do understand. You do understand? Oh, of course, my dear. I always promised myself that the man I'd marry would be one who loved me so much that he... He just couldn't find words to tell me so. Oh, you, you promised yourself that, huh? Yes. And, and darling, this was really selfish of me, fixing this all up with Dad. Yeah? Well, you see, I wanted you to be an executive so that I, I could, I could see, see, see some, something think of you. If you think I intend to share my husband with the lady in the moon, you're mistaken. I want you down on the ground with me. You do, huh? Oh, yes, Rusty. Well, uh... There, there's an old custom when people get engaged that... Uh... Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Why, Rusty, darling, aren't you glad? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Sure, I'm glad. The curtain has just fallen on Act One of Misty Mountain with James Stewart and Jane Bryan. We'll continue with Act Two in just a few seconds. And if the men in our audience will listen very carefully during those few seconds, I think we may be able to help them solve an important problem. All right, John Conti. You know how much store your wife sets by those little extra courtesies you show her. How delighted she is at any unexpected thoughtfulness. And you know, too, how often you've wanted to bring home some little token of your affection, and, well, you've been undecided on just what to choose. Well, next time, why not take home a lovely piece of silverware? Fine silverware is always a welcome gift to a woman, and more than ever welcome when it helps to build a service not yet entirely adequate for her entertaining needs. Or, if you know that the silverware your wife has is not really very good silverware, why not choose a special occasion and give the silver theater set in 1847 Rogers Brothers' most sensational silver plate pattern, First Love. She'll be thrilled to read the distinguished name of 1847 Rogers Brothers on every lovely piece. Thrilled, too, to see the sterling-like detail of that beautiful first love pattern. And you, on your side, will be surprised to learn that you can get this gorgeous 62-piece silver plate service for only $59.75. A saving of more than $14 over open stock price. Let your silverware dealer show you this 1847 Rogers Brothers service tomorrow and tell you what easy, convenient payment terms can be arranged. For here is a gift to be enjoyed every day for years to come. The gift of America's finest silver plate, 1847 Rogers Brothers.
Once again, the lights are being dimmed and the silver curtain is rising on the concluding act of part one of Misty Mountain. Captain Rusty Lane, engaged now to Helen Marshall, daughter of the president of Standard Airways, is making his last flight but one as a regular transport pilot. High over the mountains of northern Arizona, he discusses the future with his anything but enthusiastic co-pilot, Elmer Sloan. A fine business. You sitting in an office pushing buttons while other guys fly the ships. Well, somebody's got to do the groundwork. Then somebody else ought to do it. Not the best pilot that ever pulled out of a tailspin. Oh, no, Elmer, you're vast. The trouble with you Rick is... Rick, City never... Weather Station calling all planes and area. Gathering storm, vicinity, Misty Mountain. Ceiling, 400 overcast. Visibility, 2 miles. Temperature, 36. Dew point, 35. Moderate rain. Wind, southeast, 12. Barometer, 30, 0, 8. That's all. Uh, storm over Misty Mountain. How well we'll climb up through it and go on instant. Why? But why? We could go around it and still... Well, why should we go around it? And on the other hand, why shouldn't we? What reason has a guy got for flying over Misty Mountain, who's engaged to the president's daughter and has an office all waiting for him with his name on the door? Now, shut up. Now, push that switch over to night frequency. You're going to call Mary Lou? Just never mind the questions. I gave an order. Well, you don't have to get sore about it. There. Blaine in standard flight 8 calling W6RX2. W6RX2. Come in. W6RX2 to flight 8. Hello, Rusty. How are you today? And how are you, Elmer? Come in. Well, you're certainly conversational up there. Isn't there any news? Go ahead. Uh, no, that's not much news. The weather report says it looks like bad weather down there. Is it raining? Well, how's Mother McCree and the pups? Go, go on. No, it's not raining yet, but I, I think it's going to. Jack was saying he hoped it would. Jack, who's Jack? Probably her husband. Oh, incidentally... Uh, Rusty, you sound kind of funny today. What's wrong? Oh, and I'm, I'm using my new condenser. Am I coming in clearer? Never mind about condensers. We just want... Uh, who's Jack? And what's more, who are you and where do you live down there? And I want to know these things. Now, tell me, what's the use of being so secret about it? Now, come in. I guess I'd better sign off now. Oh, oh, Rusty, if you get a dog for Christmas and you don't know where it came from, maybe it'll be one of the pups. I'll send a care of the airline. How about it? Uh, Mary, listen, I want to tell you something. You see, this is, this is my next to the last trip over. I, after my flight back day after tomorrow, I'm going to New York on a big job. So if we miss you or anything on the next trip, well, this is so long, see? And now, will you tell me something about yourself? Now, go ahead. What's the matter? Mary Lou? Mary Lou? She signed off. Oh, wait. Calling W6RX2. W6RX2, come in. She's gone, that's fine. I guess the transmitter just went on. Sure. Mm -hmm. All right, will you quit humming that tune? Okay, but why should I? A voice out of nowhere and she can stay there. That's what you said. So why should you get sore? Of all the guys. You see, Lane, there's an unusually heavy shipment of mail, so I'm going to have to send one ship through without passengers today. Now, I can't have Collins go, but I thought you might be particularly anxious to get back to Miss Marshall. What's that? Well, of course, we've heard the news. Congratulations. Oh, thanks. Well, what will it be, mail today or passengers tomorrow? Well, I guess you're right. I'd better get it over with. That is, I'll, I'll go today. Good. Of course, Sloan will be with you and your regular stewardess. So it's goodbye, Lane, and good luck in the new job. We'll try to keep the line running here without you, but it won't be very easy. Up here. Up here. Well, here she goes, Rusty. The last one. Yeah. Hey, a fine flight this is. Me being stewardess to a bunch of mailbags. Why didn't we take our regular run? Lucky couldn't wait another day to get back to his Helen. Well, now, isn't that too the bad? The stewardess quarters are in the cabin, Miss Wexler, and not in the cockpit. Do you mind? Well, excuse me, Captain Lane. I'm sorry. For a guy that's supposed to be spilling over with happiness, you've sure been doing a great imitation of a sore head. Well, it gets my goat. What does? Not knowing. Not knowing what? Let's forget it. Okay, Rusty, Sure. After all, it's your life, and if you want to stop flying, that's your business. The 
Besides, Helen's a swell girl. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Turn on the big. Good weather. Guess that storm over Misty Mountain is all blown away. Yeah, yeah, sure it has. We got clear weather all the way from now on. Nine to Las Vegas over a misty mountain at 10,000 climbing at 545. Estimate Las Vegas 704, Burbank 912. Go ahead. Okay, flight nine. Weather and traffic ahead unchanged. Okay. Now I'm going to throw that switch. The night frequency? You heard me. You mean you're going to. Th- Thank God, mine. W6RX2 calling flight nine. Rusty, is that you up there? Come in, please. No, it's Mary Lou. She's calling us. Something's wrong. Hello? Lane, Lane, Standard Flight 9, calling back W6RX2. Hello, Mary Lou, what's wrong? Come in. Rusty, please, I need help, quickly. Help me. Hey. Just above the timber line is a force patrol landing field. You can land there, but you must hurry. Please, Rusty, I, I can't explain now. Oh, hurry, please help me. Mary Lou, Mary Lou, calling W6RX2. Elmer, she's gone, and we got to get down there. You're crazy, you're carrying mail. It'd mean your job. Rusty, you can't do it. I can't do it. Well, I'm going to do it. I'll try and spot that field. We're going down. The wings off. You see that field? Is that it there? Up right. Point? But Rusty, look at it. You can't land this ship there. If that's a landing field, I'm... Wheels down. You... Oh, wheels down. Hey, what happened? Why the forced landing? Are we in any trouble? Now, never mind. You get back in that cabin and fasten your safety belt. Yeah, but I'm not. You heard me. Get back there. Crazy things, Rusty, but this tops him. Now, never mind. As soon as we're stopped, you head her into the wind and keep the motors running while I'm gone. You still don't know where she lives? Well, I spotted a house just a second ago. It looks like a forest ranger station. It must be the place. And anyway, I'll find out. And remember, whatever happens, you and Millie stay and guard this mail. You understand? Hello. Hello, home. Mary Lou? Was anyone here? Hello? All right, all right. Open up here. Well, all right, Lance. Wait a minute. Now, what do you all want? Are you aiming for to wreck the place? Lie down, dog. Hey, what? Are you Mary Lou? Who? Mary Lou. Didn't you just call for help? Say, mister, you ain't catched, are you? Now, look. Now, some girl radioed me up on that plane that she was in trouble and needed help. A girl named Mary Lou. Well, it all sounds right crazy to me. Oh, wait. Look. Is there anybody else living on this mountain? Another girl. Nary a soul. But surely... Hey, be you, quiet, you must afraid. know... What'd you call that dog? Oh, why, you... Uh... Now, now, let me in here. No, you can't. Go on, go on, be quiet, Mother McCree. Go back to your pop. I see, a ham radio transmitter. So you never heard of Mary Lou, huh? Oh, Rusty. Hey, what's the idea of the hillbilly act? Well, come on, answer me. Well, I, I was scared. I didn't really think you'd come down here. I, I tried to call you again and tell you not to, but look, you can see the transmitter's still on, but... Well, wait a minute. You mean nothing's wrong? Mm-mm. Well, what are you doing here alone? Well, my brother's the forest ranger at the station, and I visit him summers. He, he's out and out at the observation post on the peak. Oh, so you brought a transport plane down, full of mail, in the worst field and nine stages for a laugh, huh? Oh, that wasn't why, Rusty. Well, then why'd you do it? Well, I... Well, you said this was your last trip. I'm like you. I was curious. I... I wanted to see what you looked like. Oh, you wanted to see what I looked like? Oh, look, that's crazy! Look, do you realize what you've done? Mm-hmm. I may even lose my license. At least I'll be fired. Well, Rusty, I, it's my fault. Can't you tell them that? I mean, wouldn't they understand? I mean, if you told them that I was lonely and, and you were a voice out of the sky and I thought I'd never see what you looked like and I told a little lie to get you down here. And... Oh, I'm sorry, Rusty. Honest, I am. Well, quit <laughs> crying about it. Yeah. Well, I said quit it. Now, what, do I have to shake some sense into you? Well, I guess somebody ought to. I... Oh, Rusty. Well, I... Hey. Hey, Mary Lou. Hey, you know, you look just like I thought you did. Do I, Rusty? Yeah. Well, this is amazing. Your eyes and your hair and your lips. Why, you're... Mary Lou. Rusty. Rusty, you, you well, did... Why did I do that? kiss you. I ought to choke you. Look, I have to get out of here. Well, wait, Rusty, will you come back or write to me? Never mind Just about that. The... Never mind about that. I got a mail plane oh, waiting. Oh, wait a minute. I'm coming to see you off. Oh, oh, oh. 
Rusty, what was it? Was Mary Lou? Oh, you're Mary Lou. Yes. And you're Elmer. Say, what is all Now, never mind all the questions. Let's get going, Elmer. We've got to make up for lost time. Come on. Come on, Mother McCray. Come on, get out of here. Get out of that plane now. Come Millie, on. get that dog out of here. Will I? Come on, dog. Oh, wait a minute. I'll help you. Mother McCray, now, come on. Get up. Give it to me. Give it to me. I've gone. i the door open. Come on, Elmer. Now, let's get started. What was it all about, Rusty? Why did you... Now, just never mind. Now, there. That dog's on the ground finally. Okay, now, let's go. Just sit there looking like something that blew out of a volcano. Why did she do that? Well, she was curious. Curious. So she hauled the plane down on the side of a mountain. Well, who wasn't curious? Boy, she was all right for looks, though, wasn't she? Crazy little quarter wet. I got a mind to t- I think, as a matter of fact, I will tell her. Here, push that switch. You're going to talk to her again? Say, I'm going to talk to her. Yeah. Flight 9 calling W6RX2. Calling W6RX2 and come in quick. Oh, W6RX2, back to flight nine. Hello, Rusty. Elma, come back for me. Rusty, it's Millie. Millie! That dog! When I took it out of the plane, the girl got in and slammed the door. She's up there with you now. Hey, Rusty, can a guy be drunk without having had anything to drink? Look, just never mind. Fly this airplane for a minute. Uh, hello, Rusty. Look, I... What are you doing here? Well, I came along to help. To help? Mm-hmm. You said you were in serious trouble, and it's really all my fault, so I came along to fix it. I- I'll explain everything to your boss. Oh, you came along to fix it. Well, now, that's... Oh, that's wonderful. Look, I'm an hour late with a ship full of mail. I made an unscheduled landing on a, an unmarked field because I broke regulations talking to a private party on a plane transmitter, and now I'm going to land in Burbank with an unregistered passenger and without my stewardess. Help me. Look, you're going to send me to Leavenworth. And here's another happy little thought, Mr. Ex-Vice President-to-be. There'll be a reception committee waiting for you at Burbank, and the whole committee's name is Helen Marshall. Yes, my boy, I'd say it was definitely going to be a happy landing. This is Conrad Nagel again, ladies and gentlemen. We hope you've so thoroughly enjoyed this first episode of Misty Misty Mountain, starring James Stewart and James Bryan, that you look forward eagerly to next Sunday night when you can hear its thrilling climax. And there's another thought we'd like you to carry away from the Silver Theater tonight. A thought that goes back to the days of our colonial forefathers, many of whom were silversmiths of remarkable skill. If you've ever seen any early American silver, you'll remember it as simple and yet extraordinarily beautiful. And I think it's interesting to know that many of the most exquisite solid silver patterns created today, international sterling patterns, adhere to many of the same principles of faultless design and painstaking artistry which characterized the silver fashion by colonial craftsmen. Because of modern improved methods of silversmithing, today's solid silver is within the reach of nearly everyone. For instance, just listen to how easily you yourself can start a solid silver service. Ladies and gentlemen, you can get one of International Sterling's lovely me-to-you sets. A place setting for one person. Six lustrous pieces of genuine silver for only $16.75. Your silverware dealer can show you one of these sets tomorrow, so be sure to visit him and see it. He'll be glad to explain the budget payment plan for larger, complete services while you're there. And you'll be glad to learn how easily you can own solid silver as beautiful as any the world has ever created. International Sterling Silver. James Stewart will soon be seen with Joan Crawford in the Metro Golden Mayor production Ice Follies of 1939. And Jane Bryan's forthcoming Warner Brothers picture is Hero for a Day. Next week, Silver Theater presents James Stewart and Jane Bryan in the second and concluding episode of Misty Mountain by Grover Jones and Drew Borton. Conrad Nagel will direct, and of course, there will be more original music scored and conducted by Felix Mills. In the meantime, if you want solid silver, you want international sterling. If you want silver plate, you want 1847 Rogers Brothers both proudly created by International Silver Company. 
All incidents and characters in today's drama were entirely fictitious. Silver Theater originates at Columbia Square in Holly. John Conti speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at chestertonradio.com. International Silver Company presents The Silver Theater. Starring James Stewart and Jane Bryan in Misty Mountain, directed by Conrad Nagel. Brought to you in behalf of two of the greatest names in silverware, International Sterling, world-famous solid silver, and 1847 Rogers Brothers, America's finest silver plate. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Conrad Nagel, welcoming you to the 18th of the new series of Silver Theater Dramatic Productions. Before the curtain rises on today's concluding episode of Misty Mountain, I want to take just a moment in which to tell you that next Sunday we shall welcome lovely Loretta Young to our Silver Theater, and that stories are already being chosen for such splendid performers as Andrea Leeds, John Garfield, Lee Tracy, Shirley Ross, and many others who are to appear on our stage in the very near future. <laughs> And now the lights are being dimmed and the silver curtain is rising on the second and concluding episode of Misty Mountain, an original drama by Grover Jones and True Boardman, starring James Stewart as Rusty Lane and Jane Bryan as Mary Lou Masters, with John Gibson as Rusty's co-pilot, Elmer Sloan. Plane in standard flight nine to Burbank Tower. Flight nine over Newhall at 524 at 4500 descending. Estimate Burbank at 529. Go ahead. Okay, flight nine. Come on in. No additional traffic in area. Field is clear. Bozeman 3010. Wind southeast 12. Land northwest to southeast. Okay. Hey, they still haven't said anything about us being late. Don't worry, they will. Rusty, when are we going to tell them? The truth. That's what we're going to tell him. I'm going right straight to Mr. Marshall. This is an airline. You can't run it on a bunch of lies. But what about your big new job? Vice president and all that. And Helen Marshall. She'll be plenty sore if she finds you've been talking by radio all the time to some other girl. She might even break off the engagement. Well, Helen will just have to get over it, that's all. Well, maybe you're right. Telling the truth will be kind of tough on Mary Lou, that's all. What are you talking about, tough on Mary Lou? Well, after all, this plane's carrying mail, Rusty. And when Mary Lou radioed up for help and got you to go down on the mountain to help her, well, maybe it was just a gag to her. She wanted to see what you looked like. But it wouldn't be a joke to the government delaying the mails and all that. Hey, I never thought of that. But we can't let that kid get in bad over this. Here, take the controls. Oh, hello, Rusty. Hey, Mary Lou, now look. Hey, what's the word? You've been crying. No, no, I haven't. I'm... I, I'm just scared. I didn't mean to get you into trouble. Honest, Rusty. Now, just never mind that. Now, we'll be landed in a minute. And I want you to act just like you were a passenger. You understand? Get out of the plane, go to the airport lunch room. I'll come there and meet you later. Yeah, but Rusty, I want to explain to your boss and make him understand that this was all my fault, that you only made that landing on Misty Mountain because... because I lied, because Now, I... the reason doesn't matter. I broke regulations. Every time I talked to you on the radio, I was breaking them. Then why did you do it, Rusty? Why? Well, because... Because why? I just because I haven't got any good sense about some things. That's all. Like uh, when you kissed me. There was no sense to that either, was no. there? No. Now look. Now we're almost over the field. Oh, Rusty, I'm scared. G can't we just keep on flying and not land at all? Well, don't talk nonsense. Now remember to keep quiet. Now fasten your safety belt. We're going down. Well, all right, Rusty. I hope everything. Yeah. All set, Rusty. The tower just gave us the go ahead. Okay, I'll take her. Wheels down. Wheels down. Can't we keep on flying and not land at all? A little dope. What'd you say? Hmm? Nothing, nothing. Maybe I'm wrong. Mary Lou. All right, well, we Mary quit singing Lou. that song. Okay, okay. Well, what's the score? Do we tell or what? I'm doing the talking to Marshall himself. I don't know how, but I'm going to find some way to leave Mary Lou out of it. You keep her out of the way and see she doesn't talk. Okay, Mr. Galahad of the Airways. 
But for a guy who's engaged to another gal, you're sure taking a lot of chances to keep that kid in the clear. Now, shut up. Come on. Let's get it over with. Oh, Rusty. Elmer. Hello, Mary Lou. Oh, Rusty, what's going to happen? Now, never mind. Just remember what I told you, Mary Lou. Keep quiet. Hello, Rusty. Elmer. Hello, George. A little late, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Here's the manifest in that mail. Thanks. Oh, uh, you're carrying a passenger. I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. Come on, Elmer. Passenger's this way, miss. Oh, uh, thank you. Rusty, I'll bet we could get away with it. Yeah. Now, Mary Lou, you and Elmer go into the lunchroom. I'll check in and meet you there. All right. Come on, Elmer. I'm coming. See you later, Brother Galahad. That is, I hope I will. Elmer, why is Rusty so long? If he's just filing reports oh, like you said, Elmer. Elmer. So you did arrive. Hey, Helen. I phoned a half hour ago. They said flight nine was delayed. Uh, yes, we, we got sort of held up. Oh. Oh, uh, this is uh, Mary Lou, Helen. Miss Marshall, Miss... Miss Masters. Oh, how do you do? Mm -hmm. How do you do? Oh, where's Rusty, Elmer? Do you know? Yeah, in your father's office. In your father's office? But, Elmer, you told me Rusty was... Oh, then you know Rusty, too, Miss Masters. She just met him once. You'll find him in there now, I think, Helen. Oh, fine. Well, thank you. I'll see you again, Miss Masters. Elmer, you lied to me. You said everything was all right, but if Rusty's in the boss's office... Okay, so I lied to you. But Rusty wants it that way. But what will they do to him? Ground him, I guess. Take away his license. Oh, but Elmer, they can't ground Rusty. Fly Why, flying is his whole life. We we've got to stop them. We've got to go in there now and tell the truth. No, you don't, Mary Lou. You see, Rusty wants to tell this in his own way, so that it keeps you in the clear. You mean he's he's taking a chance of losing his license be because of me? That's about it, I guess. Oh, Elmer. Then he I mean th that but he But look, that... Mary Lou, there's something else that you don't understand. Elmer. Elmer, even if I can't talk to Mr. Marshall, there's another way I can help Rusty. That steward is. I'll phone my brother. You know, he's the forest ranger on Misty Mountain. And he can drive it to the station so she can back, get back here sooner. Oh, where's the phone? A uh, phone uh, right through the archway there. Hey, wait, have you got some money? I'm all right. Wait for me. Yes, miss. Something I can do for you? Mr. Marshall's office. Can you tell me where it is? Mr. Marshall? Why, yes. That door over there. But unless you've got an appointment... Well, thank you. Oh, well, Miss Master, where are they? I've got to see your father, Miss Marshall. He, he must understand that it wasn't Rusty's fault. Well, what wasn't Rusty? Oh, so it wasn't his fault. Well, I suppose you explain all this to me, Miss Masters. If it concerns my father, he'll usually listen to me more quickly than to someone else. Oh, will you help? You see, Rusty would never have made that emergency landing if I hadn't lied to him. The emergency... Oh, well, yes, of course. Uh, you've known Rusty for a long time, then. Oh, no, I've never seen him till today. It was just by radio. By radio? It's by a ham transmitter. You see, I've got one up at my brother's place on Misty Mountain. I'm alone a lot, and, well, I, I just got in the habit of talking to Rusty every time he flew over. Oh, I see. And then when Rusty said it was his last trip over the mountain and that he was leaving to go east on a big job, well, well, it was crazy, I guess, but he'd always been just a, a voice up in the sky, and I wanted him to be more than that. I had to see him just once anyway. Oh, no, So I radioed him that I was in danger and needed help. And he landed. Of course, of course, when he found out why I'd done it, he was awfully mad. That is, except for a moment or so. And, and he rushed back to the plane to take off again. But I knew it would help him if I came and told the truth. So I came along. I had to. You understand that, don't you? Yes. Yes, I do understand, Miss Masters. And I want you to know that I appreciate what you've done. You... Appreciate? Yes. You see, I wouldn't want that. Lane, furthermore, I want to... Oh, hello, Helen, dear. Hello. Oh, Mary Lou. What... Oh, hello, Rusty, darling. Oh, uh, Dad, uh, this is Miss Masters, uh, an acquaintance of Rusty's. How do you do, Miss Masters? Oh, how well, do you... Helen, all our worry about Rusty was unnecessary. He's been telling me why he was delayed. Oh, yes? What was the reason? Well, thought he'd gotten a distress signal from some forest range station, so he made an emergency landing. Turned out to be a mistake. But then on the takeoff, the stewardess somehow was left behind. Well, it all sounds almost unbelievable, doesn't it, Miss Masters? Why, uh... uh look, Mr. Marshall... Now, let's I... not discuss it further. Right now, there are other things to consider. Oh, yes. Have you told Rusty the news, Dad? Well, I thought you'd want to. <laughs> and of course, you know about these two, Miss Masters. Why, I... Uh, look, I think we... Your executive appointment, Rusty. Dad says it can be official now. 
From now on, you'll spend your working days on the ground. Yes, Lane. We start to work on the transatlantic service at once. In fact, we leave for New York in about three days. We? Yes. You, Helen, myself, and whatever co-pilot you wish to select. Uh, we'll go on my private ship. Oh, and incidentally, Rusty, Dad says that we can be married just as soon as we arrive in New York. After all, I see no purpose in further delay. Oh, dear Dad. That's what he says now, but you've no idea what a time I had to get him even to agree to our engagement, Miss Masters. Yes, I... I can imagine... Well, if you'll all excuse me, I, I'd better be going. Oh, so soon. I have to be getting home, and it's quite a ways. I'm so happy to have met you all. And good luck on your trip to New York. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Miss McMasters. Goodbye. Goodbye. Mary Lou. Hey, wait a minute. Well, what's got into that young man? Oh, it's nothing at all, Dad. He'll be back. And soon. I'm sure of it. <laughs> my train. Thank you for coming to the station with me, but you needn't have bothered. Now, look, Mary Lou, for the 40th time, what did you and Helen say to each other? Now, why this sudden rush home? <laughs> why not? The whole thing was just a lark, and now it's ended. What was a lark? Well, all of it. Talking to you up there in the sky, and getting you to come down a misty mountain, and then riding out here in the plane. <laughs> I've never had such fun. Fun? And now that everything's straightened out, I'm, I'm glad for you, Rusty. You'll be happy in your new job and all. You know, you know, there's some people that, well, that just belong in the sky and others that should be on the ground. <laughs> Joke is, I had you all wrong. I thought you were one of the up in the sky ones. You did, huh? <laughs> but I'm cured of talking to airplanes from now on. I guess I'll have to stick to Boris. Boris? Well, who's Boris? Oh, he's a fellow in Russia. I pick him up on 34 meters about 10 in the morning. <laughs> he doesn't speak any English, and I don't speak any Russian. We have a swell time not understanding each other. What? Well, my train's leaving. Oh, Mary Lou, wait just a minute. Won't you please? Goodbye, Rusty. It's been fun being crazy for a while. Goodbye, Rusty. Good luck. Mary Lou. Mary Lou. Mary Lou. Ladies and gentlemen, before we continue with the rest of tonight's entertainment, may I say just a few words about the entertaining you do? It so often happens, you know, that a man's business success depends a lot on his wife's success as a hostess. And the more important your husband's position, the more social obligations for you. More dinners, buffet suppers, occasions when your silverware is sparklingly on parade. And naturally, you'll be a more poised and gracious hostess if you know that silverware is beautiful and correct. So may I suggest international sterling silver? International sterling is solid silver through and through. Its patterns exquisite in every detail. And radiant with a mellow luster that is given to sterling silver only by silversmiths devoted to their craft. What's more, you can own this lovely solid silver far more easily than you imagine. And here's the man to prove it to you. John Conti. Ladies and gentlemen, you can now get a place setting for one person. Six lustrous pieces of solid silver created in international sterling's exquisite enchantress pattern for only $16.75. Visit your silverware dealer tomorrow, Monday, and talk with him about it. See the other beautiful international sterling patterns while you're there and learn firsthand how very easily indeed you too can own silver that's a lifetime treasure. Solid silver by International Sterling. Once again, the lights are being dimmed and the silver curtain is rising on the concluding act of Misty Mountain, starring James Stewart and Jane Bryan. Two days have passed since Mary Lou went off to rejoin her brother Jack in the lonely forest ranger station on Misty Mountain. And meanwhile, Rusty is the center of intensive activity preparatory to leaving the West Coast for New York. But a change has come over Rusty. A change he can't understand himself. Look, 
rusty boy. Will you please get Mary Lou off your mind? You're engaged, remember? To Helen Marshall. And you're taking her to a banquet in half an hour. You gotta get ready. I'm not going. But you gotta go, Rusty. The whole party's a send-off for you and Helen. You can't get out of it. All right, all right. I heard you, and I'll go. I, I'm an executive now. I gotta go. That's where big business is done, over a banquet table. Sure, sure, I'll go. And Captain Lane has very definite plans for the route, haven't you, dear? What was that? I said, you have the new route across the Atlantic all laid out. You're just looking for the right flyer to try it out. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. A flyer. That's what I need. One of those up in the sky ones, not an on-the-grounder like me. That kind wouldn't do, would it? Well, Rusty, darling, what on earth are you talking about? How about a statement for the press before you leave, Captain Lane? Is it true you and Miss Marshall are getting married as soon as you reach New York? Sure. Sure, it's true. Why shouldn't I marry? We're engaged, aren't we? The Lane and Marshall Spatial. We're ready to take off. Okay, Lane. Field is clear. No traffic in area. Take off north to south. Wind south 22. And here's a special weather report. Storm area is still holding in the vicinity of Rex City and moving southward toward Barlow and Misty Mountain. That's all. Go ahead. Okay. Wait a minute, Rusty. What? Sure you want to do it through a storm and all? What are you talking about? You. You're not the Rusty Lane I've flown with 300 times. Something's happened. I don't know what, or maybe I do, but it's none of my business and I don't care either for myself. But Helen and Mr. Marshall are back there in the cabin. They've got a right to be piloted by a guy who still hasn't cracked up somehow inside himself. How'd you like to shut up? Don't do it, Rusty. You're not yourself. You know you're not. Please, Rusty. I said to shut up. We're taking off. Keep your hands off these controls. I'll pilot this plane and I'll do it alone. Your play. I put the red jack on the black queen. Oh, I'm I'm sorry, Jack. I look, let's not play anymore, hmm? Huh? Okay. Oh, now look here, sis. I didn't ball you out for that plane business in the stowaway act. Only now that it's all over, you gotta snap out of it. For your own sake. I know. You're right, and I have, Jack. I'm I'm, I'm just upset tonight somehow. Maybe it's the storm, and maybe I'm Oh, sure, sis, I know. Hey, look, sis, if this lame fellow has done anything to make you unhappy, well, I'm... Oh, but he hasn't. As a matter of fact, he was grand to me. He's he's just engaged to someone else, that's all. Uh, I see. I'm sorry, kid. Oh, Jack, it is so crazy. A man I only saw once in my life. Oh, that doesn't make any difference, Mary Lou. We can't decide things like that. (laughs) They sort of get decided for us. Yes, I, I guess they do. Oh, and Jack. Uh-huh. Wait. Well, what's the idea of locking the radio room? Well, you keep this key, will you? And don't give it back to me. <laughs> okay, sis. You're the doctor. Okay, why shouldn't it be? The weather's getting worse all the time and we're losing the beam. Well, suppose we are. A flat without the beam. Well, shut up and leave me alone, will you? Now, look, Rusty, don't get sore, but we're mushing and losing altitude. Look at that altimeter, 8,600. Well, I can't go any higher. We're icing up. We'll have to go under the weather. Go under the weather? We're still in the mountains and you knew it. And San Carlo Ridge is nearly 10,000, and in this weather we could crash into it before we saw it. Hey, hey, the beam, it's gone completely now. All right, let it go. Rusty, you can't talk like that in a storm like this. It... Now, let any, any way it's clear in here, you see? Rusty, Watch, it's look clear. out there ahead, the ridge. Now, Rusty, now bang, now bang. Hold on. Oh, well, the 
That's one way to see a mountain. Look, Rusty. You gotta get back on course. You've got to. I can't. I've tried to get on course. I can't. Well, then where are we? I don't know. I don't know. I'm lost, Elmer. Do you get that? Do you get that? 200 flights on this run and Rusty Lane's lost. I'm lost. I'm lost. That's funny. What are you going to do? Do? I don't know. I don't know. I just keep flying. So we get somewhere or nowhere. I... Who cares? I wish she could okay. see you now. Oh, Helen? Oh, she was... No, no, not Helen. Mary Lou. The girl who thought you really belonged up in the sky. The girl who broke her heart when she found out you weren't going to stay there. The girl down there somewhere on Misty Mountain who right Elmer. now is... Elmer. Elmer, that's it. That emergency transmitter. Switch it on. What do you mean? Mary Lou? She won't be listening. I Why said should switch she... it on. Hurry. Okay, okay. Lane. Lane calling W6RX2. W6RX2. Mary Lou, come in, please, and hurry. Hurry. W6RX2, come in. Going to bed. I did, but I, I just couldn't sleep. Oh, Jack, oh, I... Oh, now, look here, sis. You've got to quit this after all. I, a I know it's crazy, just like all the rest of it, but, Jack, I'm not feeling sorry for myself or anything like that. It, it, it's something else, something I, I can't describe. I don't know. I... <laughs> but I do know. Jack. Jack, the key... The key? To the radio room. Give it to oh, me. Oh, but Mary Lou, you said no, you I don't care what I said. Look, please give me that key. W6RX2. 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 Come in. Come in. You gotta give up, Rusty. There's not enough gas to keep on like this. Better go down again and take a chance on finding a landing. You can't... I know what I'm doing. Maybe I didn't before, but I know now. Plane calling W6RX2, calling W6RX2. Come in, Mary Lou, come in, please. I tell you, if she was there, she'd have answered long ago. You're going bats if you keep it up. W6RX2, Rusty Lane calling W6RX2. Come in. Will you quit it, Rusty? I tell you, she... W6RX2 calling Rusty Lane. W6RX2 calling Rusty Lane. I'm standing by. Come in. Mary Lou, Mary Lou, we're up here somewhere in the storm. I think I'm north of Misty Mountain near San Carlo Ridge, but I've got to make sure... Now, I think you can guide us on our course again. Do you understand? Come in. Yes, Rusty, but how can I? It's storming here, too, and I can't see a thing. Go ahead. You're not going to see. You're going to hear us. Now, I'm going to turn south and try and find Misty Mountain. Now, you've got to let me know when I'm overhead. So listen for us, and when you hear our motor call back, come in. All right, Rusty, I understand. Come in. All right, Mary Lou, I'm standing by. I'm turning south. Jack, do you hear him? No, sis, not yet. He may have been a long ways off the course. Have him keep coming. W6RX2 calling Rusty Lane. Calling Rusty Lane. Come in. Go ahead, W6RX2. We still can't hear you playing, Rusty. But don't, don't be afraid, darling. You can't be. Because you do belong up there. I, I lied when I said you didn't. You're an up-in-the-sky man, Rusty. The sky can't beat you. I know it can't. Hey, Mary Lou. Sis, Listen. I'm going to turn off for a moment so I can hear you. But stand by, Rusty. Hey, Lou! There they are! Just over northwest of us. Have them turn southeast and be right over here. Rusty! Rusty, now you're northwest of us. Turn southeast! Southeast, Rusty! Now, Rusty, you're overhead. I can hear you. Turn east and you're on your course. Yes, what does he say? Hey, do that so I can talk back to you. Throw the switch. Sis, what's wrong with you? I can't. I, I can't let him call back. What is there for him to say? He's on his course and says he can mess up. Oh, yes, sis, but listen. W6RX2 to Rusty Lane. Goodbye, Rusty. Goodbye and happy landing. W6RX2 signing clear. <laughs> Come 
coming with me? Uh, hey, what is this? <laughs> Seems to me only a couple of days ago you were through with radio for life. Well, this doesn't count. I'm talking to Boris. Who? Oh, oh, that fellow in Russia. Oh, oh, thanks. I won't have some. W6RX2 calling UX24Y. Calling UX24Y in Moscow. Calling UX24Y. Come in. Uh, you, uh, uh, hello. W6RX2. This is, uh, Boris, uh, Nichibok, uh, covers more than America. Go ahead. Boris? Boris, is that you? Come in. Yeah, sure it's... Oh, sure it's... Uh, look, uh, I lost my accent. Come in. Rusty. Rusty, where, where are you? Go ahead. Now, never mind that. Now, listen. Standard Airways is going to start its transatlantic service without Rusty Lane, and Helen Marshall has sailed to Europe to find herself a count. Now, what I want you to tell me is this. What's a guy called Rusty Lane who belongs in the sky going to do? Now, come in. Well, I don't know, Rusty. What is he going to do? Well, he's going to land on Misty Mountain and kidnap a gal named Mary Lou, and if she won't promise to marry him at Las Vegas this afternoon, he's going to throw her overboard without a parachute. Well, how about it? Oh, yeah, I forgot. I love you. Come in. <laughs> and I love you, Rusty. I do love you. That's all I want to know. I'll be right down. Nagel again, ladies and gentlemen. I know you're all eager to have our stars, James Stewart and Jane Bryan, come back and say a personal word, and they will be back in just a moment. First, however, I'd like to ask you to take a quick look back with me to a day 91 years ago in a little tree-shaded town of Connecticut, where three brothers were creating silver plate of surpassing beauty and craftsmanship. Those three brothers were founders of the house of 1847 Rogers Brothers. 91 years ago, their name was little known outside their own small New England town. Today, 1847 Rogers Brothers is the most important name in American silver plate. Many of you have cherished this silver plate in your homes for years and need no words of mine to convince you of its beauty and quality. To those of you who are not familiar with 1847 Rogers Brothers silver plate, here is a man with a special invitation for you. John Conti. It's an invitation from your silverware dealer, ladies and gentlemen. An invitation to visit him tomorrow and see the magnificent 62-piece service of 1847 Rogers Brothers Silver Plate, which can be yours for only $59.75. A saving of more than $14 over open stock price. You can get this service in many different patterns, including the sensational first love pattern. You'll be surprised and delighted, too, to learn what easy, convenient payment terms can be arranged. For this is indeed the time to get America's finest silver plate, 1847 Rogers Brothers Silver Plate, at savings beyond your dreams. And now back to Conrad Nagel, who is leading our stars out in front of the silver curtain so that they meet, may meet you in person. And here they are, James Stewart and Jane Bryan. Well, Jimmy and Jane, suppose you tell us something about yourselves. You, Jane, I understand you just finished Hero for a Day at Warner Brothers. Yes, that's right, Conrad. And you, Jimmy, how are you coming along with your flying? Oh, swell. I've got quite a few hours in the air, and it's a lot of fun. That's why I got a great kick out of playing pilot Rusty Lane. Ever been grounded? Grounded? Uh, well, I uh, just finished Ice Fallers of 1939 from Metro Golden Mare, and I was grounded plenty in those skating scenes. I, uh... <laughs> Had to take the de-icer off my plane and wear it in my pants for two weeks. <laughs> well, maybe this will take your mind off all those spills. You know, we're thinking of having a nice silver medal struck off for you. Well, that's wonderful for, for piloting. No, for endurance. Endurance? Well, how come? Well, Jimmy, you hold an all-time record for stars who've made silver theater appearances. You've chalked up eight broadcasts. Oh, that's grand, isn't it, Jimmy? Uh, <clears throat> any chance of me piling up a record like that, Conrad? Well, we'd love to have you, Jane. But I won't be satisfied with a silver medal when I do. No? No, I'm going to hold out for a complete set of that lovely first love pattern I've been hearing about. Well, we'll try to do something about that. 
Now, I'm sorry to say that our time is about up, and I'm afraid uh, that we... Just one more thing, Conrad. I want to get in a quick thanks for Johnny Gibson's work as Elmer, my co-pilot in today's show. That guy's terrific. And thank the rest of the cast for us, too, will you, Conrad? I'll do that gladly. Thanks a million, James Stewart and Jane Bryan. We hope you'll be back soon. <laughs> Next week, Silver Theater presents Loretta Young in another original radio play by Grover Jones and True Boardman. Conrad Nagel will direct, and of course, there'll be more original music scored and conducted by Felix Mills. In the meantime, if you want solid silver, you want international sterling. If you want silver plate, you want 1847 Rogers Brothers, both proudly created by International Silver Company. All incidents and characters in today's drama were entirely fictitious. Silver Theater originates at Columbia Square in Hollywood. John Conti speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com. For almost two centuries, Americans have enjoyed the valuable privileges of freedom. Now, freedom needs each American to dedicate himself to its preservation. We must not allow our liberties to be endangered by neglect of our duties as citizens. During this year of rededication, join with your fellow Americans in reaffirming the principles on which this country is founded and the safeguarding of those principles. Make it your business to see that federal, state, and local governments are conducted honestly. Help to maintain the good morale of your sons and daughters in the armed forces. Learn the facts about all candidates and issues. Then, vote for the one you believe in. Make the most of every minute on your job. Produce as much as you can, and thus increase our military and economic strength. Work for better schools and a better community. Guard your American heritage of freedom. It needs you. You are listening to Chesterton Radio at ChestertonRadio.com. In a moment, you'll hear James Stewart as the Six Shooter, just one of many fine programs brought to you each week on NBC. Tomorrow night, there's top comedy entertainment with the Bob Hope Show, the Phil Harris, Alice Faye Show, and Can You Top This with Senator Ford. Bob Hope delivers rapid-fire comedy routines while Phil Harris and Alice Faye bring both mirth and music. It's a great Friday night lineup of comedy programs, all of them heard only on NBC. James Stewart as the Sick Shooter. saddle is angular and long-legged. His skin is sun-dyed brown. The gun in his holster is gray steel and rainbow mother of pearl. Its handle, unmarked. People call them both the Six Shooter. The NBC Radio Network presents James Stewart as the Six Shooter. A transcribed series of radio dramas based on the life of Britt Ponsett, the Texas plainsman who wandered through the Western territories, leaving behind a trail of still remembered legends. a Tuesday evening choir practice and quite a spell, but when Reverend Broom stopped by the Tropical Ranch where I was working and asked me if I could manage to take part in this week's rehearsal, well, I sure couldn't see how to do any harm, so I... Bringing in the sheaves, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Anyhow, there we are. About ten of us all gathered around. 
John Farley's general store it was. You see, the town of Easter Quick didn't have a regular church building yet. They held their services and social affairs in the mercantile while they went ahead trying to raise money to put up a community church. It, it was during the second verse of bringing in the sheaves that things started sounding a little peculiar, sort of like the voices and the music were sort of traveling different trails. At first, I thought it was me. I never had been exactly what you'd call melodious, but uh, then the other folks were beginning to have their troubles, too. And it, Holy smokes, it just was getting terrible. And finally, Mrs. Peebles, she, she was the organist. She just threw up her hands and stopped even trying to play. I can't go on, Mrs. Broome. I simply can't. No, no, Elvira. Heaven knows I tried. I've done my best. But this organ just won't play anymore. Well, we'll have Mr. Farley take another look at it, Elvira. I'm sure he'll be able to get it back oh, into shape. There's nothing Mr. Farley can do. Or anybody else. It's plain wore out. You can't expect a thing to last forever. Oh, no, no, of course Seems not. Seems to me but... that after all this time, something could have been done about buying a new organ. When I donated this one to the congregation, I didn't suppose I'd have to go on playing it all the rest of my life. But apparently that's what's expected. No, of no, me. there's no need to upset yourself, Elvira. Well, I can't help being upset. I, I say I can't help it. How do you think I feel every Sunday? All those sour notes and that wheezing and whining. Folks are beginning to think that it's me, that it's my plan. Oh, no, 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 no. Well, I've been humiliated for the last time, and I won't go through it again. No, but, but, but Elvira, we got to have music for Easter services. Oh, music? Well, you certainly don't call that music, do you? Good night, Reverend Bruce. Oh, somebody get us back. Yeah. All right, everybody. Give me your attention, please. Attention, folks. Quiet down now, please. Quiet down. It appears that matters have come to a serious crisis. It's bad enough for a town by the name of Easter Creek not to have a proper building for Easter services. But to be without an organ and an organist. Well, it's a disgrace, a positive disgrace. No, now we mustn't blame Miss Peebles. That instrument has seen its best days. There's no doubt about it. So I propose that we take immediate steps to purchase a replacement. Just, just one thing, Reverend Boom. Yes, sir. Where's the money coming from? Well, uh... Now, I've given that matter serious thought, Sheriff Appleton, and there seems to be only one possible solution to the problem. We'll just have to borrow from the building fund. Yeah, 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 uh, that's yeah. sort of like robbing Peter to pay Paul, isn't it? No, no, not exactly, not exactly. Seeing as how we haven't reached our thousand-dollar goal anyway, well, the uh, money's just sort of lying there. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't know about that. Uh, just how much do you figure a new organ will cost, Reverend Bruce? Well, I've done some investigating in the field, Mrs. Appleton. Last month, when Elvira's foot went through the pump pedal, it seemed like the situation was coming to head. The church over to Whitefield purchased a new organ just last Christmas, and uh, they're willing to sell us their old one. Uh, it's used, of course, but it's still in excellent repair. And they're only asking $95. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm afraid that's a bit more than we can afford, Reverend. Oh, we must have at least $95 in the building fund. We've been putting money aside for the last year. No, no, we ain't. We got forty two fifty. That's the total. Up to and including $3.65 from the Cake Bazaar a month ago. $42.50? Yep. Oh, I just had no idea. I was... We're certain. shy over $50 from what it would take to buy the organ. And there just isn't any way we could raise it. Not between now and Easter. Now, now, now. We mustn't give up. After all, we only need um, the $50. Uh, $52.50. Yeah, yes, exactly. Well, let's see. There was just someone who could take a firm grip of the situation. A, a man who... Mr. Ponson. Uh, yes, yes, Robert. Uh, uh, Mr. Ponson, I know you aren't a regular member of our congregation, and, and you've only been in our midst a few months. But... Well, I, uh... 
sure be glad to donate what I can to the cause, Reverend, but I'm afraid it'd only be a drop in the bucket. Oh, a donation wasn't exactly what I had in mind. Oh? I think perhaps you can be of more service in another fashion. Ladies and gentlemen, I propose that we appoint Britt Ponson. A committee of one to take charge of the organ raising. Well, oh, now, hold on a minute here, Reverend Brown. We all know that, that you're a man of strength and determination, Mr. Ponson. That you inspire confidence. And we trust generosity. Well, now, I, I'd sure like to oblige you folks, but what you're asking is just out of the question. That's all. You wouldn't turn us down in our hour of need. Oh, no, I'm not turning you down exactly. What I mean is, I it just couldn't be done. I, why you've been a whole year raising forty two fifty, and now you're talking about raising over fifty dollars in just a few days. Well, we've been going at it the wrong way, I'm Mr. Right. Potts. What? I'm sure your approach will be one hundred percent more effective. Well, course, My approach? Why, well, certainly. And just to show you how easy it'll be, we'll start things off by taking up a collection right now. <laughs> Sheriff Appleton, will you pass the hat? Well, but the uh, uh, all right, here, everybody. Reverend. Dig down deep. It's a wonderful thing Mr. Ponsett's doing in taking over this fundraising campaign. But, but I never said and a word. And here's our chance to let him know how Reverend. much we appreciate Reverend. Well, the sheriff finished passing the hat and poured it out on the table. And Reverend Broom counted it. $2.50. And yet the Reverend was real pleased, too. He said that that meant that I only had $50 to go. A nice round number. Well, not that I had any intention of taking this job of raising the money to get the new organ, you understand. I told the Reverend I couldn't do it. I told him just as plain as day that I couldn't do it. But somehow he got the idea that I had already agreed to do it. And no matter how hard I talked, he just kept... And the other folks, they... They were as bad as Reverend Broom. They I was just outnumbered. That's all there was to it. So, early the next morning, I took my hat in my hand and started out. Um, must have been getting around noon when I finally came back to the sheriff's office. Oh, come in, Bet. Come in. Good morning, Abner. Oh, well, how's everything going? You you've been out collecting? Yeah, yeah, I've been collecting. Well, well, eleven dollars. That's what I got so far. Hey, eleven dollars, huh? Yeah. That's remarkable, Brett. Simply remarkable. But the trouble is, I've already asked everybody in town. Uh huh. Except you, that is. Oh. Oh well, I, I suppose I could give you a dollar, but don't forget, I was in on the collection at Clarfax. Today. You ain't serious, Britt. You, you don't mean you really ask everybody else. I, as a matter of fact, there is one area I sort of skipped over. Oh? Well, there are those cabins over east of the creek and the ranches out that way. I I haven't visited them yet. Well, you'd just be wasting your time if you did. I would, eh? Yeah, those folks wouldn't be very anxious to help out at church. Mess of thieves, cattle wrestlers, every other kind of riffraff. Oh, the... Is that what they are? Oh. Oh, well, now, that's just a general census of opinion. And of course, if I could know for certain that we had any actual outlaws living around Easter Creek, if I was positive, that is, well, it'd be my duty to arrest them. I see. Uh-huh. But the fact is, they ain't caused any trouble here in town, none of them. And I can't go around arresting people on rumors. Well, can I, Britt? Hmm. Yeah. Uh... I uh, I understand Red Eye Kirk has a place somewhere east of town. Is that right? Mm, that's hearsay, Red. Oh. Pure and simple hearsay. Oh, I see. Why, you don't think I'd let a notorious gunfighter like Red Eye live right here under my nose, do you? Well, it's too bad he's not in these parts. Oh? No, I was thinking I might like to pay him a little visit. Well, what on earth for? Well, as long as he's not in the neighborhood, I guess it doesn't matter, Kind of a shame, though. Oh, well, now, if you're really anxious to... Uh, what I mean is... <clears throat> oh, but they do say there's a fellow who somewhat resembles Red Eye. He's got himself a cabin just this side of Deer Mountain. Just this side of Deer Mountain, huh? Hey, now, uh, well, wait a minute, Red. Wait, wait a minute. Uh, what in some did you want to get mixed up with Red Eye Kirk for? What's he got to do with raising money for a new organ? Well, a 
probably won't have anything to do with it, but it's just that I don't want to leave any stones unturned, you see. So long, Abner. <laughs> It was about a half hour's ride out to the cabin Sheriff Applin told me about. Not much of a cabin, though. Just a shack at the foot of Deer Mountain with a corral off one side. Hmm. There sure were a lot of different brands on the horses in that corral. Well, I pulled up in the yard about 15 feet from the cabin door. Whoa, boy. Whoa. Whoa, Scott. Whoa. For a minute, it didn't seem like there was anybody at home, but... And then I heard the door start to creak open. The barrel of a forty-five poked into sight. The man behind it was tall, square-shouldered, and thick black beard, and kind of reddish eyes. Howdy. What do you want, mister? I'm looking for Red Eye Kirk. Ain't nobody here by that name. Uh-huh. Well, maybe you'll do, then. What? My name's Ponsett, Brett Ponsett. Ponsett? Now, hold on, hold on. Now. Just take it easy with that gun. Get him up. Get him up high. Oh, sure, sure. How's this? You alone? Yep, yep, I'm alone. You must be plumb crazy thinking you can take me single-handed. No, 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 I'm not interested in taking you, Red Eye. I told you that ain't who I am. Oh, that's right, yeah, that's right. Yes, she did. Yes, that's right. Uh, you mind if I get off my horse? Well, just don't try nothing, that's all. And don't move toward your holster. Don't worry. That's close enough. Sure, 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 sure. Now, what are you doing out here, anyway? Well, the fact is, uh... You see, Mr. I, uh, Mr. Uh... What'd you say your name was? Uh, Jones. Bill Jones. Yeah, yeah. Well, Mr. Jones... I've been given the job of raising some money. What? Now, now, don't get me wrong. It wasn't my idea, but since it was for such a good cause, I just couldn't turn the folks down. Good cause? A new church organ. That's what I'm collecting for. What? Now, you see, the one that Reverend Broom's congregation has been using, it sort of gave up the ghost last night, and what with Easter coming on, I... Well... Are you <laughs> joshing me, mister? No. No, of course I'm not. You mean you're out here trying to raise money so you can buy a church organ? That's right. Go on. Get moving before I take a shot at you. You won't give me a hand, huh? I wouldn't give you five cents for every church organ west of the Mississippi River. Now, it, it wasn't your money I wanted. What? No, no. No, it wasn't that at all. And what the devil did you come around bothering me for? Well, I was thinking that... Uh, you're a pretty influential man with some of the folks here about. Yeah, they'll toe the mark if I tell them to. You can bet on that. Yeah, well, that's just the impression I got. So what? Well, it seemed to me that if I was to go moseying around these parts alone, some of your friends might not look too kindly on the idea of giving me donations. <laughs> they sure wouldn't. But on the other hand, if... If we were to approach them together as a kind of a team, you might say. A team? That's the general idea, yeah. You? You want me to go along with you? I sure would appreciate it if you would. And and help you raise money for a church organ? That's, that's right. Well, I'll be... <laughs> <laughs> Me taking up a Sunday school collection. Well, that's the doggone notion anybody ever had. <laughs> what do the boys think? Huh? Jack Denton, Wisconsin Billy. Why, it'd be almost worth it just to see their faces. <laughs> you sure got a sense of humor, Ponson. And you know something this here crazy scheme of yours? I'm going to take you up on it. Uh, you know something, Mr. Jones? Uh, you, know, you know something? I kind of thought you would. <laughs> you are listening to The Six Shooter, starring James Stewart as Britt Ponsett. 
the Texas plainsman whose name has become a legend throughout the great Southwest. And now, Act Two of the story called Crisis at Easter Creek. Well, the first place we came to was a farmhouse about a quarter of a mile south of Red Eye's cabin. At least it had been a farmhouse once. And there sure wasn't any crops growing in the vicinity now. The porch sagged off at a slant, and the windows were stuffed full of papers and rags. Even the front door looked like it was about to slide off its hinges. The place really looked deserted, but Red Eye gave me the nod, and we pulled up and dismounted. <laughs> Old Red Eye, he had a great big grin as wide as a full moon spread all over his face. Been there ever since we started off. Hey, Danton! Get out here, Danton! It's me, Red Eye! Uh, well, I'm, I mean, uh, well, I guess you know who I was anyway, didn't you? Well, I, I, I had a pretty good idea. Howdy, Red Eye. What can I do for you? Danton! This here's Britt Ponson. Ponson! Howdy, Danton. Now, don't you worry, Red Eye. Even if he did get the draw on you, he ain't turning you over to no sheriff. Oh, put your gun away, Denton. Huh? Use your eyes. Ponson ain't covered me, is he? Then, what are you doing riding along with him? Oh, we got us a little project. Now, you explain it to it, Ponson. Well, the fact is we're collecting money to buy a new organ for Reverend Broom. What? That's right, Jack. Oh, Sounds to me like you said money for a new organ. I must be getting law close. I sure ain't going to argue that with you, Denton. Well, come on. Come on, fork over. You you mean you're serious, Red Eye? Of course I'm serious. And he must be holding a gun on you. I ain't got all day, Denton. How much we need, Britt? Well, let's see. Uh, Twelve from fifty, uh, thirty-eight dollars. Well, you heard him. Denton. Oh, 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 sure, sure, Red Eye, sure. Uh, now, uh, just let me look in my purse here. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, two dollars gold pieces. How's that? Well, I, I didn't mean that you had to contribute the whole thing. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, just just keep the change. Just keep the change. Oh, well, thanks a lot. Oh, my pleasure, my pleasure entirely. Uh, well, was there anything else, Red Eye? Uh, no, no, I guess that'll do it for now. Well, let's go, Ponson. Yeah, sure. Easy, boy. Easy. I'm glad you boys stopped by. Anytime I can... Well, you know where to find me. <laughs> now, we'll stop at Mike Morgan's place next. That's just down the road. Well, that's mighty considerate of you, Red Eye, but uh, we, we don't need to make another stop. What? Well, what are you talking about? Well, $38, that's all we needed, you see. Oh. See, the, the organ's all paid for. Now. Well, uh, 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 there must be something else the Reverend needs money for, ain't it? Oh, I suppose. Well, that doggone could... it, Ponson. I'm enjoying myself. And besides, it wouldn't be fair to the rest of the boys if Denton was the only one who got a chance to do a little contributing to charity. At least we can do is stop at Mike Morgan's. Since how we're so close. I said, well, whatever you say. Whatever you say, Red Eye. <laughs> Well, we made about eight more stops before evening, and I must say that all of Red Eye's friends are mighty generous. I, I even had to turn down the offer of a couple of cows for the cause, seeing as how there was some doubt as to the legal owner of the stock in question. But the gold and the silver and the paper money, well, there just wasn't any way of telling how that was come by. At least there uh, wasn't any way I could think of it. So by sundown, I was carrying quite a load of cash. And we were riding away from Slick Wilson's place when Red Eye gave a little sigh and looked at me sort of disappointed. Well, guess I better head back home now. Sure, Red Eye, sure. <laughs> what, what's the matter? I was just thinking about how Mike Morgan tripped over his shotgun when I oh. told him what it was we wanted. Oh, and then yeah. they blowed himself right over the bar. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's kind of a close call, wasn't it? Doggone it, I don't see why Wisconsin Billy wasn't at home. Well, he'd have been fit to be tied. Well, we did all right without him. You know. Easy. Say, 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 it's a Brit. Oh, why don't you come back tomorrow, huh? Oh, no. He'll probably be around there. Oh, no, no. No, thanks, Red Eye. I, I got a... Well, I got a whole whole lot more than I ever expected. I, 
And I sure do appreciate your assistance. Oh, pleasure's all mine. <laughs> well, good luck. Same Come to on. you. Same to you, Red Eye. Bye. It was about an hour's ride back to town, but before I'd gone more than halfway, I I got the feeling there was somebody following me. I sure didn't like it either. Not with all this money I had in the saddlebags. You know, I gave Scar a little touch of the spur. Come on, boy. Come on. Come on. Let's go. When I heard the other horse pounding up the trail after me, I let's go, boy. Come on. Come on. Let's go. His first shock was over my head. There wasn't any point in trying to outrun him. Scar being as tired as he was, so I slid out of the saddle and I rolled over behind a rock. He was still coming, so I eased my gun out of the holster and inched up to get a look at him. He was a big fella, holding his revolver loose in his hand like he didn't figure on using it. Well, I didn't figure on letting him rob me either. I waited until he was about even with the rock where I was hiding. Then I stood up. Drop it! Drop it! Okay, okay, take it easy, Ponset. Why, you know who I am, huh? Red Eye told me you was heading this way. I've been trying to catch up with you for the last 15 minutes. You... You mean Red Eye sent you after me? I'll say he did. Well, I'll be darned. Huh. I thought I had him figured different. Now, I suppose he told you about the money, too. Sure, yeah. sure, here's mine. Hmm? My share, catch! <laughs> What? Your, your share? Plymouth Church Organ. Name's Wisconsin Billy. I was out when you come by to collect this afternoon. Oh. Oh. Then I wanted to make certain you got my donation. Oh. Oh, I see. Now, do you mind handing me my gun? Your you guy? No, not a bit. Here. Here you are. Thanks. Well, so long, Ponset. Oh, yes. Yes, so long, there. <laughs> simply can't believe it, Mr. Ponson. There must be over a thousand dollars here. Yeah, just about, Reverend. Just about. Enough for the organ. Enough to build a church, too. Yeah? <laughs> well, uh, Mr. Ponson. Yeah? Now, you mustn't think me ungrateful, but I'm afraid we can't accept this money. What? Well, you see, Sheriff Appleton told me where you got it. He did, huh? Now, mind you, I don't have any objections myself. I think when help is offered, it should be accepted, regardless of the source. But uh, some of my people, they aren't quite so broad-minded. And the idea of permitting Red Eye Kirk and those other outlaws to donate to our fund, well... Now, we... now, now, just hold on a minute, Reverend Bro. Now, just hold on. Now, when I was talking to Sheriff Apperton earlier today, he claimed that there weren't any outlaws in the vicinity of Easter Creek. Well, we don't like to admit that our town is a, a haven. Uh... Why, the, why, the sheriff said that if there were any bandits around here, it was his duty to arrest them. Of course, that would mean getting a posse together. It would probably mean a lot of shooting and killing. Well, Mr. Ponson, everybody knows it. I mean, it's common knowledge. And as for Red Eye Kirk ever having anything to do with that money I raised, well, I, you could be mistaken, Reverend. But, but you were seen riding along. Well, it, it looked like Red Eye. Didn't Sheriff Faplin ever tell you about the fellow that lives out near Deer Mountain who's supposed to be the... Spitting an image of Red Eye Kirk didn't oh, you tell about? Now, Mr. Ponson. No, no. Even if some of those fellows on the other side of the creek are sort of outside the law. Now, I'm not saying they are, mind you, but even so, you know, accusing them of being criminals, it might stir up a whole lot of trouble. Well, that's true, of course. And besides, Sheriff Applin says they're law abiding citizens. And he's your duly elected sheriff. He sure ought to know. Hmm? Well, night, Reverend. I'll uh, see you in church. Well, I guess there was a little argument about whether or not to accept the money, but Sheriff Appleton finally convinced folks that they didn't have any right to turn it down. So by the following Sunday, Easter, the congregation had a new organ. 
service is real well attended, too. Now, I, some of the folks didn't look like regular church goers, they, but Red Eye, he, I mean, uh, Mr. Jones, he explained to me afterwards that he and his friends just wanted to make sure their contributions had been put to a good use. I don't know if they've been back since, but you never can tell, you know. Reverend Broom preached a real fine sermon that morning. Transcribed NBC Radio Network production in association with Review Productions. It is based on a character created by Frank Burt and is written by him. Mr. Stewart may currently be seen in the Universal International picture, The Glenn Miller Story. Others in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Marvin Miller, Ted DeCorsia, Robert Griffin, and Red Eye Kirk. Special music for this program was by Basil Adlam and the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents were fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. Oh, by the way, you'll be interested in knowing that the sick shooter has been chosen for broadcast to our men overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Services. This is John Wall speaking. play Truth or Consequences with Ralph Edwards on the NBC Radio Network. This is ChestertonRadio.com. Silver Theater, starring Rosalind Russell and James Stewart in an original story, First Love. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, from the International Silver Company, makers of 1847 Rogers Brothers, America's finest silver plate. Welcome to this, the gala opening of their new Silver Theater. This is a big day, an exciting day. The day when glamorous Rosalind Russell and popular James Stewart inaugurate a weekly series of half-hour productions with the first episode of a romantic comedy drama entitled First Love. And in the coming weeks, there will be a parade of other vivid stories starring Hollywood's finest dramatic talent. And ladies and gentlemen, there's still another reason why this is a day to remember. Today, with the coast-to-coast -coast premiere of their new radio series, 1847 Rogers Brothers also present their latest and loveliest pattern in fine silver plate named First Love, a pattern whose craftsmanship is of the kind never before available except in special order silver plate and sterling silver. I'd like to tell you more about it right now, and I'd like to let you know, too, about the generous gift offer which is being made to every one of you listening in. But that must come later. Right now, the show is the thing. And the man behind the show is the man of the hour. I'm going to introduce a famous personality who will be with us in the 1847 Silver Theater each week to tell you about our stars and our plays. He's worked with most of the great names of the stage and screen. 
He's distinguished himself on the stage, screen, and radio as both an actor and a director. We're very fortunate to have with us for this series a man who can lend such dramatic and directorial knowledge and skill to its production. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Conrad Nagel. Thank you, Mr. Conti, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I know you're all waiting to hear the play, but first I just want to welcome my old friends, those two grand troopers, Rosalind Russell and James Stewart. You're going to enjoy them on the air every bit as much as you've enjoyed them on the screen. Incidentally, you have a treat in store with Rosalind Russell's new metro goldwyn Mayer picture, Love, Live, and Learn, in which she will soon be seen with Robert Montgomery. She's a fine actress as always. And in her new picture, she's more beautiful than ever. As for Jimmy Stewart, that lean, handsome Princeton student of architecture who became an MGM star overnight, well, you'll see this ace among the younger leading men in his forthcoming MGM picture, The Last Gangster, starring Edward G. Robinson. But now for the play. It's an original story written especially for this program by Grover Jones, author of such great screenplays as Lives of a Bengal Lancer, Trail of the Lonesome Pine, and Souls at Sea. Our story is called First Love, and it's about a boy and a girl in Hollywood. But the lights are being dimmed and the silver curtain is rising. And in a moment, you'll hear the story told by Rosalind Russell, who plays the part of Gene Wilson, and James Stewart, who plays Jimmy Parks. We've all worked very hard, and we hope you like our show. idea I was talking out loud. Hmm. There's no need to be sorry. Anybody's liable to talk to herself if she's lonesome. What's his name? What? Oh, oh it's not a man, honestly. Hmm. Don't know what else would make a girl act like you have. Oh, I've watched you all the way across country. There's something on your mind. As a matter of fact, there is, but I... What is it? Well, you see, I... I'm just scared, I guess. What about? I'm going to Hollywood. Bah. Well, not just to see the place, I mean to work there. Acting? Uh-huh. Still, bar. It's silly business. Get rich quick and get your name in the papers. Only you don't. Chances are about a thousand to one of succeeding. Better be smart and go back home. But there's no such thing as going back home. Not for me. Know anybody in Hollywood? Oh, yes, yes, a boy I was in school with. He's arranging a screen test for me. That'll be my chance to prove what I can do, you know. Well, from what I hear... There's nothing like Hollywood if you make good. I know. And nothing like it if you fail. But I can't fail. You better go back, 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 you better go back. The girl hasn't had a chance to rehearse, Bob. She just got the script half an hour ago. Okay, on the line now, Bob. We're ready to shoot. Now, wait a minute, Bob. Let's spend an hour and give the girl a break. After all, she's a friend of mine, and I've sold the front office. Listen, on... they give me six days to make a war picture, and then you want me to sit around here and teach some dame how to act. I get her on the set, and now it's off. Mike, over here by this base of flowers. How's it coming, Jean? All right, I think. By the time I study the lines a little longer and rehearse a few times, you now, know... Look, Jean, I... I know this is a tough break, but the director's all tired out, and I'm afraid that, well, you're just not going to get a chance to rehearse. But, Joe, I can't do a scene like this without a Joe, certain... Joe, bring the girl and let's get going. Step on it. Come on, kid, troop it through. But, Joe, my makeup, my hair, the lines, I... Joe, answer me. They didn't like it, did they? No, Jean, they didn't like it. But they would Don't have... Don't say any more. I know. I saw the test, didn't I? I was terrible. Awful. And I heard what that director said. He couldn't use me even if he was making slapstick comedies. Well, he's right. I know it now. I, I'm no good. I was lucky I found it out this soon. I can't act. I can't act. I can't. 
afraid we can't use you. But I used to pose for commercial photographers in the East. I did quite I'm a bit of that. I'm afraid you won't out here. You see, we don't do much of that kind of work on the coast. Sorry. You see, I've done quite a bit of modeling. They always told me I had a good figure for ready made. Well, you can leave your name, but we already have over 50 girls on our waiting list. Sorry. any more openings for sales girls until Christmas. Sorry. Christmas? Well, that's months. Oh, bring the girl and let's get going. No, Jean, they didn't like it. I'm sorry. We don't do much that kind of work on the coast. Sorry. But we already have all the pretty girls on our waiting list. Sorry. More openings for sales girls until Christmas. Sorry. They didn't like it. Sorry. We don't do much that work. Sorry. Oh, the girls. No more openings for sales girls. Sorry. 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 You better go back. You better go back. You better no. go back. You better go back. No, go back. no, stop it! I can't go back. I can't go back. I can't go back. I'll take cheese on rye. Anything else? Yeah, you on Saturday night. No kidding. Why don't you break down and give me a date, Jenny? He's on right coffee. My name's not Jenny, and please let go of my hand. You know, you ought to be nice to me. I practically own the studio across the street. Of course, I dress like a carpenter, but I'm really a partner of the boss, Martin Ricky. Ain't that right, boys? <laughs> <laughs> so if you treat me right, I might get you a job in one of our pictures. How'd you like that? There's one thing in the world I don't want. It's a part in one of your pictures, or anybody else's pictures, for that matter. Uh, waffle coming up, Jean. Oh, thanks. Give me a number four sandwich on toast, cheese on rye, two coffee, and... Oh, Pierre. What's the matter? It's not getting you down, is it? Oh, it's got me down, those... those oafs. Making passes at me, that cheap line of wisecracks. And why? Because they know it gets your goat. Oh, get wise to yourself, my petit. Give it right back to them in their own language, like Miles and the other girls do. And listen, mon, mon enfant... You know, if you don't do as I tell you, the boss is going I to... I know, I know. Thanks, Pierre. How's this? Hey, you. Where's that waffle I ordered? Are you embalming it? Oh, magnifique. Well, here it is. Not so good, but make him like it. Will I? Hey, sister, where's that waffle I ordered? Here's your waffle, brother. And your oh, coffee's coming please, right up. Oh, Must have having large orders by carbonates of so-so. <laughs> I beg your pardon. What by you... carbonates of so-so. Needing beery bar on stage heaven. Uh, he means bicarbonate of soda, Gene. Must be for Martin Ricky. Dollars to donuts that Trista Lane dames on the old warpath again. Oh, yeah. It's when she a warpathing, all right. If I not bringing soon, studio I in a shambles. Martin Ricky no, having double indigestion and Trista Lane... <laughs> about all of this I'm going to. And let me tell you, Martin Ricky, unless this outbreak is corrected, you're going to need more than the carbonate of soda before I get through okay, with you. Okay, Trista, okay. I've sent for Jimmy and he'll be here in a minute. Meanwhile, let's keep shooting. Remember, we must think of superb productions as well as of ourselves. And it's costing me thousands of dollars to... Now, please, Trista. Ray, come on, let's get going. I won't, I tell you. I won't, I won't. Not if it costs a million dollars, I won't. Get the idea, Ricky? She won't. Quiet, very quiet. What, you want me, Ricky? Jimmy Parks, I'll say I want Wanted you. Wanted you? Wanted you? Where's that magazine? Listen to this. Just listen to this. Trista Lane, popular and beloved star of superb productions, today endeared herself to new millions of her fans when she stated that she looks forward to a family of nine children. Did you put that in that magazine? Well, yeah, of course I did. <laughs> and you call yourself a publicity man? Writing stuff like that for Trista Lane, the glamour woman. Why, I... Now, now, wait a minute, Trista. Now, take it easy. We just felt that the time to change you was time to change the approach in your publicity. We want to make the public... Uh... Sure, we have to lay off that glamour woman stuff. Like Jimmy says, there's a gimp in your glamming. Ricky! Ricky, are you going to stand for this? That's what it's costing me? No, Trista, I'm not. Now, listen here, Jimmy. I want no, to... No, 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 Ricky. Now, you listen to me. Now, just, just remember this. Her glamour was my idea in the first place. That's my glamour. It's my publicity store. It's my build-up that made Trista Lane. What? Why, why sure, you... Sure, sure. He even made the critics believe that your dumbness was repression. Oh! No, no, no. Quiet, for you now. All right, we, we've used this glamour angle as long as we could, Trista, but now that you're getting older... Old? Old? Why, you you cheap scribbler. A cheap... Ricky, are you going to let her A cheap it? scrib... How do you like that? Did you hear me? A cheap scribbler? Listen, you. I made road shows out of your last three pictures. Yeah, and what were they? 
Trista Lane meets David Montrose in the desert. Trista Lane meets David Montrose in the hospital. Trista Lane meets David Montrose in a canoe. 24 reels of heaving bosom and no plot. Oh, that's done it. That's done it. If you think that you can... Oh, wow. here we are, Mr. Ricky, sir. By Cabernet of Soto. Yeah, give it to me. I'll tell you. The executioner drank a hearty breakfast. Now, get off this lot. You're fired, both of you. No, no, we're not. We quit five minutes ago. Come on, Perry. And just for your information, my flat brain friend, you're throwing away about $5 million. I said get... Who said $5 million? What are you talking about? Well, I'll tell you what I'm talking about. I was just about to turn over to you a girl I've discovered who would have made Trista Lane's success look like a wet firecracker. But now I'm going to take her to another producer, somebody who'll appreciate a Jimmy Parks build-up. And boy, this girl's going to get it. Come on, Perry. We're interrupting one of Mr. Ricky's A pictures. Yeah, and A is for awful. <laughs> Jimmy, I'm ashamed of you letting them talk to you like that. Why, if I'd have been you... Quiet. Mm. I don't have to have you around to tell me what I should take and what I shouldn't. Why, every time I... I... Oh, you're right. Why do I get mad so slow? Well, just just, just wait till I see our friend Ricky again. May I take your order? Trista Lane wants Lizzie Cassidy calling me a cheap scribbler. Why, May I, I ju- take your order? Well, can't you wait a minute? Give me coffee. Black and four aspirins. Give me uh, tea. Green tea. And hurry up. Tea? <laughs> well, well, yes, I said tea. You heard me. I, I like tea. Any objections? Now, go on, snap into it. Listen, I'll snap it up. All right. That old fight, Jimmy. Talk like that to Ricky. Nah, don't worry. I'm going to make Martin Ricky sorry he fired me if it's the last thing I ever do. Well, how? Well, I'm, I don't know. But I'm going to. Well, we got a swell working capital to start on. Sixty cents more and we'd have 24 bucks. Yeah, I know. Why can't we learn to save our dough? Yeah. Hey, what's the matter with us? We're okay. You forgot our ace in the hole, that gal. What gal? The dams are looking out, Trista, Trista. Who is she, by the way? Oh, wake up, Perry. Wake up. Use your head, will you? Oh, I get it. She ain't. Well, Brother Parks, it looks like a long, hard winter. Here are your coffees and the aspirin for you. Coffee, coffee. I said tea. Oh, did you? I got mixed. You see, there's so many well, people. Why can't they get some girls around here with some sense? I just I have got said... sense, but I made a mistake. It's nothing to make a fuss about. Who's making a fuss? You are, and if you'll wait a second, I'll change it. Oh, you'll change it. Well, she'll change it. Well, isn't that nice? If you'd spend a little less time wisecracking with guys at the counter and pay more attention to your Don't job, you, talk you wouldn't... talk to me like that. I'll talk to you anyway, please. Hey, Jimmy, wait a minute. Now, you keep out of this. Listen, if you had any brains at all... No, you, you shut up, you, you cheap Hollywood windbag. What? If you think you can treat me like that, so so you want your order, do you? Well, there. Hey, you got over it. over my coat, you crazy dumb... And as for you, you... Ow! Well, now look what I've done. Huh? I got to blow off so I insult a kid like that. I stay cool for Ricky and insult a girl. Well, that's great. I'm doing all right today. Hey, wait a minute. Where are you going? Where do you think I'm going? What, Jimmy? Hey, Cook, that, uh, that girl that just came out here, where is she? Jean? Out there on the alley. Say, are you the one that made her cry that way? <laughs> Look, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Please don't cry. I'm not crying. Go away. Leave me alone. Well, no, no, listen to me. Please, no. I'm, I'm not like that, really. I wouldn't sore at you, even if I had Leave me alone. It doesn't matter. No, no, it matters a whole lot. Now, come on. Come on, tell me it's okay, will you? Here, here, here's a, here's a handkerchief. I don't hey. need it. <laughs> oh, thanks. Here, you, you'd better sit over here on that box. you get your uniform all dirty in the garbage. I don't care. Here. Here's your handkerchief. Oh, no, you keep it. That's okay. You keep it. Mm. Say, uh, is that real? What? That, that curl above your left eye. Oh, please, please don't kid me anymore. I can't take it. I thought I could, but, well, I... No, no, I'm not kidding. Honest, I'm not. Gosh, if you, you just knew how low I feel. Oh, it's not just you. It's, it's a lot of other things but, that have been... But I, I, I've just got to do something. See, when a fellow feels ashamed, I don't know. Well... If it was 15 years ago and my mother here was here to give me a lick, I'd... 
<laughs> well, you, you can smile after all, huh? <laughs> oh, forget it. It's all right. You sure? Sure. Say, I got an idea. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, now, here are a couple of tickets to the preview of the Chinese tonight. Now, suppose you call up your boyfriend and tell him to come... But, uh, wait a minute. Don't tell him what a heel I've been. He'd be down here and take a <laughs> swing at me, you know. But, uh, what, is he a big guy? No. Oh. Little guy? No. Oh, medium sized guy? No. Oh. I get it. I don't believe it, but I get it. <laughs> well, uh, well, then, wh why not, uh, why not you... Uh, no. What? Well, of course, it was such a crazy idea, but I just thought maybe you might go with me. I... <laughs> that is a crazy idea, but I might. What do you, you mean? Uh... Hey, how's about Claire in the alley? I got a delivery to make. Okay, okay, make it, my friend. Now, look, what's your name, anyway? Where do you live? Now, I'll call for you about... <laughs> Listen, Perry, now, I asked Miss Wilson for the preview. I have two tickets, see? Two. Two. Now, why don't you go off someplace by yourself and be a crowd, huh? All right, if you insist, I will come along with you. Thanks, pal. <laughs> you too. <laughs> oh, hey, I almost forgot. Perry, uh, turn on the broadcast of this clam bake we're going to tonight, Okay. Will you? And incidentally, Jean, I... You don't mind my saying so, I think you look up like a million bucks in that dress. It looks swell. Oh, it's not very new, I'm afraid. I wore it once. And we'll see if we can get her to say a word into the microphone. Miss Tristel Lane. Oh, that thing. Turn it off. You mean to tell me we're going to have to walk up past the microphone like all those stars are doing? Sure. Oh. We'll sail right up there between the crowds and you'll look just as much like a star as any... Oh, just like a star. Turn that off, Perry. Just like a star. Wow. Jean, hmm. let me look at you. Hmm? Well, what are you talking about? Now, let me, let me see your hands. Mm -hmm. Perfect, perfect, perfect. How tall are you? I'm five feet five, but I wish you'd let me in. Jimmy, on if you mean what I think you mean. Why not? Why Jimmy, not? Jimmy, what is all this? Now, I want now, to know. Now, don't ask questions. Now, whatever happens, just don't open your mouth. I'll do all the talking. You certainly are. Oh, 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 Jimmy. Jimmy, that crowd in front of the theater, them... There must be thousands of them. They're lined up behind the ropes on each side of the entrance as if it, as if it were a parade. It's all right. All the better. Now, oh, come Jimmy, on. Jimmy, I'm scared. All those people. L let's not go to the preview. Huh? Please, let's go back to me. Please. Don't worry. Don't worry. Now, leave everything to me. Now, pile out, Perry. Okay. May I assist you, Mr. Parks? Cut it, Perry. Don't do it, Jimmy. Don't do it. Not to a sweet kid like that. Out of the way. I said I'd get even with Martin Ricky tonight. Okay, heel. Are you two going to let me out of here? Hey, here, hon. Take my hand, Jean. Now, watch your step. There we are. All right, Thank that's you, a girl, Mr. Jean. Chin up, honey. Head high. That's a stuff. Now, look, the, annun the announcer spotted us here. It's my old friend Jimmy Parks, and with him is a very lovely young lady. And you can bet your bottom dollar that if she attends a premiere with Jimmy Parks, she's really a somebody. She looks a little like, oh, Mr. Parks, will you say just a word to our radio audience and perhaps introduce your charming companion? Sure thing. Mr. Jimmy Parks, publicity director of Superba Productions. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I assure you that there's nothing I'd rather do than introduce this young lady who's with me tonight. And here she is now, Miss Jean Wilson. Oh, no, Jimmy, I couldn't. I'm sorry, but I really couldn't. <laughs> that, that's quite all right, Miss Wilson. I, I'm sure the folks out there quite understand your modesty. But, ladies and gentlemen, this is a great thrill for me to have this opportunity to present to you for the first time this new exciting personality, this new star, Miss Jean Wilson who combines all the glamour of a Trista Lane with the girlish winsomeness of a character out of uh, Sir James Barry. Jimmy. Why, why, she's beautiful, yes, but infinitely more an actress. She's toured the world studying various forms of drama in every corner of the globe. Why, she's not going to be a star of tomorrow, she's going to be the star of the morning. Oh. I'll remember that name, Miss Jean Wilson. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy Parks. I know people all over the country will anxiously await the appearance of this new star on the silver screen. Jean. And now, folks, two more cards. Where's Jean? In case you're interested, your brand new star is scrammed. Well, where? Down the street, that way. But look, Jimmy, don't do it. It's a dirty... Well, Jean. Jean. Wait a minute, Jean. Jean. Now, Jean, now, just a minute now. You've got to understand. Don't talk to me. Leave me alone. Aren't you satisfied? Had your joke, now run along. Joke? When I'm talking to millions of people, well, that speech was on the level, Jean. You are my new star. You've got please, to be. stop following me. Oh, no, look here now. The lights are against you. Uh, let go of my arm, please. Jean, will you please stop this marathon and stand still and listen to me? 
I'll make you a million dollars. And I, did you hear that? I'll make you a million dollars. All you have to do is just let me manage you. That speech back there was only the beginning. Tomorrow morning, all Hollywood... Right, tomorrow morning, all Hollywood can choke itself for all I care. Oh, Jimmy Parks, why did you have to do this to me, to me, above all people? Now, listen, Jeannie, if it's only the acting you're worried about, forget it. Crystal Lane couldn't act. Half the big stars couldn't act. All it takes is looks. And you've got that on the old Hollywood build-up, and I've got that. Well, listen, I can make a star out of that dummy over in that store window there. Oh, oh, you could, could you? Well, I'm not a store window dummy, and I'm not Crystal Lane. I studied for years so that I could be an actress, not a star, just a good actress. I worked, and I worked hard. Well, if you can act, that's so much the better. Well, I did plays in high school, plays in college, in little theaters, doing bits, even walk-ons in summer stock. Summer stock, that's great. Bits and bits on Broadway. Broadway, yes, and stock and stock in Wheeling and Poughkeepsie, even in Cincinnati. We closed there in three weeks, but I played it, a well, store window dummy. Well, <laughs> Jeannie, Jeannie, with all that behind you, you're bound to be good. Oh, I am, am I? Well, you're just what this town needs. Oh, I'm just what this town needs, huh? Well, it took a swell way to show it. Oh, and I know how you feel. You probably was tough. Lots of girls go through the same thing, honey. Pounding the old pavements to casting offices, waiting for calls that don't come. I know. Even going hungry. I and know suppose that. I had. Do you think there's nothing worse than hunger? Well, there is. It's having every little last breath of ambition or hope you ever had drained out of you. So you're left dry and lost and, and even afraid. Well, that's what your Hollywood's done for me. But, Jeannie, Did now you, you ever have one thing that mattered to you more than anything else in the world? I did. It was to prove to everybody, it was to prove to myself that I could act. Well, this town gave me a chance to prove it. A test. A test with a quickie company in Poverty Row. And do you know what that director said? He said I wasn't good enough for slapstick comedy. Oh, but you shouldn't pay any attention to what some two-bit director said. Well, I do pay attention. And I can't play a little game, see? You need an actress. Well, I'm not an actress. I'm going home. I swore once I wouldn't, but I'm going home. Oh, you can't do that, Jean. Now, please, let's not pass this thing up, Jean. I, I can't back out now. I'm broke. I got no job. I, after that big blow off on the air just now, well, you don't understand, but when a fella here in Hollywood puts up a big bluff and then can't make good on it, well, you... Don't quit now, Jean. I'm sorry, Jimmy. It's just no good. Jimmy, I said I could act once. Maybe even that was a lie. Maybe I was kidding myself. But now, now even if my life depended on it, I, I, it's gone, Jimmy. Don't you see? It's all gone inside. Yeah, I get it. I, but you see, I, I figured that with the two of us working together, it'd be a pipe. That's, that's all you need. Someone who knows the ropes to be right beside you, you know. See that you get good direction, the right script, swell lighting. Those are the things that come, Jamie. And I, I just felt that with the two of us together, we could really work this thing. Because we... Well, that was an idea, anyway. I just thought it'd be fun trying. So long, Jamie. So long, Jamie. Hey, you sort of got that curl wet. You ought to find somewhere to... Put up out of your eyes. Here, like that, see? Uh, Jimmy. Yes, Jimmy. You, you know that about, a, about our doing it together. You standing by me all the time, and, and you seeing me through, and you say that again. I would, Jeannie. I would so help me. Uh -huh. It'd be just two of us against this town. That way we couldn't be. Like, believe me, Jeannie, we couldn't. Now say you'll do it. Say well, you'll do it. Remember, I can't act now. I mean, I'll let you down. I'm well, warning you. Take that chance. Say yes, Jeannie. All right, Jimmy. It's crazy, but... As long as it's both of us together, I'll... I'll try. Oh, Jeannie. Jeannie, I could kiss you. You could, Jeannie. You have. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to call Rosalind Russell and James Stewart back to say a word to you in just a moment. But right now, I want to introduce a young man who has a very important part to play throughout this entire series. Our announcer, John Conney. Thank you, Conrad Nagel. Ladies and gentlemen, as the curtain falls in the 1847 Silver Theater today, we bring to a close the first episode of the four-part comedy drama, First Love. 
but the curtain is just rising on the exquisite beauty of 1847 Rogers Brothers' sensational new silver plate pattern, also called First Love. And so that you may know the richness and grace of First Love, 1847 Rogers Brothers offer you an exquisite example of this new pattern, which will add distinction to your dinner table or cocktail tray. A finely wrought special serving fork for hors d'oeuvres, certain meats, patties, and any number of things. Its regular price will be $1.50. But if you act now, it's yours for only 45 cents. 45 cents, mind you. That's a saving of $1.05. So go to your jeweler or your favorite department store tomorrow and get the serving fork in the new First Love pattern. While you're there, ask to see the sets of 1847 Rogers Brothers silverware in the glorious new pattern and learn for how little this lifetime loveliness can be yours. And be sure to get your serving fork tomorrow in the loveliest of new patterns, First Love by 1847 Rogers Brothers. Here come our stars, ladies and gentlemen. Conrad Nagel is bringing Rosalind Russell and Jimmy Stewart out in front of the curtain. Well, Rosalind, how does it feel to have a first performance behind you? Mm, well, frankly, I was scared to death, but I loved it. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. How about you, Jimmy? I hope I can get my knees to stop shaking by next week. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know you both want to get out and hear what your friends thought of the show, but before you go, let me thank you for two grand performances. And Rosalind, mm -hmm. the makers of 1847 Rogers Brothers Silverware have asked me to thank you, not only for naming our play, but especially for so appropriately naming their lovely new pattern, First Love. Well, I really don't know what else I could have called it. Because when I first saw it, I give you my word of honor, I just fell right in love with it. Any woman would. You see, well, what I mean to say is, well, if you saw it... <laughs> <laughs> well, never mind, Rosalind, we know what you mean. We're sure you couldn't have picked a better name. Thank you, Conrad, and thank you, Jimmy. So long, everybody. So long, Rosalind Russell and Jimmy Stewart. And good afternoon to all of you. I hope you'll be with us again next week. romance of Gene Wilson and Jimmy Parks, as played by Rosalind Russell and James Stewart, will be continued in the second episode of the 1847 Silver Theater production, First Love, next Sunday evening at 5 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, with Conrad Nagel directing and special music by Felix Mills. This is John Conti speaking for 1847 Rogers Brothers. Broadcasting System. KMX, Los Angeles, the voice of Hollywood. You are listening to Chesterton Radio at Chesterton Radio. It's the comfort and inspiration of religious faith, for it is faith which helps hold our families together, builds moral and spiritual character. And today, perhaps more than ever before, there's a need to turn to a way of life based on the enduring principles of religion. There are a great many programs of religious nature on NBC Radio, which you'll enjoy hearing this Sunday. Among them, The Art of Living, The National Radio Pulpit, Eternal Light, The Lutheran Hour, The Catholic Hour, and The Hour of Decision, conducted by Billy Graham. These are but a few of the broadcasts that will bring you inspiration and comfort, not only this Sunday, but on the Sundays to come. Of course, the Easter message will be the highlight event this week. We know you'll enjoy hearing them as a supplement to your visit to the church of your choice. And when you do go to church this Sunday, take the whole family with you. Starring Rosamond Russell and James Stewart in an original story, First Love. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. International Silver Company, makers of 1847 Rogers Brothers, America's finest silver plate, welcome you to the 1847 Silver Theater. And the second episode of the romantic four-part comedy drama by Grover Jones, First Love, starring Rosalind Russell and James Stewart. In coming weeks, 1847 Rogers Brothers will present Hollywood's most brilliant dramatic stars in a series of thrilling stories. 
And right now, to celebrate their 90th Jubilee year, 1847 Rogers Brothers are also presenting their newest and loveliest pattern, First Love. It's modern as you are, yet First Love possesses ageless beauty. No matter what the decoration of your home, First Love will gracefully take its place there. Silverware you'll be proud to have and to hold, loveliness to last a lifetime. And First Love is made by 1847 Rogers Brothers, who for 90 years have been creating masterpieces of silver design. First Love, this loveliest of all their patterns, is simple, fine in detail, with ornament richly raised and deeply etched. Its craftsmanship, the kind that until now you could get only in special order silver plate and sterling silver. A little later on in the program, we'll let you know how easy it is for you to take advantage of an exciting gift offer in this thrilling new pattern. A gift of first love by 1847 Rogers Brothers. Be sure to listen for it. And now I'll leave things in the capable hands of a man who has won fame as an actor and director of stage, screen, and radio, whose knowledge and ability are of inestimable value in the presentation of this series. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Conrad Nagel. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. In presenting the 1847 Silver Theater, we hope by trying some unusual devices and by using stories written especially for radio to add new thrills to presentation of radio drama. Before our play begins, I'd just like to say that Metro Golden Mayor has announced that Rosalind Russell's new picture in which she starred with Robert Montgomery, Love, Live and Learn, is soon to be released, as is James Stewart's new picture, The Last Gangster, starring Edward G. Robinson. I'd like to tell you more about our stars, but now the lights are being dim. And the silver curtain is rising on the second episode of First Love. The story of Gene Wilson, played by Rosalind Russell, and Jimmy Parks, played by James Stewart. Just two young people against the town called Hollywood. I know you're anxious to hear what's in store for them. Hello? Oh, Jimmy. Yes. Yes, of course it is. But, Jimmy, that paper, I just saw it. Well, I didn't get 1,100 telegrams, and that about eight foreign councils wanting to entertain me. You can't tell all those lies, Jim. Oh, then you're really going through with it? I know, but I thought overnight you might have changed your mind. Oh, yes. Yes, I can be back by that time. Well, never mind where we're going, Jeannie. Now, you just leave everything to me. Be ready at one, remember? And uh, uh, don't go near that restaurant you were working. Goodbye. Come on, Perry. We got to move. You're telling me. We got to move a couple of mountains before you turn that waitress into a star. Oh, Jimmy, if you wanted to promote some girl to get even with Martin Ricky for firing you, you could have at least picked one that could act. Well, use your head, will you? That's just the point. I sell him a girl that can't act. And I make him pay a million bucks for her. Episode two of the Park Fairy Tales will be heard tomorrow at the same hour. Yeah, you think so, will you? Now, listen. My boy, you heard me tell Jean Wilson we'd meet her at one o'clock. All right. Now, between now and then, we're going to set the stage for our little show. We're going to put Jean Wilson in a frame so that any producer in Hollywood would buy her. Yeah, but Jim... I know, I know. Money, money. I know. Now, listen. We, when you've got something to sell that's worth a million dollars, well, you can always find partners to help you with the deal. Now, come on. Harry, follow me, boy. That's the picture, Alphonse. Four percent of her first year's salary in return for the use of this apartment. But this girl, who is she? She's the real goods. I'm behind her. Have I ever missed yet? Didn't I put over Ella McRae, Thomas Stone, Trista Lane? All right, what do you say? Yeah, Monsieur Parks, because it is you, I will do it. But please, not the penthouse, my most valuable. Now, the penthouse or nothing. All right. I hope she is good. One percent of her first year's salary, eh? And I'd be in complete charge of the kitchen? Complete charge. I'll do it for three percent. Two percent. So, but she'd better be good. Why should I? I get 50 bucks a day renting my car to pitches. 50 bucks? That's chicken feed. This means a share in a million. Now, you know me, Buck. I don't call them wrong. When I start out to make a star, I make them a star. Okay, Jimmy. Two percent, you say? I'll take it. One percent, huh? Well, the penny 
Fall. Sounds crazy to me, but if y'all say it's all right, I read my bill. I being houseboy for one percentage? Okay, Mr. Pot, it's our deal. Have to have three percent, please. Oh, two. Take a side and say, no. Uh, but I'll come out of course. Two percent. Two percent. Oh, hello. Hello, Jean. You ready? Yes, please. Well, now I'll take your bag. Let's go. Oh, excuse me. Hold just a minute. Yeah? What's the idea? Well, it's sort of a goodbye, I guess. What goodbye? To this funny little place. He's in the view of brick walls and laundry lines. You see, a lot of pretty swell dreams went bust here. At least I thought at the time they'd gone bust. And you sort of get attached to, uh... Well, you couldn't very well understand what I feel about it. Well, what do you mean I couldn't understand how you feel? Say, there was a room in a flat bush boarding house, second floor back. There was a crocheted thingamajig on the wall that said, Success is yours. I was trying to write plays then. Each time I had a script rejected, I'd come home and see that thing staring at me. I finally fixed it. What did you do? I threw the darn thing out of the window. I gave up trying to be an honest writer and became a press agent. <laughs> well, you ready now? Yes, I'm all ready. All right, now take a deep breath, Gene Wilson. Here comes fame. Okay, Jimmy Park. Let her come. <laughs> It's a penthouse. Why, I, I've never seen anything like it. Not even in pictures. Oh, don't be silly. This room's only 40 feet long. In pictures, they're always 140. Mm -hmm. That is, unless the people are rich, and then they're big. <laughs> oh, and the furniture. It's real Queen Anne. Yeah, why not? Oh, oh look, you can that balcony. No, right? no, wait. I want you to see that for the first time tonight. Besides, there's something else for you to see first. In here. Mm -hmm. Now, the lady's boudoir. And in case you're wondering, that canopy thing over there that looks like it's off of Valentine, that's your bed. Oh. Eh? Jimmy, Jimmy, don't show me any more. Now, I can't take it. Now, just this. Our International Star's wardrobe. <sighs> if I were my grandmother now, I'd faint. <laughs> I hope I guessed right on the size. I, I told Hedry and I thought you were about the same measurement as Joan Crawford. Hedry, he, you mean to say he made these clothes? Well, sure, nobody else. Now, look at this, this uh, blue one with the fancy sleeves. I picked that up myself. That's pretty swell, isn't it? Oh, Jimmy, you, you wait out here. I've just got to try it on. Okay. You know, these are only the first dresses. Why, they'll be all... Yeah. yeah. What, 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 what's wrong in there? Well, there's nothing wrong, is it, Perry? Oh, no, uh, Jimmy, uh, Mr. Rock and Snuffle is here to see you. Rock and Snuffle? Oh, sure, you know, Rock and Snuffle. Oh. The percentage. Oh. There are... Quiet, quiet. Gene, hmm. uh, someone's here to see me. I'll just be a minute. All right, Jimmy. Come on, sir. Hey, what is this? We will tell you what it is, Mr. Park. We have played your little game so far. Yeah. But also, we are business people. We demand our contracts. All right, all right, all right now. You'll get your contracts, all of you. They'll be made out tonight. All right. Well? If you want to know the truth, we ain't sure that we want to go through with this business anyway. Yeah, that's right. There's a rumor around town that this year Gene Wilson ain't no international star at all and never could be. Yeah, how do we know that you're not going to find him? I never had no Gene Wilson before. Oh, Jimmy. I, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know. Gene, Gene, that's right. You, you, oh, um, uh, Miss Wilson, these are the servants. I'm the oh. trade people and all that. How do you do? Uh, I, uh, Mr. Wilson, I'm just explaining to them their duties and all that. Yeah, and all that. Yeah, but you needn't bother with these domestic details. Now, I suppose you listen to the radio in there. You'll find it hidden in an ashtray or something. All right, Jimmy, and uh, I'm very happy to have met you all. I'll see you all later. That is, uh, I'll ring when I need any of you. Thank you, Mr. Well, who wants to back out now, well, huh? We'll sign all of us. Just give us our contract. All right, in the morning. Now, suppose you all get back to work. Yes, yeah, sure. Right. Beautifully. Oh, yeah, yeah. Boy, everything entrance is perfectly fine. Did you see their faces when they saw on that dress? You should have seen your own. Where are you going? I'm going into change. Wait a minute. What about that percentage list? Oh, here they are. Yeah. 
Jimmy, my boy, have you looked at this list lately? Oh, what do you mean? This total. You've given away 70% of it. Well, I had to cover everything, didn't I? Besides that, at least 30% for us. That's not so bad. No, that's 20% for me and 10% for you. That's not so good. Hey, hold everything. I just thought, what about Jean? Oh, my God. I forgot all about it. Of course, I guess that don't matter. She's just going to do the work. Now, quiet. I'll fix it. I'll give her 10% of mine. Well. And 5% of yours. Well. Now, you go ahead and line up these contracts. I've got to get Gene set for tonight. Hey, Jimmy, wait a minute. I, well, look, for the last time, don't do it. Well, what are you talking about? Oh, call it off. It'll break that kid's heart when she finds out you sold her down the river like this. Well, so what? I said I'd make her a star, didn't I? Well, I will. What does she care how? But I got a hunch she does care, and so have you. Haven't you, Jimmy? Haven't you, Jimmy? Now, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. I do know what I'm doing. Well, Terry, I thought of telling her the whole business, but can't you see what it means? If she learns about the percenters, well, she won't let all those people depend on her. She'll back out, and then where are we? Where is she? Just where we were when we started. Okay. And the teller? Yeah, that works. Good. But it's pal to pal, break it easy. Because I got a hunch it's going to be something to that kid. Jean? Jean? Oh, hello. I saw him look from the balcony. I couldn't wait till night. I found the radio. I hope you like the... Well, Jimmy, the way you look... Don't you like the dress? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's not that. It's... Oh, it's... dress is swell. I mean, you and I... Oh, it's a swell dress. Jimmy... What time is it? Some oh, hours. Well, about two, I guess. That gives me ten hours. For ten hours? Until midnight. When this dress turns back into an apron, the limousine we came in, back into a pumpkin, and the chauffeur, or well, what is it now? A, a pale white rat. Ah, but there's just one thing you forgot, Your Highness. What's that? The glass slipper. I looked all through the closet, so they weren't there. <laughs> Look, Jeannie, I've, I've got to talk to you. I hate to have to say this, but, well... Maybe I was wrong. What? About the ten hours. Maybe it's now. Is that what that look in your eyes means, Jeannie? That you want to call it off? Call it off? No, now, now, wait a minute. Well, of course, I... if you do it, it's all right, Jimmy. I don't blame you. No, but you've got to understand. We can't uh, go through this. I understand. Dinner. I do. You thought it over, that's all, and you see that it won't work. Well, it would work, but you see there are others. That is... Uh... I'll, I'll go take out the dress. Jimmy. Yes? About the money you must have spent. This apartment, the servants, and the dresses... I'm sorry. Well, that's just the point, Jean. The, the money is... You hate to lose it, I know. Oh, no, I don't. I mean, I, I wouldn't if... Jean, don't say any more, please. <laughs> oh, Jean. It's, it's crazy. I mean, uh, all of a sudden, everything is upside down. Last night, you were trying to sell me on this, and now I... I... Oh, there's something in me that says to try to sell you... Genius. You know what I did all last night? I lay awake for hours, thinking of what you said. Of all the fun we'd have doing this thing together, and of the ways I could help you. And I could, honestly, I could. Of course, there is the acting. I, I still don't know what I'd do before a camera. But with you to help me, and about the lights and the makeup and the stories like we talked, maybe I... Well, it was an idea anyway. You see, thinking that you had faith in me almost gave me faith in myself. And you're going to keep it. Well, what's the matter with me, Jeannie? You're going to keep it. Oh, Jimmy, Jimmy, I want to. I want we to. We will put this thing over, Jeannie, tonight. Tonight? Tonight, yes. You're going to wear that dress and you're going to the Trocadero. Jimmy! You're not alone. The Siamese ambassador is going with us. The Siamese ambassador? <laughs> yeah, you can laugh, but there'll be a lot of producers there tonight that won't. <laughs> but, Jimmy, I've never even met a Siamese. Ah, uh -huh, you've met this one. Oh. You, me you remember Yama, that studio janitor that used to come around to the restaurant and get bicarbonates of so-so for Martin Ricky? Not him. The same. But he's not Siamese. Yeah, he is tonight. <laughs> He's borrowing some oriental robes and some long mustaches from a cousin of his, and then, he, well, uh, never mind. You wait oh, and you Jimmy, see him. Jimmy, this is crazy. Sure it is, and so is Hollywood. Now, look, Jeannie, 
Before this night's over, you're going to have a contract in those little hands of yours. A five-year contract signed by Martin Rickey, Martin president Rick? of Superba Production. Martin. What you you said? Why you can't get a contract from me? For, from him? We, you said he fired you. Well, yes, he did. But that doesn't matter. He knows I I never miss picking stars. And if he thinks that some other producer wants you, why he'll sign you in a minute. But how do we know any other producer will want me? Now you just I'll see to that. But you'll have to help me, Jeannie. Now if you ever acted in your life, you've got to tonight. You've got to look and act and sound like Jean Wilson I valued. The Jean Wilson who studied drama in every nation of the globe. The girl who was accustomed to eating with six ambassadors instead of one. Now, how about it? Can you do it for me? Can I do it? When it's for you? Oh, Jimmy, you just watch me. Perry, Perry, where are they? Now, something's happened to them. Ah, they'll be here. You told Jean to hold off till it was late enough for all the big shots to have arrived. I know I did, I know. But listen, are you sure the conductor understands about that music? Sure, sure. The doorman's gonna phone in. Will you quit worrying? There they are. Boy, look at that crowd. Every eye on the door, Pat. Listen, this is perfect. Yeah, if Yama doesn't trip over those mustaches. Now, shh. Now, wait a minute. Look at them. Look at them, Perry. What a picture. The way that girl carries herself. Well, she's worth a million dollars. Maybe you're not so crazy after all. Martin Ricky over there is taking it big. All right, here she comes. Come on, get up, Stooge. Ah, good evening, Mr. Park. And Mr. Perry. Good evening, Miss Wilson. Hiya. Uh, good evening, Miss Wilson. Gentlemen, may I introduce the Siamese ambassador, Dr. Chang Yananda, Mr. James Park. Ah, how do you do? Oh, being very pleased to... Oh. Quiet, Mark. Don't talk, just bow. Ah. And Mr. Perry Burke. Ah. And don't order ham and eggs. Oh. Please, uh, do be seated, gentlemen. How was it, Jimmy? Perfect, kid. Perfect. We're a sis. I just keep it up. Keep it up now. Uh-oh. Watch, Yama. Here comes the waiter. Uh-oh. Now, no English, Yama. No matter what happens, no English. You wish to order now? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, Miss Wilson? Uh, a chicken sandwich and coffee. And the, uh, gentleman? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, Miss Wilson, uh, since Dr. Yananda doesn't speak English, don't I suggest you translate his order. Huh? Yes, you just... Oh, uh, yes. Yes, of course. Um... Uh, he'll have a ham sandwich on right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With mustard. Uh, yes. And you, gentlemen? Make ours the same without mustard. Very well. Oh, <laughs> Jimmy, I can't. Oh, you can. You're marvelous. And anyway, we'll be long now. You've got to move fast before you almost slips. Now, Jean, uh, would you mind dancing with Perry? What do you mean, my... Of course not. And then meet me in the balcony about five minutes. Right now, I've got some important business to attend to. Hello, Colton. Oh, well, glad to see you. How are things over transnational? Uh, never mind, Fox. Get to the point. I've known you too long to think you came over here just to be sociable. Want to sell me that girl? Well, I might be interested. No, no, you wouldn't. But I have got a little idea you might go for. Yeah? That is, unless you object to putting Martin Rickey behind the biggest eight ball in the history of Hollywood. Object? When he's the guy that started double features? <laughs> I could choke him. Now, no, you won't have to, because Colton... I've got a way you can really put the hooks into Ricky. Yeah, how? Well, it's very simple. Now, in a few minutes, you just happen over to our table and offer Jean Wilson a contract with Gra uh, Transnational. What? Well, how do I know she isn't a phony? Well, I'll answer that one. She is a phony. She uh, made three of the worst tests since talking, all in one. Uh. But you're not going to sign the girl, Colton. You're just going to bid for her. Huh? Yeah, now, it's like this. Ricky hasn't had his eyes off the girl since... Here you are. Oh, it's perfect out here, Jimmy. 
Let's not go right back in. I'd much rather be Jean Wilson than uh, Jean Wilson, if you know what I mean. Okay, well, get your air quick. It's just about time. Oh, that's swell. What is? Well, I was just watching Colton's come over to our table and start talking to Parrot. Oh, if that doesn't bring Ricky over. Who's Colton? Well, he's head of transnational productions and Ricky's personal enemy number one, and he's interested in you, too. Oh, maybe he'll give me a contract instead. No, no, he won't. I, uh, I told him how swell you are, just, you know, to get some competition for Ricky, someone to bid against him. And oh. boy, is it going to work. Uh, what am I offered, gentlemen, for the young girl? Strong, healthy? I have a thousand? Did I hear two? Yeah, you can kid about it if you want to, but that's how I'm going to do it. You see, Oh, I... look. What? A falling star. Oh, superstitious? Oh, not a bit. Oh, oh I know it. Ricky, there he is. Come on, Jean. Oh, wait, wait just a minute. There, there's one question I've got to ask you. Well, now. not now. Not... Uh, now, Jimmy, now. Uh, why, Jimmy? Why? All this for me. Oh, oh, I get it. Oh, you mean, you mean, have I any crazy ideas about, I don't know, are there any strings to this? Well, now listen, Jeannie, I've been around long enough to know that business by itself, okay. Romance by itself, okay. When you try mixing them, they're dynamite. Is that right? Oh. Oh, yes. Yes, Jimmy, that's right. Yes, and this is strictly business. Oh, oh that reminds me. Now, you better sign these before we go in. Here's a pen. Sign them? What are they? Well, uh, one's a blank contract, and when... I uh, get the terms set with Ricky. I'll fill it in and then get him to sign it before we leave tonight, see? You mean I sign the contract before it's even made out, before he has well, a... Well, don't ask questions, Jean. Just, just sign it. Oh, all right. There. But this one... Yeah, that too. What's this? Well, that's a contract between us. That makes me legally your manager, see? But, but we don't need that if we're going to do it together, now, Jean. Will you please not argue, Jean? Now, we've got to get in there. I'm doing business, and you have to. Well, well wait just a minute, Jimmy. Let me understand. This means you're legally my manager, that you handle all my affairs? Yes, yes, of course it does. It makes me an official 10 percenter, you see. Oh, oh then you get 10 percent of all I make for your services? Well, yes, of course. That's, that's part of it. Now, there's no hurry about that end of it, but the thing is we can't talk now. Now, sign, Jeannie, so I can get in and get this deal set for you. Yes, Jimmy. Well, will you, will you please but, hurry, But I Jeannie. want to tell... I mean... All right. There. Okay, now, now let's go. I'm not going in. You're not going yet, well, but you've got to go Aren't in. Aren't you my manager? What do I pay you for? Besides, I've done my parade act. They've seen what I, well, what they're buying. Go ahead with your auction. Well, don't be crazy I'm now. not being crazy. I'm being sane for the first time in three days. I'm not going in there. But you, what's wrong with you anyway? Okay, stay here then. <laughs> Jean Wilson. You're a fool. <laughs> so you're going to Hollywood. Well, you're foolish if you ask me. <laughs> You better go back, you better go back, you better go back, you better go back, you better go back. I couldn't even use her in slapstick comedy. Gee, look, forget all that. I'll make you a star and together we're a cinch. They can't beat us. Marks, I want that girl for transnational. I'll offer 50000 a year. Oh, no, you don't, Colton. I'm signing that girl. I offer 80000 Oh, yeah, Ricky, 100,000. 120, Jim. 150. 175. 200. 275. 300. No. Gene, Jeannie, look, I did it. Hold out your hands. There it is. Five years, Gene Wilson. A five year contract with Martin Ricky as top star of Superba Productions. When does my salary start? Well, in a week. Why? Well, what? what? What a, what a crazy question. You know what time it is? Why? I can tell you. It's just 12 o'clock. But I'm lucky. Yeah, I'm lucky. Well, my coach hasn't turned back into a pumpkin. Well, what are you talking about, Jean? You wouldn't understand, Jimmy. It hasn't anything to do with business. Yeah, I'm lucky. I'm lucky in another way, too. I don't have to worry about glass slippers. My Prince Charming is sure to find me to collect his 10%. Well, I'm going home now. Good night, Jimmy. Pa.
Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to call Rosalind Russell and James Stewart out for a curtain speech in just a minute. But in the meantime, allow me to introduce one of the most important members of our 1847 organization, John Conti. Thank you, Conrad Nagel. First, I'd like to make a bow in the direction of our stars and their grand performances in First Love. For I think most of us appreciate something beautifully done. And those of you who seek perfection in all its forms are sure to be lavish in your praise of First Love, the exquisitely beautiful new pattern in silver plate by 1847 Rogers Brothers. It's a sensational new achievement in silver design and craftsmanship. New beauty captured for a lifetime in finest silver plate. And to introduce this glorious new pattern, 1847 Rogers Brothers are making a special gift offer so generous that it can be made for a limited time only. An exquisitely wrought fork in the first love pattern that you can use for hors d'oeuvres, certain meats, patties, and any number of things. A special serving fork to add distinction to your dinner table or cocktail tray. Soon, its regular price will be $1.50. But now, it is yours for only 45 cents. Go to your dealers tomorrow and get yours. Take advantage of this unique opportunity and see the sets of gorgeous 1847 Rogers Brothers silverware while you're there. For this is the best year of all to buy your silver. To celebrate their 90th Jubilee year, 1847 Rogers Brothers offer sensational savings on 60 and 90-piece sets in First Love and other patterns. Savings as high as $20.50 on a set. And there are smaller sets for as little as $32.50. Such a small price for a lifetime purchase. And your dealer will gladly tell you, too, about the amazingly convenient terms. So why not be justly proud of your silverware? Why not own the best? 1847 Rogers Brothers. And now, Conrad Nagel. Thank you, John Conti. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you'd like a word from our stars, Rosalind Russell and James Stewart, before we ring down. We... Hey, hey, wait a minute, you two. Where are you going? Well, you see, Conrad, I've just moved into a new house, and I'm ta taking Jimmy home with me to help me shove the furniture around. Yeah, <laughs> that's what she thinks. You know, I've been making navy blue and gold for MGM uh, right now, and for the past week I've been bounced around the Rose Bowl by a whole football team, so I couldn't move an ashtray ten feet, Rose. Oh, I... you can't, eh, Jimmy? Well, you can try now. You can just try. Well, all right. So long, everybody. Goodbye, and thank you. Thank you, Connor. <laughs> thank you, Rose. Goodbye, goodbye, Jimmy. Ladies and gentlemen, you'll be interested to know that Rosalind Russell gave the name First Love not only to our play, but to the new 1847 silverware pattern. We hope you'll all be able to be back with us again next week. Au revoir next Sunday afternoon. romance of Gene Wilson and Jimmy Parks as played by Rosalind Russell and James Stewart will be continued in the third episode of the 1847 Silver Theater production, First Love, next Sunday evening at 5 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, with Conrad Nagel directing and special music by Felix Mills. Grover Jones' story, First Love, is adapted for radio by True Borton. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton Day at Chesterton Radio. For com. almost two centuries, Americans have enjoyed the valuable privileges of freedom. Now, freedom needs each American to dedicate himself to its preservation. We must not allow our liberties to be endangered by neglect of our duties as citizens. During this year of rededication, join with your fellow Americans in reaffirming the principles on which this country is founded and the safeguarding of those principles. Make it your business to see that federal, state, and local governments are conducted honestly. Help to maintain the good morale of your sons and daughters in the armed forces. 
Learn the facts about all candidates and issues. Then vote for the one you believe in. Make the most of every minute on your job. Produce as much as you can. And thus increase our military and economic strength. Work for better schools and a better community. Guard your American heritage of freedom. It needs you. Quiet. Turn them over. Jimmy, in case you're interested, they caught you. Going to Hollywood, are you? You're a fool. I couldn't use her if I was making slapsy comedies. Better go back. You 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 better go back. The eighteen forty seven Silver Theater. Starring Rosalind Russell and James Stewart in an original story, First Love. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. International Silver Company, makers of 1847 Rogers Brothers, America's finest silver plate, welcomes you to the 1847 Silver Theater. In just a moment, you will hear the third episode in the romantic comedy drama of Hollywood First Love, starring Rosalind Russell and James Stewart. I was going to say something entirely different to you right now, ladies and gentlemen, but I was distracted by Rosalind Russell's new hat. It's one of those new sort of high-flying numbers, and she looks mighty beautiful in it. And looking at her new hat made me think how different women look from year to year, depending upon the fashion. For fashion designers create styles to last only a season. And then I got to thinking about the people who design our 1847 Rogers Brothers silver plate. They've got a much bigger problem on their hands, for they must create a design to last a lifetime. The silver plate does. And that's just the kind of design first love, the new 1847 Rogers Brothers pattern is. The type of loveliness that looks thrillingly new, but which will gleam just as proudly from your dinner table many years from now. It's a pattern whose simplicity will grace many backgrounds, yet with a richness of ornament to go proudly with more elaborate settings. The ornament is a garland of formal flowers in the moonlit shimmer of America's finest silver plate. And there's news to this ornament, for it's more deeply etched, more richly raised in a perfection of craftsmanship never before available, save in sterling silver and special order silver plate. Only 1847 Rogers Brothers silver plate shows this workmanship. Workmanship possible only by a great house of 90 years' experience of working in silver so that you may see for yourself what new loveliness in silver plate can be yours, 1847 Rogers Brothers are offering you a finely wrought fork, a special serving fork in this glamorous new first love pattern at less than one-third its regular price. So ask your dealer about it tomorrow, and ask him to show you sets of first love, the greatest achievement of a great house, 1847 Rogers Brothers. And now, for the man behind the show, Conrad Nagel. Thank you. Thank you, John Conti. Today, we pick up the story of Gene Wilson and Jimmy Parks right where we left off last week. As I mentioned last Sunday, we're trying to do things a little differently in the 1847 Silver Theater. The opening scenes of the drama tell you virtually everything that has happened so far without resorting to narration, so that when you hear today's episode, you'll be completely up to date on our story. Now the lights are being dimmed and the silver curtain is rising on the Grover Jones story, First Love, starring Rosalind Russell and James Stewart. We hope you like the novel touches our author has given his play. I ain't sure as how I should be letting you wait in here, mister. Uh, Miss Wilson, she's busy getting ready for that screen test and... God, she don't want to talk to no reporters. But I tell you, she'll be glad to see me. I'm going to give her a lot of free publicity, which means she'll make more money. Well, And that I... means you'll make more money, too. How come? Don't you get a percentage of her earnings instead of salary, just like all the rest of her servants? How come you knows about that? Oh, I know a lot of things that... Was... Oh, hello, Mr. Parks and Mr. Burke. Where's Miss Wilson, Beulah? Oh, it's at a makeup place and getting ready for that test. But she don't want to see you, Mr. Jimmy. 
She done told me to tell you not to come around here till next Friday when she gets paid. In other words, Jimmy, my boy, you're still in the doghouse. Now, quiet, Perry. Well, never mind, Beulah. We'll just come in and wait. Uh, there's another gentleman there, though. Hello there, Jimmy. How are you? All right, Barnett. What's up? Hiya, Perry. You heard him. What's up? Why, nothing in particular. Just a little business I wanted to talk over with Miss Wilson. Any business you have concerning her, you'll talk with me. I'm her manager. Yeah? All right, Jimmy. That ought to do just as well. But there's one funny thing about me. I always like privacy when I talk business. No, uh, Bueller, go over to the makeup department. Jean may be needing you. But Mr. Park, she done said... And you, you too, Perry. Get out of here. Fresh air, it'd be a pleasure. All right, let's have it. <laughs> What's the rest? No? I said let's have it. All right, Jimmy, it's like this. I know this Jean Wilson's a new star, and I've got a story she might be interested in. Uh, you too, Jimmy. You used to write... <laughs> You'd like that. Go on. It's about a girl, see? A waitress in a restaurant right across the street from this studio. Well, suppose we call the girl Jean. Then there's a fella. He's a publicity man named, uh, well, let's call him Jimmy. And he gets fired from the studio, see? But as he's leaving, he tells the boss that he has a new star. Of course, he hasn't, really. But he runs into this waitress over at Umla. And then he gets the idea of getting back at Ricky, at his boss, by tricking him into signing her as a star. So he takes the girl to a preview, see? And they're broadcasting the shindig. Uh, am I boring you? Go on. Well, our hero ups to the mic and introduces little Jeannie to the nation as a famous international actress. Then to back up the bluff, he rigs her out like a million bucks, gets her a fancy apartment, clothes, servants, the work. Only our hero is broke. So he has to get all those things by giving away percentages of the girl's salary, if and when she gets it. And now comes the good part. Got the he... comedy, Barnett. What else do you know? All there is to know. How much do you want? So you like my story? Well, I'll tell you. I might take a few percent myself, but for two things. First, I happen to know you've already given away over 70% of it. You've been pretty busy, haven't you, Barney? <laughs> I get around. The other reason is that Martin Ricky is going to get out of that contract just as soon as he finds out his new star can't act. Because you and I both know she can't. She had a test with a quickie outfit four months ago. It was terrible. I asked you once, how much do you want? A thousand? Cash? Oh, I, I know you haven't got it, but it would be easy to promote on the strength of that contract. Uh, that's why I want to tell this girl. You won't tell her anything. No? No, because you're going to keep your mouth shut to Jean and to everybody else. Oh. So she don't even know. Well, that makes... And she's not going to know. Now, look here, Barnett. You get this straight. You're going to keep your mouth shut. Do you understand that? Am I? Yeah. This town would have been a lot better off if somebody had whaled the daylights out of you a long time ago, and there's nothing I'd rather do than take on the job no, right now. No, wait, wait a minute, Jimmy. I... Bueller, we've got to... Oh, oh I didn't know that. That's all right. That's all right, Jane. Mr. Barnett here wanted to talk to you about some business. I... I've taken care of it. He was just leaving. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh... So long, Miss Wilson. I'd, uh... Lo uh, uh so long. Well, as long as the business, whatever it is, is disposed of, there's no reason why you shouldn't go, too. Now, Janie, don't be like that. Now, come off that high horse of yours, will you? Why haven't you let me see you for the last three days? What was there to see you about? Contract was signed. After all, just because you're my agent, I can't expect you to devote all your attention to me. You'd be in an awful spot if that froze that way. What? That nose of yours up in the air. Not very funny, Mr. Park. No? Well, maybe I don't feel very funny. Here, this is what I came for. Leave this. What is it? Well, it's the contract I had you sign the other night, making me legally your agent. You remember what you said at the truck just after I told you Ricky had signed you up? About how your Prince Charming would be sure and find you to collect the 10%? Well, maybe I'm dumb, but it just came to me last night in the middle of the night what you meant. Oh. Then you mean you don't want to manage me any longer? Oh, Jeannie, will you quit it? We started in this thing together, and didn't we? Now, I want us to go through with it together. I had to have that agent's contract to make it binding agreement for you with Martin Ricky. Then it wasn't all just business? I, I mean, I mean, to make you a 10% commission? I don't you... give a darn about 10% or 20% or 2% or 90%. Why do you suppose I came here this morning? Because I heard you were going to do this test, and I came to help just as I promised you would. That's really why you're here? Yes, of course it is. Oh, oh Jimmy, I, I'm, I'm glad I've been so Never mind, never mind. Now, never mind. Here, let's see that makeup. 
You see, I thought that you'd only said you now, believed quiet, in me because... Now, quiet, now, here, turn your face here, the light. That's oh, okay. Who did it? Wally? I, I think that was his name. Yeah, that's a good job. You ought to photograph like a million. When are you supposed to shoot? Any minute now. They're going to send for me. Do you like my dress? Yeah, yeah, swell. You know your lines? Gosh, yes, I hope so. Here, you cue me, will you? All right, all right. Uh, did they tell you what picture you were testing for? No, but I imagine it's the, it's the one with Trista Lane. She's doing the test with me. Trista's going to do the test with you herself? Well, yes, she offered of her own accord. Oh, isn't that nice? Well, what do you mean? Well, I don't like it. I know Trista. She's been top star of Superba for a long time, and she's determined to stay top star. So when she starts holding out a helping hand to somebody younger and better looking, you know, it's apt to have a knife in it. Well, what could she do? Well, just try and steal the scene from you and show you up, that's all. That girl knows all the tricks. That's why, that's why you've got to be plenty sure of yourself, Gene. Now, come on, let's run over these lines. Here, I'll give you your first cue here. Let's see, uh... Oh, yeah. Uh, he said he would return. Do you remember? Yes, Anne. Uh-huh. And Trista has a long speech about spring and stuff, ending with, uh, uh, but you're just a child. You could not understand. But I do understand. That's right. Now then, she has another long speech about, hey, hey, wait a minute. Hey, this is a sequence from a picture Trista did two years ago. What was the name of that thing? Um, memory Lane. Memory, Me memory Road, that's it. That's it, and this is supposed to be a test for you. Jeannie, do you know what she's done? She's picked out a big, the biggest scene she ever played in her life, and she's using it for your test. Only you're playing a stooge part opposite her. Look at the length of her speeches, and what do you say? Yes, Anne, but I don't understand. You, my dear, of course I will. Oh, Jeannie, why didn't you have me on hand to take care of these things for you? If you were the best actress in the world, you wouldn't... Yes? <laughs> They're waiting for you on the set, Gene. It's back on stage 12. Oh, Jimmy. Well, they can't do it. Now, I'm going to make them change this. Oh, no, 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 no. We can't do that. I, I can't start out like that. Besides, they'll at least see how I photograph. Miss Wilson, come on. They're showing up yelling for oh, you. Oh, Jimmy, how do I look? My dress, my hair. Oh, that curl. That's not in your eyes again. No, never mind. Come on, come on. I'll fix it on the set. Come on. Sorry to hold you up this way, LaRue. I, I can't imagine where the girl is. Oh, if this girl is but half what you say she's, Ricky, then she's worth waiting for. An international actress. As I said last night, Ricky, if she shows well in this test, I shall be glad to direct her in a picture for you. <laughs> that is, if you have a story that will... Uh, okay, Mr. LaRue, but we have the camera set up now. You want to look at it? And to be sure. And you will pardon me, please. Oh, she only likes her, Trista. Do you realize what it will mean to have Rene LaRue directing for Superba? Of oh, course, Ricky. And we must see that he does like her. Trista, I, uh... Well, I wish you weren't being quite so sweet about all this. Why, Ricky, you know I only want to help the girl. Here I am, Mr. Ricky. I hope I didn't delay oh, you. Oh, it's quite all right, Miss Wilson. Quite all right. Hello, Jimmy Berg. Glad to see you. Oh, uh, Joe, tell Mr. LaRue that Miss Wilson's ready. Yes, Mr. Ricky. Good morning, Miss Lane. Uh, sorry I held you up. Good morning, my dear. It's quite all right. I, I can understand. It uh, would have taken them a long time to find the right makeup for you. Oh, but you look lovely and, and so calm. So of course, I know how you must feel inside. Oh, hello, Jimmy and Perry Burke. It's good to have you both on the lot again. Yeah, I had a hunch you'd been lonesome for us, Trista. Ah, uh, crap, Perry. Trista, it was good of you to help Jean by picking out the test she's going to do with you today. It gives her such a swell chance to show what she can really do. Y yes, doesn't it? Uh, she's here? Uh, yes. Yeah. Ah, oh, and so this is Miss Wilson. Yes, Renee. Miss Wilson, Mr. Rene LaRue. How do you do, Mr. LaRue? Mademoiselle. Oh, and uh, Mr. Parks and Mr. Perry, Mr. LaRue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Monsieur. You know, my dear, when Martin asked to talk of uh, asking Mr. LaRue to come and direct your test, I encouraged him. I was sure that being an international star, you would enjoy speaking French again. Vraiment, mademoiselle. Après le travail, nous parlerons en français. Hollywood se trouve si loin, on quand arrive un grand plaisir à parler de Paris et des vieilles choses, n'est-ce pas? Uh, uh, Miss, well, uh, Miss Wilson was a little upset just now. Uh, maybe later. Why, right, Jimmy, I'm not at all upset. Vous avez raison, Monsieur Leroux. Il faut que nous parlions de Paris. Oh, mademoiselle, for my tears, parley. Oh, uh, well, uh, I don't like to interrupt, but, uh, you know, everything's ready and holding up the set costs money, and... Uh, we must think of uh, superb uh, productions as well as ourselves. Exactly, Berg, exactly. You took the words right out of my mouth. Uh, bien. We do the test at once. Uh, you are sure you know your part in the scene, Miss Wilson? I think so. And Miss Lane, you, uh... Well, you can shoot the scene right away as far as I'm concerned. 
<laughs> you will pardon me. Uh, but uh, that is not my method, Miss Lane. We run through it once for the mechanics of action. Uh, then we polish it a bit. And polish? Then, uh... Mr. LaRue, are you aware that I, uh, that uh, Superb Productions, almost won an Academy Award on this theme? Quite, Miss Lane. Uh, but I am also aware that I saw it. And that today Miss Wilson is being given a test. As I said before, we will polish the scene. Now, if you please. Uh, that action of walking to the window. Uh, once again, if you please. Of course, Mr. LaRue. Still too fast? A little, but do not worry. We keep at it till it is right. A very good suggestion, Mr. Park. Thank you. Oh, uh, Miss Lane. Uh, could you manage to play a little more down scene uh, so that Miss Wilson will not have to be looking away from the camera when she plays with you? When I played it before, I... Please, Miss Lane, down scene. Thank you. Much better, much better. Cameraman, is there enough backlight on Miss Wilson? Let me see. Uh, no. Uh, more backlight on Miss Wilson. Right. Flood out those inkies on the end. That's too much backlight for me. We never use better, them. Better, better. That's better. Uh, a little down scene, please, Miss Lane. And uh, now, just one final rehearsal and then we shoot. Rehearse? Again? Please, Miss Lane. We must give Miss Wilson every chance. Ah, oh, perfect. Now we take it. Ready, Miss Lane? Am I ready? <laughs> Miss Wilson? I believe so. Uh, just a minute, Mr. LaRue. Her hair. I'll fix it. Just Save second. the line. Can't we hurry, LaRue? This is costing money. It's just a test. We're not making an A picture, you know. Ah, uh, no, but we are making an A test, Monsieur Ricky. What's wrong with my hair? Nothing. I just wanted to say good luck. Thanks. Hey, you think it's going to be all right? You bet it is. This fellow LaRue, I love him. He's wise to our Miss Lane, all right. Bien. Are we ready? Come on, kid. Troop it through. Gosh. Somebody else said that to me once. That test at Freedom Productions. Oh, forget all that, will you? This time you're a cinch. Give it the works, Jeannie. Well, when Miss Wilson is ready, I'm waiting. I'm all ready. I'm sorry, but my hair had to be fixed. Just the light. Later, please. Uh, not too fast, Miss Wilson. And Miss Lane, please remember not to make Miss Wilson have to turn from the camera. Quiet. <whistles> Quiet. Turn them over. Rolling. Action. He stood there, almost in the very spot where you're standing now. And he smiled as he said he would return. Do you remember? Yes, Anne. And he didn't even kiss me. He just turned, that smile still on his face, went out the door and down the path to the road. And I stood at the window and watched till he was out of sight, down there where the road curves into the pines. It was spring then. And even as I watched, I knew that I'd never see him again. And not seeing him, there could never really be another spring for me. Oh, but you're just a child. You could not understand. But I do understand. Oh, stop it. Stop it. I can't play the scene with this girl. But Miss Lane. Oh, don't Miss Lane me. You could at least say the right line. But that was my line. Oh, be quiet. You spend the entire morning rehearsing a simple scene, and then you can't even give me the cue. I did give you the cue, and even if I hadn't, there was no need to stop. Oh, there wasn't. Your awkwardness completely destroys the mood of the scene, but there's no reason to stop. As a matter of fact, there was no reason to start it in the first place. I should waste my time on a rank amateur. I'm not an amateur. Oh, I'd be quiet. You're nothing but a cheap little imposter being ballyhooed by that windy Jimmy Park. You keep Jimmy out of this. Ooh. So it's like that, eh? You not only can't play a scene when I choose the simplest one in the world for you, I'll but say you... you did. You chose one that didn't even give me anything to do. Your Academy Award scene. You think so, do you? Well, as a matter of fact, it could have gotten the Academy Award, but not the way you played it. How dare the you? The actress that played that part in that scene needs a heart, Miss Lane, and that's something you haven't got. The girl in that scene has to have loved someone, and the only person you're capable of loving is Trista Lane. An amateur, am I? Well, if I couldn't play that scene better than you did, I wouldn't try to act. Oh, perhaps you'd like to uh, show me how it should be done. You bet I would. Listen. He stood there, almost in the very spot where you're standing now, and he smiled. Why, you, you're not going As to. he said he'd come back. Do you remember? And he didn't even kiss me. He just turned, that smile still on his face, and went out the door. And I stood at that window and watched till he was out of sight. 
down there where the road curves into the pines. It was spring then, and even as I watched, I knew I'd never see him again. And not seeing him, there could never really be another spring for me. Cut. Cut. What a scene. Jeannie. Wonderful. Print that one. Print it. Print it. You took all of that. Of course we did. Jeannie, Jeannie, I can't believe it. You were terrific. Ricky, Ricky, Ricky will you stand for this? They can't print that. This visit is amateur. Ricky, you want me to make a picture for you? Bien. With this girl, I make it. That girl and the right story, we win six awards for you. Bien. Such fire, such spirit. Ricky, do you buy off our contact now, out? Now, listen to reason. Jeannie, come on. Where? I don't know where we're going out of here. Come on, we're going to celebrate. <laughs> Where are we going? To celebrate, I said, to the beach. We're going to swim and dance and ride merry-go-rounds and shoot the shoots till morning. Yippee! Yippee! Quiet back there. We'll throw you out. <laughs> oh, Jimmy, not so fast. You'll be arrested. Ha-ha. <laughs> they have to catch me first. Jimmy, in case you're interested, they caught you. Come on, Jimmy. I'll race you back to shore. All right. Wait a minute. Watch me die from the float. A perfect jackknife. Oh. <laughs> Hi, old silver. Grab it, Jimmy. Grab a I ring. got it, and Jimmy, it's a gold one. I get a free ride. Hooray! Nine hot dogs. Nine. Sure, three apiece. And be sure that pedigree. That means with mustard. It's for five years with no options. Well, what the... Maybe I'm crazy. Goodbye. Oh, Jimmy, you can't go on. Jimmy, Jimmy, let me try. Here you are, ladies. Sure, we'll all try. Give us a dozen balls. Jimmy, I knocked one off. I hit it. Here you are, lady. Another baby doll. Here you are. Hey, see the one with the chip on it? That one's Lane. Watch me hit it. Oh, 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 oh. Poor Trista. Yeah, boo-hoo-hoo for Trista. She's down, but you know, something tells me she's not out. Now, what is it that's so important and yet so secretive that you can't tell anyone but me personally? Well... Well? It's like this, Miss Lane. I heard indirectly that you and this Jane Wilson sort of had some trouble at the studio today. Oh, you heard, did you? Yeah. Well, you can get out of here and mind your own business. I have no statements for prying reporters. That's just it. Maybe I have. I said to... What? Miss Lane, it just happens that I'm anxious to leave town in a hurry, and I'd much rather go with $1,000 in my pocket. Stop making riddles. What do you mean? Would it be worth $1,000 to you to prove that Gene Wilson is not an international star and that our contract with Martin Rickey is no good because it was made through fraud? Can you prove that? I'm just asking you, Miss Lane. And if that isn't enough for your money, would it help if I could prove that Jimmy Parks put over this whole deal by giving away percentages of her prospective income? A little gag which Miss Wilson herself doesn't even know about? She doesn't know? And you can prove it? I could round up the shareholders in an hour. Round up the shareholders? Well, isn't that interesting? Sit down. I, uh... I think we might do business. Mr. Park. Huh? Got any more dance tickets left? Sure, plenty. Well, tear them up, eat them, do anything with them. This has got to be the last dance. My feet are I just... see. Turn it softy on me. Hmm? No, I'm fine. Now, apparently, the Wilson blood doesn't spring from the same hardy stalks as them Parksies. Ah, is that so? Notice you didn't ring the bell with the sledgehammer. Neither did you. I rang the ladies' bell. Oh, that, that was mere nothing. Ladies' bell. Why, with both hands tied behind me, I could say, hey, you, you know what we're going to do after this dance? I know. We're going home. Home at this hour? Fishing. Out at the end of the pier. Fishing? Uh-huh. Wait and see. Poor Perry. Look at him, loaded down with all those Cupid dolls. Shh, well, don't remind him. He may want us to carry some, see? Don't tell me you stopped your dance marathon. If it's me you're worried about, go ahead. I've been here so long now, the people think I'm a concession. <laughs> oh, Perry. They've been looking around for rings to throw at my nose so they could win some of these Cupid dolls. 
Hey, aren't we going home now? I'm all stove in. <laughs> well, well, then you go back to the car. We'll be along later. I know what that means. Well, listen, if you see a hulking mass in the back seat, don't disturb it. It'll be my recumbent form. Perry, want another hot dog? Dog. <laughs> Come on, Judy. <laughs> Can't understand it. Neither can I. A nice brown cord for a line, a bent hairpin for a hook, and a chocolate raisin for a bait. I mighty funny fish don't bite on that. Too particular. Yeah. Might be the wrong time of day. My father always said you could never fish after dark. Oh, your, your father was bad. Is that so? Well, what? I'll... What? I'm too tired to argue. He was bad. Like your father. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway, fish always bite when there's a moon. He said no. He's a liar. What's the matter? That curl. There it is. Down your eyes again. Let it stay. Uh Uh-uh. There. That's better. Oh, Jeannie. That moon on your face. Jimmy. I love you, Jeannie. I love you. Do you hear that? Oh, Jimmy, I'm so glad. Jeannie, there's something else I've got. There's something else you've got to know about you and I was swore to myself I'd tell you before I I told you I loved you but I not, not now Jimmy whatever it is not now tomorrow or any time but let this day all of it be be just what it has been oh Jimmy 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 look a bite haul up the line quick Jimmy <laughs> Jimmy, it was mean to leave Perry to bring up all those Cupid dolls and things by himself. Oh, I ought to be rested, sleeping all the way home. Oh, me too. Oh. Just tell him to put them outside the door here. I'll get them in the morning. I'm too tired to wait. Okay. Good night, Jimmy. Good night, Jimmy. Darling. Gosh, I was proud of you today. Were you? Yeah. And Jeannie... Tomorrow, when, whenever I, I mean, just remember one thing, will you? What I said out that pier, that, that was on the level. I remember. Good night. Jimmy, Jimmy, wait. Come back, there, there's someone in here. Someone in there? Oh, so there you are. Miss Lane. Trista? Yeah, we'd like to see you. Trista, what's the idea of this in Miss Wilson's apartment? Oh, who are all the... What is this? Oh, so you recognize us. I say us, because I bought out the apartment manager's interest. So now I'm a shareholder too, Jimmy. A shareholder in your little Jean Wilson Corporation. Jimmy, Jimmy what, what's she talking Come about? On, let's get out of here. I'll, I'll explain. Oh, no, you won't. I'll explain. You see, my dear, every one of us here has a contract for a percentage in your first year's salary. A contract signed by your manager, Mr. Jimmy Park contract for Cindy. But that's not true. Oh, isn't it? Well, just ask them. Ask Mrs. Ryan there, your cook. Or Mr. Steiner, who supplied your groceries. Or Buck Braddock, who's been chauffeuring you in his own car. Or your maid. Ask any of them. If he didn't make them all believe that about you being an international actress, instead of the cheap waitress that you are. Well, why don't you ask them? Jimmy, say something. I wanted to tell you, Jeannie, I tried to... Oh, you should have, Jimmy. All those lies, that pretense. Oh, for publicity, it might have been all right. But to let all these people gamble on me... Oh. Oh, but it's all right now. All of you believe me. Even if Mr. Parks did lie to you, I have a contract. Just today there was a test and, well, you'll get your money. I have a contract. Oh, have you? And how long will you keep it? When Martin Ricky finds out it was made through fraud? Trista, shut up. You see, my dear, now you know how your friend Jimmy made a waitress into a star. But you still don't know why he did it. No, Trista, stop it. Get out of here. I'll tell her myself. He'd been fired by Ricky because he bugged on my publicity campaign. So he swore he'd get even. Do you know how? Trista. By selling him a phony. By getting him to give a contract to a girl who had already proved that she was the worst actress in Hollywood. That's a lie. He believed in me. He told me. Maybe that's why he told Roger Colton that you couldn't act for sour apples. 
And that if they could trick Ricky into signing you, they'd be putting him behind the biggest eight ball in the history of Hollywood. <laughs> oh, yes, he believed in Presta, you. Presta, will you shut up? Oh, no, 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 Jimmy, let her talk. That's how we learn things. Funny things. Things that we can laugh about. Why don't you laugh? Why don't we all laugh? Oh, Jimmy Pog. I this is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com. Ladies and gentlemen, the chief hope of our enemies is to divide the United States along racial and religious lines and thereby conquer us. Let's not spread prejudice. A divided America is a weak America. Through our behavior, we encourage the respect of our children and make them better neighbors to all races and religions. Remind them that being good neighbors has helped make our country great and kept her free. Thank you. Hey, Jimmy, take it easy. Is it a third time Gene Wilson ain't here? But I tell you, I've got to see Ricky. I am trying, but I just can't play the part. We'll take the scene again, and this time give me something. Quiet. Turn him over. <laughs> Forty-seven Silver Theater, starring Rosalind Russell and James Stewart in an original story, First Love. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. International Silver Company, makers of 1847 Rogers Brothers, America's finest silver plate, welcomes you to the 1847 Silver Theater. And right now, I'd like to introduce the man behind the show, a man known everywhere for his work on stage, screen, and radio, our director, Conrad Nagel. Thank you. Thank you, John County. Today, we bring to a close the story of Gene Wilson and Jimmy Parks, taking up the thread of the romance right where we left off last week. Before we ring up the curtain on this afternoon's performance, I'd like to tell you of other plays and famous players which we have in store for you. Next week, we shall present the celebrated dramatic actress of stage and screen, Miss Miriam Hopkins, in a special radio adaptation of a Faith Baldwin romance entitled, P.S. She Got the Job. In following weeks, we shall present Brian Ahern, Jane Wyatt, Madeline Carroll, Clark Gable, Lee Tracy, and many other distinguished names of the screen and theater. And now in just a moment, our play First Love will begin. It's a romantic comedy drama, two against that town of hopes and heartaches, Hollywood. It's a play with that intangible thing called glamour. It's a play oh, that... Oh, uh, pardon me, Conrad, but uh, could I borrow that word? Borrow a word, John? What word? The word glamour. Certainly, go right ahead. <laughs> I want to borrow the word glamour, ladies and gentlemen, because... Glamour is just the word that describes 1847 Rogers Brothers' new pattern in silver plate, which Rosalind Russell herself christened First Love. For Miss Russell says that the moment she saw it, she fell in love with this thrilling new pattern. First Love is strikingly beautiful, radiantly lovely, really glorified silver plate of graceful lines and exquisite proportion. Even more than that, the garland of formal flowers which ornaments the First Love pattern is richly raised and deeply etched in a new perfection of craftsmanship never before available save in sterling silver. And only 1847 Rogers Brothers know this secret of sterling craftsmanship applied to silver plates, the glorious climax of more than 90 years of working in silver. First love is glamorous as a Hollywood star, a pattern to grace surroundings of any type, a pattern which you must really see to appreciate its beauty. And so that you may see this latest and loveliest of patterns, 1847 Rogers Brothers make it possible for you to secure a finely wrought fork, a special serving fork in the first love pattern at one-third its regular price. So be sure to ask your jeweler or your department store about it tomorrow. And now for our play. The lights are being dimmed, and the silver curtain is rising on the Grover Jones story, First Love. Starring Rosalind Russell and James Stewart. We hope you like it. Hey, hey, Jimmy, take it easy. We've got to find her, Perry. We've got to find Jean, do you hear? Yeah, but wouldn't you just as soon we were still alive when we do? Oh, she's only at the station. Yeah, and you can talk her into coming back. 
Something tells me that's going to take eloquence, my boy, the way she was feeling when she ran out of that apartment. Why did she have to take it that way, Perry? Look out. Oh, Jimmy. What if I did give a bunch of people percentages on her first year's salary to help make her a star? That's been done before. Oh, and... don't be a sap. That's not why Jean ran out on you, and you know it. What busted her up was finding out that you lied when you said you believed in her. It's like I told you from the first, Jimmy. I'll look in the station. You wait here. Hey, wait a minute. I'll go. Examiner time. Hello? Yes, sir. Ticket? No, look. Has a girl bought a ticket in here tonight since midnight, I mean? Oh, where would she have been going? Well, east. New York, maybe. Or Springfield. That's it. Springfield, Massachusetts. That's where she'd be going. I haven't sold any ticket to Springfield. Besides, there's no train east out of here for about five hours. Not until 7.30. Well, have you seen her? Look, she's about five feet four. No, five five. No, and pretty. Awful pretty. And brown hair, brown eyes, and... Had on a suit, uh, brown, uh, maybe blue. Well, I don't know, but... I'm uh, afraid I can't help you, but I'll keep an eye out. Examiner <laughs> Times, paper, read. What luck, Jimmy? Did no you... luck, no luck. There's no train out for five hours. Where now? Well, the hotels. We're going to check on everyone in Hollywood. Jimmy, And then we're going to hard... start on the rooming houses. Oh, hey, but you can't wake people up at this hour. Besides, we ought to get some sleep. Sleep? I said we're going to find Jean. But that name registered. Well, she might have used another name. Now, look, she's about so tall and dark hair and brown eyes, and I think she had a suit on, a gray suit, maybe green. Oh, uh, Frank is not here. Sorry. No, wait. Hello. No, this girl would have come in since midnight. She's not? Okay, thanks. See here, young fellow, for the third time, Jean Wilson ain't here. She moved away a couple of weeks ago, got a job in the movies. Now, will you quit waking me up? Well, I just thought she might have come back. I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right if it's urgent, but she's not here at the YWCA. I'm sorry. Right, right. No, you... no one that answers that description. Sorry. Buy a ticket, sorry. Not at this hotel, sorry. Haven't seen her, sorry. Not at the YW, sorry. No one that answers that description, sorry. Not here, sorry. Haven't seen her, sorry. No ticket, sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. 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 Oh, Jimmy, it's no use. Give it up. We're gonna keep going. Let's go. But Jimmy, it's almost. Oh, all right. Where now? Where? I don't know. Or do you just keep driving? I'll think of some place. Okay. Oh, Jeannie. Jeannie, where? Where? I hope you know this whole business is crazy, Jimmy. It's crazy, Jimmy. It's crazy. You'll never be able to make me a star. As long as both of us together, I'll try. Yes, sir, it's bets. Chasing all over town ever since midnight. Until midnight, Jimmy. Ten hours till midnight. When this dress turns back into an apron and that limousine we came in back into a pumpkin. Oh, Jeannie. What did you say, Jimmy? I didn't say anything. Keep driving. Okay. But the next time you start out to turn some gal into a star, oh... A falling star, Jimmy. Superstitious. I'm glad, Jimmy. And I love you, Jimmy. Good night, Jimmy. Of course, it's like I told you from the first. You never should have told her all those lies. All those lies, Jimmy. Lies and pretense. Lectures to talk. That's how we find out things. Funny things. Things we can laugh about. But why don't you laugh? Why don't we all laugh? No, Jeannie. No. No, you don't understand. Come back. Hey, what? She won't come back, Mary. We're not going to find her. She'll never come back. Coffee. Is that all? That's all. Okay. Jean. Jean Wilson. Hello, Marge. 
say I didn't recognize you at first. Gee, how are you anyway? Me? Oh, uh, I'm fine. I'm fine, Marge. I'll get you coffee. Say, it's well to see you. I read all that stuff in the paper. Uh, here you are. Gosh, think of you being a star across the street from the same restaurant where you used to juggle trays. Ain't life funny, though? <laughs> Want some more cream? Huh? Uh, no, no, thank you. Oh, I wish you'd have come in earlier so the other girls could have seen you. Uh, say, what are you doing here all alone this hour of the morning? Been working over the studio making night scenes? Or, or did it just get lonesome for the old place? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Lonesome. Hmm. Funny how you can feel about a place you work once, huh? Oh, say, I wanted to ask you. All that stuff in the papers about you being an international actress and stuff, that's just a lot of bunk, ain't it? Yeah. That's all it is. Bunk. That's what I told Ruthie. I says, Ruthie, it stands to reason if she was a big star, she wouldn't have been working here with us. And I told her. Hey, what's the matter, Do You feel all right? I mean, you look sort of... Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. Oh, oh, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. Besides, Ruthie, I says, look who her manager is, that Jimmy Parks guy. The fellow who used to be head of the publicity department across the street. Everybody knows he's the biggest liar in Hollywood. Why, look how he made a star out of that Trista Lane. Just by making people think she was... Hey, aren't you going to finish your coffee? Hey, Jean, wait a minute, you're changed. Hey, oh. Well, good morning, Miss Wilson. Good morning. Glad to see you. Mr. Ricky. Sit down. But uh, there's no time... You better. I have an idea you and I have a good deal to talk about this morning. A good deal to... Mr. Ricky, do you already know what I'm here to tell you? Yes, Miss Wilson, I do. You see, Trista Lane called me after she left your apartment last night. Oh, I see. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad. That, that makes it much easier. I, uh... Oh, all that she told you was true, Mr. Ricky. I'm not an international star. And I was a waitress in the restaurant across the street. The whole thing was just a little idea of, uh, of Mr. Parks to... To get back at me for firing him. I know. But something tells me you didn't know, Miss Wilson. Not about that part of it. Well, what difference does it make? All that matters is that you have a contract with a girl that can't act. Well, that's why I'm here this morning. Mr. Ricky, I brought this. What is it? My copy of the contract between us. If you'll just write me a check for $51.46, you may have it back. A check? $51.40? What are you talking about? Well, that happens to be the price of a ticket to Springfield. I'd rather not have taken anything, but... But, Miss I... Wilson... It also happens that you're not going to Springfield. Well, what do you mean? I have no intention of canceling that contract. But, but it was made through fraud, and when you signed me, you thought that I was... I thought you'd be a good box office, and you are. As for the Ballyhoo of Parks, it's great publicity. Now we'll tell the public the truth about you, and they'll be more interested than ever. But, Mr. Ricky, that's crazy. I mean, you don't understand. I'd be no good to you. I, I, why, I, I can't act. I can't believe that. Remember... I saw you make that test yesterday with Trista Lane. But that, that was different. That was because I had someone, uh, I mean, something I, I could count on. But now it's no use. Oh, Mr. Ricky, you've got to let me out of that contract. I'm afraid I can't do that, Miss Wilson. Besides, you're just a little upset now, and hard work's the best thing in the world for you. Oh, but, but please, I... I have a script called Cold Embers ready to go into production. Great story, Miss Wilson. A story of women in the war. And there's a girl in there... Well, when that picture is released and with you in that part, you will be an international star. Oh, no, no, Mr. Ricky, please. Please, you don't understand. You've got I to let me out of it. I do I... understand, Miss Wilson. And now you better go home and get some sleep. Beginning tomorrow, you're going to be a very busy young woman. But please, yes, please, Mr. you've Ricky. got to listen. Uh, make appointments for Miss Wilson tomorrow morning. A makeup test at 9. No, no. Fittings at no, 10. Please. Photographs Ricky, at no. 12. And interviews at 2 to 4. And see she gets the trip. Take nine. Action. And please, Miss Wilson, give me something this time, eh? But don't you understand? The man's an enemy, Margaret. We don't dare give him shelter. He's hurt, and he needs care. 
Are we to let men die because they don't wear the right uniform? Oh, if Joe and all the rest felt that way, where would we be? Well, they don't. They're killing every chance they get. Cut! Angie! No, no, Miss Wilson. We can't spend the entire day on this one scene. Quiet! I want the set quiet. Quiet. Assistant, no visitors. Visitors off the set, please. Yes, Mr. Moreau. I'm sorry, but you folks will have to get off the set. I will explain again. The whole spirit of the story is in the lines you speak in the scene. There is determination. There is bitterness. There is despair. All the complex emotions that a woman feels in time of war. Now, put those things into it. Feel the scene, please. We take it again. <coughs> Turn them over. Rolling. Scene 14, take 10. Action. But don't you understand? The man's an enemy, Margaret. We don't dare give him shelter. He's hurt and he needs care. Are we to let men die because they... No, no, no! Cut! Will you tell me what is wrong with you? Oh, maybe it's my fault, Miss Wilson. Maybe of I'm not Of course it's not your fault. It's, it's so... Oh, Mr. LaRue, I want to do what you say. I'm trying. I seem to be all tied up inside. I... Uh, can we try it again? No, no, we try it no more. We're wasting time. The company is dismissed oh. for the day. The girl is flat, colorless. The day she took the test, she was an actress. Now she's a stick. All right, I'll get another story. I'll get a dozen stories if I have to. But I'm going to make a picture with Gene Wilson, and you're going to direct it. You're crazy, Jimmy. She won't even see you. But I'm not going to see Gene. I'm going to see Ricky. He'll throw you out. This one had better be good, because if this script doesn't fit that girl, I'll fire you all and get some writers who can write. I'm busy. Mr. Parks is here again. Says he must see you. Parks, tell him to get off the lot and stay off. Turner, how soon can you have this new story ready to shoot? We've got to get started on a picture. We have to get out of here. No, no! Cut! Miss Wilson, in this story, you are supposed to be gay, to laugh. This is a comedy we are playing, not Macbeth. Will you please try? I am trying, but I can't do it. I can't do it, I can't do it. We've tried her in six stories, and she couldn't play any of them. That's why I brought you from New York, Max. If you can't write one that she can play, I don't know what we'll do. But I tell you, I've got to see Martin Ricky. I give up. There is no use. I'm through. Completely and absolutely finished. Parks, I gave orders to keep you Ricky, off the lot. Ricky, you've got to listen to me for five minutes, please. Ricky, I want to be honest with you. What do you know about honesty? I gave you the best publicity job in Hollywood. I paid you top salary for five years. I saw you through every scrape that your crazy hot-headedness got you into. And how do you thank me for it? By one of the lowest tricks that ever was pulled in Hollywood. And you talk to me about honesty. I know all that, Ricky. But I'm not here this morning for myself, Ricky. I, I swear I'm not. Oh. Maybe you've got a new actress to tell me, huh? Somebody else that I can waste $200,000 on. Do you realize that I hired the best writers in the country to turn out scripts for that girl and... Oh, well, never mind. She's through. Have you got any more great Ricky. ideas? Ricky, let me write a story for her. Ah, oh, you're crazy. That's what I'm here for, Ricky. I've got a story that she can play. What are you talking it's about? It's her story. Her own story, Ricky. The story of a girl with one single dream, one ambition, and a guy who was too much of a fool to recognize that dream in time. Let me do it, Ricky. This won't cost you a dime, but I, you've just got to let me write it. Well... What makes you think she'd be any better in this story than she was in any of the others? You saw her that day on that test with Trista. She was great. You know it. Well, since then, something's happened to Jane. I know what it is. She's lost the one thing an actress must have. Faith in herself. Well, the story I'm going to write will give that back. It'll make her see a lot of things straight now that seem twisted up in a million crazy shapes and... Oh, Ricky, 
You've got to... I've got to do it. I've got to do it for so many reasons. Please give me this chance. All right, Jimmy. I never knew you to do a bad job on anything you had your heart in. I've got a hunch your heart is in this. Take it easy, Mr. Hess, or you'll burn up the keys. No, I'll be quiet. Okay, Mr. Hess. Hey, what is this Hess business? If you'd stop work long enough to read the paper, you'd know. It's your nom de plume, or should I say de type. It's all over the movie columns this morning that Superba's finally found a story for Gene Wilson. A story called Hollywood Girl by Ronald Hess. What a name, Ronald. Never mind, never mind now. He is writing it for all you know. You just keep your mouth shut, see? How about to Gene? Most of all to Gene. Now, she's not to know. Fine business. You're writing practically a stenographic report of the things you've said to each other. And you expect her not to... You're bad. Am I? The girl in that story is Jean and the fellow is you, Jimmy, my boy. The masks you put on them are so thin it'd take a blind man to be fooled. No, you come on. You get out of here and mind your own business. Here's the third sequence. Now tell Ricky I'll get the rest of it by tomorrow night. Oh, Jimmy, you can't. Use your head. You can't keep working like this. Get some rest and some decent food. Don't worry. I'll get rest. Plenty of it, after this picture's finished. What do you mean? Well, I think Hollywood and I can do without each other for a while. I, I thought I'd do a little traveling, maybe down to Australia, you know. I've always wanted to see those wombat and the platypus and the kangaroos. I, well, hey, what is that? Now, come on, get out of here. Okay, okay. Perry. Yeah? Perry, wh- when do they start to shoot? Did Ricky tell you? Sure, tomorrow. They're going to start with that sequence in the park. And the guy tells a girl he can make her a star. Wonder where you ever got that idea. Well, Perry, now, you stick around. And you watch the lighting and watch Jean's makeup, now, everything. And if she's not getting every break, you go to Ricky and you tell him. Now, you do that, Ricky. Okay, okay. Ronald has. Ronald. Pardon me, Mr. LaRue. Gene, the old faithful curl that's in your eyes again. Oh, thank you. How's that? That's swell. Excuse me, Mr. LaRue. Quite all right. Thank you for noticing. Eh bien. Turn him over. Rolling. Scene 37, take one. Action, please. I'll make you a star, Helen, so help me. I'll do it. But I'm warning you, I can't act. Not anymore. Of course you can. And we'll be together. I'll be there to pull you through. Together with a cinch. Say you'll do it, Helen. All right, Tommy. It's crazy. And I know I'll let you down, but, but as long as we're together, I'll do it. Oh, Helen, I could kiss you. You could, Tommy? You have. Huh. Huh. Excellent, excellent. Thank you both. Save the light. I'm delighted, Miss Wilson, delighted. I see already that this story for you is the answer. Yes. Yes, I'm beginning to think it is. Mr. LaRue, uh, who's writing this story, do you know? Uh, someone by the name of Ronald Hess, I understand. Yes, but who is Ronald Hess? I have no idea. The name is new to me. Regina, uh, Mr. Burke, uh, do you by any chance happen to know who is this Ronald Hess? Who, me? Say, I make it a point never to know any writer. No. Oh. I see. Perhaps we'd better go on shooting, Mr. LaRue. Exactly. Cameraman, give me a setup over here. Let's have it quiet for rehearsal. <laughs> You're haywire, Jimmy. You can't end it that way. No, I'm writing this story. But the public won't go for it. So far, it's been a swell story. You've got to get the boy and the girl together in the end. Why? You say the story's been good. Well, do you know the reason? Because it's real, honest, and genuine. That's why. Well, it's going to end that way. The guy's a heel, isn't he? Well, as long as he's a heel, he doesn't deserve it. Ever hear of this thing called love? Yeah. She's not in love with him. She couldn't be. Jimmy, you may know publicity, but when it comes to women, you're four points below being a moron. Yeah. Well, this story, she doesn't love him, see? She gives him his walking papers right here in this speech. Now, listen. The fellas come to say goodbye to her, see? And 
she says, why did you have to come back? Isn't it better to forget things that are over and done with? The one decent thing you might have done is to leave me alone. Oh, no, no, I'd better just stay that way. It reads better. Let's see. Why did you have to come back? Isn't it better to forget things that are over and done with? The one, one decent, decent thing, thing you might have done was to stay away. I almost thought I loved you once, Tommy. But I know now I didn't, and I never could. There's too big a barrier of lies and pretense. And what I'm, what I'm trying to say is this. There was a time I needed just one thing in life, Tom, and that was faith. Your faith in me. She didn't come through, Tommy, because you didn't have that faith. Now will you go? And this time, don't come back. Please, Tommy. Please, don't come back. <laughs> That, that is a picture. Perfect. It's not. It's not. It's all wrong. It can't be like that. Perry. Perry, where is he? Where is he? Take me to Wait, him. But he, but he said I that... don't care what he said. Take me to him. Was that you, Perry? I'll be right out. I'm making some reservations. Hello. That's right, yeah. 840 to San Francisco. Yeah, lower. Thanks. Well, Perry, listen. How did the scene go? Well, Jeannie... I came to see Mr. Hess. Perry told me he lived here. Well, Perry's bad. You better go back to the studio. Oh, but I won't. Till I see Mr. Hess. That story has got to be changed. And you know how? I'll show you. Well, here, Jeannie. Now, wait a minute. Well, I... You read over my shoulder, Jimmy. I'll show you what that closing speech of hers should be. Let's stop this crazy business of torturing ourselves. I love you for writing the script for me. I love you for trying to keep it a secret. I love you for... Oh, who cares what for? I love you. Jeannie. Jeannie, is this... You mean... Yes, Jimmy. I could, and I do. Oh, Jeannie, my darling. Mm -hmm. Mike. Oh, Perry, no. Don't mind me. That's all I wanted to know. Scene 382, close up. The two stand in close embrace, forgetting that there's anyone in the world but themselves, as we slowly fade out. The end. You're wrong, Perry. Isn't he, Jimmy? Dead wrong. Mm -hmm. It's the beginning. It's just scene one, and believe me, this is going to be a picture. In just a moment, Rosalind Russell and James Stewart are coming out before the curtain so that you may meet them, but first, John Carty has a word for you. Today, we've heard the happy ending of our play, First Love, in which we all enjoyed Rosalind Russell and James Stewart so much. And next week, in the 1847 Silver Theater, we'll hear about another play of another title. But you'll still hear a lot about the name First Love. For First Love, 1847 Rogers Brothers' stunning pattern in silver plate is news real news, a design of enduring loveliness with craftsmanship of the type never before available save in sterling silver. Craftsmanship possible only from the great house of 1847 Rogers Brothers. For 1847 Rogers Brothers is the most important name in silver plate, a name which for 90 years has stood for the finest quality and workmanship. So go to your dealer tomorrow and learn now for how little this lasting loveliness can be yours and how easy it is to buy out of income. For today, you can make your dream come true. You can own the finest silver plate by 1847 Rogers Brothers.
And now, here is Conrad Nick. Ladies and gentlemen, I feel that we're all a little sad right now, for we've come to the end of our play, First Love, with Rosalind Russell and James Stewart. We hope you enjoyed it, and we know you enjoyed our stars. I want to congratulate them on a grand job. Thank you, Conrad. I do know that I've enjoyed it. Me too, Conrad. And I know everybody will be thrilled with Miriam Hopkins' next play. Next week here on this program, Fanny Hurst's story, P.S. She Got the Job. But before I go, I would like to thank all of you for the wonderful way you've received our play. Your letters have meant so much to me, and I'd like to thank 1847 Rogers Brothers, too. You know, I feel as though 1847 people and I were old friends. Matter of fact, we are. My mother has 1847 Rogers Brothers silverware in Connecticut, and I do here, too, in Hollywood. That's what we think of it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we certainly hope you'll be back, Rosalind. We appreciate MGM giving you permission to appear in our Silver Theater. Also, we wish you and Robert Montgomery lots of luck in your new picture, Love, Live, and Learn. Well, Jimmy, I guess it's our war to you, too, isn't it? Yeah, I guess it is, Conrad. I guess I'll pack up my mic fright and get back to stage eight. <laughs> You've got a new MGM picture coming out soon, haven't you, Jimmy? Yeah, The Last Gangster, starring... Edward G. Robinson. Well, I know it'll be a big success, and we also hope you'll do another play for us again here in the Silver Theater. Well, maybe that's a date. And what Rosalind said about your letters goes for me, too, and my most sincere thanks to 1847 Rogers Brothers for letting me do Jimmy Parks. So long, everybody. Goodbye. Come along, Jimmy. Goodbye, Rosalind. Goodbye, Jimmy. <laughs> this is Conrad Nagel bidding you good afternoon. I hope you'll be with us again next Sunday. Next week, at the same time, the 1847 Silver Theater presents Miriam Hopkins in the exciting Faith Baldwin one-act play, P.S. She Got the Job. The Grover Jones story, First Love, was adapted for radio by True Boardman with special music composed and conducted by Felix Mills. This is John Conti speaking for International Silver Company, makers of 1847 Rogers Brothers, America's finest silver plate. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. who would like to live in the Republic of the United States or the Dominion of Canada where that good Olga Cole is sold. The citizens of our free countries are the envy of many people elsewhere because of the personal freedom which we have enjoyed. Why then doesn't every country adopt a form of free government? One answer is that unfortunately there are people and parties in many nations who are so greedy for power that they will sacrifice the freedom of their fellow countrymen to obtain power for themselves. History, even recent history, is replete with such instances. That is why the citizens of the Republic of the United States and the Dominion of Canada must be careful to recognize at its very beginning any movement to steal or limit their freedom. That is not always easy. The man who would enslave a free people doesn't begin by saying, now I'm going to be your dictator. Instead, he probably will claim that he is a devoted supporter of personal freedom. But all the while, he will support policies that weaken and undermine personal freedom. Such a man will deny any totalitarian aims. But free citizens must not be deceived by such denials. Apparently, it is a cardinal principle of every sincere totalitarian that he is justified in lying, if such lies will advance his plans. In these times, no public figure and no party or organization supporting such a person can be accepted without careful consideration. Every public figure and organization must be carefully scrutinized. And if their real aims are to limit or to destroy our freedom as individuals, they must be opposed and defeated. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Carol Lombard and James Stewart in The Moon's Our Home. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. I seem to remember telling a certain young lady a few years ago that she'd never get anywhere in pictures. 
I believe I said you didn't take yourself seriously enough. Well, I've long since eaten those words about Carol Lombard. And tonight we bow low and welcome her to the Lux Radio Theater on the arm of James Stewart, her co-star in the captivating comedy, The Moon's Our Home. Paramount gave it to the screen, and we give it to you now as our prescription for raising your spirits at least 100%. It's a madcap love story of two famous and rather temperamental people. One a screen star, the other a combination author and explorer. I know you'll approve our casting of Carol Lombard and James Stewart for these parts. And we have a great respect for you who are out there beyond the footlights. A great respect for your choice of plays and players and your constructive criticism of this theater. And another thing we respect is your good opinion of Lux Flakes. What pleases me is that so many of you are self-appointed members of our research staff. Because each week, a large number of you tell us about some new use that you've discovered for our product. I'm sure you've all learned that you can depend on Lux Flakes, all except perhaps a very few who haven't tried it yet. And I hope those few will learn in the very near future. Say, the first thing tomorrow morning. But the first thing on this schedule now is to raise the curtain on Act One of The Moon's Our Home, starring James Stewart as Anthony Amberton and Carol Lombard as Cherry Chester. On the lot at Paragon Studios stands the dressing room bungalow of Miss Cherry Chester, star of Paragon Pictures. In the bungalow stands Miss Chester herself. She has a wild look in her eye and a vase in each hand. The lovely voice that has thrilled audiences throughout the world can now be heard all over the studio lot. I won't, I won't, I won't! Stop throwing things! I won't do it, you hear me? I won't! You miss me, dear. You must be overtrained. Oh, Boise, darling, I'm a beast. My own darling nurse has taken care of me since I was a child. I might have hurt you. There was a good chance of it. Oh, Boise, if I ever did, oh, I'd blow my brains out. I know, and I'd have to tidy up afterwards. Now sit down. We must discuss this calmly and sanely. Your grandmother demands that you come to New York at once. Blast my grandmother. I'm sick of having Lucy Van Steeden run my life. Why doesn't she leave me alone? Because she's fond of you in her somewhat specialized way. And it worries her when you get mixed up with a lot of Egyptians. Oh, boy, see, Prince Ali's only one Egyptian, a very small one at that. Lucy ought to stop reading the gossip columns. They're too old for her. Listen to me. You know, you've got to go to New York, Cherry. I am not going to New York, and don't call me that foolish name. Well, Sarah Brown, then. And don't call me that either. I don't look like a Sarah. That's what you were christened. I was there when it happened. And Cherry or Sarah, you'll go to New York. Your grandmother gets her way. She always does. Well, this will be a nice change for her because baby's not going. For once in my life, I'm going to do what I want to do. She asks very little of you. Only my right eye. Oh, dear. Sometimes I wish I had a nice, restful job as a night nurse in a psychopathic ward. Oh, I know. I'm awful, Boise. But I'll be an angel from now on. I promise an absolute angel. That's my good girl. Now, run in and change your clothes. Hedda Manning from Movie Universe is coming to interview you. I won't be interviewed. I won't do it. I won't. I won't. Drop that lamp, my absolute angel. Oh, oh boy, so you're wonderful. Put the lamp down. All right, darling. That's more like it. I'll go put on something that makes you look sweet and friendly. But I want to be aloof. I want to be mysterious. Don't try that. You're not Swedish. Now go get dressed and stop acting like an actress. But I am an actress, Boise. First an actress, then a woman. My art comes before anything else. Save that for the interview, Sarah Brown. This is me you're talking to, not your press agent. This is Miss Chester, Miss Manning. How do you do, Miss Chester? How do you do, Miss Manning? I'm so sorry that I kept you waiting. But the moments fly by on silvery wings when one is lost in told story. Oh, you're interested in literature, Miss Chester? Interested? Oh, there's nothing I like better than to hide away by myself with a book. A good book. Oh, well, you may write that down. Thank you. But frankly, Miss Chester, I'd like to do an article closer to the hearts of our readers, like uh, love and marriage. Yes, that would be quite original, love and marriage. Let me see. Marriage should be like a ski jump, sudden, swift, reckless. Starting on the heights, leaping into the void, never knowing the end, never caring, breathless, defiant, exhilarating. I, I see what you mean. Oh, in love. There's only one way I could fall in love. Not as Cherry Chester, the actress, but as a plain, ordinary girl. 
I could only fall in love with a man I didn't know and who didn't know me. There should be nothing but us two, the man and the woman. No past, perhaps no future, just the magnificent present. Oh, my. That's it. That's what I want. Oh, they're going to eat this up, Miss Chester. Oh, Miss. What is it, Hilda? I'm, I'm afraid it's another telegram from your grandmother. I thought I told you to take those telegrams and... Oh, thank you, Hilda, for bringing it to me. Just, just put it down. Yes, Miss. Well, I, I mustn't take any more of your time. Thank you so much. I know our readers will adore every word you've said. Goodbye, Miss Manning. Thank you. Well, if I recall your last interview, you were all for athletics. You hopped over a couple of fences to prove it. Romance was out, and you were wedded to the open air. That was the last interview. But you know, Boise, th there's something in what I just said to that woman. Well, if there is, it certainly escaped me. Read your telegram. All that about falling in love with a man you don't know and who doesn't know you. Oh, that's romance. But not for you, darling. If I know you, he'll have to Boise, be... Boise! What's the matter? This telegram is... Hilda! Hilda! Quick! Boise, call the railroad station and get a reservation to New York. But what yes, on the... Mr. Hilda, go home, pack everything, everything. We're leaving for New York. Oh! But Boise, don't stand there as if you were painted on the wall. Do something. Do you mind explaining what this is all about? You'll find I understand English like a native. It's Granny. It's my own darling grandmother. She's ill. Maybe she's dying. Oh, I've got to get to her right away. Hilda, hurry. It's Granny. Lucy Van Speeden. Hot or cold, she gets her way. <laughs> I can't sign all your books. I'd like to, but really, I haven't time. Conductor, we should have left five minutes ago. We're holding this train. Sorry, Miss Chester. We're waiting for a guy named Anthony Amberton. Hey, Anthony Amberton's here. Anthony Amberton! Well, that seemed to interest everybody. Who is this Anthony Amberton? He's a writer. Movies? Books. My wife reads herself to sleep with him. Oh, one of those writers. Yeah. Women of the Torrid Countries by Anthony Amberton. Below the Equator by Anthony Amberton. Igloo Nights by the author of Melee, Day by Day. Just between you and me, he gives me a pain. Just between you and me, he gives me a bigger one. Come on, dear. I've just bought a book for you to read. Astride the Himalayas by Anthony Amberton. Oh, oh. you too. Oh, please, please. No, I can't. I've got to get on the train. Porter, where's my car? Right this way, Mr. Amberton. Oh, excuse me. Not now, please. Now, I missed my train. In here, sir. Wait, will you get me out of this? Your compartment's this way, sir. Boy, headhunters in the jungle, autograph hunters in Los Angeles, savages everywhere. I, I've climbed Mount Everest. I've swum the Hellespont. I've crossed the Andes on a lum. I never went through anything like that before. Right in here, sir. Oh, sanctuary. Yes, sir. Certainly it's nice to have you with us, Mr. Amberton. I'm a kind of explorer myself. I got as far as Honolulu one time. Oh, you did, huh? Well, good for you. Well, we'll swap travel logs in the morning. Until then, I don't want to see a single soul. You understand? I'll have dinner in here. Yes. Uh, that time I was telling you about in Honolulu... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, goodbye. And uh, here, buy yourself a ukulele. Yes. Sir. Oh, we got another celebrity on board, Mr. Amberton. Miss Cherry Chester. Cherry Chester? Well, nobody's named Cherry Chester. Well, she says she... Well, what is Cherry Chester? Some kind of new soft drink or something? Well, no, sir. She's a moving picture star. Oh, oh, well, I never go to pictures. Those marshmallow-faced movie stars make me sick. Yes, sir. Now, give me the simple, primitive woman, the woman of long silences, consuming in love, enduring in marriage. Yes, sir. Me too. Cherry Chester. Huh. Sounds like a hero in a costume picture. Let's see that book, dear. Anthony Emberton, The Great Adventure. I'll bet he's lost without his hot water bottle. Anthony Emberton, he makes me sick. Come in. Hello, Anthony. Welcome to New York. Hello, Holbrook. Nice of you to meet me. Al, how are things in the publishing world? Just marking time till the next Emberton bestseller. Where's your luggage? Oh, the porter took it. I'm waiting for that crowd to clear off the platform. I sort of wanted to sneak into New York quietly, you know, just for a change. Oh, but Anthony, that crowd yeah, isn't don't here. don't tell me about crowds. It's been that way all the way across the corner. You know, it's a funny thing, isn't it? If I were still Samuel Smith, heir to the Smith Plumbing Supplies, they wouldn't even notice me. But now that I'm Anthony Amberton, the boy explorer, well, just look out there. Look at me. Anthony, I, uh... I'm afraid your devoted publisher is your only crowd. Well, no, but the headhunters, look, they're out in full force. Yes, but uh, you see, Cherry Chester came in on this train, too. 
Who? Oh, oh, that movie Martha, huh? Well, she probably lives on this sort of thing. I loathe women like that. Give me the simple, primitive woman, the woman of long silence. Well, I'm only a publisher, but I'll see what I can do. Oh, yeah. Well, let's go as long as they aren't here to see me. Come on, old boy. Please, I can't stop now. Boys, you get me out of here. I've got to get home to Granny. Tell me I'm too late. I'll... Well. Granny, oh, Granny, darling. Come here to me, Sarah Brown. Granny, why aren't you in bed? Let me look at you. You're thinner. Well, we'll change that. <laughs> you look fairly healthy, though. Yes, but you're the one that's ill, I believe. I? I never had a sick day in my life. Lucy, Lu- you, you, you old folk. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy, you're magnificent. I, I thought you were dying that telegram. <laughs> it was a dirty trick, but anything's fair when you want to see your granddaughter as much as I do. Oh, dear. Darling. Now, what's all this I hear about you and that Egyptian prince, as he calls himself? Well, he's got a certain right to call himself one. He is the prince. Don't quibble. What about it? Oh, the papers make so much of every little thing. All he wants to do is marry me. Marry you? I never heard of such a thing. Oh, Grandmother, you modern. You know what I mean. Answer me, Sarah Brown. Are you going to marry that uh, that camel tamer? No, dear, not for a while anyway. A million years or so. Well, that's better. Now... There's just one thing more. No cherry chester of Hollywood is going to stay in this house. Look at you, all powdered and painted. Your ancestors must be spinning in their graves. Now go upstairs and wash your face. And when you come down to dinner, I want to see my granddaughter. Plain Sarah Brown. Simply done hair, simple dress, everything simple. Simple? Lucy, I'll be positively idiotic. What's for dinner besides food? Oh, just a few old friends of the family. Wee! Paper caps and confetti! Yeah, don't be absurd, dear. And I believe Horace is dropping in, too. Horace. You mean Cousin Horace? Your third Cousin Horace. Oh, I think I'm beginning to understand. So that's your little plan, is it, Lucy? Horace Van Steeden is a monument of respectability. Rose Grant's tomb, but who wants to marry it? I said nothing of marriage. Not yet, you mean. You've been throwing Horace Van Steeden at my head since he was ten and I was three. And I won't marry him. I won't. I won't. Put down that vase. Where did you ever learn such manners? In Hollywood. Well, you're not in Hollywood now. Put it down. All right. Come in. Oh, hello there. Oh, come in, Horace. We were just talking about you. Oh, were you? Hello, Sarah. Hello, Horace. Uh, nice to see you again. Very nice indeed. Why, thank you, Horace. Thank you very much. Sarah. <laughs> I- I've just been telling Sarah that I hope you two will be seeing a good deal of each other for the next few weeks. Oh, I, I think that should be very enjoyable, very. Oh, do you, do you, Sarah! Sarah, wait, where are you going? I'm going out for a drive. I shall go mad if I don't. And if Horace proposes once more, I'll tear him in pieces, I swear it. I've never seen you so upset. Oh, Boise, I'm so tired of being Hollywood's Cherry Chester, and I'm fed up with being Grandmother Sarah Brown. Oh, to be alone on a mountaintop, alone with the snow, the sunshine, the stars, where... Well, people don't know me, where I could live and do as I pleased without interference. That place doesn't exist, dear. Go on, have your ride. You'll feel better. Wait a minute. What's that thing out in the street? The carriage, dear. The carriage. Oh, yes, I'd forgotten. Good afternoon, Miss Sarah. Why, good afternoon, Higgins. I see that Grandmother still disapproves of motor cars. Yes, miss, it's the odor of gasoline. You know, this seems like old times. Already, miss. Uh, one moment while I adjust my hoop skirts and raise my parasol. Okay, Higgins, let's rip. Whee! Amberton in person, book department. He's autographing books. Come on, Harry, this is our chance. Isn't he just too marvelous? Well, Mr. Amberton, I can just see you stalking through the jungle. Can you? Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, who's next? Mr. The... Amberton, will you please write something personal in my book? My husband's so jealous. Yes, well, I... Oh. Oh. Look, Holbrook, what's the matter, Anthony? That perfume again, smell it. Well, what's the matter with it? I don't know. Everywhere I go, on boats, on trains, in airplanes, women wear that perfume. Why? Well, it's very popular. It's cherry blossom, named after Cherry Chester. (laughs) Cherry Chester? 
Well, look, I can't stand it. Come on. Anthony! I, I've got, get me out of here. I'm sick. All right, all right. Take it easy. We'll go out and get some air. Come on. Where's he going? Oh, where's he going? Well, how do you feel now, Anthony? Well, uh, better, thanks. That fresh air always does the trick. That, that stuff gets me every time. I was marooned on a plague-ridden African village once for six months. It had the same odor. Ever since, the smell of musk knocks me out. Well, don't look now, but here comes the thundering herd. Oh, no, listen, I can't face that crowd again. I'm leaving. All right, run. I'll hold them off as long as I can. All right, so long. Call me at the office. <laughs> I don't know, miss. The crowd seems to be chasing somebody. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, do you mind if I get in here with you? Thanks very much. Uh, keep going, driver. Will you, uh, just sit here, will you, please? Uh, sort of let me hide behind you. Thanks very much. Hello. What's new? Uh, uh nothing much. Uh, you uh, Don't move, please, or I'm lost. Say, what do you think you're doing jumping in there? It's all right. Higgins, pay no attention oh, to him. Very good, miss. Oh, well, you're very kind. Boy, that was a narrow escape. Would you mind dropping me off further on a bit here? I should hand you over to the police. What did you steal? Steal? Oh, no, no. I, you think I'm a shoplifter. No, you're wrong. I haven't stolen anything. Well, you should give it back. No, really, really. I, I haven't, I swear. Look, it's a very simple thing to explain. All you have to do is know who I am. Is yeah. that all? Well? Uh, well, take a good look at me. All right. I'm looking at you. Now what? You mean you don't know who I am? Of course I don't, but I'm sure the police do. No, but they don't. How fortunate. Well, I can see I'll have to explain. Please don't. Let's change the subject. I'm sure it must be very embarrassing for you. Oh, well, all right. Uh, do you like New York? Not much. Do you? No, it's a terrible place. I'm going to get out of it, too. Somewhere where nobody knows me, where I can be alone. No. It's funny you should say that. That's exactly how I feel. You? Really on the level? <laughs> on the level. Well, why are you looking at me like that? You know, you know, you could be quite lovely. Oh, do you really think so? Yeah, in a curious sort of way. Well, are you sure you uh, haven't seen me before? You don't know who I am? Why, no. Is there any reason why I should? No. No, of course not. Say, uh, tell me, is this, uh, is this your carriage? Here? Well, it, it belongs to my people. They don't understand me. They're trying to marry me to a man I loathe. In this day and age? Well, that's impossible. Well, he... He has a great deal of money. Money? And they'd sell you. Why, those are dark age medieval ideas. Well, you don't know my family. If, if I could only get away. Look, look. I, I must see you again and talk to you. You can't. Well, who's going to stop us? Well, I don't know, but... Coachman, coachman, what's the matter? Keep going. Can't. Traffic light. Oh, a traffic light at a time like this. Now, listen. I must see you again. Free, untroubled by people or convention. Just yourself. Well, I don't know. I don't want to know your name or where you live. I won't tell you mine. Oh, listen. Look, they're after me again. Look. Who? That crowd, they'll tear me to pieces. Well, get out and run. Run. Well, no, I'll have to, but I'm, I'm going to see you again. Now, this is a dream, but we can make it more than just a dream if you'll come. Come where? Well, take this card now. I'll be waiting to see you. I'll come soon. Goodbye. Well, uh, goodbye. Mr. and Mrs. Abner Simpson, Moonsocket, New Hampshire, winter sports, reasonable rates, home cooking. Higgins, can you imagine? What, miss? A shoplifter with an address. <laughs> Did you enjoy your drive? Oh, it was lovely, lovely. Isn't life glorious, Boise? Haven't been uh, drinking, have you? <laughs> <laughs> Boise, are these flowers for me? For you, from Prince Alley. Alley, oh, how sweet. Remind me to send him a wire. You needn't bother. He's here in New York, and he's called 16 times this afternoon. Only 16? He's slipping. And we're sailing for Buenos Aires tonight at 12. Sailing tonight? Lucy's idea. Yes, conceived shortly after the flowers arrive. She's meddling again. I won't stand it. Bonus Aries. Bonus... Now, please don't break anything. Bonus Aries. And why not? It must be quite lovely at this time of year. What? Give me that phone book. Yes, yes. The ocean voyage would do Lucy a world of good. Uh, Horace is going too. Oh, dear Horace. How thoughtful, how very thoughtful of him. Sarah, do you feel all right? I feel perfectly swell. Go and tell my doting grandparent that I'm delighted with her plan. All right, but I wish you'd tell me what you had to drink. Nectar. Mm -hmm. Ambrosia. Get out, Boise. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Abner Simpson, winter sports, reasonable rates. Oh, hello. Hello, Grand Central. Can you tell me what time the next train leaves for New Hampshire? Oh, a very special place. Moonsocket. 
M O O N S. In just a moment, Mr. DeMille and our stars, Carol Lombard and James Stewart, will return for Act Two of The Moon's Our Home. And now, a last time announcement. Listen carefully, for tonight is our last offer of the Lux Flakes Gone with the Wind brooch. No wonder women are thrilled with it, for it's exquisite, an expensive-looking jewelry piece, and such a bargain. Let me tell you about it. It has the rich, authentic look of the heirloom jewelry of the Old South, for the original was worn in Gone with the Wind. It is even lovelier than the Scarlet O'Hara brooch we offered last fall, and entirely different in design. It is round and big, almost two inches in diameter, with a safety catch on the clasp. In the center is a big turquoise-colored stone surrounded by a circle of five exquisite simulated pearls. It has an antique-style gold finish, and the edge is daintily scalloped. Why, it's so good-looking as you'll want to wear it right around the clock, with party dresses, suits, and street dresses, too. Now, of course, you want to own one of these exquisite jewelry pieces. Well, it's not too late, but you must let us have your order at once. Tonight is the last time we will make this offer. Now, here's what you do. Buy a big box of new Quick Lux Flakes. They come in the same familiar box and cost you no more. Tear off the opening tab at the top corner of the Lux box. Mail this tab with 15 cents in coin, no stamps, please, to Lux, Box 1, New York City. Lux, Box 1, New York City. Be sure to include your name and address. With your brooch, we'll send an illustrated order blank showing how you can get a bracelet, ring, pendant, and earrings to match your brooch, all at wonderful bargain prices. Now remember, send the opening tab from a large box of Lux Flakes, 15 cents in coin, and your name and address to Lux, Box 1, New York City. This offer is good only in the United States. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of The Moon's Our Home. Starring James Stewart as Anthony Amberton and Carol Lombard as Cherry Chester. Cherry Chester Mystery! Nationwide search for movie stars! Cherry Chester disappears! Like the snows of yesterday, Cherry Chester has vanished into the snows of the present. For the snow is six feet deep in Moonsocket, New Hampshire. In an old-fashioned sleigh, she jingles merrily toward the Simpson home, her eyes sparkling with adventure. The driver of the sleigh, Mr. Simpson, is a fund of information. Uh, that's the old Redfern farm over there. Nellie's having her fourth baby. Big house, though, plenty of room. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, say, we've got another city border out to the place. Oh, have you? Yeah, queer sort of cuss, too. Mighty queer. Well, uh, is uh, the queer cuss, is he a young man? Well, I wouldn't be saying he was young, and I wouldn't be saying he was old. But uh, judging by appearances, I'd say he was around uh, 30. <sighs> That's fine. On the other hand, uh, appearances can be deceiving. Uh, now, uh, uh, take you, miss. Uh, I, I didn't quite catch the name. Brown. Brown. Hmm. Uh, his name is Smith. <laughs> well, what's so funny? Uh, uh, nothing much. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Simpson. Yes, I am. I wonder if you have a room for me for a few days. You didn't write for accommodations. No, no, I didn't. But, but a friend of mine told me about your place, and I needed a rest, so I just came. I guess we can put you up. Oh, thank you. Uh, where does this grip go? Upstairs, silly. That's my husband. Yes, we've already met. Oh, it's lovely here. So peaceful. Oh, tell me, is there a, a young man named Mr. Smith staying here? Smith? Why didn't you say so? Say what? That you were Mr. Smith's cousin he was expecting. He was expecting? Yes. He said you'd come. He didn't tell me your name. Uh, Brown. Sarah Brown. You are his cousin, aren't you? Why, yes, that is distantly. You, uh, you see, we haven't seen each other for years. I, I ran into him the other day. I see. Well, he's out tobogganing. You can probably find him at the top of the hill. Thank you. Expecting you. Oh, I shouldn't have come. He's too sure of himself. Hello, you. Oh, hello, mister. Well, I got here last night. What took you so long? Now, just a minute. Well, never mind. I'm glad you came anyway. Are you? I'm not so sure. And by the way, Cousin Smith, how are the rest of the family? Oh, uh, uh, splendid. Of course, little Archie fell in the cistern last week. Didn't he? No. Oh, yes, yes. Oh. Very sad. Well, there's so many at home, they'll never miss him. Yes. <laughs> well, how, how'd you like to take a ride in my toboggan? Oh, is it safe? Well, sure. Can't run out of gas. All right. 
Sit down. Wait, is your name really Smith? Oh, yes, yes, but it isn't the name by which most people know me. I don't want to tell you my other name. It sort of spoils things. And what makes you think there's anything to spoil? Uh, well, you make me think so. Oh, I do, huh? Yeah, sit down. Where? Well, back seat. That's where women belong. Now, put your arms around me. I will not. All right, if you think you can hang on, let's go. Now, watch yourself now. <laughs> I told you, better put your arms around me. All right, all right. All right, there, that's much better. Think you're smart, don't you? Why, you frightened? Of course not. Do you like it? Oh, I love it. It gets steeper down here. Don't let go now. Wow. Oh, it was grand. You were frightened, though, huh? Well, just a little at first. Well, you'll never be frightened with me. We'll travel rougher roads and turn narrower corners. Will we? we? Say, you're pretty sure of yourself, aren't you? You know, you're lovely. Yeah, I, I, I told you in the carriage that you could be, you know? Oh, I, I, I hate you. Good, good, good. There's nothing more helpful to romance than a little hate. Now, just tell me one thing. I, is your name really Brown? Yes, it is, but it's not the name by which most people know me. I shan't tell you my other name. It, it would spoil things. <laughs> Ah, do you see that moon up there? That's where we belong, you and I. Alone on the moon, where nobody could ever bother us. Yeah, that's our home up there. Do you always go without a hat? Huh? Why? <laughs> well, I've heard of sunstroke. There's probably a moonstroke, too. Oh, yeah. Well, probably. Well, going without a hat's good for the hair. But... Yeah, I had a friend of my, on my father's side who always went without a hat. He was bald. Yeah, he probably didn't have any hair to start with. <laughs> you know, uh, you should never comb yours. Why? Well, I sort of like it that way. I, I, I think you're crazy. Well, I am completely. Well, it certainly is a glorious night, isn't it? Glorious? And what's more, there's nothing phony about it. No camouflage. All this could be paradise for the right sort of people. Tell me more about your idea of paradise. Well, for one thing, not being hedged in by a lot of crazy conventions. As for me, I just discard them. <laughs> you sound like a heathen. Oh, no, nothing like that. It's just that I don't burden myself with a lot of illusions as to right and wrong. I don't believe in marriage. Well, what's the matter with marriage? Well, everything. In the first place, it's unimportant. Well, your father and mother didn't think so. Or did they? Uh, uh, <laughs> well, uh, uh, no. Uh, it's old-fashioned, outdated. It would only take one woman to make you change your mind. No, no. Marriage is the monkey wrench women throw into the machinery of love. Now, without it, there'd be no past to bother you, no future to worry about, nothing but the present. Interesting, but strangely familiar. I must have read it somewhere. Oh, read it where? I don't remember. Say, say, aren't we going too fast? Yes, as a matter of fact, we are. Hey, hey, easy, Nellie. Hey, whoa, Nellie. Well, pull on the reins. Well, what do you think I'm doing? Uh, I'm pulling on... Whoa, uh, whoa, Nellie. Oh. You see, feminine instinct all over willful, headstrong. Well, I can't stop her. You got any ideas well, on this Well, you way? might try flattery. Flattery, that's not a bad idea. Uh, uh, no, uh, nice, Nellie. Uh, sweet, Nellie. Hey, hey, look, Whoa, whoa, now, hang on tight. Stop, Nellie. Uh, lovely Nellie, will you? Oh, oh, no. Hey, hey, where are you? Here's the snow. Help me out. Well, are you all right? <coughs> yes, I'm all right. That was nice driving, mister. What happens now? Uh, well, simple. We'll both walk home from a sleigh ride. Oh, yeah. well, you think she'll catch cold, Miss Simpson? Can't tell, but I send her up to bed. We'll put this stone at her feet. Ought to be hot enough now. Well, here, uh, let me take it up to her. Careful, don't burn your hands. No, I won't. Thanks very much. Oh, uh, Sarah. Sarah, are you awake? Who, who's there? What's me? Let me in. Let you in? Let you... Get away from that door. Why? What are you talking about? L listen. Get away, do you hear me? Maybe you don't believe in a lot of crazy conventions, but I do. Now get away from that door before I scream. Ah! <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Hey, why didn't you let me in last night? Did you expect me to? Well, I certainly did. Oh, you did, of all the nerves. Don't see anything to get so hysterical Not about. Not only are you a thief, but Oh, I'm... so you're going to bring that up again. <laughs> oh, God bless you. Uh, you. You still think I'm a shoplifter, huh? Oh, what's the use? Exactly, what's the use? I don't blame you. I blame myself. You did what any ordinary man would do. I 
followed you here like a naive schoolgirl. I, I wanted to find out what kind of a man you were. Well, I found out. Are, are you trying to tell me that you think that last I'm night not I... trying to tell you anything. Oh, so you're putting me in a tough spot, huh? Well, just get this straight now. If you've got any funny ideas about my interest in you, just forget them. Your type of woman bored me. Give me the simple, primitive woman, the woman of long silences. You're not even good looking. You've got freckles. You're, your face is covered with them. You've got red hair, and I hate red hair. You've got green eyes, cat eyes, and you're stubborn and bad-tempered. And what more, you're ungrateful. Oh, he loves me. <laughs> That's your move. Oh, I'm sorry. Hey, you, you could have taken my king. Oh, I didn't see it. Hey, you're very strange tonight. What's the matter? Thinking. What about? Things, many things. Of shoes and ships and getting wax. Cabbages and kings. And why the sea is boiling hot and whether pigs have wings. Yeah. Yeah, you're different tonight. Warm and human. Somehow, all woman. A doubtful compliment. But well meant. Oh, it's been heavenly here. But I'm leaving tomorrow. Oh, leaving? No, you can't. Why not? Well, I have plans, and strangely enough, they all concern you. For instance? Well, for instance, I'm going to teach you to ski tomorrow. You'll have to find another pupil. Well, now, no, wait. What makes you so determined? Something I'd almost forgotten. Oh, oh, listen. That, that man you told me about in the carriage that day, is he the reason? Maybe. Oh, well, that, I, I feel better. Now that's all settled. You aren't going to marry him, you're going to marry me. Well, is that a proposal or a threat? No, it's just a statement. Well, it's quite impossible. <laughs> Why? Why? Well, for one thing, I, I don't believe in marriage. You don't? Well, now, who's been putting those half-baked ideas into your head? <laughs> well, marriage may not be perfect, but it's the only solution for the average woman. I am not an average woman. What makes you think so? Would you have fallen in love with an average woman? Mm, no, I wouldn't. But would you have fallen in love with an average man? Well, what makes you think I have? Well, no, no, of course not. Well, there you are. The only thing left for us to do is get married. I you? don't even know your name. Sam Smith. Sam Smith, oh, that's awful. Well, but what about Sarah Brown? I have a violent temper. Well, I have had complaints about mine, we'll too. We'll fight every day. And we'll make up every night. I'll leave you ten times a year. I'll always find you. I'll always find you, Sarah Brown. Oh, darling. <laughs> Authorized and empowered by the law to perform a marriage between two people who have expressed a desire to be married. So, Sam. Shh. I have here a license. Uh, wait, folks, I can't marry you. There ain't no license. And in New Hampshire, it takes five days to get one. I have it right here. How's that? The license. I have one. Have what? <laughs> the license. Here it is. See, right here. I'm a little deaf. That's fine. I'll start the ceremony. Where did you, you get that Smith license? Take five days ago. You were that five? sure of me? Why, of course. Fine. To have and you have been since before, the beginning, haven't you? Well, certainly. Good. After you all that, do you still expect me to marry you? I do. That's well, I wasn't taking any chances. Do you still think I was presumptuous? Do I? Sir, do you really mean it? I most certainly do. You made a fool out of me long enough, I'll marry you. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Just a minute. Just a minute. What'd you say, mister? Man and wife. It's over, folks. Three dollars, please. After a short intermission, Mr. DeMille will return with our stars, Carol Lombard and James Stewart, for Act Three of The Moon's Our Home. Meantime, here's a new kind of quiz, a sort of uh, that-reminds-me test. Now, I've asked one of our Lux Radio Theater audience, Mrs. Tyler Johnson of North Hollywood, to come to the microphone. I'm going to mention four words, and she's going to answer right off the bat just what these words remind her of. Are you ready, Mrs. Johnson? Yes, Mr. Ruick. Kitchen. Um, cooking. Dinner. Dishes. Dishpan. Dishpan. Why, red hand. Good. Last word, gentle. Uh, that's easy when you're thinking of hands in the dishpan. Lux flakes, of course. Aha, uh -huh, you're a mind reader, Mrs. Johnson. That's just what I hoped I'd remind you of, that Lux in the dishpan is gentle to hands. You know, every woman dreads that red, rough, ungroomed appearance of the hands that we call dishpan hands. And that's why, more and more, women are turning to new quick Lux for dishes. Because with Lux, their hands stay soft and smooth. 
Now, we've proved scientifically the great difference between Lux and harsh soaps in our famous one-hand tests. Hundreds of women took part in these tests, and here is what they did. They dipped one hand in Lux suds, the other in suds from another leading soap, under conditions similar to home dishwashing. The Lux hand stayed so much softer, smoother, and prettier that the women themselves were amazed. For example, take Mrs. Bruce Wilkinson, one of the many women who made the test. She says, My left hand was smooth, soft, and lovely after being a new quick Lux. My right hand in another soap was so unattractively red and coarse that I was really ashamed for anyone to see it. After this, I'll never use anything but Lux Flakes for dishes. You'll feel proud of your hands if you use new quick Lux for dishes. They'll stay so nice. These gentle suds are fast and thrifty, too. So why not get that generous big box tomorrow and use Lux Flakes for dishwashing all the time? We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The curtain rises on the third act of The Moon's Our Home. romance of Cherry Chester, born Sarah Brown, and Anthony Amberton, born Samuel Smith, has been one long series of arguments, but now all arguments are over and done with. Safe in the bridal suite of the Moonsocket Hotel, they face each other as Mr. and Mrs. Sam Smith. Hello, darling. Hello, darling. Any regrets? Not yet. Are you happy? I, I think so. I am very happy. Oh, I'm so glad. Except for one thing, Sarah. There's something I must tell you. Oh, let it keep until tomorrow, please. You, you see, I have something to tell you, too. Well, tell me now. Well, even if I wanted to, I couldn't now. You're really not a shoplifter, are you? Well, would it matter very much if I were? Oh, not tonight. Perhaps tomorrow. Perhaps not at all, ever. Oh, my darling. Kiss me, darling. Oh, Sam. Sam. Uh, uh, uh. Sam, what is oh. it? Holy smokes, that perfume again. You've got that perfume on your neck. Well, what's the matter with it? I can't stand it. I'm getting sick. Well, it's a cherry blossom. I know it is. Now open the windows, will you? Open them quick. For heaven's sakes, are you crazy? It's named after Cherry Chester. I know, I know. I, well, why don't you do something? Don't stand there like a petrified fort. Well, open the window. Can't you see I'm sick? Well, do you expect me to freeze to death just because you've got a complex or something? Oh, no, I, I should have told you. But that perfume, I, I never thought, you know, all this time you've never used it, Sarah. Watch that. You would change your clothes. You would take a bath or something. So. <laughs> Oh, I understand now. You've got memories, haven't you? That perfume brings them back. Yes, but... Uh, oh, you admit it. No, Don't no. deny it. I can see it in your face. I'm sick. That's what you see in my face. Oh, our, our wedding night, and you're thinking of someone else. Oh, I hate you. Sorry, sorry. I'm going to pass out. Go on, pass out. Oh, Throw no, it all over the place. Oh, Sarah, you, you wait. can't fool me. Oh, you, please, you don't, leave me. don't leave me here now. Oh, oh. oh. Good morning, Mr. Smith. Uh, did you sleep well, I sir? I don't remember. Where's my wife? Your wife? Oh, why, she's gone, sir. Gone? Gone where? Uh, to New York, sir. Uh, she left last night. Well, where in New York? She didn't say. I didn't think it was my place to ask. I never right. interfered. Well, when's the next train out of here? The next train? Oh, why, there isn't any. What? No, sir. Uh, there was a snow slide early this morning. The track's blocked. All right, well, charter me a plane. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. We haven't any airport. Well, get me something. Get me a dog sled or anything. I've got to get to New York. <laughs> Hello, Holbrook. I didn't expect you back for weeks yet. Have a nice trip? Had a rotten trip. Oh. Have a... Now, how did you like the Simpsons? Didn't like anybody. Well, uh, uh, how was the weather? The weather was foul. <laughs> What's the matter, Anthony? Upset stomach? Now, listen, Holbrook. You've got to help me. Where can I find a girl in this town? A girl? Why, uh, oh, my, my, my wife has some very nice friends. Oh, no, no, I don't mean I want to meet a woman. I mean I've met one, the woman, but she's disappeared, vanished, gone. Oh, well, if you know her name, why don't you try the telephone book? Well, there are 116 Sarah Browns in the telephone book, all ages, colors, nationalities. I've talked to every one of them. I've searched the city directory. I've been to the Bureau of Missing Persons. I've done everything. Well, uh, 
What does she look like? What does she look like? What does she look like? She's the sweetest, most wonderful, most beautiful girl in the world, Holbrook. She's... Well, now, we've got to find her, Holbrook. If you ever expect me to write another line, you've got to help me find Sarah Brown. Well, I'll... Uh... I'll certainly try, but if you've done everything... What's that yelling about? Huh? Oh, uh, nothing very important. They found Cherry Chester. She's come back. Cherry Chester. She's the one I've got to blame for this whole thing, you know. A woman I've never seen has wrecked my whole life. Here's what Warner Wilson says in Broadway Lowdown. Although Miss Chester refuses to explain her whereabouts for the past few days, your correspondent has it on good authority that there is a certain guide in the main woods could shed some light Boise, on... Boise, stop it. I don't want to know about it. Well, just as you like. The other paper says you're in the sanitarium with the DPs. Well, I feel like I was. <laughs> Boise, Boise, why do the papers want to hurt me? Why are people so unkind? I've, I've done nothing, at least nothing, that concerns them. You're a public figure, and as such, your life is not your own. Oh, I've made an awful fizzle of things, haven't I? It seems that I always do. I... I just wanted to get away to be myself. I didn't expect to get myself in a jam. And what a jam I'm in, you'll never know. I haven't bothered you with any questions. No, won't either. Thank you, darling. Boise, Boise, do you believe in fables? Fables? I used to. Well, fables always have a happy ending, don't they? Always, darling. Good morning, Sarah. I want to speak to you. I thought you would, Granny. Boise, you may leave. Yes, ma'am. Sarah, everything is arranged. I've already talked to Horace and the newspaper men are waiting. Waiting for what? For the announcement of your engagement to Horace. Engagement? But, but, Granny... My dear, my dear, I've gone into the situation quite thoroughly. The immediate announcement of your engagement to Horace is the only step we can take to silence this scandalous gossip. But, Granny, it's, it's impossible. Why, Granny, suppose I were to tell you that I was already married. <laughs> I'd say it was your way of evading an issue. But I am. Huh? Who to? Why, to... Sam Smith, that's it. All right, all right. Who is he? Where does he come from? What does uh, he do? Well, I, I don't... Granny, you've got to believe me. I'll believe you. Produce him. Where is he? I don't know. That is, I'm not exactly sure where he is. I'm trying to find him. Sarah Brown, if you must lie, do it more convincingly. Now, come on. Come on, let's see the reporters and get this thing over with. Granny, please don't please. Are you coming with me, or shall I see them alone? All right, but when I marry Horace and they come and arrest me for bigamy, don't say I didn't warn you. Fiddlesticks. Hello. Hello, Holbrook. Holbrook, this is Anthony. Find out anything? Oh, well, if they can't look at him, nobody can. Look, Holbrook, I've got to get out of this town. I can't stand it. Get me passage on the first tramp of sailing. Where? I don't anywhere. Just call me back, will you? I'm at the club. Have them page me in the lobby. Oh, oh, excuse me. Oh, I, hello, Horace. Why, Sam. I mean, Anthony. It's stupid of me. I never can remember your pen name. Oh, that's all right, Horace. How have you been? Oh, fine, 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 fine. <laughs> well, aren't you going to congratulate me? Congratulate you? What for? Oh, don't tell me you haven't heard whether the newspapers have been full of it. Well, I haven't read a paper in weeks. Oh. Well, I, I'm going to be married. Married? Oh, well, that's great. Hey, what's the matter with you? Are you sick? No, no, no. Just dying. That's all. Now, you look awful. See, I've got it. What you need is a little relaxation. You're coming to my New Year's party tomorrow night. No, thanks. I don't think I can make oh, it. Oh, I won't take no for an answer. You've got to meet my fiance. You'll be crazy about her. And she may like you. <clears throat> Of course you're coming. Where's the old college spirit? A little conviviality is just what you need. Well, Horace, maybe you're right. That's exactly what I need. A seat on the merry-go-round. Of course I knew it. Meet me at the Club Continental at 10 o'clock. Club Continental at 10 o'clock. Uh, what was that trick you wanted, sir? A Stambul slide car. I, I think that's got me. You mean to say you've never heard of a Stambul slide car? Uh, no, sir. I don't know what kind of a place is it. Where's everybody been for the last ten years? Well, I come from Milwaukee myself. Oh, well, never mind. Just mix me something strong. Make mine double. I need it. Sarah. Sam, I couldn't believe my eyes. Sarah Brown. Sarah Smith. I'm the lady you married, remember? Oh, yeah. But you look different. Darling, why didn't you try to find me? Well, I, I did. Did you want to be found? Oh, what do you think? Well, I think the world's quite sane and we're completely mad. Now, come on, let's get out of here. Well, there's a terrace outside. Come on, quick. Oh, darling, why 
why didn't you tell me? I, I never would have run away from you. Oh, I tried to tell you. I was too sick. I didn't, anyway, you wouldn't listen. <laughs> I thought it was the memory of some woman you couldn't forget. On this earth, there's only one woman, and it's you. Oh, darling, I missed you so. I was going to drink myself into my grave. <laughs> you couldn't, sweetie. You'd have gotten sick. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I don't know. Tell me, though, you've changed. Well, what's it all about? Your, your clothes and everything. Where are my freckles? What's happened to Sarah Brown? Well, Sammy, there's something we've got to talk over, something important. Well, of course, darling, any time you want. Where is she, Horace? Where did she go? I don't know. She went toward the bar, then I lost well, her. Well, find her. I'm looking, I'm looking. I wonder if Anthony's around. I did, I did want Shelly and Anthony to meet. All right. I married Sarah Brown, and now I discover I also married Cherry Chester. So what? Now I married Sammy Smith, and I find out that I've also accepted Anthony Emberton. So what? Sweetheart, we're bigamists. And I love you desperately. Oh, Anthony. We, we, I mean, Sam. We did have fun, didn't we? Loads. And we'll have lots more. Lots. And with this, this inane career of yours, without that to worry you, why, think how happy we'll be. What? I said we'll travel the world's highways, we'll explore every hidden byway, we'll do crazy, ridiculous things, we'll, we'll live on the moon. But, Sammy, I'm not retiring from the screen. Oh, yes, of course you are. That's all settled. Well, are you giving up writing and exploring? Oh, no. No, certainly not. Oh, I see. The woman's place is in the home. Hallelujah. That's quite true. Oh, no, it's not. Well, she certainly has no place on a movie screen making faces for a living. You don't call that acting, do you? Well, I hope you don't cherish any illusions as to your ability as a writer. Oh, so you've read my books. I tried one. I couldn't finish it. I don't believe it. Which one? The one where you slide down the six pyramids. There are nine pyramids. Six? Nine. So I'm not only a bad actress, but a liar. Now, I never realized how utterly disagreeable you can be. I never realized you were so righteous and smug. I just merely said that you were a disagreeable, worthless little brat. You're That's a conceited, it. ill-tempered, impossible beast, and I detest All you. All right, now you listen to me. Take your hands off me. I'll show you. Oh, just let me get my shoe off and I'll show you. All right, just stand up here. Go on, stand Have up. Have you ever been hit on the head with a high heel? No, and I won't. That's what you think. Ooh. Come on, give me that slipper. Take it. Now, come on, oh. give me that, will you? Let me go, you big ape. Come on, stop kicking here. Stop, look out. Look out. There. Oh, knock me down, will you? All right, now give me that slipper. Hello there, Sarah, dear. I've been looking all over for oh, you. Oh, Horace. Uh, is something wrong here? No, no, nothing at all. Oh, uh, Sarah, this is Anthony Amberton, my old friend. Anthony, my fiancé. Charm. Just a minute. Did you say fiancé? Why, yes, of course. Oh, I see. Well, I really owe you an apology, Miss Chester. You're not only a great actress, but a cheat. For a divorce, I suggest Reno. Oh, help me up, Horace. Oh, <clears throat> Sarah, this is awful. What did he mean about a divorce? Nothing. Nothing important. Well, where's my shoe? Well, I think he had it in his hand. Shall I go after No, him? let him go. Horace, you're sane, quiet, and soothing, aren't you? <laughs> well, I, I'm conservative, yes. Yes, and that's what I want from now on. Oh, it's 12 o'clock, Sarah. Well, Happy New Year, Horace. Happy New Year. 12 o'clock and Cinderella's lost her slipper. I thought I made that clear. I'm looking for Sarah Brown or Cherry Chester or whatever she happens to be calling herself today. She's not here. She isn't? Well, I'll look for her myself. Get out of this house. Get out or no, I'll have you arrested. No, I won't. Don't think you're frightening me. I've heard all about you, you antediluvian tyrant. Ooh. Yeah, you don't impress me. You, I don't see anything so terrifying about you. But, but, but what do you want? What do I want? Do you see this slipper? I want the foot that goes in it. Do you see this marriage certificate? It's a claim check on a girl. A girl about five feet two, red hair, green eyes, face covered with freckles. She's willful, spoiled, has a terrible disposition. My granddaughter. My wife. Your wife? Oh, so you're Sam Smith. Yeah, yeah. Don't hold that against me. You're very masterful, aren't you? That's just what Sarah needs. Look, I don't know what she needs, but I need Sarah. Now, where is she? Thanks to your bad temper and, well, my stupidity, your wife is catching the 11 o'clock train for Reno. 
where in due time she expects to marry Horace Van Steeden. Well, wait a minute. I've got to stop her. How? Well, I don't know, but Wait, I wait. I have some influence in this town. Boise, get me the police department. <laughs> Hurry, Sarah. Hurry. I'm hurrying, Horace. There he is, officer. Stop. There he is. Stop. Sam. Oh, hello, Sam. I... Oh, thought you'd sneak out of town, eh? Here he is, officer. Come along, you. Hello, wait. What have I done? No, no, none of that. Come on, Benny. Benny? Boston, Benny. We know you. Escaped from Altoona a year ago. Oh, that's ridiculous. I've never been in... A... What'd you say? Altoona. In Altoona in my life, have I, Sarah? What's the use? They've got you dead to rights this time, Benny. Sarah! Come along, Sarah. Hello, wait, this is a horrible mistake. You can't... Oh, Sarah. Oh, Sam. Uh, darling, uh, le let's talk things over. Oh, yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. So ends Act Three of The Moon's Our Home. In just a moment, Mr. DeMille and our stars will be back for their curtain call. And now, let me remind you that this is our very last offer of the Lux Flakes Gone with the Wind brooch, the one designed from the exquisite pin worn in the movie Gone with the Wind. You'd better send your order in immediately, or it may be too late for you to own one of these stunning jewelry pieces. And they really are stunning. So many of my friends have remarked about mine especially about how rich and expensive looking it is. But, well, the thing I like best is how lovely it looks on many different outfits, from a tailored suit to an evening dress. I think my gun with the wind brooch is one of the nicest presents I ever gave myself. And it certainly is the biggest bargain. Sally is right. This brooch does make a beautiful present, for yourself or to give to your friends. And yet it costs so little. It's entirely different from the Scarlet O'Hara brooch we offered last fall. Even lovelier. It's round and big, almost two inches in diameter, with an antique-style gold finish and a lovely cluster of simulated turquoise and pearls in the center. The kind of jewelry piece that every woman loves. Because it's not only beautiful in itself, it's fashion right. Now here's how to get this wonderful bargain. Listen carefully, please, because this is the last time we are making this offer. First, buy a big box of Lux Flakes. You'll need this to take care of all nice washables, stockings, underthings, sweaters, and dresses. Next, tear off the opening tab at the top corner of the Lux box and mail it with your name and address and 15 cents in coin, no stamps, please, to Lux, Box 1, New York City. Lux, Box 1, New York City. With your brooch, you'll get an illustrated order blank for matching jewelry pieces. Ring, pendant, bracelet, and earrings. All amazing bargains. But don't delay. Now remember, send the opening tab from a big box of Lux Flakes, 15 cents in coin, and your name and address to Lux, Box 1, New York City. This offer is good only in the United States. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. Once more, the spotlight turns to Carol Lombard and Jimmy Stewart as they come back to this microphone. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. You know, the thing I like about this Lux Radio Theater is the way everything runs so perfectly. You never miss anywhere. Say, you're not going to play the accordion now, are you, Jimmy? Oh, no, uh, I didn't bring it tonight. I, uh, I should have been applause there. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, this is no place for my accordion. Why, even the boys and girls that collect autographs at the door won't take just anything. For instance, there was that girl who stopped me on the way in tonight. You, she... uh, you surely didn't disappoint her, Jimmy. Oh, no, I signed, and then I asked her what she was going to do with it, and she said, well, if I can get Carol on board when the show's over, why, uh, I know where I can trade both of you for Clark Gable. <laughs> to speak to her. She can't make a bad bargain like that. Oh, now, be polite, Carol. I might have to take back my autograph. <laughs> but seriously, Mr. DeMille, I have enjoyed very much coming back to Lux Radio Theater. In the past few months, I think you've really taken on a new assignment here. All entertainment is a premium now, and anything that lifts us out of the everyday routine for an hour or so is what we need at a time like this. 
America must be strong, and we must keep it free by making it stronger still. While we're all working toward that end, to the limit of our strength, we need the emotional outlet that a theater like this provides. Let me show you a little of our mail sometime, Carol, and you'll understand why we think of this as a national theater. Oh, what's going on in it next week, Mr. DeMille? Plenty of action, Jimmy. Our play is Johnny Apollo, and our stars are Dorothy Lamour, Edward Arnold, and Burgess Meredith. Johnny Apollo is the story of a father and son who lost faith in each other, and of a girl named Lucky who brought them together again. Next Monday night, you'll hear Edward Arnold as the father, Burgess Meredith as the son, and Dorothy Lamour as the girl named Lucky. The 20th Century Fox picture made a hit on the screen, and I have a distinct premonition it will do the same for us. Well, that's a great story, Mr. DeMille, and you have a swell cast. Good night. Good night. Mm -hmm. Good night. <laughs> Our stage doormat has welcome on it for you two any time. Good night. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Dorothy Lamour, Edward Arnold, and Burgess Meredith in Johnny Apollo. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. This week, the nation is celebrating Boy Scout Week, the 31st anniversary of the Boy Scout movement in America. Today, a million and a half scouts are training for democracy as active members of this great organization. Ladies and gentlemen, we invite you to join the Lux Radio Theater in saluting the Boy Scouts of America. James Stewart appeared tonight through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and is currently seen in this studio's production, Come Live With Me. Carol Lombard's current screen hit is Mr. and Mrs. Smith, the RKO production, which was directed by Alfred Hitchcock. Heard in tonight's play were Clara Blondick as Lucy, Verna Felton as Boise, Hans Conried as Horace, Lou Merrill as Holbrook, Charles Seal as Justice of the Peace, Ralph Sedan as Abner, Stanley Farrar as Coachman, Gloria Blondell as Hilda, James Hegels as Hotel Clerk, Jack Carr as Porter, Celeste Rush as Miss Manning, and Noreen Gamill as Mrs. Simpson. The brooch, offered you by the makers of Lux Flakes, was designed from one worn and gone with the wind, the Selznick International picture, produced by David O. Selznick and released by Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. Our music is directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. In just a moment, you'll hear James Stewart as the Six Shooter. There's music for you tomorrow evening with two of your favorite song stylists. First, it's the Dinah Shore Show, and then Songs with Sinatra. There's laughter, too, in your Friday lineup with three comedy favorites. The Bob Hope Show with Bob's guest Jerry Colonna, the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show, and Can You Top This? It's a great Friday night program lineup, all of them heard only on NBC. James Stewart as the sick shooter. The man in the saddle is angular and long-legged. His skin is sun-dyed brown. 
The gun in his holster is gray steel and rainbow mother of pearl. Its handle unmarked. People call them both the Six Shooter. The NBC Radio Network presents James Stewart as the Six Shooter, a transcribed series of radio dramas based on the life of Britt Ponsett the Texas plainsman who wandered through the Western territories, leaving behind a trail of still-remembered legends. It was about 7 o'clock on a Saturday evening, and... I was riding down the east trail that led from Castle City over to Crown Ranch. It's been a real warm day. A little breeze was coming up now, and things were cooling off. A nice, comfortable twilight. I hadn't seen any signs of habitation for the last few miles. The soil was pretty thin and sandy. Probably wouldn't grow much. But a little further on, the ground turned brown, rich-looking. I noticed a frame house sitting back, oh, 50 yards back from the trail. When I was almost even with the house, the front door opened and somebody came running out toward me. Hey, hey, mister, would you hold up a minute, mister? Young boy, it looked like, about 15, 16, wearing blue jeans and a checkered shirt and a little peaked cap pulled down over his ear. Whoa, Scar. Whoa, boy. Whoa, boy. Howdy, son. What can I do for you? You come from town, mister? That's right. You didn't run across Friendly DeWitt on the trail, did you? Friendly DeWitt? You know him, don't you, mister? He runs the traveling mercantile. How's that? Oh, sure. We're too far out to get into town very much, so he brings around a wagon load of goods every once in a while. I, I just don't know what we do without him. Well, don't stand out there all night joying. Just find out about Friendly, like I told you. The gentleman ain't seen him, ma'am. Ah. Oh, shut up, Fern. You can wear something else if you have to. Ah. The supper dishes are waiting, Cindy Lou. What what was that she called you? Cindy Lou. But that's a girl's name. Oh, oh. Oh, oh. Oh, in this light here, the way you were dressed, I, I sort of thought maybe you were... It I don't mean... matter. Thanks again, mister. So long. Ah. Ah, so long. Hmm, Cindy Lou. Hmm. Well, I gave Scar a little touch of my heel. Let's go. Come on. Come on, boy. We started off. I figured I'd had about eight miles to go before I'd reached the Crown Ranch. I, I hadn't been through this part of the country in quite a spell. But I was pretty certain Floyd Prince would remember me from the old days. He'd sign me on for the summer if he had an opening. Come on, Scar. Come on. Come on. It was about 15 minutes later, and I... I came to the fork on the trail. I saw a wagon rolling along from the south. There's some wagon, too. Almost twice the size of anything I'd ever run into before. And the way the canvas bulged out, it looked like it was loaded to the brim. Well, it stood to reason that this was the traveling mercantile that Cindy Lou had mentioned. Whoa, Scott. Whoa. Whoa, Peggy. Whoa, Peggy. Easy now. Easy there. <laughs> Howdy, friend. Good evening. Good evening. You're, uh, Mr. DeWitt, I take it. You take it right, sir, except for that Mr. Part. Just call me friendly, like the rest of the folks. A friend in need is a friend indeed. <laughs> uh, something you needin', mister? No, no. Shoelaces, chewing tobacco, flour, salt, kitchen utensils, ammunition, yardage, zone equipment, anything at all. Just you name it, I got it here in my wagon. <laughs> yeah, sounds like quite an assortment there. Oh, that's only a part of it. I didn't even touch on my medical supplies. Oh. Old Doc Bostow's painkiller. Seth simple, all-purpose salve. Uh. Miss Jenny's bunion plasters and corn removers. You got any corns that's troubling you, mister? They're just a thing. No, no, I don't do too much walking. Oh. Some liniment, then? Uh, no, uh, thanks, just the same. I'm in pretty good health. Uh, well, uh, what about wearing apparel? I got a full line of Levi's shirts, bandanas, cotton and wool socks. No, <laughs> I'm just afraid I'm just not in the market for anything, friendly. Oh. The only reason I stopped was to tell you that those folks down the trail were getting kind of anxious about you. Folks down the trail? Uh-huh. You know, the farmhouse a couple miles back there. Well, I just can't imagine who you're talking about, mister. I ain't even headed that way. I'm making a delivery over the Davis Ranch near Evergreen. Uh, Davis girl's getting married tomorrow morning. I'm bringing all the paraphernalia for the wedding. 
You sure somebody in this neighborhood's looking for me? They seem to be. I don't know the family's name exactly. The girl I bumped into is called Cindy Lou. Well, that must be Cindy Lou Ames. But why would... Great yellow pumpkins. Patty Ames. That dress she ordered for her daughter Fern. Uh, what time you make it out to be, mister? I ain't on pack my shipment of alarm clocks yet. Oh, must be 7.30. Well, know. maybe I can get there before they leave. If I don't, Hattie Ames will skin me alive. Uh, get up, Pitty. Come on now. Come on, Francis. Come on. I knew there was something else. And I was working on that dress only this morning, too. Shorten in the hem. So long, mister. Hope you enjoy the square dance. Dance? What are you... Come on, Scott. Come on, Dance, what are, you, what are you talking about? Well, that's where you're heading, ain't it? The Crown Ranch? Yeah, as a matter of fact, it is. But I didn't know about any dance or anything. I was going to ask Floyd Prince for a job. Well, you mean tell me you ain't heard about the celebration tonight? No, not a word. Well, it's a count of Floyd Prince's son. He just come home from school and back east. Why, you mean Monty Prince? Yeah, that's the boy's name. You know him, mister? Oh, I used to. He was just a little shaver then. He's all grown up, huh? Well, he must be 20 or so, somewhere along in there. I guess he'll be taking over the crown one of these days. I see. Well, I reckon better put off my job hunt until some other time. I I wouldn't want to bother Floyd and give him a party. I'll, I'll ride along with you for a spell, friendly. Well, if you're an acquaintance of Floyd Prince's, I imagine you'd be more than welcome in his party. Practically everybody in the neighborhood's been invited. Maybe so, maybe so. But fact is, I'm not too good at square dancing. I don't know, but there's just something about my legs. A little too much of them, I reckon. <laughs> well, I just hope you're the only absentee. Well, what do you mean? Well, I had his daughter Fern. She was planning to wear this here dress her mom ordered from me. Oh. Yeah, oh. like it's not she's having a tantrum right now. She sure takes after Hattie. She does, huh? Yes, sir. And mind not delivering her outfit on time, well, there'll be real catastrophe. You see, Hattie's aiming to marry her Fern off to this young Monty Prince. And she'll probably manage it, too. Hattie usually gets her own way. Uh, uh-oh. Look over there, mister. Hmm? Uh, buggy coming up the trail. That'll be Hattie and Fern on the way to the crown. Yeah, I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Well, yeah. it's too late to do anything about the dress now if they're started off. Yeah, the best thing for me to do is to stay out of sight. Uh, I'll get my wagon over here under these trees here. Well, but... Easy, Francis, easy now. But, oh, but what do you... Easy. They're bound to see you sitting there. Oh, right? you don't know Hattie Ames like I do. What do you mean? Why, well, she's as nearsighted as a buffalo. Can't see her hand in front of her face unless she's wearing her bifocals. Oh. Uh, and she won't be wearing them either. Not if she's heading for Shindig. Well, what about the daughter? Well, I told you, Fern takes after her mother. She's as blind as a bat without her spectacles. I see. Uh, sh- sh- here they come. <laughs> there, there. What did they tell you? Oh, the dog <laughs> gone. They never even glanced over towards us, did they? No, not a glance. <laughs> well, I guess I might as well mosey over to the Davis Ranch. Nice meeting you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh... Oh, I'm sorry, friendly. I meant to introduce myself. My name's Ponset, Brick Ponset. Oh. Oh! Why, Mr. Ponset, I, I didn't recognize you. Oh, no reason why you should, friendly. No reason you should. Well, I heard so much about you. And that gun. Here, Mr. Ponson, here. I, I got me some samples of a new hair tonic. Smells real elegant, too. Uh, maybe you'd like to try it. They say it'll grow fuzz on... <laughs> Not that there's anything matter with your hair, you understand? Well, my supply's kind of decreasing. A little tonic might be very handy. All right, sir. Just a second now. I got it right back here. Yeah, here it is. Ah, oh, thanks, friendly. My thanks pleasure, Mr. Ponson. My pleasure. Well, I... Say, uh... I, I just happened to think, uh... What happened to the other daughter? Hmm? Well, uh, that buggy that just went by. uh, There were only two women in it. Now, the girl I met back at the farm, she wasn't... Oh, you mean Cindy Lou. Well, she wouldn't be going to Prince's dance. She she wouldn't have. No, no. You see, Hattie ain't uh, got much use for her. Uh, Cindy ain't Hattie's real kin. She's just a stepdaughter. Oh, oh. Yeah, Hattie and Fern, well, they just seem to go out of their way to make things miserable for her. Uh, not like this here dance, for instance. Everybody knows that Monty Prince and Cindy Lou used to be real friendly when they was kids. Well, she'd probably give her eye tooth to go to that party tonight, see him again, but... Well, well it's too bad she can't. Yeah, it? yeah, but there's nothing anybody can do about it. Why, she don't even have a dress to her name. You know, I've got a hunch she'd be real pretty if Hattie ever allowed her to fix herself up. Well, she seemed a mighty nice-looking girl, to me. Yeah, sure is. Yeah. What's the matter? Why shouldn't Cindy Lou go to that dance tonight? With all the stuff in this wagon, I could fix her up so she'd be the prettiest girl there. Oh, maybe you could, friendly. Maybe you could. 
It sure be a good trick to play on Hattie and Fern. <laughs> Why, if they couldn't tell my wagon at 50 feet, they'd never know Cindy Lou when I got done with her. <laughs> Come on, Mr. Ponsett. Why? Well, a girl can't go to square dance all by herself. She's got to have an escort. Oh, I suppose so. But, oh, now, hold on, friend. What, you don't mean me? Well, right? you're a friend of the princess. You said so yourself. Why, I'm old enough to be her. If fo- we don't hurry, Mr. Ponson, square dance will be all over. Come on. Step lively there, Francis. Come on there, Peggy. Let's go traveling. Come on, Mr. Ponson. <laughs> don't understand, Mr. DeWitt. You, you mean you want to loan me a dress? And all the trimmings, Cindy Lou. Before I get done with you, you'll be so duded up that your own stepmother won't recognize you. And and you want to take me to the dance, Mr. Ponson? Uh, yeah, sure. That is, if you want to go. Yeah. Well, that, that's right kindly of you both, but the fact is I, I don't have no interest in attending the doings at the Crown. Oh, oh you don't, huh? Well, in that case... I don't know where you ever got such a notion, Mr. DeWitt. As if I cared anything about seeing Monty Prince again. Well, well, I haven't even thought of him since he went away to school. Not once. Mm -hmm. Well, I I reckon your stepsister Fern's done some thinking about him. A lot of good it'll do her. Monty wouldn't look to... I mean, it's none of my business, one way or the other. No, no, I guess it isn't. Uh... I'm oh, sorry we bothered you. Right. Let's go, Franny. Mm-hmm. Okay, Miss Ponson. Night, Cindy Lou. Um, uh, Mr. DeWitt. Hmm? Was there, um, something you wanted, Cindy? I, uh, I guess maybe I'm acting kind of ungrateful. I mean, well, you both did put yourself out for me, and it was real generous of you to do it. I don't suppose it would do me no harm to go to that square dance. For a little while, anyway. If you really want me to. Well, now, that's more like it. Uh, let's see now. The uh, first thing we got to do is find a dress. Uh, you come on out to my wagon, uh, Cindy. We, we'll pick something that'll make you look like a princess. Uh, yes, sir, a real princess. <laughs> Well, I want to tell you, Friendly wasn't very far wrong. That's just exactly how Cindy Lou looked when she came out of that bedroom about half an hour later. And for a minute, we just stood there, just not saying a word, just staring at her. Something wrong? Don't I look good enough to go to the dance? Mm, Good enough? (laughs) Why, Cindy Lou, you're you're as pretty as picture. Ain't she, Brady? Why, she sure is. Well, if uh, you're all ready, Cindy, well... Uh, there's just one thing. We forgot the shoes. Shoes? I don't have any party slippers of my own. Oh. <clears throat> well, uh, well, you see, Cindy Lou, that, that, that's about the only item I don't stock in my wagon. I, well, I, I guess you can make do with the shoes you're wearing, can't you? Oh, oh I don't see how... I... Well, well, look at him yourself. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, no. No, wait, wait. I am carrying one pair of fancy slippers. They're part of the Davis girls' wedding outfit. Well? Uh, oh, no, no. I, I couldn't loan them to Cindy, though. I, I got to leave for the Davis ranch as soon as you two start off for the dance. I, I promised I'd be there first thing in the morning, and it's a good eight hours drive on that wagon of mine. Oh, I see, yeah. Well, it... It was real nice of you both, anyhow. I'll never forget what you tried to do for me and how I felt when I put on this dress. How wonderful. Now, hold on, Cindy. Hold on, hold on. It's all right. I, just let me do some figuring here. I see. If I was, if I was to leave here by midnight, I, I could be at the Davis place long about 8 a.m. Hmm. That ought to be early enough. Well, there ain't no reason why you both couldn't be back here before 12 o'clock, is no, there? No, no, no reason at all. Well, then I guess the next thing to do is to find out whether them slippers will fit or not. I'll bring them right in. Well, I just don't know what to say, Mr. Pont. Nothing like this has ever happened to me before. It, well, it, it all seems like something out of a storybook. You know, Cindy, I was just thinking the same thing. Well, here you are, Cindy. Try them on. Gee, they sure do look small, don't they? Mm. 
You oh. think you can make it? Oh, I don't... Oh, there. Oh, it is kind of tight, but I... Well, well, try the other one. Uh, if you can get one on, I... the other ought to go, too. Uh, there. Good, good. <laughs> uh, now, are you going to be able to walk all right? Oh, I'll be able to walk all right, Mr. Dewey. The way I feel, I could almost fly. Well, then you better get started. <laughs> you won't have too long of the dance, you know. And don't forget, Britt. You gotta have her back here by midnight. Don't worry, friendly. I won't forget. You are listening to James Stewart as the Six Shooter. The story of Britt Ponsett, the Texas plainsman whose name has become legend throughout the Great Southwest. Now, Act Two of the story called When the Shoe Doesn't Fit. that Cindy Lou up on Scar and she managed to seat herself in front of the saddle. I kind of held on to her to keep her from falling off and we started off for the Crown Ranch. It took us about 45 minutes to get there and that party was in full swing when we walked into the parlor. Lloyd Prince came over to the door when he Here saw us and told me we're more than welcome. He's real nice, considering I'd invited myself. I sort of managed to avoid mentioning Cindy Lou's name, and what with all the hubbub, Floyd didn't seem to notice that I hadn't introduced her properly. But Floyd's son, Monty, well, he didn't wait for any introduction. He just took one look at Cindy, and that was the last I saw of her. As far as I could tell, the other girls at the party were just completely out of the picture from then on. I waited until there was an intermission and the dancing, and then I moseyed over to the punch bowl. Oh, can I help you, Mr. Ponce? Uh, oh, I, yes, ma'am, thank you. I'm Mrs. Ames, Patty Ames. Oh, how do, Miss Ames? Oh, third, third, over here, dear. I want you to meet somebody. Oh. This is my daughter, Fern, Mr. Ponce. I'm pleased to meet you, Fern. Well, speak up, speak up. <laughs> Oh, uh, Fern, sort of shy. I, uh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, by the way, um, that young lady that you brought to the party, she doesn't seem to be spending much time with you, does she? Oh, that's the trouble when a man brings a pretty girl to a dance. He's apt to find himself all alone. Fern, stop your fidgeting. <coughs> Of course, now, some girls have character as well as look. All right, I now, say. Grab your partners for the next dance. Oh, 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 my goodness. They're starting another dance. Now, Mr. Ponce, don't think that you have to ask my permission to dance with Fern. You just go right ahead. Uh, uh, yes, uh, ma'am. Uh, Fern? Uh, uh, <laughs> Like I said, I'm not much of a square dancer, but there just didn't seem to be any way of turning Fern down. Well, I guess I should say there wasn't any way of turning her mother down. So, we did our best. Whoop, whoop. Oh, sorry, Fern. As the evening wore on, it didn't look like she had any other part lined up. And, well... I figured it was up to me to sort of fill in. Whoop, whoop. Oh, my. I sure didn't mean to kick you, Fern. <laughs> There's one thing about her, though. She sure didn't talk a man to death. And somehow the time passed. And the next thing I knew, it was after 11 o'clock. Now, that meant Cindy and I had to be starting home. So I looked around for her, but she wasn't in sight. I excused myself for Fern and headed out the front porch. Yeah, yeah, Cindy was there all right. But the thing that surprised me was she was all alone. Looked like she'd been crying. Uh, <clears throat> Cindy. Oh, oh, Mr. Ponson. What, are you all right? Oh, I'm fine, just fine. Where's Marty? I don't know. 
Uh, well, maybe you'd better find him and say good night. I never want to see him again. Not as long as I live. Oh. Well, what happened? I thought you two were hitting off real good. Uh... I, I thought so, too, at first. While we were inside dancing, everything was just wonderful. And then, all of a sudden, he started acting like he didn't care about me at all. He said he couldn't be spending all his time with one girl. He had to dance with some of the others. Mm-hmm. Well, after all, the party is in his honor. And that ain't all, Mr. Ponsett. He didn't even know who I was. Well, didn't you tell him? Well, I thought sure he'd know. I, I never figured he'd forget me, not in just a few years. Mm, well, you've changed, Cindy, and the way you're all fixed up tonight. Oh, that and... wouldn't matter. Not if Monty really liked me. I, I'd never forget him. I'd know him no matter how much he changed or, or how he dressed. Well, all you had to do was just tell him who you were, you know. No, I... I just couldn't. And you mustn't tell him either. You've got to promise me you won't. Now, please, Mr. Ponson. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what you want. Well, I I think maybe we'd better leave. Yeah. Well, I, I'm ready. Uh, you, uh, you got everything? Mm-hmm. I guess so. Why? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I just thought maybe you'd lost one of your slippers or... My slippers? Whatever gave you that idea? <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. I just... Sort of crossed my mind, so I'm a... <laughs> Never mind, I, I, I'll get scarred. Well, it just goes to show you that stories in real life don't work out the same way. Instead of falling in love, Cindy and Monty Prince were just far away as ever, and even farther. And there didn't seem to be any way of getting them together, either. At least ways... He wasn't going to be able to do it by finding one of her slippers at the dance, that's for sure. As a matter of fact, she couldn't have lost a shoe at the dance if she'd wanted to. When we got her home, we found out she couldn't even get them off. Doggone it, Cindy, you must not be trying. You didn't have as much trouble getting them on. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. DeWitt. I, I'm doing my best. My feet must have swelled up from the dancing or something. The slippers... Here, just... here let oh. me do it. Oh, sure. <clears throat> Why, they're, they're just plain stuck fast. I know. Maybe in the morning my feet will go back to normal. And yeah. you... Hey, look out the window there, friendly. Isn't that a buggy out there? Holy smoke. Fern and Hattie. So long, Cindy. Bye, Britt. Oh, wait a minute, friendly. I don't want them catching me here either. But but what about the slippers in the wedding tomorrow? The bride's wearing a long dress. Reaches clear down to the floor. She can get married in the bare feet if she has to. Well... Well, thanks for everything. Good night, Cindy. I'm I'm sorry things didn't work out better for you, but uh, good night. Well, along about noontime the next day, I was in my hotel room washing up for Sunday dinner. They were uh, planning to serve fried chicken and corn fritters and apple pie. The Castle Hotel always put the food on family style, so I figured I'd better be real prompt or there wouldn't be any... Yeah? Yeah, come in. Oh. Oh, Marty. Oh. What are you doing in town? I, uh... I came to see you, Mr. Ponsett. Oh, is that so? It's about, um... About that girl you brought out to the Crown last night. Well, I sort of had the impression you weren't too interested in her. Oh, I'm interested, all right. I wish I wasn't, but I am. How's that? Well, you see, Mr. Ponsett, before I went back east, I was, um... Well, I was real fond of another girl. Cindy Lou Ames, her name is. Oh. And we sort of, uh, promised that we'd wait for each other. But last night, that girl with you... Well, she sort of made me forget Cindy. She did, huh? For a while, anyway. And then I remembered, and I felt real bad, because it, it didn't seem like I was being fair to Cindy. So I went inside, and I left the other girl to herself. But doggone it, all night long, I kept thinking about both girls, and they, they sort of got mixed up in my mind. I couldn't even keep them straight. Uh-huh. Uh, you've got quite a problem there, haven't you? Yeah. Excuse me. Good morning, Mr. Ponsett. I finally managed to get... Oh. Cindy Lou. Hello, Monty. 
Golly, it's good to see you. I was hoping you'd be at the dance last night. Were you? You know, you haven't changed a bit. No. No, I guess I haven't. They're in this paper bag, Mr. Ponce. Those things I borrowed last night. Oh. I, I thought I... maybe you could return them to Mr. DeWitt for me. Well, I'm not sure I'll be running into him again, Cindy. Here, Mr. Ponce. Now, be careful. Don't... Dr- oh, oh, oh. oh, Mr. Ponce. Oh, doggone it, Cindy. I just, just sort of slipped out of my fingers. I'm... Well, here, I'll put these party shoes back in the sack. There. Well, goodbye and thanks. Goodbye, Monty. Uh, Cindy, wait a minute. What? Where'd you get those shoes? I, I don't know what you mean. Why, they're the same ones that... They're exactly the same. Cindy Lou, you were at the square dance last night. You and that other girl... Why, there wasn't any other girl. It, it was you... No wonder I couldn't get you straightened out in my... What are you talking about? Uh, tell her, Mr. Ponsett, what I told you just before she came in. Well, I think maybe you'd better tell her yourself, Monty. As a matter of fact, I'm kind of anxious to get downstairs while there's still some fried chicken left, so... Now, you listen to me, really Cindy. I've been in love with you ever since I can remember. I don't believe you. Well, it's true. And it doesn't matter what kind of a dress you wear or how your hair is fixed or... or... <laughs> Well, there wasn't much point in my hanging around to see if Cindy and Monty would finally get together. There's only one way a story like this can end. I guess you know as well as I do. They were just bound to live happily ever after. The Six Shooter is a transcribed NBC Radio Network production in association with Review Productions. It is written by Frank Burt and is based on a character created by him. This is ChestertonRadio.com. National Silver Company presents The Silver Theater. Starring Rosalind Russell and James Stewart in Up From Darkness, directed by Conrad Nagel. Brought to you in behalf of two of the greatest names in silverware, International Sterling, world-famous solid silver, and 1847 Rogers Brothers, America's finest silver plate. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Conrad Nagel. I want to welcome you to the fourth of the new series of Silver Theater dramatic productions. In weeks to come, you'll hear such stars as Francho Tone, Helen Hayes, Ginger Rogers, Betty Davis, and Clark Gable, playing in stories by America's foremost authors. Today, we are proud to welcome back to Silver Theater MGM's brilliant stars, Rosalind Russell and James Stewart, in the first episode of Up From Darkness a two-part radio play especially adapted for us by True Boardman from an original story by Grover Jones. Our town is Middleton, in the heart of America's great coal mining region. Our people, a girl called Michael, played by Rosalind Russell, and a boy called Tim, played by James Stewart. Organ of Prosperity. Work tomorrow. Oh, sure, it's just fine music, Tim. Now, Mom, where's my clean shirt? On the table. Oh, oh yeah, I got it. <laughs> Say, you'll never guess who I saw in town, Timmy. Oh. Michael Gargan. The boss? Well, who didn't see him? Didn't he come down on the mine every day? Oh, no, not him. Her, his daughter. Mickey? Mm-hmm. She come back from college just this morning. I saw her in Coburn. No. Yes. Well, what do you know? She's back, huh? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Mom, you can start supper. I'm all washed up now. So Mickey's back. Well, what's what? What she look like? 
What'd she say? What she, she still got those freckles? <laughs> She's got no freckles now, Tim. Or if she has, you can't see them. What, Mickey Gargan and no freckles? Hey, what's, uh... Well, just remember, Tim, boy, four years at college can make a lot of difference in a girl. Oh, and now don't pester me. I got to get supper on the table. Your brother will walk in here, star. Oh, no, there's plenty of time. He hasn't even finished shot firing yet. I can tell because... Joe, of... shot firing? Oh, yeah, sure. Didn't he tell you? Yeah, Pud Llewellyn got hurt yesterday, and yeah, he lit a short fuse and didn't make it to the breakthrough in time, so they had to have a new shot fire, so Joe's it. Joe, I thought he told you. No, he didn't. Well, hey, Mom, why that long look? It's a break for Joe. What means more pay? Besides, you know, Mike Gargan said he wanted Joe to work every job in the mine. That that boss got real plans for Joe, yeah, Mom. Yeah, I know, this... I know. Well, besides, somebody got to blast out the coal for us. Who can do the job better than Joe? That's right. Nobody. Hey, you know what? I'll bet if we give a listen, we'll be able to hear some of the shots he sets off down there. Now, the last rooms he'll be firing in are Nielsen's and Hughes's, and they're in the new rooms just off Main North. I pulled a trip down there today, and I was saying to myself, I said, I'll bet this entry is so close under our house that if I sing loud enough, Mom will be hearing me up there, you know? Oh, Tim Barlow, <laughs> 700 feet down and you talk about... Ah, you're crazy as a blind dog in a meat house. Listen, what'd I tell you? That's, that's in Nielsen's room. I bet my shirt on it. Now there'll be, let's see, there'll be two more shots in Nielsen's and four in Hughes's. Six more shots and you can put on the stake. Joe will be up before it's done. Mom, did you hear me? Yes, Timmy, I heard you. Six, did you say? Then that's one of them. Oh, hey, Mom, look, what's happened to you? You're getting jittery because Joe sets off a few shots? Uh, I'll get used to it, like I get used to everything. Two. Now, Mom, now quit it, will you? Joe knows how to take care of himself. Come on, now tell me more about Mickey. Huh? Ah, uh, never you mind about Miss Michael Gargan. Just because you went to high school together, you don't need to think... Oh, Mom, she... you're dove. I'm not thinking anything. Well, I think I'll go down to the temple and meet Joe when he comes up. And, oh, Mom, uh, press my good pants for tomorrow, will you? <laughs> All right, Tim. Three. Four. <laughs> Hello, Michael, girl. Oh, gosh, how oh, I've missed you. Well, how about me? Yeah, let me look at you. <laughs> well, are they all through with you up at that school? Well, I'm through with them. How about it? You think you got your money's worth? Yeah, and I'm not sure yet. Of course, I'm not exactly used to the idea of a gargan being so darned educated. Never happened before. Well, give me time and I'll live it down. <laughs> I hope so. Oh, you're just in time to help, Dad. That crayon portrait of Uncle Joseph has lived at us about 20 years too long. Down it comes. It's the beginning of the revolution. Oh, is it? It is. First the pictures come down, and then that stove out of the middle of the living room. I'm going to make this place livable, Dad. I'm going to do now, the Hold on, wait a minute. You're going to do nothing of the kind. Now, Mike Gargan, just because you own a coal mine, you don't have to live like a mule skinner. No? Now, you listen to me, young woman. Every man in this town calls me by my first name. And it's going to stay that but way. But, Dad, that still doesn't mean your house has to look like a museum. This place is almost as out of date as, uh, as your mind. Now, never mind the mind. Stick to something you know something about. I do know something about it. I know that 70 men have been killed down there in the last five years, and that other men are being injured there every day. All right. What are they worth? Well, maybe being your daughter, I think something ought to be done about it. Yeah, I suppose you'll be doing it. You probably had a very fine college course on problems of the miners or something. Now you've come home and tell me how to run things. <laughs> Yeah, that's swell. Of course, the mere fact that you've never been down in the mine, that doesn't make any that's difference. That's not fair, Dad. I... Oh. oh, what's the matter with us? I'm home an hour and we're right where we left off when I went away. Battling about the mine. Yeah, you're right. It's my fault. I, I'm sorry, girl. Dad, while I was away, I thought about this a lot. Let's, let's talk it out, hmm? All right, Michael. First of all... What you said about my never being down in the mine, having gone down into it, well, uh, I would have a long time ago accepted I... Uh... That you're afraid. Yeah. I know that, girl. I've always known it. But I don't think you know why, Dad. 
You know, the very first thing I remember as a kid, it was the shriek of that wildcat whistle that means a new disaster somewhere down there under the ground. Even before I was old enough to understand, I sensed the horror and terror that lay behind that sound. Sure, I know, girl. I, I can't tell you what it did to me. The dread it gave me, the, the thought of being part of something that could destroy so many lives. That's why I came to hate the mine, Dad. And I do hate it. But there's something else that I hate even more. That's letting you down. <laughs> you see, I've, I've always let you down. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Michael is a boy's name, Dad. Oh, you made yourself pretend that you were glad I was a girl. And you called me Michael anyway. But that couldn't make me another Mike Gargan. To grow up in the mine and to love it as you've loved it. Oh, you're crazy. No, I'm not, Mike. And because of that, I want you to know that I'm going to do something about the way I feel toward the mine. Sure, I'm afraid of it. I'm petrified of it. But I'll lick that fear, Mike. I've got to. Going to. Yeah, but look, Miss Michael, it's no good for you just hang around mine all day. It's all right, Jan. But what you do here? Just standing hours and look at mine. In your face, it. You feel sick, maybe? No, no, Jan, it's all right. Maybe you're here to wait for somebody, huh? No, no, never mind, Jan, please. Tell me, that bunch of miners who came up in the cage, was that the last load for today? I mean, I mean, is there no one left working down there now? No, one more load. There, cage just come up now. This last one. I don't care to be been cage for 40 years. Good night, boys. I feel differently about the whole thing. He sort of set the world on fire or something. Good night, Yarn. Good night, Tim. Mickey. Well, Mickey, how are you? Tim. Tim Barlow. Gee, it's great to see you, Mickey. I, I heard you were back. Mom told me you were. Come on, let's... Come on, sit over here in this crate. Here, I'll dust it off for you. Say, you... You look swell. You sure do. How, how was that college business? College? Oh, it was fine. Hey, you you feeling all right? Y yes, yes, Tim. What, you're waiting for your dad? No. No, no I just came down to see the mine. To see the mine? Uh -huh. You? Gee, as far back as I can remember, you always wanted to stay just as far away from the mine as you could get. Tim, you... Uh... You've changed. I, I didn't recognize you. Oh, yeah. Well, it's pretty hard to keep clean. Don't no, it isn't know. your face, Tim. Or your clothes or anything like that. It's... Oh, you used to be taller. Why do you stoop over like that? Well, I, you just get used to it, I guess. You're down in the oh, tunnels, you know. You... I see. <laughs> so you're still here. Working down there, I mean. Just like all the rest of them. Going down there every morning before dawn, coming out every afternoon. Well, what do you mean? Well, sure, I'm still in the mine. Why shouldn't I be? Say, I'm a skinner now, Mickey. But it's four years, Tim. Surely in four years you've had time to find something better than working down in that blackness. I mean, a job where you could accomplish something. What do you mean? I am accomplishing something. I helped get that black stuff out of there, and you know what that stuff does? It makes light for people in heat and it runs factories and... It's a kind of magic, that stuff is. It's like that lamp that guy, Aladdin, what's his name, had. Why don't I accomplish something like, like that? Tim. Hmm. Take me down in the mine. Take you down the mine? Now. I want to see it and know it and feel it. All of it. The shaft, every entry, every oh, room. Oh, now, wait a minute. Doesn't make sense, Mickey. You're scared to death of going down there. I know that. That doesn't matter, Tim. Believe me, I've got to go down there. If I'm scared, I'll get over it. I've got to, Tim. My name is Michael Gargan. Oh, yeah, you're... Yeah. Oh, I, I think I get it. I... But, Mickey, your dad will probably... Oh, dad needn't know. Me. I'd rather he didn't until... Until I've licked it, Tim. Oh, please. Please, Tim, take me down. All right, Mickey. 
It's all sort of crazy, but if it really matters to you, I'll do it. I'll take you down. You've just heard Act One of the first episode of Up From Darkness, starring Rosalind Russell and James Stewart. Before the second act starts, a young man steps from behind the silver curtain with a grateful word for living in this generation. John Conti. We don't talk about it very much. But I think at heart, we all realize how fortunate we are to be living in a generation that makes it so easy for us all to enjoy the finer things of life. Take that most cherished of women's possessions, lavish sterling silver, solid silver through and through. Today, modern methods of silversmithing, modern skill and craftsmanship have brought solid silver within the reach of nearly everyone. For example, do you know that right now, you can get an individual place setting in International Sterling's thrilling, enchantress pattern. Six distinctive pieces of solid silver for only $16.75. Well, you can. And believe me, enchantress is a pattern of incredible beauty. It's modern in its graceful sweeping lines and exquisite proportions, and yet it's romantic, too, in the delicate bit of carving at either side. But see enchantress at your silverware dealers tomorrow. When you do, when you realize that here is silver loveliness that will never fade, when you find out for how little and on what easy terms you can own the solid silver you've always longed for, I know you are going to own International Sterling's Enchantress. And now the curtain is rising on the concluding act of the first episode of Up From Darkness. Starring Rosalind Russell as Michael and James Stewart as Tim. The time and scene are the same. I don't know, Tim. All there say no visitors in mine when shot firing going on. Yeah, but, Jan, we won't go where Joe's working. Please, Jan, it's all right. Uh, your father know you go down in mine? Well, no, but he doesn't need to know. Please, Jan. Well, okay. You get on, Cage. I send you down. Okay, Jan. Come on, Mikey. Oh, wait. Oh, wait till I get my cap. Hold on a minute, Jan. All right, Tim. Here, you better wear one, too. Thank you. Uh, hold still while I light your pit lamp. Now I'll light yours for you. Okay. Hey, your hand's shaking there. I think maybe I'd better light it myself. Now. Okay, Jan. Okay, Tim. Down you go. Pretty fast, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, I should have warned Jan to run it slow. Well, what, what happened? Oh, no, that's just a little too much speed. The cable slapped, that's all. There ought to be something to hold on to in this cage. It's not safe like this. I mean, it should be all closed no, in. No, no, it's it. okay, it's okay when you get used to it. Now, if your ears feel funny, try yawning. That, that always does the trick. What, what's that? Now, we just hit the bottom of the shaft. That's Here, it's soaking. Oh, sure, yeah. I didn't think of that. That sea beach is always like that. Of course, it's not so good on those shoes. Oh, that doesn't matter. You see, up in there. So, what? Be careful. Be careful. Gosh, you almost walked into that lead wire. That 1,200 volts on that circuit. You mean a wire like that is left exposed in this darkness? Oh, yeah, sure. Well, everybody knows where it is. And besides. Jim! A... What? There, just now, I saw something. Oh, yeah, well, that's just a little rat. There's a lot of them down here that they won't hurt you. Come on, I uh, think you better take hold of my arm. Yes, maybe I better have. Keep your head down when you're walking along. See better now? Yes, I think so. Sure you can. Uh Uh-huh. You know, I know a miner who would never wear a cap when he works. You know what he used for light? What? Lightning bugs. Ah. Yeah. 
Yeah, he used to go out the night before and capture just one lightning bug, put it in the bottle. Then the next day, he'd bring it down here. He'd work with that light all day. And then one day, the lightning bug fainted, and then he couldn't see it all. Hey, uh, you're supposed to laugh at that. That's some joke, that. I guess I, I don't feel much like laughing right now. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I can just try. Tim, those things up there, what do you call them? Are they cap pieces? But they look loose. Yeah, so they do. What if they give way? The roof caves right in. Does it do that often? Yeah, every now and then. How can you just pass it off like that? If the shaft does fall in, it means... It means... Tim, aren't you afraid yourself? Afraid? Well, I don't know. I never thought about it very much. I guess if I did, I might be. Uh, you see, Mickey, you, you get used to that down here. All these things that bother you, they're, they're just part of our job. Even men being killed? Even that. Now look, Mickey, can't you understand? No, no, I can't that... understand. It's horrible down here. Even worse than I imagined. The dark, the cold, the dampness, as if that weren't enough. Oh, Jim! Ah! It's all right, it's all right, Mickey. I should have warned you. Those are the shot fires. Now, Joe, my brother, is blasting out coal for the men to load tomorrow. Oh, I'm... I'm sorry, I... Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I should have warned you. Mickey, don't you want to go back up? No. No, I'm all right. Let's go on. Huh? Oh, Mike. Uh, hello, Mike. It's you, huh? <laughs> hello, Mike. Hello, Jan. Uh, this is one fine day, Mike. That's right. Uh, no rain. No? No, it's, it's a fine day, Mike. Hey, what's the matter with you? I didn't come down here to talk about the weather. I'm going down. Get over there and drop the cage. Well, you go down to the mine, Mike? But uh, uh, Joe's down there, Mike. Joe shot firing. I know that. That's why I'm going. Good lad, Joe, but still new on that job, and I don't want to take any chances with him. Yeah, but, Mike, I think maybe... Hey, listen, Jan, I don't pay you to think. I pay you to run these cages. Now, get over there and drop me down and move. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, sure, Mike, sure. Uh Now, that's what we're coming to, Mickey, is a part, and that's where the... Oh... I'll have to get used to those. Ah, uh, sure you will. Hey, you dropped your cap. Oh, oh yes. Here, here. Boy, you, you don't look much like four years of college now, Miss Gary. <laughs> Hold still. I swear I'll get that smudge off. There. Thanks. You're, you're swell, you know that? Mickey, uh, I... Maybe this isn't the time or place to tell you, but I... Well, all the time you were away, going all sorts of places with all sorts of people, and... Well, I was right here. And I was thinking about just one person. Timmy! Of course, you may not think that you've ever been down here before, but... I want to tell you, you have, Mickey. You've been riding around down in here for years with me. Oh, I'm glad, Timmy. True, I'm... Tim, I left! They're going out! Hey, man, down there where Joe is. Come on! Oh, Mickey, I'm Miss Gargan, your father, and your brother, Tim, they're in there, caught in a fall. Dad! Aye, he just come down to inspect. The shot went off and the roof fell in. They're caught in there, both of them. No, no! Mickey, wait. Are all the shots fired off, Jock? I don't know. We'll take a chance. You stay here, Mickey. Come on, I'm coming with you. We've got to get them out. <laughs> Oh, Dad, oh, my darling. Tim, Timmy's here. Jock, go up for help quick. Mike's alive. 
Get the whole crew down here. He's half buried under a pile of slate. Right. And I'll get the whale check whistle going. Hey, Jan. Jan. Mike. Jim. Jim. Your brother. I couldn't get him out. He, he's under there. I, I tried. Thanks, Mike. Oh, Dad. Dad. Jim, help me. We'll get him free. Oh. No. Michael, girl. It's no use. Just. Just let me lie. Oh, Dad. Okay. <laughs> you. You picked a swell time to. Finally come in the mine. Darling, I. Tim, Tim, listen. This messes things up. I, I counted on Joe to keep things going. I help Michael. She needs help. She, she doesn't know the mine like, like we do. She. Don't worry, Mike. Oh, do you hear that, Michael girl? Mike, first name. Oh, remember what I told you. When they call you by your first name, you're okay. Even, even if you die. Easy, 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 easy. No use. No use. My father said, can't you understand that? My God. My father said. Yeah. And so was my brother. So was my father, almost like this two years ago. You. You just stand there, not even cry, not say anything. Just accept this. The mine, Mickey, it'll always be the mine. For me someday. And for you, too, unless you stay up above where women belong. Why did my father die, Tim? For what good reason? That passage could have been braced and safe, strong enough for a hundred blasts like that. Mickey, listen to me. It's not just Dan. It's what Joe and your father. It's for all the others who have died and still others who will die if this place has its way. Mickey. Look at it. Live wires left exposed and cables unprotected and cages that are death traps in themselves. You're talking wild. You don't know what you're oh, saying. Oh, yes, Mickey. I know. This mine belongs to me now. And I'm going to fight it. I know that I can fight this monster that you and all the others just accept. I'll fight it alone if no one else will help me. But I'll make it pay for Michael Gargan's death. If it's the only thing I ever do in life, I'll beat this mine. In just a moment, you'll hear about what's in store for you in next week's episode of Up From Darkness, starring Rosalind Russell and James Stewart. But right now, here's a man to offer you something very special. John Conti. For many of you, this fall holds a really gala occasion. The day when someone in your family or one of your friends, someone you hold very dear, walks up the church aisle in veil and orange blossoms to the romantic strains of Lohengrin. And if you'd like to make your wedding gift to that bride as memorable as the occasion, you'll give the gift of every woman's dreams. Beautiful silverware. Solid silver like the international sterling silver we spoke about earlier in the program or the finest in silver plate, 1847 Rogers Brothers, First Love. First Love, so named by Rosalind Russell, one of the stars of our Silver Theater performance tonight, represents the latest and greatest achievement of the famous house of 1847 Rogers Brothers. It's a pattern whose lovely ornament is deeply etched and raised in high relief in a perfection of craftsmanship never before available in silver plate. You can see this sensational pattern at your silverware dealers now. In fact, in order that you may see it, 1847 Rogers Brothers are making a special offer of a small distinctive serving fork. A fork which ordinarily costs a dollar and a half, but which you can now have for only 25 cents. When you go to your silverware dealer tomorrow for your fork, when you actually see its rare, rich beauty, I know you'll not only want a complete first love service for the bride, you'll want one for yourself, too. And you can have one easily. Your silverware dealer will tell you on what really convenient terms you can own the aristocrat of silver plate, 
1847 Rogers Brothers, First Love. that way, all the shot firers go that way. It gets them. But you can't do these things, Mickey. It's mining. You'll break yourself against it, Mickey. And, Miss Gargan, we miners ain't stepping back into the shaft until them machines of yours come out. It'll let it destroy all of you. Stand by and watch it while it kills. But I won't. I'll destroy it, do you hear? I'll destroy it! This is the fight that Michael Gargan must wage. Not alone against the terror that she feels, but against the very people she would raise up from darkness. Next week, at the same time, the Silver Theater will star Rosalind Russell and James Stewart in the concluding episode of Up From Darkness, directed by Conrad Nagel, with original music scored and conducted by Felix Mills. And in the meantime, if you want solid silver, you want international sterling. If you want silver plate, you want 1847 Rogers Brothers, both proudly created by International Silver Company. Rosalind Russell will next be seen in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer production, The Citadel. James Stewart can next be seen in the MGM production, Ice Follies. This is John Conti speaking. Listening to Chesterton Radio at ChestertonRadio.com. International Silver Company presents The Silver Theater. Starring Rosalind Russell and James Stewart in Up From Darkness, directed by Conrad Nagel. Brought to you in behalf of two of the greatest names in silverware. International Sterling, world-famous Solid Silver, and 1847 Rogers Brothers, America's finest silver plate. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Conrad Nagel. We welcome you to the fifth of the new series of Silver Theater dramatic productions. In weeks to come, you'll hear such stars as Francho Tone, Helen Hayes, Ginger Rogers, Betty Davis, and Clark Gable playing in stories by America's foremost authors. Today, we're proud to welcome back to Silver Theater Metro Goldwyn Mayer's brilliant stars, Rosalind Russell and James Stewart, in the concluding episode of Up From Darkness, a two-part radio play especially adapted for us by True Boardman from an original story by Grover Jones. And now the lights are being dimmed and our curtain rises. It was just three months ago that Michael Gargan's father died. Died the quick, dark death of disaster in a mine. And since that day, she's lived for but one purpose. To beat the mine that killed him. To rob it of the power to take men's lives. This is the task that faces Michael Gargan, played by Rosalind Russell. A task in which she has one strong ally, Tim Barlow, played by James Stewart. 
Our scene, the head office of the mine, early one evening. Michael is conferring with Mr. Melvin, the head bookkeeper. Miss Gargan, if I hadn't worked for your father for 30 years, I wouldn't say this. But if you want to have a mine to run, you've got to stop throwing money away on them machines. Throwing it away? Did it ever occur to you, Mr. Melvin, that the safety of the Gargan mine might mean more to me than a surplus in the B- Gargan bank account? You can't run a business on sentimentality, Miss Gargan. This is a coal mine, not a charity institution. Dangerous, perhaps it is. But mining is always dangerous. Your father accepted that fact all his life. Yes, he did, and because he did, he... Well, we won't argue, Mr. Melvin. Please see that the orders for the new motorized equipment are put through immediately. You... You mean you're actually going to... Hello, Mickey. Oh, hello, Tim. Look, I've been trying... I'll be through in just a minute. Oh, hello, Melvin. Huh. Now, here's the month's balance, Miss Gargan. If you can call it that, considering it's written mostly in red ink. Thank you. I'll go now. Mrs. Melvin's been waiting dinner for an hour. I'm sorry. I I know the change here has been hard on everybody. But things will adjust themselves in time. I hope so. Good night. Good night. The old sourpuss. Look. Mickey, do you have to keep working 16 hours every day? I've been trying all afternoon. Excuse me. Oh. Hello? Who? Oh, Mr. Wyrick. Fine, thank you. How's the Wyrick Coal Company? Yes, Mr. Wyrick. No, I'm sorry. I happen to feel that that's my own business and no one else's. I see. And if I don't? Well, you may as well understand this, Mr. Wyrick. If making the Gargan mine safe means running it at a loss, I'll run it at a loss. Good night. What now? Mr. Wyrick over in Hastings is up in arms about the improvements I'm making. Says it's unfair competition and he's going to do something about it. It's not so good. Don't worry, Mickey. He's just just talking. I don't care, Tim. I'm winning. Wyrick or anyone else can say what they please, but I'm doing it. I'm licking the mine. Do you realize there hasn't been one person killed, not a serious injury since Dad, in over three months? Yeah, 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 that's, that's swell. Well, think of a record like that, Tim, even before the job is finished. And by the time we've installed the rest of the equipment I've ordered, now, Mickey, we'll be well on our way. Mickey, that's what I wanted to talk to you about now, those machines and safety devices. Yes, Tim? Well, they... Well, now, never mind now. Hey, uh, your face is dirty again. Ink this time, I think. Mm. Here, I'll fix it. You know, since you turned working woman, you can manage to get your face smudged up more. Crazy. Tim? Yeah. Tim, I... uh... I've got to check this balance. Oh, look, Mickey, it'd work out swell, you know it? We could drive over to Sheridan and then go for a week at Bryant Falls. I got quite a lot saved up, and besides, I got an uncle in Dubuque who's going to leave me 3000 bucks, and he just wrote Mom last week that he's feeling pretty low. And Tim! Make... <laughs> Wait a minute. Is this supposed to be a proposal? Yeah, I guess that's what you'd call it. Oh, Tim, I really... I... You see, Mickey, I, I sort of think maybe your dad would like to know that somebody was taking care of you. You know, a woman on her own can manage to get herself mixed up in more darn jams, especially what? if she's sort of bullheaded. And uh, no, well, no, I don't know. Miss Gargan, Miss Gargan. Hello, Jan. Miss Gargan, I just here, so I come quick tell you tonight at Miners Hall meeting. Well, go on, Jan. What kind of meeting? Men from mine, Miss Gargan. They meet to talk what they do about changes you make in mine. Everybody be there. I think you want to know. Thanks, John. Thanks for telling me. Okay. You do something, maybe, huh? It's not so good, Miss Gargan. I know, Jan. I know. Good night. Good night. Night, Tim. You knew about this, didn't you, Tim? I guess I did. And that was the reason for your... uh... A proposal? Oh, not the reason. Maybe it's sort of, uh, sort of rushed it a little. I see. Now, look, Mickey, this is serious, honest. Now, you've been up here in the office. You don't know how the men have been feeling. 
It started as soon as you began making changes down there, and it's been getting worse all the time. There's no telling what'll happen at that meeting. No tonight. matter what happens, Tim, it can't make any difference. I started this fight, and I'm going to finish it. Mickey, you still haven't answered me. Will you marry me? But don't you see, I can't answer that now, Tim. I can't believe me, not until I've until I've finished this job. Oh, but Tim, ask me again, will you? Uh, no matter what happens to your uncle in Dubuque. I've been waiting to see just what a bunch looked like that could go on working on a woman's mind. I'm surprised at you. Some of you have even got your hands dirty. (laughs) Now listen to me, you guys. Any sap knows that a woman around a mine is unlucky. And they don't make them any unluckier than Miss Michael Gargan. Look at all these fancy machines she shoved in down at the mine. Do you like all that junk? Uh, Of course you don't. And here's something else. Just wait a while till these fancy machines get really working. One by one, you'll find yourselves getting fired. The machines will be doing the work. Yeah, not only some of you are going to be out of a job, you'll all be out. Six more months of that highfalutin gal boss and this mine will shut down. You'll all be in the street. Yeah, your wives and your kids will be hungry. But that don't matter. Miss Gargan don't care about them. The only class, That's a dirty line, you know it. I've been waiting for you to blow off, Barlow. Now, listen to me, you guys. This bird Slocum doesn't live here, he doesn't work here, and I'll tell you what he is. He's a hired agitator from the Warwick mine over at Hastings. Oh, yeah? Well, how does it feel to be promoted, Barlow? A mule skinner one day and a boss foreman the next. Having a gal for a boss may be unlucky for everybody else. But it's sure all right for you. Why, you low... Look out, Slogan. Right. Right. Get away. Let him up. Come on. Get back, you guys. Nice going, Barlow. Socking a man when he's not looking. You were looking then, you're looking now. Come on. Now, look here. There's no you... hits in no place. Let go of me. Get out. Take it easy. There'll be none of that here, Barlow. Now, listen to me. Listen, all of you. Now, don't pay any attention to this guy. Don't be crazy. Look at what Mickey Gargan's trying to do. Suppose she has spent dough on those machines. It wasn't for herself, was it? And if she fired anybody, no, and she's not gonna. Now give her a chance. She's only had three months. She's worked her head off. She's... Mickey. Hey, look. Who's in charge of this meeting? You, Mr. Saunders? Uh, yes, Miss Gargan, but... Uh... I'd like to say something to the men myself. Well, this is a miners' meeting, ma'am, and according to the rules, an operator Then I'm can't... going to break your rule. Men, I... I heard most of what Mr. Slocum said a moment ago. And there are some things I want you to understand. He said I wanted to take your jobs away. That's not true. What I'm trying hey, to boy, do is do your own we good. Got rules. Hey, I want you to no operators to be to a meeting unless they're invited. No. Well, what are we waiting come for? On, let's go. Let's move the meeting be adjourned. Yeah, come on, boys. Come on. You can all go down the street to Chambers. Please. Wait a come minute, on, please. On, Can't you listen to me? Hey, now, what's I the want... matter with all of you? Give her a break. Wait a minute. It doesn't matter, Tim. I'm sorry, Miss Gargan. Nothing I can do. Such fools they are. Thanks, Jan. It's all right. Uh, I go back to mine. Good night. All right, so... Oh, Mickey, you shouldn't have come here. I see that now, Tim. But we'll win them over. I know we will. What we're doing is for their own good and... And as long as you believe in me, as long as you'll help me... Quit it, will you? Well, what's wrong, Tim? I'm a liar, that's all. Now, look, Mickey. I'd lick any other man that says it, but it's true. You're wrong. And if you keep on the way you are, you'll wreck the mine. Tim! You've gone about it with your eyes shut. Those men have always dug coal in just one way. It's part of their life, and now you want to change that life. Well, you can't, Mickey. Believe me. You're not a miner. You can't understand. Wait a minute, Tim. There's just one thing I want to know. Are you helping me finish what I started, or aren't you? I can't, Mickey. Not the way you're doing it. For your own sake, I can't. You're going to... You're going to... That's enough. So I've gone about it with my eyes shut, have I? Well, maybe you're right. I was blind. I was blind enough to think that you, at least, could understand. To think that what you asked me this afternoon meant... Mickey, please, now listen to me. Why? Why should I listen to you? I wouldn't understand. You're a miner. I'm not. We speak a different language. 
fear and suffering and death, they're not the same things to you. And I'm me. only trying to make you see it straight. Will you go now, please? Mickey. Go on with the rest of them to Chambers Hall. Mickey, go just... on, leave me alone. Okay. <laughs> I'll do it alone, Dad. I'll do it anyway. I said I'd make the mine pay for your death, and I will. So help me. I'll do it alone. just heard Act One of the second episode of Up From Darkness, starring Rosalind Russell and James Stewart. And now, before we bring you Act Two, we bring you a passing comment on today's styles. Many of the fashions women follow today reflect the subtle blending of old and new, of your grandmother's day and your day. And in silverware, too, you find the same fascinating combination of romantic tradition and modern art. Particularly is this true of International Sterling's bewitching pattern, Enchantress. For the lustrous mirror-clear center panel is truly modern. The delicate carving at either side just is truly romantic. A pattern all the more desirable because it's solid silver. Silver that grows richer, mellower as time goes on. And yet this exquisite silverware is not the luxury you might think. For example, you can get a place setting for one person in the Enchantress pattern... Six distinctive pieces of solid silver for only $16.75. And there are other larger services also priced within your reach. What's more, there's a budget payment plan whereby you can buy your sterling silver right out of income. Your silverware dealer will be delighted to tell you all about it. See him tomorrow. See Enchantress, too. And begin now to make a dream come true. To own solid silver by International Sterling. Now the final act of Up From Darkness. There are three in Middletown who have known a sleepless night. First, Michael, desolate and alone in the Gargan house on the hill, knowing that now she can expect no help in her struggle against the miners and against the mine itself. Next, Tim walking the streets while blackness turns to dawn, bitterly unhappy at his action in deserting Michael. And third, Tim's mother who has waited through an endless night for his return. I've been at last in the Barlow home just after seven in the morning. Jim, boy. Well, Mom? They've been waiting for you, son. There's something wrong. I'm leaving, Mom. Leaving? Don't ask me why. I just got to. So you're just like all the rest of them, or maybe worse. At least they're not running out. You don't understand. Oh, don't I, though? Just because the men all called a strike... You ain't got the courage. Right. Uh, don't tell me you don't know. Last night at Chambers Hall, they voted not to go to work this morning or any morning, as long as Michael Gargan is in charge. Yeah. Yeah, I see. So long, Mom. Go on with you, then. And I'm not so sure about what she's well rid of you. Oh, don't talk like that. You're a fool, Tim Barlow. And I'm ashamed of you. Well, what do you want me to do? Do? I want you to stay here and fight for the girl you love. I did fight for her, Mom. I keep on if she was right. If she was right, she is right. Do you think that Mickey Gargan is the only woman in Middleton who wants safety in the mine? But the men, Ma. The men are fools, like you. They don't like changes because they've always worked another way. It's humbug. Let them learn, I say. Oh, you still don't understand. A woman just can't run a mine. Why can't she? So Michael's wrong, is she? Well, I'll tell you how she's wrong. She hasn't learned to tell that bunch of numbskulls where to go. Mom, Mickey's a girl, remember. She can't. Why can't she? She's a Gargan, isn't she? My Gargan called every man in this town by his first name, and vice versa. And when she learns that and a few cuss words, you just watch her run that mine. Mom. Sock me one, will you? Go on, sock me. I never needed it more, but I'm not starting that now. Ah, oh, Tim. I couldn't be seeing you throw away your heart and your life. Oh, God bless you, Mom. You 
go on with you now. Get on and find your girl. What time is it now, Jan? Twenty after seven. I see. But maybe still not strike. Maybe mine is just late, huh? All of them, Jan. All 20 minutes late. Jan, why didn't you strike, too? Why do you stay at the mine? Me? Me top man. Keep the fan going in mine. But anyway, Jan, not strike. Mike Gargan always good friend to Jan. Jan always good friend to Mike's daughter. With my people. Once friend... Always friend. You can't always say that for my people. Oh, you don't worry, Miss Michael. Tim, funny guy. He's kind of crazy like all Americans, but Jan. he come back. Oh, you think Jan blind, maybe. Jan, huh? Jan, Jan, please. Please don't talk about Tim. Sure. Sure, not. You go home now, maybe, huh? No. No, I'm going down in the mine. Down in the mine? I... I want to talk to someone. With the mine empty, Miss... Oh. Oh, you mean down there? Your father? Oh, yeah, I understand. Be good, maybe you go. Sure. Sure, you just get on cage, I'll let you down. You got Captain Pete Lamp? Yes, here's one. Wait, I like. Now, you're not scared for down alone? No, I'm not scared. Good. Miss Michael, maybe down there, you say hello for Jan, huh? All right, Jan. Down you go. Yours, Mike. I, I really fixed it up. I fixed it up so swell that nobody would come work in it. You see, you you shouldn't have called me Michael after all. I guess we both see that now. <laughs> oh, Dad. You've got to learn to love the mind, Michael girl. To love it. Not be afraid. I'm not afraid. I think that bad. I told you I wouldn't. I have. But what good does it do? I can't run the mine without men to work in it. Mike. Remember, girl. Mike. If they call you by your first name, you're okay. You're okay. I tried, Dad. I tried. But they never will. They never will. Mickey. Tim. Mickey, you shouldn't be down here by yourself. I... I wasn't by myself. Oh, but you... Oh. Oh, yeah, I get it. Do you want me to go, Mickey? No, Tim. After all, your brother's here is... Much is dead. Yeah. Oh, look, Mickey, I... There's something I want to tell you here. I love you. Oh, Tim. Tim, darling. Mickey, I... Oh, don't say any more. Just hold me close. I love you, Tim. I do love you. Well, then that's all that matters. When two people love each other, they're... They're unbeatable. 
Do you know that? They are, Mickey. And now you and I are going to fight this thing through, both of us. But it's too late, Timmy. I've, I've messed everything up. I've already failed. Failed? What do you mean, failed? Listen, Mickey, you're right. You're right about everything you've done. It's just how you've done it that's been wrong. Why was it wrong, Tim? This mind isn't just yours, Mickey. It's the men's, too. Every one of them feels about it just like Mike Gargan did. And you shouldn't have changed things all at once, Mickey. Not without talking it over with those guys. Don't you see that? But how could I, Tim? I, I was away so long. They're, they're like strangers to me. Oh, don't let them be. They don't want a woman running the mine. Well, don't run it like a woman. Tell them where to head in that, Mickey. And if you run out of words, you just ask me. You gotta stop calling, making them call you Miss Gargan. You gotta make them call them Mike. I know, I know that. Somebody else already told me. And I'll do it. Sure you will. You're going to fight fire with fire. That's the way we'll let him. Sure, we will. Tim, what did you say? I said you got to fight fire with fire. And we will, Timmy. This strike, it's going to end now. Today. Come on, Tim. Oil catch whistle. At the mine. Something's happened. Let's go. A strike. And I suppose that stops the men dying. I'm going to that mine. Safety machines, listen to that. Something's happened at the mine. I told you it was bad luck to have a woman run a mine. Come on. There's the girl. There for the temple at the head of the shaft. This was all a trick to get you back to work. Oh, no, it's not. Listen to me. You all walked out on me before, but this time you're going to stay and listen. So you're all on strike. None of you like the things I've done to improve the mind. You don't want to work for a woman boss, do you? Oh, why don't you answer? You, Tom Carson, you don't want to work for me, do you? Or you, Luke, or you, Shorty? All right. That's all I want to know. Wait a minute. Listen, everybody. This here gal's trying to cut... Now, look, Slocum. Yeah. Mickey's talking here, and you're going to shut up. This is a free country, Barlow. You can't stop me. I can't? Get... Are you looking now? Hey, you got... <laughs> all right, Mickey, go on. Go to it. Tell him. And now, you women, what about you? I'll tell you what about us. You've got no right to scare us with that whistle when nothing's happened. Well, something's going to happen, Mrs. Novak. Unless at least you women back me up. What do you mean, back you up? Why should we? Because you're women. And being women, you can't help but understand the thing I've tried to do. Change the mind? Sure, I've changed it. I've changed it to give your men a chance to live down in that hole. Well, what about it? Have you got the courage to tell your sons and husbands to go back to work? So you won't help me. So I have to fight your men alone. Well, that's great. There never was a gargan that didn't like a fight. And, boys, you've got one. None of you wants to work in the gargan mine. You'd rather go hungry than work in it. Well, then you're going hungry. Because I hate the mine. With or without improvements, I've always hated it. So I'm going to save us all a lot of trouble. Jan, huh? hand me that piece of timber and open that fire box. Yeah, here, Miss Gargan. Do you see this tipple? Well, it's 40 years old and as dry as tinder. Hey, she's got a torch. Miss Gargan, Miss Gargan, wait. What are you going to do? Do? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to burn the mine. There. There. But the mine's on fire. Oh, you've got to stop her. Hey, she threw a torch down at the temple. Jack, don't stand there. The mine. Go put it out. And your job. Come on. Oh, on. Come on. Come on. Look at them go so they didn't light the mine. Hide fire with fire, ain't you? Um, Mickey, and you have. Tell them where to go, boy. How you told them. Oh, my huh? God. Sure, why not? Fire almost out now. Pretty soon, men, I'll go back to work. I blow whistle, let town no strike over. Sure, Jan. Let her blow. Go ahead. Okay. And you do one swell job just now. You're damn fine boss, Mike. Oh, Timmy. Timmy, I've done it. Did you hear? He called me Mike. Sure, he did. And they're all going to be calling you Mike. Did you... Hey, hey. Hey, hey, Mickey. Crying. Hey, you can't cry. You're boss here. I know, I... I just can't help it. You can't help it? You win, so you can't help crying. Well, I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy. Yes, you are. Jan said so. Like all Americans. But, oh, Timmy, crazy or not, 
I love you. In a few minutes, I'm going to ask Rosalind Russell and James Stewart to come out in front of our silver curtain so that you may meet them in person. But first, here's another friend of yours, John Conti. Ladies and gentlemen, as soon as this program is over, will you go to your buffet drawer and look at your silverware? Is it the kind you can be really proud of, silverware that adds distinction to your dinner table? And just how complete a service have you? Do you own salad forks and coffee spoons? If you're not perfectly satisfied with what you see... Now is the time to replenish the service you have or to buy completely new silverware. Because now you can get solid silver like the international sterling we mentioned a few minutes ago or the finest of silver plate like 1847 Rogers Brothers' First Love at prices you never dreamed possible. First Love is a pattern of really unusual beauty. The floral ornament is deeply etched and richly raised in a perfection of craftsmanship never before found in silver plate. 1847 Rogers Brothers would like you to have a small, distinctive serving fork in this exquisite first love pattern. A fork that sells for one dollar and a half, but which is yours for only 25 cents. By all means, go to your silverware dealer tomorrow and get it. Look at sets of first love while you're there and learn how easily and conveniently you can own the best in silver plate. 1847 Rogers Brothers. And now, back to Conrad Nagel. For two persons such as Rosalind Russell and James Stewart, there's only one thing we can do. Ros and Jimmy, here's the microphone and several millions of your fans. Uh, well, Ros, you start. Well, it's been very nice for both Jimmy and me returning together to the Silver Theater. Ros, you know, this and is I... a lot like the time we were on the Silver Theater last season, you know? You just finished a new picture for metro Golden mayor Van and... <laughs> You've just finished the Citadel for them now. Well, you I... were all banged up from playing football last year. Really banged yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's happened again in the same place. Uh, another football picture, no, Jimmy? No, 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 ice skating. Now, for ice falling, this picture MGM has me making now. I, I, I never knew ice could hit back so hard. You know? <laughs> no, Jimmy, there's one more thing. Even nicer than a return engagement. Conrad has told me how much the people have liked First Love since we introduced it last season. Yeah, yeah, Roz, can I interrupt again? You I know, suppose so. I uh, bought some silver last week, oh, a whole lot of it. Enchantress and First Love, the pattern you named, you know, from a new house. Is that mansion of yours finished? No, no, the roof isn't on yet, but I thought I'd start furnishing it in the right way. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, everyone. So long. Thank you. Good night, Rosalind Russell and Jimmy Stewart. We'll see you both soon again. Next week, at the same time, the Silver Theater will star Francia Tone with Rita Johnson in the Vivian Bretherton story, Hollywood Legend, directed by Conrad Nagel, with original music scored and conducted by Felix Mills. All the characters and events in today's drama were purely fictional. John Conti speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at chestertonradio.com. Do you love sharing the gospel and want to learn to be more effective? Join the St. Paul Street Evangelization Online School of Evangelization. You will learn to build bridges of trust and make disciples by befriending strangers, proclaiming the gospel, inviting people to the church, and praying with others. We'll ask for a pledge of financial support, but if you are unable to give, We'll give you a membership at no cost. Find out more and get involved today at streetevangelization.com. That's streetevangelization.com. This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at chestertonradio.com. Good evening. Tonight, Lady Esther takes exceptional pride in presenting the Screen Guild players in Philip Berry's delightful modern classic, The Philadelphia Story. It stars the three brilliant players who made the story so memorable on the screen. Cary Grant, K. 
Katherine Hepburn and Jimmy Stewart, the Lady Esther Screen Guild players in the Philadelphia story. Tracy Lord's first marriage to C.K. Dexter Haven was dissolved by a vigorous right to the jaw. And now Tracy is about to be married again. The season's most important event to mainline society in Philadelphia and streamline journalism in New York. Which brings us to the office of Mr. Kidd, owner and editor of Spy Magazine. Miss Simbry, you'll take your camera, of course. Uh, Connor, you'll take your own special talents. Where? Yeah, what's the deal? Your assignment will be Spy's most sensational achievement, Tracy Lord. Tracy Lord? Big Lord. game hunting in Africa, fox hunting in Pennsylvania, married on impulse and divorced in rage, and always unapproachable by the press. The unapproachable Miss Lord. Now, look here, if you The think Philadelphia that I... story, closed with the portals of snobbish fox hunting, uh... No, 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 wait. No Hunter of Foxes is Spy Magazine. Nevertheless, presented for the first time, quote, a wedding day inside mainline society. Or what the kitchen maid saw through the keyhole, unquote. Huh? You're the writer, Connor. I'm only the publisher. All right, publisher, take this. Quote, no hunter of buckshot on the rear is KG Crafty Connor, unquote. Close paragraph. Close job, close bank account. Look, Mr. Kidd, how could we even get inside the estate, let alone into the house? Oh, it's been arranged. Miss Wallace? Yes, sir? Send him in, please. Now, Liz, now, wait a minute. We won't do it. It's degrading, demeaning, undignified. So is an empty stomach. Now, just relax. We'll have to... Hello. Who are you? Connor, this gentleman has been employed in our Buenos Aires office. I believe he can help us. How? Tracy Lord's brother, Junius, is in the American embassy down there, and an old friend of this gentleman... He'll introduce you to the family as an intimate friend of Junius. Dear old Junius, hmm? Oh, does Tracy Lord know this guy? Oh, yes. Yes, you might say Tracy and I grew up together. You might also say you're C.K. Dexter Haven, and you were Tracy Lord's first husband. Yes, you might. Holy muck, what goes on here? Oh, I remember that honeymoon very well, Mr. Dexter Haven. You and she in a little sailboat. The true love, wasn't it? That's right. How did you know? I was the one photographer whose camera you didn't smash. You were terribly nice about it. You threw it in the ocean. Oh, one of those, huh? Yes, that's right. I rather thought our honeymoon was our own business. Incidentally, he paid for all the cameras, Mike. I got a sweet letter of apology, too. Oh, always the gentleman, huh? I wouldn't count on that. Now then, uh, what are the plans? The wedding is Saturday. This is Thursday. They should spend tomorrow night as guests of the Lord. Wait a minute, wait a minute. There's something screwy here. Now, if he's resigned, why is he doing this? Uh-oh, oh oh oh, 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 I get it, mister. Oh, you want to get even with your ex-bride, huh? As one gentleman to another, that may be exactly what I want. I'll have a car pick you up in North Philadelphia tomorrow noon. Good day. Well, what do you, well how do you like that? He just walks out on us, just as though we were... Had, we're... A handkerchief, Mike. There's a little spit in your eye. It shows. <laughs> Oh, dear, so many things to do in so little time. Tracy, when you finish listing those wedding presents... Mother, how do you spell omelet? Two L's, two M's, one or the other. Omelet? <laughs> That's a funny wedding present. Dinah, dear, it's an omelet dish. This one... It stinks. Oh, darling, don't say stinks. If necessary, smells, but only if absolutely necessary. Mother, if I ever finish writing down... Oh, this lamp, isn't it awful? Yeah, let me see that card. Oh, yes, friends of your father's. Wouldn't you know? What are they, tap dancers or just musical comedy producers? Tracy, that's hardly fair to your father's interest in the arts. The arts? The art of putting up a fortune to display the shapely legs of some... Tracy, please. Well, I'm certainly glad George isn't like that. Mother, isn't George an angel? George is an angel. Is he handsome or is he not? George is handsome. I like Dexter. Really? Why don't you stop the wedding? How? Get smallpox. Oh, please. Don't give her any ideas, Tracy. Now, Dinah. Oh, gee, Tracy's always so mean about Dexter. Well, darling, he was rather mean to her. Did he really sock her? Dinah. Really, Mother, if I don't choke her before Saturday... That'd stop the wedding, wouldn't it? It would not. You're supposed to be riding, young lady. Yes, Dinah, they must be waiting at the stable. All right, all right. Mother. Yes, dear. How do you get smallpox? Oh. Dinah, please go. Oh, I'm going, I'm going. Now then, Tracy, let's get those lists finished. And... Mother. Mother. That whistle. Dexter! Dexter, you're back! Dinah, my dream girl, my own true love. Oh, no, it can't be. He wouldn't dare. Mother, look! 
Lucky's here. Mother, it's Dexter. Well, hello. Dexter Haven, you go right back where you came from. I can't. Dinah says it's too awful here without me. Redhead, if you don't look in the pink. Much too nice for George. If you think you can walk in here and... Uh, Dexter, tell me, how is Junius? Oh, Junius is fine. Heartbroken, of course, not to be here for the wedding. I suggested representing him as best man, but... Dexter, I appreciate your offer, but I'm afraid George would prefer to have his best man sober. Ah, yes, yes. Well, I'm sure you'll like the people Junius did send. People? The... The junior sent, did you say? Yes, Miss Imbry and Mr. Connor. They're waiting now in the South Parlor. You really ought to tell them what rooms they're to have. Rooms? Dexter, have you switched from liquor to dope by any chance? Well, it was Junius's idea, you see. They've been terribly nice to him, and when they said they were coming to Philadelphia... And... Dexter Haven, you're lying. I can always tell. Hmm. Can you, Red? Yes, you have a habit of just a minute now. You went to work after the divorce, didn't you? Well, not right after. First, I tested several hundred bottles of bourbon. But after that, after that, you took a job in South, um, South America. What for? A Who magazine. For? Ah, and it wasn't by any chance spy magazine. Oh, you're just a mass of intuition. And I don't suppose Junius is friends of photographers by any chance. Well, not exactly by chance. I thought chance. you were low, Dex, but I never thought, oh, you... Ah, no, you're slipping red. I used to be afraid of that look, the withering glance of the goddess. I didn't think that alcohol would destroy your last shred of decency so soon. I ought to... Tracy, oh, please... Dinah. Oh, Mother, not yet. Come along, dear. You're late for your ride. But, Mother, maybe he's going to sock her again. Dex, I'll have no argument about this. I want those people out of here, and you too. Yes, Your Majesty. But first, could I interest you in some small blackmail? No, you... What? Here you are, galley proofs. An article complete with snapshots, details, and insinuations ready for publication in Spy about your father and that dancer in New York. Father and Tina Mara? But they can't. They can't publish this. It's got to be stopped. Well, it is stopped temporarily, if you'll allow Miss Imbry and Mr. Connor to turn in the story on your wedding. And when Mr. Kidd says story, he means story. I'm going to be sick. Yes, dear. An intimate day with a society bride. I am sick. Too bad. Well, they're in the South Parlor, Your Majesty. Shall I conduct you in? Don't bother, please. I'm sure I know the way. <laughs> I'm, uh... I'm Tracy Lord, though I suppose you know that, but any friend of Junius's is a friend of... So nice having you with us. We're happy to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure. Too bad Junius couldn't be here. At least one male member of the family, too. Hey, uh, where's your father? Darling, Papa, I do hope you'll stay for my wedding. Yes, we'd like to. Yeah, that was more or less the idea. The house is rather a mess, of course, but we'll try to make you as comfortable as... Oh, what a cunning little camera. Wait, uh, I take pictures with it. <laughs> Well, I hope you'll take loads. Dear Papa and Mama aren't allowing any reporters in. That is, except for little Mr. Grace, who does the social news. Mr. Connor, can you imagine a grown-up man sinking so low? No, it does seem pretty bad. <laughs> You're a sort of a, a writer, aren't you, Mr. Connor? No, oh, sort of. A book? Mm-hmm, yeah. Under what name do you publish? My own. Macaulay Connor. Just try and call me that. <laughs> I won't. What's the Macaulay for? Well, my father taught English history. I'm Mike to my friend. Of whom you have many, I'm sure. <laughs> English history. It's always fascinated me. Cromwell, Robin Hood, Jack the Ripper. Where did he teach? I mean, your father. Well, he, in a high school in South Bend, Indiana. He... South Bend. It sounds like dancing, doesn't it? <laughs> And this is, this is your first visit to Philadelphia, a quaint old place, don't you think? Odd customs and such, where the scrapples eat biddle on Sunday. <laughs> but then you're still quite young. Well, I don't know about that. I'm 30. Really? One book isn't much for a man of 30. <laughs> I don't mean to criticize. You probably have other interests outside your work. No, none. Unless, unless... Uh, oh, uh, oh, how sweet. <laughs> Are you two going together? Well, sort of. Engaged, well, yeah. I presume. Uh, no, no, but, uh, but... But very much in love. Oh, isn't that a little personal? Is it? Well, it's so very interesting, Miss Imbry. Miss Imbry, if a man says he loves a girl, don't you think he ought to marry her? Hey, now, just a look. Please, Mr. There, Connor. Uh, I asked Miss Imbry a question. Well, uh, it, it depends. I'm disappointed, Miss Imbry. I've been very frank with you. However, I'll send a butler to show you your rooms. You'll join us, I hope, at the swimming pool. Ah. Huh. Wow. That's what I say. Well, Who's I just... interviewing whom? Yeah, yeah, just study, old girl. I don't let her throw you. You want to take over? Mm, I want to go home. But uh, since I'm on the job, I'll settle for the swimming pool. 
And then she came out and he wandered in and then men there and oh. to find out. Uh, oh, Mr. Connor. Yeah, you said to come down here. I didn't mean to interrupt your reading. It's nothing important, I hope. I... You bet. It's very important. It's your book. Oh? Oh. Well, I didn't know you had it. Well, I didn't. I sent to the library for it. Oh? Well, well, you like it? I like it very much, especially the story called With the Rich and Mighty. I think I like that one best. Really? Well, I, uh, I got the title from a Spanish peasant's proverb, With the Rich and Mighty, Always a Little Patience. I like that. Tell me something, will you, Connor? When you can write a book like this, how can you possibly do anything else? Well, you'll never believe it, but there are people in this world that have to earn a living. Yeah, yeah of course, but people buy books, don't they? Not if there's a library around. That book re represents two solid years' work, not, and that had Connor less than... Oh, heck, that's Dexter. Look, stand by, will you, Connor? I don't want to be alone with him. Well, well, there you are. Funny, just where I thought you'd be. Fancy seeing you here. Orange juice? Certainly. Don't tell me you've forsaken your beloved whiskey and whiskies. No, but I think a pale pastel shade would be a better color for me today. And how about you, Mr. Connor? You drink, don't you? Alcohol, I mean. Mm, well, a little, and you a writer. Dexter, will you do something for me? Anything, Red? What? Crawl into some small hole until after the wedding? Oh, I couldn't do that. At least not until I've... Uh... Connor, don't miss a word. Don't miss a word. We're going to talk about me. Why not? You find the subject fascinating. You're far and away your favorite person in the world. Of course, Mr. Connor, she's generous to a fault. To a fault, Mr. Connor. Except to other people's faults. For instance, to what used to be my deep and gorgeous thirst. It was disgusting. A uh, weakness, sure. And strength is your religion. Well, when I realized I was not expected to be a loving husband and a good companion, but a kind of a high priest to a virgin goddess. Dexter, you... Well, then my drinks grew more frequent and deeper, that's all. Connor, don't you let him make you think why he's gone. <laughs> I like him. Dexter, what are you trying to make me out as? Red, what do you fancy yourself as? What are you trying to do with this marriage to George? How can you even think of it? George Kittredge is everything you're not. He's been poor and he's had to work and he's had to fight for everything and I love him as I never even began to love you. Really? Oh, you really are in love. Yes, I am, and you needn't sound so contemptuous. I'm not red, never of you. You could be the finest woman in the world if you just learned to have some regard for human frailty. If only you'd slip a little sometime. But I guess that's hopeless. Your sense of inner divinity won't allow that. This goddess must and shall remain intact. <laughs> this woman must represent her class, a special class, the married maidens. So help me, Dexter, if you say another word... I'll... Tracy, darling, you there by the pool? George. That's a new high priest. I'll run along. <laughs> Here, Red, I brought you a little wedding present. Sorry I had no ribbon to tie it up with. So long, Red. A present? Well, I wonder what... Oh. Oh, there you are, my dear. I thought I'd run over and... Tracy, aren't you going to say hello? Yeah, yeah. Hello, George. What's that you've got? Oh, a wedding present from Dex. A photograph? A picture of the true love. The, the what? We sailed her up the coast of Maine and back the summer we were married. My, she was yar. Yar? What's that? It means, oh, easy to handle, quick to the helm, fast, bright. Everything a boat should be until it develops dry rot. Oh, George. Well, there now, he'll not upset you anymore. He never appreciated you anyway. How could he? Anyone as wonderful as you. George. It's what I've always thought from the first time I saw you. You're like some marvelous, distant old queen, I guess. There's kind of beautiful purity about you. George. It's what everyone feels. They worship you, darling. George, listen, I don't want to be worshipped. I want to be loved. Oh, you're that, too. I mean, really loved. Of course. And now I'll have to hurry, darling. Big party tonight, you know. I'll pick you up around now. Well, I, I... Connor. Hey, Connor. Are you around here somewhere? Yeah, here in the dressing room. Are oh, you calling me? Yes, I was. Connor, do you ever take a drink? A drink? Oh, yes, yes, sometimes. Well, that's good. Let's go in and open a bottle of champagne. The second act of the Lady Esther Screen Guild show starring Catherine Hepburn, Cary Grant, and Jimmy Stewart will follow in a moment. Now, 
A word from Lady Esther. Have you heard what's new and smart in Easter hats? There are lots of styles to choose from. Adorable little hats made entirely of flowers, perky bowlers with rolled-up brims, bewitching bonnets to frame your face with beauty. But here's the one style note that's most important. The new spring hats are worn back off your forehead. They give the world a good look at your face. Well, now, how about your skin? Will it have a lovely springtime look to show the world? It will if you use my new spring face powder shade called Bridal Pink. Lady Esther Bridal Pink is fashion right for spring and beauty right for you. Now, at last, you don't have to worry about which shade of face powder is right for you. Here, for the first time, is one shade of face powder that's right for four basic types of skin. If you're a blonde, Bridal Pink will dramatize your blondness, make your skin look softer, more alluring. If you're a brunette, Lady Esther Bridal Pink will intensify the contrast, make you look so much more romantic. If you're a brownette, Bridal Pink will give an exciting lift to your whole appearance. And if you're a redhead, Bridal Pink will wake up your skin, give it the life and warmth it needs to go with your hair. Buy a box of Bridal Pink tomorrow. Don't wait for spring. Start now to use this lovelier face powder shade, which makes even a bride look more romantic. And now Lady Esther presents the second act of the Philadelphia story starring Jimmy Stewart, Catherine Hepburn, and Cary Grant. Well, that bottle of champagne was just the first. Later, at the party on a neighboring estate, Tracy and Mike sampled quite a few more until George departed in a huff and left Mike to escort Tracy home. That's where we find them now, just arriving with a bottle they've brought along for the road. Well, well, here we are, Professor. You know, it's funny I never noticed this lake before. <laughs> Silly, that's a swimming pool. Oh, oh. <laughs> you, know, you know, champagne's tricky. I'm used to bourbon. Bourbon's a slap on the back. Champagne, champagne's a... A heavy mist before my eyes. A quick swim will fix that. Dexter and I always swam after parties. Well, let's forget about Dexter. Have a drink now. Why not? Mike, Mike, do you hear a telephone ringing? I did a little while ago. No, I can't hear it. Well, now. Yes, I do. No. Well, it's very far away. Mm -hmm. That's my bedroom telephone, and it's probably George. I better go in and... No. No, it stopped. Fine. Go, go, drink your champagne. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. <laughs> Hello, you. <laughs> Hello. You look fine. I feel fine. <laughs> Did you like the party? Sure. The prettiest sight in this fine, pretty world. The privileged class enjoying its privilege... Privilege... Privileges. You... <laughs> You're a snob, Connor. No doubt. No doubt. Hey, Tracy. Hey, you, you can't marry that guy. George, I'm going to. Why not? Well, you don't match up. Professor, you're stepping out of character. My mistake. Oh, don't apologize. Who's apologizing? Really, I never knew such a man. I guess I never knew a girl like you, Tracy. Yeah? Tracy, you're wonderful. There's a magnificence in you. Mike. A magnificence that comes out of your eyes and in your voice and on the way you stand and the way you walk. There's fires banked down in you, Tracy. Hearth fires and holocausts. I... You, you don't think I'm like a goddess? You're flesh and blood. That's the blank, unholy surprise. But you're... You're the golden girl, Tracy. You're full of life and warmth and delight. Hey. Hey, what goes on? Have you got... Got tears in your eyes. Shut up, shut up. Oh, Mike, Mike, keep talking, keep talking, talk, will you? What good is talk, Tracy? Tracy. Golly. Golly, Moses. 
Well, nobody's ever kissed me like that. Tracy, I want to tell you something. Please, all of a sudden I've got the shakes. Please, Tracy. It's as though my insteps were melting away. Oh, gee, what is it? Have I got feet of clay or something? Tracy, you're so lovely. Wait, I know. The pool, there's a moon and it's warm and we could go... Now? Now? No. Mike, Mike, put me in your pocket and let's go swimming. Don't you see, Dexter? I had to tell someone. Oh, I could hardly wait till you got here this morning. Yes, but darling, my love, are you sure it wasn't just a dream? Well, I can't be positive, but... Good morning. Well, what ho, the bride. In her wedding dress. Such a lovely day. Is everybody fine? That's fine. Hmm. How fine are you? Well, I, d I don't know what's the matter with me. I can hardly open my eyes. I must have had too much sun yesterday. Um, it's awfully easy to get too much. Tracy, you're not really going to, are you? Going to what? Mary George, after last night. Last night? What are you talking about? Tracy, don't you even remember? Remember what? Well, I've been telling Dinah it was just a dream. A dream? Well, what kind of a dream? Well, last night, it was awful late, I guess. I woke up and looked out of my window, and guess what I saw? What? Mr. Connor. Mike? Uh-huh. He was sort of coming from the pool, with both arms full of something. And what do you think it turned out to be? What? You, and some clothes. And you were sort of crooning. I never crooned in my life. <laughs> then what? Well, then he carried you into the house, and I could hear him take you into your room. Mike and me... Well, I'm going crazy. I'm standing here on my own two hands and going crazy. What else? Well, after that, he... Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. Oh, well, morning, Connor. How do you feel? Hmm? Well, Mike, I... what's happened to your chin? My chin? Oh, well, you see... Tracy, I... I didn't get to tell you. When Mr. Connor came out again, George was waiting for him. No. Yes. And Mr. Connor sort of got hit on the chin. George? No, me... You, Dex, you were there, too? Good grief, why didn't you sell tickets? <laughs> uh, I, I'll say Dexter was there. What a clip he gave me. Oh, well, I'm sorry, Mike. I thought I'd better hit you before George did. He's in better shape than I am. <laughs> Dex, Mike, will somebody please tell me what happened before I go start raving mad? On the level, you don't know? Of course I don't know. I don't remember anything. Ah, lucky Tracy. She's drawn a blank. Shut up, Dex. Mike, you tell me. Well, Tracy, y yes. Tracy, are you ready, darling? The guests are all here and the bishop's waiting. And... Oh, dear, where is George? <gasps> George? Good heavens, Tracy, I forgot he was here at ten and left this note. For me? Well, I wonder what he could have... Well, go on, read it out loud, Red. We're all friends. Yes, I will. Listen to this. Quote. Your conduct last night was so shocking to my ideals of womanhood that my attitude toward you and the prospects of a happy and useful life together... Tracy? Hello, George. Tracy, I didn't dream you. All these people... Why, it's only a letter from a friend. They're my friends, too. I, uh, I thought I ought to come and, uh, and explain. I mean, I... It's clear it... enough, George. You're chucking me over in good riddance. Well, after all, I have a point, you know, on the very eve of your marriage... Well, to... just a minute, George. Mike... Why don't you tell him what happened last night? Well, exactly two kisses and one late swim, after which I deposited Tracy in her room and I left. You mean, you mean to say that's all there was to it? I do. Why? Was I so terribly unattractive, Mike? So distant, so forbidding that you... No, no, you were extremely attractive and far from distant or forbidding, but you were also, uh, You well... were pretty pixelated, Red. Yeah, and, and there are rules about that. <laughs> I think men are wonderful. Oh, uh, Tracy, uh, uh, perhaps I was a little hasty, but, well, a man does expect his wife to... To behave herself naturally. To behave herself naturally. Uh... <laughs> Will you please... Well, I'm sorry. Tracy, if, if you're willing to let bygones be bygones, uh, what do you say? Goodbye, George. I beg your pardon? I said Goodbye. But, but we you have see, to... you're much too good for me, George. A hundred times too good. And I make you most unhappy, most. Very well. That's how you want it. Possibly it's just as well. Good day. Well, congratulations, Red. Or is that proper without a groom? Hey, we can make it proper, Tracy. Yeah, Mike? I got you into this. I'll get you out of it. Will you marry me, Tracy? No, Mike. 
Thank you, but... Mm -mm, no. Why not? Because I, I don't think that nice girl with a camera would like it, and I'm not sure that you would, and I'm even a little doubtful about myself. Well, there goes your wedding music, Tracy. And besides, I, I made a mistake yesterday. I opened a wedding present too soon. A present without any ribbons on it. Red. Just a picture of a boat. A boat I don't think I've ever forgotten. Red. I've got an old wedding license, the one we didn't use when we eloped. What do you say? Dex, Dex, are you sure? Not the least, but I'll risk it, will you? And, and, and you, you wouldn't be doing it just to save my face? Why shouldn't I save it? It's a nice little face. <laughs> oh, Dex, I'll be yah this time. I promise, darling, I'll be yah. Be whatever you like. You're my redhead. Are you all set? All set. Oh, never have I been so full of love. Mike, how do I look? Like a queen, like a goddess. That's funny, Mike, because you know how I feel. For the first time in my life, like a human being. <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy Stewart, Cary Grant, and Catherine Hepburn for a most delightful half hour. Well, as a matter of fact, Mr. Bradley, there isn't an actor or actress in Hollywood who isn't eager to come here and take part in the great work this program does for the Motion Picture Relief Fund and its country house. Am I right, boys? You are right, That's Kate. Fine. Say that again. And now, before we tell you about next week's show, here's a word from one of America's best-known beauty authorities, Lady Esther. Thank you, Miss Hepburn. Ladies, did you ever come back from a wonderful vacation and have everyone say to you, why, you look simply marvelous, just like a new woman, so gay and fresh and vital? Well, women write and tell me that's the kind of new, fresh, vital look that comes to their skin when they try my romantic spring shade of face powder, my lovely bridal pink. You see, Lady Esther Bridal Pink is not just a new shade of face powder. It's a new kind of powder shade that ends all guesswork about the right shade for you. For this one specially blended shade has the amazing quality of flattery for every type of skin. The unique texture of my Lady Esther face powder makes it more flattering, too, because of the special way it's blended. My powder spreads a delicate film of beauty over your skin, hides tiny lines, little blemishes, makes pores look smaller. And because Lady Esther powder is so fine and smooth, it clings far longer than ordinary face powders. Keeps your skin looking more velvety smooth. America's most beautiful women will be wearing bridal pink in the Easter parade. What shade will you be wearing? Next week, the Lady Esther Screen Guild players will present The Moon is Our Home. It will star Fred McMurray and Virginia Bruce. Be sure to listen. The Philadelphia Story was produced and directed for Lady Esther by Bill Lawrence, adapted by Harry Cronman, and was presented through arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of It Happened in Brooklyn, starring Frank Sinatra, Catherine Grayson, Peter Lawford, and Jimmy Durante. Music on tonight's program was arranged and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Catherine Hepburn can currently be seen in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer picture, The Sea of Grass. Cary Grant can soon be seen in Dory Sherry's RKO production, The Bachelor and the Bobby Soxer. James Stewart can now be seen in Liberty Films' production of Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life. This is Truman Bradley speaking for Lady Esther. Thank you, and good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Mutual Broadcasting System presents the Family Theater, starring Loretta Young and Don Amici, with Jimmy Stewart as your host. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Good evening. 
This is Jimmy Stewart. Tonight, the family theater stars Loretta Young and Don Amici. You know, since this is our first program, maybe we ought to have a dedication. So right now, let's dedicate the family theater to your family, with the hope that families everywhere will always be together, and that your home will be a happy one, with the conviction that prayer, simple prayer, will help to keep it that way. Now, uh... (laughs) Maybe you're thinking this is sort of an odd way to start a series of radio programs, programs from Hollywood with movie stars, actors, musicians. Maybe you're wondering what it's all about. Well, why don't you just sit back and listen? Listen to the music of Meredith Wilson's orchestra and, and listen to our story. It's called Flight from Home, a story written by True Boardman and starring Don Amici and Loretta Young. Yes, Nora. We're just leaving. We'll be there in less than half an hour to take you to the train. All right, I'm all ready. Still packing? Uh, no, no, as a matter of fact, I'm writing a letter. Oh. Uh, but I'll be ready when you get here. All right. Uh, goodbye, Nora. Dear Jim, I don't pretend even to myself that this letter can make any difference. What we said last night before you left was final and definite. I know that. Within an hour, Nora and Charlie are coming to drive me to the train that will take me home to Cleveland. Home. It's funny that after six years, I should suddenly be thinking again of Cleveland as home. But what does one do while one waits those last minutes before she says goodbye to a lifetime? I don't know. I only know I feel impelled to put it down in black and white. Perhaps then, the separate pieces will make some pattern that has sense and order. Perhaps seeing it like that will help me, and you, if you ever read this letter, to somehow understand it all. As I say, I don't know, but I have to try. I'm sitting now by the front window that faces over the river. The day is perfect, and you can see all the way to the hills across the valley. And as I look out now, one object holds my eyes and my thoughts. It's something you built for me, Jim, with your own hands and showed me so proudly the day we arrived here from our honeymoon. The day that was really the beginning. Okay, Mrs. Matthews, your mansion awaits. All out. Oh, Jim, this is the Star Island place. Oh, you don't tell me. Oh, but Jim, we agreed on that little house near the university, the place on Elm Street. That shack for the wife of a man who in two years will be head of the university research lab? Oh, couldn't think of it. Oh. Come on. <laughs> but, darling, we, we agreed. We talked it all over and decided, And remember? I decided you should have a place worthy of you. Uh, Mary, wait. Before we go inside, there's something here in the garden you didn't see before. What is it? Come on. In here. Well? Oh, Jim. Oh, darling, it's... it's... You see, the house was already built and furnished, and I wanted the place to have something I'd made myself. Just for you. Oh, darling. And what better for a girl I couldn't even get to see for the first three months I knew her unless I went to church four times a week. (laughs) You? I went to church to see you. (laughs) What do you mean? Your mother told me you practically lived down at that church before you ever saw Jim Matthews. Oh, Jim, if I didn't already love you more than any man deserves, this shrine you built for me would... Oh, Jim, I'm so happy, I'm scared. Hey, hey, now, take it easy. (laughs) You know where I got the idea for the shrine? Uh -uh. That trip I took around the world, on an island in the Indies I visited. Each family has its own shrine outside the house. They do? Uh Uh-huh. Guarantees every newly married couple fair weather, good crops, and at least 14 children. Fourteen? Well, thirteen. Oh, all right. <laughs> Come on, let's go inside the house. Darling. Huh? Before we go in, could we... Could we dedicate our shrine? Oh, it has been. The moment it was finished. By a fellow I know. Oh. And what did this fellow say? Oh, he said something like, Thanks, Lord, for what I know is going to be a fine marriage. Thanks for Mary understanding about my work. 
and taking the job at the lab here because it means more freedom and authority, even though I could earn more money for somewhere else. Thanks for this house. And above all, may it be blessed with children. And may every one of them look like their mother. Oh. That was all. You have anything to add? Yes, just one thing. What? Thanks, dear Lord, for Jim. And help me to be the wife that he deserves. And if it be your will, let there be children, all just like their father. Amen. All right, darling. Let's go inside. That was the beginning, Jim. Such a rich and warm and happiness-filled beginning that I forgot all about your overruling our agreement as to the house we'd buy. There was fun for us in those first months that so quickly became years. Such fun that, well, I wonder now how and when we first began to lose it. I only know that suddenly we were aware that there were two shadows across our life together. We had no child. And it began to seem we weren't ever going to have one. That was one shadow. And the other... Well, you felt you'd receive no recognition at the lab for all the work that you'd done. And then, just before our fourth anniversary, there was a night when it all seemed perfect again. We were alone, and, and you were helping me in the kitchen. Gosh, two people can dirty an awful lot of dishes. <laughs> you don't have to help me with them, Jim. You're tired. Who's tired? I only played seven sets. Oh, excuse me. I forgot I was married to the original Iron Man. <laughs> what do you think of the new man? Hmm? Well, I played singles with. Oh, Mr. Michaels? Hmm. Why, he's all right. Oh. He's the old man's new pet. Former student of his. So? So some people think the old man might decide to make him director of the research lab when... Professor Kenny retires this fall. Oh, Jim, he couldn't. You've worked hard for that directorship. You deserve it. Don't worry. The old man knows that. In fact, you said something about it this afternoon. Oh. Looks good. Jim. Hmm? Jim, what would you do if Michaels did get that appointment over your uh, head? Nothing. Just blow the roof off the lab and the old man, that's all. Yeah, and I'd help you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, uh, Jim, by the way, I, I went to see Dr. Peters this morning. Why? Oh, nothing important. Just to make sure whether or not we were going to have a baby. We are. Hand me the platter there. Here. Uh, where's this young Michaels from, Jim? Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. How soon? Uh, December. Maybe, maybe January. You know, he's quite handsome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Doc, say you're all right? Perfect. Swell. You know, it's funny. People make such a to-do over this baby business. In the movies, the girl always has moonlight, soft music when she tells her husband he's supposed to faint or something. <laughs> no, no, that's when he's born. Here, here's the platter, and be careful. But take us. We're washing dishes. Matter of fact, hmm. just conversation. Nobody excited, nobody nervous, nobody... Look out! <gasps> oh! Oh! Oh, Mary. Mary, <sighs> darling. Jim, I'm so happy. Jim, this time it's really true... Oh, thank heaven, it's really true. Those months that followed, Jim, for those months I will always be grateful. Our life had purpose again, and it was beautiful and complete. And you were as proud as if you'd personally invented the idea of parenthood. And then that night, that one horrible, unforgettable night... Darling, if only that storm could have happened a week before or later or any time, but when it did... But it didn't, Jim. It happened then. At perhaps the most crucial moment of our lives. Yes, Dr. Peters, of course you're right. She shouldn't drive in this storm. Oh, I'm... Yeah, I'm positive she does. Yes, right here. Here, Mary, he wants to talk to you. All right. He's definitely sending another doctor. Oh, oh yes, all right. H Hello, doctor. Yeah, fine time I pick. Helpful Mary, that's me. <laughs> Oh, yes, yes, of course I understand. You're right. Yes, of course it's safer in this storm. Oh, certainly, as long as you recommend him. But just so he makes it in time. Oh, no. No, I haven't been able to find Jim anywhere. And, Doctor, I'm worried about him. He should have been home two hours ago. Now, Doctor, look, you know I'm not alone. I called Nora and she came right over. Now, now don't you worry about me. I'm going to be all right. <laughs> and don't forget... 
I bet you it's a girl. Now, you say it's a boy. It's still a boy, huh? <laughs> Nora, Dr. Peters said... Oh, Nora. Hold on, honey, hold on. That one was 18 oh. minutes. Nora, the front door. Jim, is that you? Oh, Jim, I'm so glad you're here. Hi, Mary. Hi, Nora. Oh, darling, where have you been? I... Jim. Bill, I've been celebrating all by myself all afternoon. I got some news for you. Michael's got that assignment as director of the lab. Pretty boy Michaels is now my new boss. Ray. Oh, Jim. Jim, Mary's needed you. The baby. What about him? You mean... Yes, Jim, yes. But I'm all right now that you're here. We called Dr. Peters, and, and he can't leave the hospital, so he's sending a doctor here. But he doesn't want me driving in to the hospital in this storm. Well, that's ridiculous. I... Of course you're going to the hospital. There's time, isn't there? Oh, I suppose so, but Dr. Peters Jim, said that's that... crazy. The doctor specifically and said... And I say to... she's going to the hospital. We'll have no home delivery with some doctor we don't know. You're having the best, Mary. You hear me? Jim Matthews' wife is having the best there is. No storm or anything else is going to prevent it either. Jim, please slow down. I- I'm sure we'll get there in time. And I'm all right, dear. But please, take it easy. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Jim, are-, are you sure I shouldn't drive? I can, you know. Don't be ridiculous. I'm terribly sorry about the appointment, dear. You, you should have had it. Jim, please slow down. Oh, be quiet, Mary. I had a few drinks, sure. What of it? Stop sounding as, as though I'm... Jim, look gonna... out! Doctor, Mary will be all right, Jim, but the child, I... I'm sorry, there was nothing I could do. I see. You should never have tried to drive in through that storm. You suppose I don't know that now? Doctor, what about... What about other children for us later? There are many children already born who need adoption, son. I'm sorry. You, uh... You'd better go into Mary. Mary? Jim. Mary. Jim. Jim, we lost our... Jim, our baby's dead. (laughs) Dr. Peters couldn't save him. (laughs) You must know this. Except except for the accident, you both would have been all right. Oh. Except for the accident. Oh, Jim. Jim, listen to me. I'll let you rest now. I'll leave you alone. Oh, no, Jim, don't do that. Jim, wait a minute. Listen, listen, listen. (laughs) But you didn't wait and you didn't listen. Then or in the many times in the weeks and months to come when I tried to talk to you about that night. I told you I forgave you, but you just smiled at me as though you heard, but you didn't believe me. So our marriage went on. But actually it wasn't any marriage at all. We were two people who lived in a single house a thousand miles apart. We both changed, Jim. I'm afraid I grew a little bitter in my unhappiness and you... Well, other people, too, began to worry about you. There was the day Professor Ahrens came to see me from the university. The old man, as you always called him. And I assure you, Mrs. Matthews, I, I try never to interfere with the private lives of my staff members. But I'm worried about Jim. He goes on working, yes, but with uh, such an attitude. He was the best project man I had. That's why I kept him free, unhampered by staff responsibilities. But lately, well, I've tried to talk to him, and his only response is he'll resign if I'm not satisfied. Now, I don't want that, Mrs. Matthews. I want Jim. But I want the old Jim, not a man who brings his mind to the laboratory and whose heart is left somewhere else. We talked, Jim, when we saw each other. But we might as well have used different languages. And then I thought perhaps I'd found an answer. 
That afternoon three months ago, I persuaded you to go with Nora and Charlie to the children's foundling home on the pretense that they were thinking of adopting a child. And when we came home that night, you were more yourself than I'd seen you in months. There was one child in particular had impressed you. Mary, did you notice that girl a little older than the others? Kid with uh, the turned-up nose and long yellow hair? Why, yes. Wasn't her name uh, Joan? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Any uh, chance of Nora and Charlie taking her? Uh, did you like her? Me? Uh-huh. Well, sure. How can you not like a kid in a spot like that? Well, I mean, did you like Joan particularly? Did you, Jim? So that's it. Yes, that's it. Nora and Charlie had no intention of adopting a kid. No, Jim, no, they didn't. But I... I, I thought about it and prayed about it for an awfully long time, and I, I honestly think that a child is the answer, Jim. Maybe our life is... is well, as it is, because it's too shallow... Yeah, I've thought of that, too. Oh, darling. Darling, do let us investigate. Let us talk to them at the home. Let's start to think about it seriously, huh? What's there to think about? If you want it that way, go ahead. Oh, Jim! <laughs> and the first thing we'll do is cut that kid's hair. Oh, oh, darling! <laughs> Three months. Three months leading up to yesterday... Three months of interviews with the adoption board and visits to the home, and fixing the den over for for room for Joan. Three months of planning. Three wonderful months of living again. And then yesterday. Yesterday, the finale to it all. Little Joan, happy and eager and frightened, all at the same time in her new home. And it's not that I'm exactly afraid, but I just never slept in a room by myself. Anyway, not since I remember. Well, I understand, Joan. And until you get used to it, I'll come in here each night and lie down with you until you're asleep. How's that? You can tell me stories, huh? That'll be fine, <laughs> Mother. Should I call you Mother or Mary? Oh, whichever you wish. It'll just work out. You'll see. And what about... Jim? Oh, we'll talk to him about that, shall we? Where is he? You said we should expect him at three o'clock. It's almost five. Well, maybe his train's late. You know, he's been on a trip. Are you sure he'll be glad to see me? Oh, Joan. Jim and I talked you over for a long time. He'll be glad. Why did you take me instead of one of the teensy kids? Most folks who came to the home took the little babies. I'd about given up hope on a con. I'm so old. <laughs> Why, honey. Oh, honey, age has nothing to do with it. You were the little girl our home needed to make it complete. I'm sure glad. Mary. There he is. I'm in here, Jim, in the den. Mary, I, I wanted to... Hello, Mr. Matthews. I'm here. Mary, didn't you get my wire? Your wire? Oh, no, dear. The phone's been out. And you know how they are about deliveries now. Mary, I've got to talk to you. Jim, I... Uh, Mother, do you want me to go outside for a little while? Uh, yes, honey, do you mind? We, we'll, be, we'll be out in a few minutes. All right. I'll stay where you can call me. All right, dear. What did the telegram say, Jim? Oh, you must have gotten it. And you went ahead anyway. No, no, I didn't. I went ahead. Oh, so you've changed your mind. No. I made it up. I had time to think during this trip. And I decided once and for all. I'm late now because I stopped at the lab. I've resigned. I'm leaving here, Mary. Here. It's a deed to the house and a power of attorney if you want to sell it before the final arrangements are worked out. I left most of the money in the joint account. Here's the book. You... You seem to have thought of everything. I'm sorry about little Joan. But perhaps you'll keep her yourself. Why, you know that isn't possible. They wouldn't let me. This adoption idea was crazy for us, and you know it. More is wrong with our marriage and not having a child in the house. What's wrong is wrong with me. Well, Jim, if you know that... Why don't you do something about it? Your trouble is, Mary, that you're still in love with a dream. And it was a dream. I'm what I am now. So let me go. All right, Jim, all right, all right. Go on, run. Go on and keep on running for the rest of your life, from me and from your job and from yourself. <laughs> oh, Jim. Jim, if, if I could only make you see things the way... You think I don't? You want the whole truth, Mary? We've never faced that, have we? Well, we will now. Two years ago, I killed our baby. Jim, that's not... I killed our baby and... 
and made us certain that we'd never have another one. Oh. Try living with that in the back of your mind, Mary. Take it to work with you day after day. See it there in the eyes of your wife every time you look at her. That isn't true. Try Jim. lying in bed night after night, reliving that crash a thousand times. You there in the street and in the rain. Not even crying in your pain. Just saying over and over to me, it's all right, Jim. I'll be all right. And the baby will live. The baby didn't live. Oh, Jim. Jim, Jim, why can't it be simple? Why can't I just put my arms around you and say I love you, dear, and I'll always love you, and that'll be all the answer? But it isn't. Our only chance is for me to try to make you see it all as I do, Jim. No, Mary, I'm going to... Now, Jim, listen to me. Listen, please. Jim, what happened that night two years ago was an accident. A single accident for which no one is responsible. It won't do, Mary. We were on that road for one reason. The selfish pride of the man you call your husband. Pride that wouldn't let him have his child born here at home when he could be important by rushing you to the hospital. The same pride that even at the start of our marriage made me buy a bigger and better house than the one we'd agreed on together. The same pride that, that couldn't take the blow of Michael's being named director and sent me to a bar to get drunk when you needed me more than ever before in our life together. Jim, if these things are true, or, or if you feel they are, what answer is it now to run away? Why don't you face them, Jim, and accept them? Face them in honesty and humility and stop running away, darling. Oh, Jim. Jim, remember that poem you used to read to me? You, you said it was your favorite, The Hound of Heaven, remember? Remember it, Jim? I fled him down the nights and down the days. Remember? Jim. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinth and ways of my own mind. And in a mist of tears, I hid from him. Why, you're that man, Jim. You're fleeing from your own faith. You're fleeing from your own forgiveness, Jim. Some things are beyond forgiveness. What things? Did our Lord ever say that? Oh, my darling, you know better if you'll just admit it to yourself. Oh, can't you see there is forgiveness if you'll just break through this wall you've built and accept it, Jim? All right, darling. Go on now, if you must. But go on out and find yourself. Go out and walk and pray. Pray with all your heart, Jim. But darling, if you can do that, I know you'll get back to me and to our life together. It's no use, Mary. <gasps> I tell you, it's no use. I... Jim! Jim! Oh, dear God, help him. Help him. And help me to live without him. If that's the way it's got to be. And so it ended, Jim. You turned and walked out into the night and it was over. And there it is, the whole story. I said that putting in a letter might help me to understand, but it doesn't. I only know that I still love you as I shall never love another human being. And that when you went out of that door, a part of myself went with you. What's left, I don't care very much about. There's a car in the driveway, Jim, and that means that Nora and Charlie are here for me. So I must finish this quickly, Jim, and... I... Oh, is that you, Nora? I'll be with you in a minute. I... I'm just finishing my letter. Nora? Hello, Mother. What? Joan, Joan, honey. Joan, how did you get here? I didn't run away and come back here, if that's what you mean. Somebody brought me. Somebody br Who? He says he wants to talk to you, please, outside. He says you know where. Yes, of course. Of course I do. Jim. I got as far as the train last night. But I kept hearing those words. I started walking. I must have walked all night. But you were right. I fled him down the nights and down the days. And all of a sudden, there was no place I could go. Once the walls I built were oh, down... darling, welcome home. 
I am home, Mary. Oh. Really home. I know. I know, Jim. And, Jim, I'm going to help you all I can. And I'll need your help. Oh. I asked for my job back this morning as Michael's assistant. Oh. Oh, I know you won't be sorry. Jim, I know you won't. I see a lot of things I wouldn't face before. The work I can do is a lot more important than whatever title they want to give me. Our child is dead. I can't change that. But there are lots of kids, like Joan, who could use the love we have to give. Oh, darling, you do see. Mother. Oh, oh yes, Joan. Come on in, honey. Oh, can I? <laughs> I mean, may I? Of course you may. This is our family shrine, Joan. And after all, you're part of the family now. A very important part. Thank you, Loretta Young and Don Amici. You know, I thought maybe you folks would like to know why we call this program Family Theater. Well, I'll tell you. Because it's the most important thing in the world. Our most precious possession is our family. We all want our family to be happy, sure, but, well, sometimes going gets pretty tough. Sickness, bills, accidents, which make it almost too much for a man and his wife to handle. Do you, you ever feel that way? You know, you don't know where to turn for help. And because you're upset and worried, you get irritable and wango. The whole family seems to sort of fall apart, and you're positive there's nothing you can do to prevent it. But, but just stop and think a minute. Maybe you're, maybe you're overlooking something. Maybe there's a way you can get help. The most powerful help a man could ask for. But you've got to ask for it. And how do you ask for it? Well, you just pray. Yes, you... You ask Almighty God for his help. He wants you to pray, but you and your family will never know how much God can help you unless you ask. Deep down in your heart, you know he'll help you. Uh, before saying goodnight, I'm sure that Loretta Young and Don Amici join me in expressing our pleasure in having had a part in dedicating this first program of the Family Theater. Thanks to everyone who helped make the family theater possible. And uh, you might be interested to know that Richard Sandville directed our play and Drew Boardman wrote it. Now, next week, our stars in the family theater will be Walter Brennan, Beulah Bondi, and an original story, No Night Too Dark, by Charles Taswell. All right, that's Jimmy Stewart saying good night. Good night, everybody. <laughs> This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. James Stewart as the Six Shooter. The man in the saddle is angular and long-legged. His skin is sun-dyed brown. The gun in his holster is gray steel and rainbow mother of pearl. The handle unmarked. But the gun has killed and the man has killed. People call them both the six-shooter. Presenting one of the screen's favorite stars, Mr. James Stewart as the six-shooter. Based on the timeless legend of Britt Ponsett the Texas plainsman who brought single-handed justice to the Western territories. I had figured on going through Clay City. It was an hour out of my way, and I was already a day late to the Jefferson Ranch where I'd signed on for the roundup. But when Scar started limping from a loose shoe, didn't have no choice. We had to head for the nearest blacksmith shop, so we turned north. Howdy, 
Sorry, mister. What's the trouble? Uh, the horse losing a show. Well, let's have a look. All right, raise it up, fella. Come on, come on, boy. Yeah. Split, mister. He needs a new one. Okay, boy. Can you take care of it? Oh, sure. Bring him over here. Hey, uh, what happened to Red, fella used to own this shop? Went to Nevada chasing silver. I bought him out. Oh, I... Yeah, you, you don't look very much like a blacksmith, huh? Oh, I'm stronger than I look. Heavier, too. What do you think I weigh, mister? Oh, I don't know. Go on, go on. Take a guess. 120? 30? Mm, well, no more than that. You a betting man, mister? Well, sometimes. Well, I say I weigh over 130. If I don't, you get the new shoe for nothing. If I do, you pay me double. What do you say? Uh, you, you got a set of scale? Don't need no scale. What do you say, mister? Is it a bet? <laughs> well, don't seem to be no way of proving it. Oh, all you got to do is lift me up. Now, you look like a man who can judge weight. What do you say? <laughs> okay, all right. It's a bet. All right, mister. Just heist me. If you don't think I weigh more than 130, the shoe is free. <laughs> all right. I, I never tried to judge a man's weight before, but all right. There, there we go. <laughs> Well? Oh, I'll be dog. I'm packed solid, mister. Real solid. Now you're packed tighter than a steer. Hi, you must weigh 150 pounds. Yeah, you see? You see? What did I tell you? 158. <laughs> the horseshoe's going to cost you money, mister, but you ain't the only one. Ever since I bought the shop, there ain't been a stranger come through Clay City but what he paid double for his first horseshoe. <laughs> he ain't sore, mister. No. No, that was a fair bet. Sure it was. I told you I was heavier than I looked. That's what folks call me, Heavy Norton. My real name's George, but everybody calls me Heavy. Hey, what's your name, mister? Ponsett. Britt Ponsett. Fella, they call the Six Shooter? Well, doggone it. I've heard about you, mister. I've sure heard about you. <laughs> oh, would have recognized you if I'd have noticed your gun. Sure is fancy, ain't it? Hey, do you mind, uh... Showing it to me? No, no. Here, catch. Hey, real fancy. Just like Sheriff Schofield said. He says he's seen you fire six shots with it while Whitey Jackson was getting off his first bullet. That time down at Eagle. Well, the uh, Sheriff kind of likes to build up a story. Oh, he swears it's the truth. Here's your gun, Mr. Ponsett. Thanks. Sure, sure. You was mighty quick in getting into Clay City. Uh, how'd you hear about it so fast? Mm, well, I'd hear about what? The holdup at the Fargo station last night. Ain't that why you come? No. No. I was headed past town. I turned off because Scar got that loose shoe. Well, now, ain't that a coincidence? A fellow holds up the Fargo office, kills one man, maybe two, gets away with $5,000, and 12 hours later, you ride into town. Well, they got any idea who did it? Nope, not a single solitary one, from, from what I hear. Like I say, the deputy agent was dead when they found him. Other fella, Fred Wilmer, a friend of his, got shot up pretty bad. Ain't done no talking yet. Doc says maybe he never will. Does Sheriff Schofield take out a posse? Nope, ain't nobody to go. Most of the men signed up for the Jefferson Roundup. Left town day before yesterday. Here the Jefferson Ranch paying good money this year. Yeah, yeah. You uh, seen the sheriff this morning? No, not lately. It might be over to his office. Uh, I think I'll walk down that way while you're fixing up Scar. Sure, sure, Mr. Ponsett. That's a darn good idea. Sheriff Schofield will be real glad to see you. A couple of doors this side of the sheriff's office, I saw the Wells Fargo sign nailed up next to a window. The place wasn't locked, so I went inside. One of the sheriffs was upset, and there was some damp stains on the floor. The cast iron safe against the wall was standing wide open, so I kicked it shut. Went out in the back stoop. There was some more blood on the steps, and then just red mud. Right at the edge, I saw the hoof prints. They trailed off along the side of the creek. Whoever made them headed west. The horse had been wearing one shoe different from the other three. A, a, a sharp rock must have cut into it sometime or another. Not enough to split it, you understand. Just enough so that the print left a jagged line, like, so like fancy handwriting. Find something, Britt? Hmm? Oh, oh, hello, Sheriff. I was heading your way. Yeah, I just saw Heavy. He told me you was in town. Did you find something? I don't know. I don't know. You see these hoof prints? Yeah. Uh-huh. Don't mean nothing. The trail gives out a mile or so down the creek at Fork. Uh-huh. 
Has Clay City had any other trouble lately, Ed? No, not a bit. I guess any town's got to expect to hold up once in a while, though. No, I heard it was a little more than that. Yeah, that's right. Fred Wilmer able to talk yet? Afraid not. Doc said he'd let me know first thing he'd come around. Took him out to his ranch. You have been out there to see him since last time? Wasn't no reason. Well, it might be a good idea to be there, you know, just in case. You thought maybe I ought to stick in town. Oh, I don't think anything more is going to happen here, Ed. I'll get Scar. I'll meet you out at Fred's place. Huh? I can handle this alone, Britt. Oh, sure, sure. I'll just offer to keep you company, Ed. I'll meet you there. He's all fixed up, Mr. Ponsett. Tied him up around the side so he'd be in the shade. Thanks, Harry. Uh, did you find uh, Sheriff Schofield? I-, I told him he was in town. Yeah. You figure out anything? Well, uh, not so far. Oh, you will. Sheriff's a good man. Why, you and him together, you'll get whoever done it. No, well, maybe so. Maybe so. You're the only blacksmith around here, ain't you, Heavy? Only one for 40 miles. Uh-huh. You ever see a horse with a shoe that's got one jagged edge, left hind leg? A lot of shoes got jagged edges, Mr. Ponsett. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. I ain't much of an artist. Now, here, it, it, uh, it kind of looks a little like this. Hmm. Seems to me I seen a shoe like that just the other day. Uh, oh, sure, I remember. Told him he ought to get a new one for it. Ben Schofield, that's who it was, just the other day. Ben? Yeah, the sheriff's kid. You know him, don't you, Mr. Ponsett? Oh, sure. Sure, I ain't seen Ben in a couple of years, though. Well, you wouldn't recognize him if you did. He just sort of growed up overnight. Yeah. Yeah, I guess he has. <laughs> That ends the first act of the six-shooter, folks. Hope you're enjoying the show. Before we get on with it, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how I happen to be doing this program. I've uh, been lucky enough to do quite a bit of radio acting before, but I've never had a program of my own. The right thing just didn't seem to come along, at least not until the six-shooter. You see, I've made several stories of this kind for pictures. That is, honest, legitimate stories of the West, and... I hope that this series can offer the same type of enjoyment with the same integrity. We think it's the sort of program the whole family will enjoy, and we think that the character of Britt Ponset typifies some of the greatness that built America. We'd be pleased if you agreed with us. And now, Act Two of The Six Shooter, starring Jimmy Stewart. Sheriff Schofield was sitting on Fred Wilmer's porch swing when I got there. The doc was inside with Fred, so I squatted down on the stoop and waited. About half an hour, the doc came out and told us we could go inside and see Fred. Fred was lying on a cot, breathing hard. The white cloth across his chest was stained pink, and his voice sounded like it was full of air. He was... Just sitting in the express office, talking. Sam and me didn't hear the back door open. Must have left it unlocked. Turned around, and there he was, holding his gun on. <laughs> she got a look at him, Fred. Handkerchief over his face, Sheriff. I couldn't see nothing. Just the gun. They told Sam to open the safe. There wasn't nothing else he could do. Sure, sure. She took the money, walked over to the door. Yeah. Looked at us for a minute, and then shot. He didn't have no reason. He hit Sam in the face and hit me in the chest. He didn't have no reason. Now, <laughs> uh, take it easy, Fred. Take it easy now. It's just like he enjoyed shooting at us. That's how it was like he enjoyed it. Maybe he was scared. Oh, he wasn't scared, Sheriff. He didn't have no reason. Thought he killed us both. Then he started down the steps. I got my hand on the shotgun and let him have it. You hit him? I don't know. Maybe he gave a yell and rode off. Uh Uh-huh. 
What kind of a fellow was he? He was young, old? Oh, I couldn't see his face. Young fellow, I'd say, though. How young? Oh, 17, 18, full grown. Pretty tall, short? Medium. About the size of your kid, Ed. <laughs> About that size. <laughs> Got enough for you, Ed? Yeah, that's enough. You, you think you'll get him, Brett? Sure, Fred. Sure. Sure. Come on, Ed. Didn't have no reason to shoot, no reason. Let's go, Ed. We're wasting our time, Brett. He's got a day's head start. He'd be 40 miles from here. Well, not if he's shot up. Now, you go on if you want to. Well, you're the sheriff. You've got to make the arrest. You ain't never been so particular before. Well, maybe not, but this time I'm particular. Are you coming? We don't even know where to start. Oh, I thought along the creek. That's as good a place as any other. It's a waste of time, Britt. Oh, we got time to waste. Come on, let's go. We picked up the trail along the creek and headed west wasn't hard to fall on. Every once in a while, we'd see a few drops of blood spattered against the shrub brush. About ten minutes later, we came to a fork where Ed had said the trail gave out. Scar stuck his nose down into the water, and I looked around. The trail didn't give out. It turned south. I nodded in that direction. Ed didn't say a thing. Just followed. At about five o'clock, we stopped to eat, and... Hell built a fire, and I opened up a couple of cans of beans I had in my roll. Oh, you ain't hungry, Ed? It's early for supper. Yeah, yeah. Ed, I talked to Heavy before I went out to Fred's place. I asked him who had a horse that would leave a mark like the one we've been following. So? And he said Ben did. Your son, Ben. I thought you ought to know that. A lot of horseshoes leave the same kind of mark. Fred said it was a young fellow. It wasn't Ben. Where is he, Ed? Jefferson's Ranch, working on a roundup. He left Clay City the day before yesterday. Couldn't be Ben. There's a lot of wild youngsters in these parts, but Ben's a good boy. Couldn't be him. You sure? That mark don't mean nothing. Plenty of horseshoes leave the same kind of mark. You know that, Brent. You had enough to eat? Yeah. Come on, let's go. but enough so you could follow the trail. For about three miles, there wasn't no blood. He must have wrapped something around the wound. Wrapped it real tight. And then we found the bandage. A piece of shirt tail sopped through. For the next mile, he'd been bleeding a lot, worse than ever. And he was hit pretty bad. Looks like it. He couldn't have gone much further because... I... Oh. Hold it, Scar. Head. Yeah. Hold on. Over there in the gully, that cabin. Yeah. Whose is it? Used to belong to Jake Levant. Died a couple of years ago. There ain't nobody living there now. There's somebody living there. Huh? Out and back. There's a pony. Better go ahead on foot. Brit? Yeah? We're gonna take him alive, ain't we? If we can. We gotta take him alive, Britt. It's been. I don't know, Britt. Not for sure. It could be Ben? It could be. Where have you been the last couple of days? I don't know that neither. Had an argument with him two nights ago. He needed some money. He'd been playing poker and lost a lot. Well, Five thousand's a lot. I wouldn't give him none. He got mad, said he'd get it, said he'd get it himself. And I hit him hard across the face. I hit him twice. He started to hit me back. Then he walked out of the house. I ain't seen him since. I wish he had hit me back. Now, we got to get across that clearing, Ed. 
over to that clump of trees. He may see us. Yeah, we'll have to take that chance. You ready? Yeah. All right? Sure. We'll stay in these trees for a couple of minutes. Okay. And then we'll rush him. Ain't gonna be easy to take him, Ed. Now that he's spotted us. You ain't gonna kill him, Brett. I ain't gonna let him kill me. It ain't his fault, Brett. It's mine. You know that ain't so. No, it's the truth. It's my fault. You didn't raise him to be a killer, Maybe Ed. I did, Brett. I was the sheriff, seeing that everybody kept close to the line, seeing that everybody lived honest, especially Ben. I broke him, Brett. Broke him like you break a wild horse or try to take all the fight out of him fast. You know what happens when you do that to a horse? He gets tame, but the fight still there, and someday he turns wild again. I'll rush him alone, Ed. No. Stay here, Brick. Now, oh, Sam Norton's dead. Maybe Fred Miller, too. Killing Ben won't bring him back. He's my son, Britt, my only son. You don't have no kids. You don't know. I'm sorry, Ed. No, we're going back to town. Not without him. We're going back. Now, you can outdraw me, Brett, but I'll still have time to get a shot off. I'll try to get him alive, Ed. I'll try. No, don't turn your back on me, Brett. Don't be a fool. Don't make me do it, Brett. I wasn't being brave. I knew he wouldn't shoot. A man like Ed Schofield just don't change overnight. You can figure a man like Ed. That's what I thought, anyway. But I hadn't figured what would happen next. I haven't figured on him running out into the clearing, standing there in the moonlight, gray against the black sky. Ben! It's me, Ben, you dad! Can you hear me, Ben? Brett Ponson's coming after you. Throw out your gun, Ben! Brett Ponson's coming! Now listen to me, Ben! It's your dad! I saw him go down, real slow, like his legs had buckled under him. I couldn't tell how bad he'd been hit. He rolled down a gully out of, out of range, and I crawled forward. I pushed myself past a couple of rocks and head toward the back door. The kid was in the kitchen. I couldn't see him, but I could hear him moving around, going from window to window, looking out, waiting for me. I slid past another rock. I could run to the door or wait. The kid made up my mind for me. I slipped down fast, and the bullets nicked the rocks. The kid had good hearing. He knew I was right there. I took out my gun and waited. I knew he'd get nervous first. Young fellows always do. I wasn't so young. I could wait. It was more than five minutes before the door started opening. And his pony knew I was coming, too. He started for the horse. I aimed at his leg. <laughs> For a second, he stopped moving and just hung in midair like a hawk. And he sprawled forward out of sight behind a log. I raised up a little and hunched myself along the side of the cabin. Everything was quiet now. Even his pony. The moon went behind a thick cloud and I came around the corner of the cabin. Suddenly, the moon came out again just in time for me to see his forty-five. Just in time to see him coming up over the top of the log. His revolver slipped out of his fingers and I saw him trying to reach for it again. He couldn't make it. I stood up and walked over to the log. The kid was lying face down, gasping for breath, a little short gasps. He pulled himself up into the flat of his hands and then he passed out. I turned him over with my foot... And I looked at his face. Ed? Ed? Over here. Where'd he get you? In the shoulder. I'm gonna be all right. Britt, is he... Did you have to? He ain't dead. Thanks. I guess he didn't hear me calling to him. He didn't know who I was. Ed. What? Ed, it ain't Ben. 
What? It ain't Ben, Ed. You, you sure, Britt? Yeah, yeah, this kid's got red hair. There ain't no reason to lie to me, Britt. I ain't shot up bad. No, I ain't lying. I ain't lying. I knew it wasn't Ben while I was growing up after him. I knew it. Well, what are you talking about? Hey, just come to me. A man don't change overnight. Neither does a boy. Well, if it ain't Ben... It... Uh, lots of tough kids in these parts. You said so yourself. Where do you suppose Ben is? Where you said, Jefferson Ranch, working in the roundup. They pay good. No. A boy don't change overnight, Ed. <laughs> you able to ride back to town? Yeah, sure. I may have to take it a little slow. I'll get the kid. Britt. Yeah? You know something, Britt? I couldn't believe it was Ben neither. Not when he shot me. I just couldn't believe it. You know that, Britt. I know it, Ed. I know it. Well, that was your first meeting with Britt Ponset. I hope you'd like to meet him again every week. And I also hope you'll try our product. It's something I use myself and it's never let me down. I don't think it'd let you down either. Maybe I'm not much of a salesman, but this product I don't think needs a lot of selling. As far as I'm concerned, it sells itself. So I'd appreciate it if you'd buy it this week and give it a try. Let me know how you like it. So long, folks. We'll be seeing you.